Did you know that every quest line in Skyrim points you at the main quest? Word walls are inexorably tied to the game's main quest as it's a new mechanic for the series. But before we get to that, we have to go back to the introduction. Now, a neatish thing about the introduction is how it approaches introducing the main quest. Rather than thrusting an amulet into the player's hands with instructions on where to go and what to do, all that happens is that Helgen gets destroyed. It's like a natural disaster without demanding the player find some way to prevent this from happening again. That said, once you leave the Helgen cave, you are technically free, but I personally have never believed this argument. Hadvar or Rayloff suggest going off on your own, but this is like saying you're free to do whatever in Oblivion because there's a single line in the journal entry saying that. Of course, Oblivion dumps you right out next to the Imperial City. In Skyrim, we're just in the middle of nowhere. To me, the first logical thing to do is to visit a merchant, which means going towards civilization, which means following Rayloff or Hadvar. This is furthered by the fact that this is clearly the way you are being shepherded to go by Bethesda, considering this is the route that Todd Howard used as a demo to advertise the game, the location of the Guardian Stones, and the additional attention that went into Riverwood. The further down this track you go, the harder it is to ignore the main quest. If you go with Hadvar or Rayloff to visit their family in Riverwood, their families will request you go to Whiterun to get Jarl Balgriff to send guards to the settlement. Well, it would be rude to deny such a simple request, especially given how important it is, and when you do that, Balgraf will then send you to his court wizard, giving you a quest to visit Bleak Falls Barrow. However, if you simply go to the Riverwood Trader in an attempt to ignore the main quest, you'll also be asked to retrieve the Golden Claw from Bleak Falls Barrow. Even if you ignore all that, should you ever do a Radiant Bounty in Whiterun or have business with the Jarl, you'll be entered into the sequence that ends with you being sent to Bleak Falls Barrow. It is rather interesting contrasting how Skyrim tries to force the player into the main quest compared to past games. In Oblivion, it is obvious what the main quest is, and if you decide to ignore it, all you have to do is not enter Wayne and Priory. Oblivion gates only start littering the countryside after you bring Martin to Joffrey. In Morrowind, Caius Cassades will outright tell you to go get experience before giving you the second quest, recommending the Fighters and Mages Guild instead. Now, the ease of ignoring the main quest from a roleplay perspective is a whole other issue. After Helgen, the player won't see any further dragon attacks until you return to Whiterun's court wizard from Bleak Falls Barrow. So, if you have meta-knowledge of the main quest, it's rather easy to avoid. However, it is impossible to engage with the new shout mechanics and avoid the main quest. This is because using shouts requires a resource that comes from dragons. This is unlike Oblivion Gates. Gates would give you sigil stones, which were one-time enchants of effects. However, you could still find enchanted gear or make it with soul gems. It wouldn't be as good, but it is good enough to avoid running Oblivion Gates. Now let's compare what you're missing out on if you decide to dodge the main quest. At Bleak Falls Barrow, you learn a word of unrelenting force. Your voice is raw power, pushing aside anything or anyone who stands in your path. If you do the companions, you learn a word of the shout to breathe fire. It's not as cool as it sounds, but your first time playing, you don't know that yet. From the College of Winterhold, you learn a word of ice form. Your thum freezes an opponent solid. Later in the college and early in the Civil War, you learn words of the slow time shout. Again, sounds cool and like something you'd want to learn how to do. In the Thieves Guild, you learn a word of disarm, a unique ability you'll only unlock through perks at higher levels. From the Dark Brotherhood, you learn the word marked for death. Speak and let your voice herald doom as an opponent's armor and life force are weakened. That's also not counting any of the shouts you learn from dungeons you are radiantly sent to or decide to go do on your own free time. Now you might say, well the game doesn't tell you which quest you need to unlock the dragon shouts. It's true, it does just refer to them as shouts in the magic menu, except at the bottom it tells you how many dragon souls you don't have and need to unlock the shouts. Also, that's making a big assumption you've missed the marketing and didn't know that Skyrim was a game about killing dragons. It's pretty easy to assume that the early quests that have to do with getting help to protect Riverwood from dragons, and then the quest where you go looking for a way to fight dragons in Bleak Falls Barrow, is going to lead to us eventually fighting a dragon. This is all to highlight that Skyrim is a game where you are undeniably a chosen one, and where rejecting that mantle requires foresight of the game's events in a way that the others did not. According to Wikipedia, Skyrim is a role-playing game, but that's hard to believe. 
While Elder Scrolls games have never really been big about player choice in the stories compared to other contemporary role-playing games, they could often rest on the laurels of giving the player near absolute freedom to create their own unique character. In fact, there is so much freedom in creating a character in an Elder Scrolls game that basic things like being a prisoner in Oblivion is a common point of contention. Compare that with something like Mass Effect or The Witcher where Commander Shepard and Geralt, while being characters that you control and make choices for, are still firmly defined by the tracks of the intended story, Paragon or Renegade, or how hardline of a Witcher you really are. That said, Skyrim characters come predefined with a trait that you have to actively manipulate the game to avoid conforming to. You are a Dragonborn. It's not as restrictive as Fallout shackling family members to the player, and I can roll my eyes every time I learn a dragon shout my non-Dragonborn characters aren't supposed to be able to use. My issue is how hard the dungeon master is trying to railroad my story to conform with theirs, simply for the sake of incorporating their new homebrew rules. Balgriff doesn't ask if the player wants to assist him further, he just assumes that somebody who survived Helgen and ran a message from Riverwood is automatically interested in going into a crypt. What are you going to do, just walk off on the Jarl? His bodyguard just drew a sword for arriving without an appointment, I don't know if that's a good idea. What else are you going to do, ignore Farangar's request? Well, that's more plausible, but it does feel rude ignoring Jarl Balin's requests. Plus, it's not that different from any of the other cell sword stuff the player does, so no reason to ignore it without meta knowledge of the consequences. I just want to get paid for slaying a giant and use the enchanting table. Out of Bleakfall's Barrow, we recover the Dragonstone, the significance of which we'll have to learn later, however. A dragon has attacked Whiterun's western watchtower. Balgriff wants us and his bodyguard Irileth to take some guards out to the watchtower to go fight it. It's not known if it's actually possible, but the Jarl figures Zerolith might be able to figure out something from the experience. It's rather interesting seeing Nords try to deal with a threat they aren't even certain can actually be stopped, and Zerolith seems savvy to this, so she tries to use the Nords' bravado to motivate them in the fight. So begins the ramp up to our first dragon encounter. We saw what one could do to Helgen, now it's time to repay the favor. We see the dragon emerge from the mountains above, and... Dragons in Skyrim are something else entirely. See, when a dragon is defeated, we as Dragonborn are capable of killing them permanently by sucking out their soul. We then spend those souls to unlock dragon shouts. However, including the DLC shouts, there are 81 words of power in Skyrim. Some of them are taught to you as part of the main quest, but even being charitable, that's still, let's say, 50 words or 50 dragons to unlock all of them. Now, there are not enough scripted encounters or even dragon peaks to constitute 50 souls, so they also are random encounters. However, the problem is that very little ceremony can be created around an enemy that you are expected to fight 50 of. Part of whatever dragon fight comparison you want to make is usually going to be level design. You need to create environments that the encounter can work around. Otherwise, you have to create a dragon AI that has the flexibility to be able to fight in a variety of environments. In essence, the problem, as always, is quantity over quality. Take the Oblivion Gates. They're actually pretty cool dungeons the first time you do them. They're largely exterior cells, they have a strong artistic direction, they have a unique design compared to most Oblivion dungeons. The problem with the Oblivion Gates is that there are 60 of them in Cyrodiil. The novelty of their design is going to wear off really quick if the player is taking the time to actually do them. Dragons have that same problem. They're legitimately cool to fight the first time you do it, but the luster goes away once you realize Mimolnir is functionally identical to every other dragon encounter in the game. Literally, what type of dragon he even is, is level scaled. He can be a normal dragon, a blood dragon, a frost dragon, etc. It all depends on you, the player, and how long you put off this fight. Let's start with the mechanics of a dragon encounter. They start off flying around, finding positions where they can hover and breathe fire or frost at the player. Sometimes they land on a perch and do this, sometimes they land on the ground. Note that while there are a couple dozen shouts in the game, dragons won't actually use anything other than the most basic of damage shouts. Some dragons apparently know unrelenting force, but I personally have never seen them use it. Dragons will not use animal allegiance to recruit allies, they won't become ethereal, disarm opponents, or slow time. In fact, despite the claim that dragons are all apparently sapient creatures with their own philosophies and intelligence, they actually behave just like wild animals. This includes them flying off to go kill random creatures in the wilderness. Outside of these scripted moments and quests, dragons will not communicate with anyone. They don't negotiate, they don't make demands of subservience, they don't even gloat. They also don't retreat, nor are they intelligent with what fights they pick. They don't strategically burn farms and minor settlements, they just sit on mountain peaks and occasionally fly off to go get killed. The smartest of the dragons were the ones that picked fights with the College of Winterhold, which they consistently lost even without my help. Even the town guard of Falkreath were capable of slaying dragons if one showed up during the changing of the guard. 
Once a dragon is at half health, they will land on the ground. At this point, it's basically over for them. Melee and magic characters can easily stunlock dragons to death, and archer characters have a big, easy target to hit. You would think that slaying dragons would be particularly difficult. Perhaps they even have a resistance to normal weapons due to their thick hides and tough scales, but... No, base iron is capable of damaging a dragon because dragons are just flat pools of health that fly around. Once you've fought one dragon, you've fought them all. A simple place to start would be to make it so that dragons use more shouts as they level up. I would also create a couple AI packages for dragons that would vary their tactics. Some dragons would be like warriors, favoring ground combat and using elemental fury to augment their abilities. Other dragons would be like archers, using hit and run tactics with their shouts. And then rarely, you would encounter dragons capable of using magic, summoning Daedra and using a variety of magic spells in addition to their shouts. I would really sell the idea that the dragons are unique and have classes, just like the player. Oh wait. I would also make a pool of dragon names so each dragon is a named encounter, even if it's randomly pulled from a list of like 150 potential names. Just look at how randomly picking names for Uruk in the Middle Earth games works really well for emergent storytelling, and no, they didn't patent the idea of pulling names from a list. Funny thing is, as far as content goes, dragons appear to have the least amount of cut content. They were also a primary focus during pre-production. It's not that dragons were meant to be amazing encounters and Bethesda had to settle their ambitions against a cruel reality of the release date. This is how it's meant to be. This is intentional. It's been stated a big movie inspiration for dragons was the 2002 film Reign of Fire. In that movie, dragons emerge from hibernation, apparently going to sleep after wiping out the dinosaurs and all life on Earth. As you can guess, they do this not out of some intelligent desire to destroy things, but because they're wild animals who are hungry. They literally threaten their own extinction because of how stupid they are. This film recouped its costs, but it was hardly a blockbuster. It's not even really considered a cult classic. However, its inspirations when it comes to cinematic interpretations of dragons is undeniable, with Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, even the Hobbit movies using similar designs. Obviously, I have to point out that these are wyverns, not dragons, because there are some real nerds out there who would be upset if I didn't. I consider that observation uninteresting, however. I mean, look at the visual composition of Reign of Fire, how dark and gray everything is, and compare that with the standard edition of Skyrim. They even recreated a shot of the movie in the live-action trailer, where the guy stands off against the dragon. I'm guessing that the team must have gone out to see the movie after Morrowind shipped, so there were some big positive associations at Bethesda. Which is fine, I guess, but it really informs a big part of the issue here. The lore and the writers say the dragons are intelligent creatures, while the artists and designers were forced to watch Reign of Fire every week. The end result is this weird hybrid. There is actually a way for Bethesda to have their cake and eat it too, it's called Lesser Dragons. You already have this idea that souls equals intelligence in Elder Scrolls, so you could simply say that dragons with weak souls are like feral creatures that only answer to greater dragons, and the greater dragons are the intelligent ones who might have three dragons worth of souls or an entire shout. As it stands, however, Skyrim dragons are fairly lame. They're just flying death claws, or cliff racers with magic. Upon Mimolnir's defeat, we absorb his soul. Now, I need to get this off my chest. Todd Howard pulled a sneaky. During the gameplay demo when he absorbs Mimolnir's soul, he quickly switches to the Firestorm spell. You can actually hear the hotkey going off. So he just makes grabbing the soul more epic than it actually is. Mind you, it's a cool effect, but really it's just kind of a lame party popper for the end of a lame dragon fight. The dragon's flesh melts off, including the scales. I was always confused how we recover the scales given the bodies burn up, or how dragon bone is an extremely valuable material, but the obvious dragon burial sites went unpilfered for thousands of years. The only use for these materials is weapons and armor. In the base game, it was actually just armor, with dragon scale being the best light armor and dragon bone being the second best heavy armor. Which is funny considering the Daedric smithing perk comes before the dragon smithing perk. Also, the dragon bone weapons came with the Dawnguard DLC as post-launch content. I think getting these high-level materials pushes players to grind their smithing skill up more than anything else in the game. Dragon encounters are far more common than the chances of the player finding ebony or malachite, especially since vendors only sell those materials at higher level. Whereas Skyrim pushes you towards fighting your first dragon before level 10. So the guards are impressed with the whole soul absorption thing and will ask if you can do any dragon shouts. Of course you can. See, you can't get the dragon stone without learning the first word of unrelenting force. And you can't fight Mimolnir without getting the dragon stone. And the game will actually unlock the first word of unrelenting force for you. So whatever words you were hoping to learn, like slow time or ice form, is going to have to wait because the game really wants you to know the marketable one, Foos, from the trailer. In their tongue, he is Dovahkiin. Dragonborn. While the soldiers are impressed with our newfound abilities, Irolith is not. 
I've been all across Tamriel. I've seen plenty of things just as outlandish as this. What, like sword singing? The replacement for dragon shouts in Elder Scrolls 6? Irelith is a really interesting premise for a character. She's a worldly Dunmer assassin who shows an appropriate level of experience and skepticism. There's a whole story about how a woman like her became the house Carl to Balgriff that Skyrim doesn't really tell, because after this point she exits the stage. Compare that with Oblivion where you meet Boris, Joffrey, and Martin all early and engage with them throughout the story. We've yet to meet a character as part of the main quest who is prevalent throughout, as doing the Dragon Rising quest enables the battle for Whiterun, meaning that Balgriff at this point has to be flexible enough to get replaced. On our way back to Whiterun, we hear a loud shout from the heavens, and Balgriff tells us that it's a summon from the Greybeards, and we cannot possibly ignore it. Yeah, thanks for sucking us into the vortex of the main quest and then giving us literal summons from the top of the world. At this point, Balgriff will make us the Thane of Whiterun and give us a housecarl named Lydia, who I promptly ignored. Her popularity is owed to her being a welfare hireling. I mean, it's not like most hirelings are particularly difficult to recruit, but you can do better than Lydia. Being Thane has no responsibilities and only two perks. You can get a bounty up to 2,000 gold for given once, and you're given permission to buy a home. I find this really amusing. By implication, I know it isn't necessarily true. Regardless, by implication, everyone who owns a home in Skyrim is a Thane. In addition, because murders are typically a bounty of 1040, you're given a one-time murder pass by being Thane. Thus, every homeowner in Skyrim is also potentially a murderer. Congratulations. 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 We've been summoned by the Greybeards, which are masters of the voice that live on top of the throat of the world. When Todd Howard said you could climb that mountain, the throat of the world was the mountain he was specifically pointing at. Big epic things like mountains, you can walk to the top of that mountain, so... It has 7,000 steps. Or 700. Uh, I have been promised 7,000 steps and I'm going to count them. <laughs> yes. Our world artists are amazing. Uh, we have a, just, just an amazing team and they put so much detail on the world. So they didn't blink when I said it must have 7,000 steps. Now the piece of lore the 7K comes from is the Pocket Guide to the Empire 1st Edition, which was a physical lore book that came with Red Guard and was a collaborative effort between Michael Kirkbride and Kurt Coleman. However, the 3rd Edition Pocket Guide that came with Morrowind did not corroborate this fact. Probably for innocuous reasons. Unfortunately, Klimek had to open his mouth. On your way up the 7,000 steps again, Klimek? Trouble is, my legs aren't what they used to be, and climbing the 7,000 steps takes its toll. 7,000 steps indeed. Next time, they need to build it closer to the ground. My view is, if you look at all the stuff we have in the world, 7,000 steps is not significantly, it's not that hard. Now, some tricky math here says the mountain would have to be nine and a half times bigger to actually accommodate the full 7,000 steps. You could argue that maybe the 7,000 steps includes the climb up to Iverstead. I would argue that I have a 15-inch cock if you start measuring from my prostate. This is one of those issues of scale. Morrowind lowered the scaling of Elder Scrolls worlds, and this has posed issues ever since. It's a consequence of handcrafted world design, but unfortunately Bethesda's not taken the opportunity to increase the scale of their worlds. Now on the one hand, this means the worlds are tightly packed full of content. On the other, when Bethesda needs to show the scale of something, they usually fall short as a consequence. Post-Red Year, the Throat of the World is the undisputed tallest mountain in Tamriel. There's a lot of napkin math around this, since it's hard to translate the size of the in-game mountain to real-world units. Since people like to pretend to climb Mount Everest on their stairs, there are decent numbers of step counts required. For Everest, this is around 17,000 steps. If you try to find a more comparable mountain, the throat of the world wouldn't even place in the top 100 tallest mountains on Earth. Which is a shame. You would think in a fantasy setting that the throat of the world would be absurdly tall, putting real-world mountains to shame. But I'm guessing that 7,000 just sounded like a good number for a lore tidbit back in the 90s that Bethesda wasn't ever certain would actually come back to haunt them. Remember that when Redguard was made, Elder Scrolls was still supposed to be procedurally generated, and Morrowind was actually going to be a hybrid of handcrafted and procedurally generated world design. Now, as lamentable as this is, it is again Bethesda that intentionally draws attention to the 7K figure. It would be one thing if lore nerds were complaining about some obscure 15-year-old factoid that wasn't actually in the games, but you dug this hole when you drew attention to it. That said, there is an interesting side effect to all this. Climbing the Throat of the World is still the Skyrim equivalent of a Mount Everest trip. 
Iverstead is a settlement practically built around the tourism industry, and the only thing missing are the Sherpas offering to help people take trips up the mountain. Clemick is an Iverstead man who actually delivers supplies up to the monastery at the top, meaning he routinely makes the trip. You can also encounter other people on the way up the mountain. This is all to say, the mountain is actually approachable enough that it makes sense people treat it in this manner. Now, once I heard from a random person in a live stream that air doesn't exist in Elder Scrolls, I'm not sure how true that is, but it was such a weird thing to say that it stuck with me ever since. Anyways, I bring that up because part of a mountain being an approachable climb is the ability to breathe. Less a deal for the people that live here and more a deal for us lowlanders who might not be acclimated or even have the ability to survive in low oxygen environments. However, ballpark estimates seem to place High Hrothgar, where the Greybeards live at, at about the same height as the tallest human settlement on Earth, or about 5.1 kilometers above sea level. Anyways, I spent too long reading about mountains to say, I don't think Bethesda did a very good job portraying how much of an ordeal this would be. If this were a movie, the climb to High Hrothgar would be symbolic of the main character's struggle with the call to action. Too often is the struggle portrayed as a monster, or a man, or a society. Not often enough is the simple act of survival utilized. It's called man against nature. It's sort of like how in The Last Jedi, Rey's struggle should have been figuring out how to survive falling in a deep pool of water despite never having the opportunity to learn how to swim. Of course, there is a big obstacle on this journey that tends to trip people up. Remember how Bethesda pushes people down the main quest line? Well, this is a common enough trend that we have evidence because the UESP article for this quest includes multiple strategies for contending with a frost troll on the path. Ah yes, the Great Filter. Step aside, Bridge Wizard, you've been replaced by... a Frost Troll. I will remind you that reaching this point in the questline required us to slay a dragon, but the filter that actually stops people is a fucking snow ape. As you climb the mountain, you'll encounter some etched tablets. There are ten of them, and they include a really basic summary of relevant lore. Dragons used to run things, then men showed up and dragons still ran things. Kine, or Kinnereth, asked Parthenex to teach men how to use the voice, and this led to a war between dragons and men. The men won against the dragons, then used the voice to found their own empire. However, the voice was defeated at Red Mountain. Jurgen Windcaller took this opportunity to meditate on their defeat, and came up with a philosophy and built High Hrothgar. The Greybeards stayed in meditative silence until Tiber Septim, who they tutored and named Dovakin. The final tablet lays out the principle of the Greybeards, only use the power of the voice in times of need. However, chances are you, yes you, didn't find all the tablets or couldn't be bothered to actually read them. That's okay though, most of this information will be elaborated upon later. So we reach High Hrothgar and drop off Klimek's supplies, which is funny considering most people are only going to be here as part of the main quest, so like, just hand deliver them. Also funny thing, you can take the supplies after dropping them off, and they're like the paintbrushes from Oblivion. No gravity. I did not find a good use for this quirk. We meet with the Greybeards, whose voices are so powerful that they can't hold casual conversation. Arngear, however, can speak without causing an avalanche that destroys Riverwood and Iverstead, so he represents the Greybeards. Funny thing, I always thought Arngear was the youngest Greybeard, so his voice wasn't fully developed yet. My evidence was visual. Arngear has this short little bush tied while the other Greybeards have full, lengthy beards. Also, Ulfric Stormcloak trained to be a Greybeard and his voice doesn't destroy everything, so I just assumed your voice would get more powerful the longer you trained. However, it's actually the opposite. Arngear is the Grandmaster and the only reason he can speak normally is because he's trained hard enough to control his voice. I think this has to do with Bethesda's leadership fetish. We are meeting the Greybeards, so of course we have to speak to their leader. Wouldn't it be better if we were speaking with the least experienced Greybeard, but he was still super wise? This brings up an unfortunate question about how exactly this order has managed to survive for thousands of years. The Greybeards, I have an issue with that name, there are only four of them, and they're all old men. Technically their name is the Masters of the Voice, but everyone calls them Greybeards because calling them tongues would have led to ceaseless cunnilingus jokes on r slash Skyrim. Okay, so they have a unifying phenotypical descriptor, but how exactly do people actually join this order? Ulfric says he was chosen when he was a lad and then trained with them for 10 years. Given that Ulfric is sporting a dirty blonde goatee, it's fair to say he wasn't a greybeard. Also, how exactly did they choose Ulfric? They apparently don't get out much, so it's not like Ulfric was a young man living in the Palace of Kings, and then one day a greybeard showed up to take him to Hogwarts. If anything, it seems more likely that the greybeard recruitment would be the people who journey up to High Hrothgar. Clemic, for instance, seems like a perfect candidate after years of making the trip and would be allowed into the monastery to begin training. I'm just saying, it seems to me like someone isn't thinking about the logistics here. 
If it takes years to develop a mastery of the voice, then it seems like the stability of the order would be at extreme risk if only two of the Greybeards were to die over the course of five years. All you have to do to account for this is to make one of the nonverbal Greybeards an obviously younger man, but of course that would betray the premise of them being Greybeards. Of course they have to all be old men, the scene demands it. A notable thing. Arngear is the first character in the main quest to recur throughout the questline. It took this long to introduce a secondary character into the storyline. I mean, I guess the big black bad dragon was at the start of the game, but all he did was break things. Hard to say there was a character introduction in that scene. Arngear is a mentor character who helps teach the player about the way of the voice, and establishes a decent chunk of lore, like the fact that the voice is also known as the Thum. Now to contrast this, Oblivion didn't really have mentor characters in the main quest line. The closest was Joffrey, and even then he was more like our boss than a mentor. Caius Cassades in Morrowind was also mostly a boss, although he did offer advice for dealing with the political aspects. Nabani Mesa, the wise woman of the Urshalaku tribe, however, was definitely a spiritual mentor for the player in Morrowind. So Skyrim is shaking things up a bit by making us a free agent for a few quests and then sending us to go visit some monks. That said, Morrowind and Oblivion both did have recurring characters introduced early and throughout their plots. Not to worry though, they'll send us to a dungeon right quick. But first, two gifts. We learn the second word of unrelenting force, making it stagger enemies... more? They also teach us a word of whirlwind sprint. This shout acts like a dash, providing some interesting mobility options. However, the extent of Bethesda's creativity with this new ability is going to be very quickly fulfilled. The Greybeards want to test us, as though climbing the mountain wasn't enough of an ordeal. It is apparently customary to receive the Horn of Jürgen Windcaller, the founder of their order, which is currently located in the ruins of Ustengrav. I'm not really sure why he was buried out in the swamp by the ocean a third of the way across the continent, when the sum of his life's work was on top of the tallest mountain in the world. The ruin is currently occupied by necromancers who have been excavating and come into conflict with the native Draugr. I don't really have much to say about Ustengrav. If you've been following just the main quest, then I guess the moment when you first enter the giant cavern area might be impressive, compared to the last time you entered a giant cavern area at Bleak Falls Barrow that was like half as big. However, this becomes such a trope not just in the Bethesda content but even Creation Club content that I'm numb to it. Skyrim's canon ending has to include a series of massive earthquakes due to how many cavitations in the earth there are. I'm also surprised it isn't more common to find skeletons at the bottom of these giant pits. Yeah, that source of light up there has to come from somewhere. Oh wait, that's actually a plot point in a DLC quest. Still, the meme of the underground cavern is only special when done sparingly. There is a jumping puzzle here that asks you to make use of your whirlwind sprint shout, complete with a chest at the end to reward you. I don't remember what was in the chest because of how minor it was. I think it was around 10 gold and a minor healing potion on my level 60 character. And there's this perk cola system that requires you to use whirlwind sprint to pass. I've tested it and it seems pretty foolproof. You would need some serious fortify speed to get past it without knowing the shout. And that's it. What is it? Oh yeah, remember when I said that Bethesda's creativity would be quickly fulfilled? Well congratulations, their creativity has been fulfilled. No, I'm not kidding. If you've played a lot of platformers, then you already know that the forward dash ability tends to unlock a lot of creative potential from the designers. There's just so much you can do when you know the player can perform a forward dash. For instance, that short jumping puzzle is one such thing. You could have gaps that only players with this shout could clear. In a typical game, unlocking Whirlwind Sprint would mean that every main quest dungeon following Ustengrav could make use of that ability. It's very common in games to give the players new mobility options and then design hidden rewards for using them. However, in a typical Bethesda moment, I can only imagine they were terrified of the idea of players encountering something they couldn't do without the shout before they got it, and so dictated that the shout could never be used outside of the one instance where it was guaranteed to be known as though some percentage of the players would somehow be able to skip this quest and complete the rest of the quest line without knowing Whirlwind Sprint. While I understand not wanting to impose playstyles on characters, it's fair to say that most people doing the main quest here are going to be fine with you actually utilizing Dragon Shouts, especially if it's for purposes that make the game more creatively interesting. Because Whirlwind Sprint otherwise has little use outside of these seven hidden areas that can only be accessed with this shout. It obviously shares a cooldown with other, more useful shouts, so the combat utility of being able to close gaps isn't really as useful as being able to ragdoll, paralyze, or disarm opponents. Especially if you factor in the apathy threshold problem. The most consistent use I found in the entire game was swinging blade hallways, something that was already easy to bypass and survive without the shout, since it shows up even in Bleak Falls Barrow. So now we're at the bottom of Ustengrav at the tomb of Jürgen Windcaller, except... BETRAYAL! The horn is gone. 
Unsurprising, really. I can only imagine how many future prophecies I fucked over due to my own tomb raiding. Actually, whoever took it left a note asking we meet with them. This is, by my estimation, physically impossible, meaning that I am more than interested to meet the person responsible as they will likely be a very powerful wizard. Actually, it's just a normal innkeeper. The Greybeards seem to think you're the Dragonborn. I hope they're right. The Greybeards are right. I am the Dragonborn. I hope so, but you'll forgive me if I don't assume that something's true just because the Greybeards say so. I just handed you the horn of Jurgen Windcaller. Does that make me Dragonborn too? Fools! Well, that's a great fucking question, isn't it, Delphine? How exactly did you accomplish this task? First of all, the necromancers won't actually complete their excavation and open up the ruins until conveniently right before we are to look for the horn. This includes the back door for the dungeon. If you come here before that point in the main quest line, this hallway is blocked off. So Delphine has a very tight window of opportunity to actually steal the horn, leading to the second problem. How did she get past the whirlwind sprint challenge? I asked my livestream chat for ideas and the best they offered was that she hired mercenaries to set off the sensors and then ran through. However, Delphine doesn't seem like the type to involve anyone she absolutely doesn't have to, so she would have had to run up against this problem first and then left to go hire mercenaries and then come back, eating up that precious little time she has before we get there. And consider this, Delphine's actually the woman we saw talking to Farangar after we returned from Bleak Falls Barrow. In fact, the reason we went to Bleak Falls Barrow was because Delphine was using Farangar to get cell swords sent to the dungeon to look for the Dragonstone. If Delphine isn't above just hiring mercenaries to do it, then why didn't she just hire her own cell swords to go get the Dragonstone? Seems like a risk that might blow her cover to involve Farangar just for the sake of saving drakes on mercs. That is, of course, assuming she had nothing to do with one of her fellow Riverwood business owners getting robbed for the Golden Claw that was essential to getting the Dragonstone, but the game never actually implies Delphine had anything to do with that, just that it was weird that bandits stole the one singular item from the shop. Anyways, my point is, given the type of person Delphine is, it's fair to say that she was the only person she would be willing to involve in this operation, which returns us to the original question of how she accomplished this. She only knows two restoration spells, nothing that would be feasible for trying to do this like conjuring a minion or reanimating a body to run past the sensors. And Skyrim doesn't do 10 foot poles, although I think you'd probably need like a 50 foot pole for this one. So the only thing I can think of is that she shadowed us and then somehow got ahead of us to steal the horn without setting off the water feature, or breaking the spider web, and then escaped without... No, I'm not really buying this one either. It's not impossible, since the whirlwind sprint challenge stays open after you get past it, but that would mean that Delphine is literally one of the best thieves, not just in Skyrim, but literally the entire setting. Not even the Oblivion Thieves Guild character could lay a finger on just how stealthy Delphine would have to be, and that guy stole an Elder Scroll from the Imperial Palace. Is she clairvoyant? I mean, that would make sense. She was apparently pretty clairvoyant last time. Well, that's a great question. It is an attainable power now, although I doubt it would be of much help to her. I don't think the power of clairvoyance can be used to achieve things that are physically impossible. So, yeah. We'll just classify Delphine getting the horn as impossible. Now let's talk about the why. Well, as Delphine puts it, When you showed up here, I knew you were the one the Greybeard sent, and not some Thalmor plant. In fairness, I know that tying everything to the Thalmor's old hat at this point in the video, but Delphine is kind of the OG Q-Boomer conspiracy theorist accusing every unexplained plot point of being involved with the Thalmor. So she stole the horn as a test of whether or not we're a Thalmor trap. Wait, I worded that wrong. Okay, so I'm kind of confused. What's the trap aspect of this situation? I assume the implication, based on the other stuff about her character, is that she's absolutely paranoid enough to assume the Thalmor would fake the Greybeard summons and the story of someone slaying a dragon just to smoke out a Blades agent. However, if that were true, then would the Thalmor even include the horn in their psyop? She would steal the horn and then the Thalmor agents would never show up because the trap would be her contacting the fake Dragonborn first anyways. She says she took the horn because she knew that's what the Greybeards would send the Dragonborn to retrieve if they thought we were legit, and that's because we showed up here, then we're the real deal and not a Thalmor agent. Okay, wait. So you think that you, and only you, are the only non-Dragonborn that could successfully know about and reach the horn? What if there was a person in Skyrim that was available for hire and could unlock literally any door- oh wait, he exists, his name was Mercer Frey. Whatever trick you use, Delphine, would absolutely be available to the Thalmor, especially since they have way more resources than you. Also, you based all this on a really faulty assumption. What signal are you going to get if the fake Dragonborn can't reach the horn versus a real Dragonborn reaching the horn, but the note is missing because it blew away or something? 
so then we would return to High Hrothgar without the Horn. I mean, in a realistic situation, I can imagine the Greybeards accepting that it's within the realm of possibility that the Horn had been stolen since the last time they sent someone to Ustengrav 600 years ago. Especially if it is supposed to be physically possible to steal the Horn without being the Dragonborn. It could have been weeks before Delphine realized that her horn test failed simply because the breeze of us entering the room blew the note away. All we really have to do is describe Jürgen Windcaller's tomb for the Greybeards to accept that we completed the test of Ustengrav and can continue with our training. Obviously this isn't possible in the game, you can't mention to Arngear that the horn was stolen. Even Oblivion had a line of dialogue here and there for situations like this. Arngear should say that whoever stole the horn would obviously be very dangerous and that we should be careful. However, Bethesda correctly assumes that most players are just going to follow the quest marker straight to Delphine, so why bother? Also, how funny would it be if Delphine had a different greeting if the player was a high elf and walked in wearing full Thalmor equipment? Delphine is a commonly hated character, and for good reason. I'll explain what I want, when I want. Got it? You'd already be dead if I didn't like the look of you when you walked in here. Yeah, extreme doubt. The character she said this to had such a terrifying presence that the ghosts of ancient warriors were scared of her. Delphine, you're going up against a character who can turn her enemies into mush just by standing within 100 feet of them. Delphine's character just starts off poorly and doesn't get any better throughout the questline. She did give us the horn back, as though Bethesda were worried that their fans would complain if they walked out of a dungeon empty-handed. I guess they would, but there was also a boss chest. So we head back up to High Hrothgar, which is an issue because of fast travel. Like, there's a world of difference between skipping the on-foot journey between Whiterun and Markarth and skipping the on-foot journey up the tallest mountain in the world. Bethesda's logic is that anyone who's ever been to the top of Mount Everest can just fast travel there now. I want to introduce you to an artifact from Morrowind, the Boots of the Apostle. What's significant about them is that they are an artifact that was actually created by the Greybeards and gifted to Talos Stormcrown for exactly this purpose. They gave the wearer the ability to fly upon the clouds, which he used to descend from Harai Hrothgar. And despite all the Morrowind nostalgia bait in the Creation Club, nobody seemed to remember this item. I guess it's because it makes you levitate, but it wouldn't be the first time a creation changed an item's enchantment just to fit inside of Skyrim. Arngear thanks us for the horn and the Greybeards blow some words at us, basically saying that we're now recognized as the Dragonborn, Stormcrown, and Ysmir. Basically, just a hero of the north. We learn the third word of unrelenting force. Fusroda. Those are the Fusroda. three. Fusroda. And you gotta, you know, you gotta yell it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it stands for f force, balance, push mm -hmm. in the dragon language. Making it a full power game ender for many NPCs, and that's it. The Greybeards have nothing else for us because now we're supposed to go do Delphine's quests instead. It is an unenviable problem. Even if the Greybeards gave us another task and it was like competing quest lines, there is eventually a point where we would run out of Greybeards quests and then would have to do the cuck walk of shame back to Delphine's Inn. The problem is that Delphine, in addition to being a mind-breaking wizard, is just a toxic person in general. I think the game is trying to draw attention to this. However, I'd hate to spoil the fact that Delphine does not undergo any redemption arc. Actually, that's not much of a spoiler. Again, Delphine's bad attitude is pretty well known and complained about. Delphine is a member of the Blades, and historically the Blades have been pretty good characters. That doesn't mean the Blades always have to be nice. I'm thinking of Glenroy, who suggested that the Blades just murder the player character in Oblivion simply for being in the wrong place. It does however kind of stand out that in a game full of bitchy female characters that the primary female character in the main quest also behaves in that manner, while her male counterparts, both in the other games and in this one, are far more polite and reasonable. To jump ahead a bit, later we'll meet Esburn who's been living in far worse conditions than Delphine, but is just a polite old man. He's the sweetest thing. You can write off Delphine's flaws as consequences of her paranoia, but at least she got to live on the surface, be an innkeeper, and actually accomplish things in her fight against the Thalmor. Delphine wants us to prove that we're the Dragonborn. Specifically, she wants to prove that we're capable of slaying dragons. I can't help but feel all of this could have been prevented if Delphine had decided to just observe the Western Watchtower confrontation from a distance. It wouldn't have even been that far out of her way on her trip back to Riverwood. And it's not implausible, one of her primary reasons for her actions is the return of the dragons, so you would think Delphine might watch how humans fight Mimolnir in order to understand what humanity could do better. And even then, We've already proven we're the Dragonborn, and I'm sure she would have heard through Farangar that a dragon soul was indeed observed being absorbed at the Western Watchtower. But Delphine wants to be super sure, so she asks us to meet her at Kynesgrove. She's used the Dragonstone we recovered earlier in the questline to create a map of Dragon Resurrections, because she's somehow had the time to visit all the dragon burial sites in the eastern part of Riften, in addition to everything else that she's done, in the time between getting the Dragonstone in this meeting. 
Her theory is that the dragons are coming back from the dead, so she wants to observe this process, and then she wants us to prove that we can absorb souls. So at least there's one aspect of this quest that's going to reveal new information. Funny thing, she actually has dialogue if you physically travel with her where she'll comment on various landmarks you pass on the way to Kynesgrove. It's neat but easy to miss because of fast travel. Kynesgrove is a tiny mining settlement near Windhelm and sure enough the big black bad dragon is there being menacing. Actually he's up at the old dragon mound. Wait, you guys know that's what that is? Do you realize how much money you'd make from digging that sucker up and selling the remains? Not like this mining town would have excavation equipment, or laborers. Sure enough, the black dragon is resurrecting a dead dragon, returning it to life. I think this is where the game first introduces the black dragon's name, although you have to pay attention to and understand what the dragons are saying to each other. Also, it's in the subtitles, which I always hate. Skyrim's capable of masking a character's name for dramatic reveals, like in Dawnguard, but if you have the subtitles on, and you really should in Skyrim, then it's revealed that the dragon's name is Alduin. Now how significant a reveal this is depends on how much you know about the lore, so not really, and his significance will be explained later. This is also the first instance where players will really see dragons communicating. I mean, Milmolnir was supposed to say stuff, but only if you have the unofficial patch or another language installed. Seriously, that seems like an important scene for the dragons for Bethesda after 10 years to still have not fixed. This isn't like Oblivion where Bethesda stopped patching the game after a couple years, they literally sold a new version of Skyrim in the current decade. You're telling me you can add a no shit Oblivion gate to Skyrim but not patch this? Alduin's all, you call yourself Dragonborn, but you don't know our language. And I'm all, yeah, well, that's what other people have been calling me because they haven't recognized me as the Emperor of Tamriel yet. At the end of our short dialogue, can't even really call it a dialogue if we don't say anything back, Alduin leaves and we're forced to fight Saloknir, which is probably the only time I'm ever going to deem to mention this dragon as he is a literal expendable pushover. I don't know why Alduin didn't take the opportunity to just kill us, I guess he has better things to do. I mean, he probably knows the stakes that the gods are making new Dragonborn. He doesn't necessarily know that we're the only one. He might figure that it's too dangerous to justify taking us on and that he'd be better off spent going off and resurrecting other dragons. My real issue is that the guy he leaves to fight us is just a normal dragon. Mimolnir was also just a normal dragon, but he was the first one you'll fight. This is an opportunity to escalate the powers of the dragons to match our own raised abilities. Except for a problem. Our only new abilities since fighting the last mandatory dragon encounter are an upgraded Unrelenting Force, Whirlwind Sprint, and if you found it, become ethereal. Unrelenting Force is the primary ability of the game that was all over the marketing material, but it isn't really that useful for fighting dragons like the trailer would imply. In reality, our dragon shouts have not meaningfully advanced, so this dragon also doesn't advance. It's literally the same encounter, and the only real difference is that there's less expendable guards to help us do damage. With the dragon soul absorbed, Delphine admits that she owes us some information. She reveals that she is a surviving member of the Blades, which were wiped out after the Great War. She doesn't really know much about the dragons, which is obvious, and she assumes that the Thalmor are responsible for their return. It's weird that Delphine assumes that some mortal organization is involved, and not Alduin himself. She literally observed them having a vocal conversation, including parts in a language that she does understand. And all of the lore that she has read is likely told her that the dragons are supposed to be intelligent creatures. Again, this is I think supposed to be showcasing how Delphine's mindset is compromised by her paranoia involving the Thalmor, that she's intentionally missing the bigger picture because she's already built up this idea in her head that her hated enemies are the ones behind it all. It's obvious that they're trying to do something with the character but failing at it because her arc is just going to be replacing her paranoia of the Thalmor with paranoia of the dragons. She figures the next step is going to be trying to find whatever information the Thalmor has on the dragons by infiltrating their embassy and base of operations. Her idea is to have us infiltrate the embassy during a party where Skyrim's nobility and empire supporters are invited to make friends with the Thalmor. We meet with a contact named Malborn who has us given whatever equipment we absolutely need, although I'm not entirely certain there's actually a limit to how much gear you can give him. This is reminiscent of the Mythic Dawn based quest from Oblivion, which I noted at the time. You have a short section where you're deprived of equipment, however Bethesda isn't really brave enough to run with the sequence or the potential that they've just created and will give your stuff right back to you before you even have to fight anything. That leaves the party sequence, and boy is it kind of sad. I guess if you've never actually been to a party, you might accept that this is how they are. Seriously, this is the best the second biggest power on Tamriel can do for us. It sucks so much that barely anybody's here. There's just a random list of people who may or may not show up. But the end result is that usually it's like four people. Hell, the embassy is actually just a copy of Solitude Architecture, so rather than taking the opportunity to show us how the High Elves prefer to build structures, we just get reused room assets from the Nords. 
The one party guest consistent between all playthroughs is Razalin. Since Malborn says we need a distraction to slip out, Raz ends up serving as a root of last resort. The problem really isn't that the root of last resort exists, by nature it has to. Without a single final possible route, some saves would get soft locked at the party. The real problem is that Razalin's distraction is the same as all the others. You do him a favor and then he causes a scene. Every other potential guest is functionally identical mechanically, assuming you have a positive relationship with them. There is some small amount of effort on display here with a little bit of repeated dialogue in each encounter. Bogriff, who only appears after the battle for Whiterun, frames Razalin as being a Stormcloak supporter. Elisif, who appears if you do her favor, will accuse Razalin of indecency. Eriker, our Thieves Guild contact in Solitude, causes a scene with one of the servant girls. One of the ways in which can potentially end up with her being sent to the torture room in the basement. General Tullius can be here if we've delivered the message to Whiterun and there currently isn't an active civil war battle. Eidgrod Ravencrone, Jarl of Morthal, will be at the party if Hjalmarch is Imperial controlled and you aren't doing her Thane quest, so you'll usually see her at this party. If you've done the main side quest in Morthal, then Idgrod will pretend to have visions of Razalin with snakes behind his eyes. Igmund, Jarl of Markarth, actually has the same dialogue as Bogriff, accusing Razalin of being a Stormcloak. Kind of weird, but okay. Maven Blackbriar will accuse Razalin of an indecent proposal. Andalamar, a Thalmar Justicier from Markarth, will accuse Razalin of disrespecting the Thalmor. This one's interesting. To actually see it, you have to complete Andalamar's quest, which is an investigation into illegal Talos worship. So it's actually interesting that in turn you can leverage that into earning a favor that generally ends poorly for the Thalmor involved. That's actually probably the only reason they didn't cut it, since I doubt Bethesda wants to have a single random side quest where you report some guy to the state police. This particular side quest has a lot of potential. Andalamar's not essential, meaning that if you decide to spare Augmund, the Talos worshipper, you can either choose to not complete the quest, kill Andalamar, or bring the city under Stormcloak control. Orthus and Dario is the East Empire Company representative in Windhelm, a character with a side quest I'd never heard of. Orthus actually knows Razalin from work and can accuse him of insulting the ambassador, although again this results in the same basic dialogue. Four lines unique to the characters, four lines reused for every scenario. Preventus Avenici can show up, but he doesn't do anything, as per usual for him. Sidgir, Jarl of Falkreath, has the same exact dialogue as Igmund and Balgriff, which Skyrim has this issue with the Jarls where they all feel like copy-paste of each other because they literally share the same exact dialogue when you become Thane, to the point of at least two-thirds of them saying congratulations. Vittoria Vici can also show up, although her favor is the spiced wine quest that I doubt too many people have done considering that whole wedding thing. Anyways, now that I've explained how every single character in this scene exposes Razalin as a degenerate, we need a good point of comparison. The first should be Lady Boyle's last party from Dishonored. Superficially, we can say that this is an excellent party. It's actually a display of wealth, contrasting with the apocalypse going on outside. It takes place in a spacious area and has many different party guests, hosts, servants, and guards. Now, obviously, the objectives are different. In Skyrim, we're trying to cause a scene to sneak out of the party, while in Dishonored, we're trying to identify which of the three costume boiled sisters is our target and eliminate them. Dishonored's trick is to lean into its mechanics for this. If you decide to sneak upstairs, then many of your innate powers can be utilized for exactly this purpose in a multitude of ways. The Dragonborn doesn't really have that option because most of our acquired abilities are just for combat. Even then, the playground is so small that even with Dishonored's power set, I would probably have a hard time doing this mission. Another good one to discuss would be the mission to infiltrate the Detroit police station in Deus Ex Human Revolution. Some of your options involve dialogue, talking your way into the morgue, while the player also has plenty of other ways to sneak into the building, utilizing a variety of potential augments. Again, this is mostly just the game relying on mechanics that aren't just overt combat mechanics. We do know that Skyrim has some shouts for non-combat applications, like throw a voice. However, if you're the person who went straight from Helgen down every main quest to this point, then we can only assume you know Unrelenting Force and Whirlwind Sprint. Those could make a scene, however the goal isn't for us to be the center of it. So, we can conclude, either we need a foundational level rework, major changes to the shout system to add more non-combat mechanics, or changes to the dialogue system to provide more depth. Yeah, I'm not liking my odds here. So in Oblivion, when we were trying to retrieve the amulet, we got put through initiation for the Mythic Dawn, which involved us sacrificing this poor little lizard. Hey, it's a choice. If we're the ultimate badass hero, let's fight for his right to live. If we aren't confident in taking on a whole room of Mythic Dawn without our equipment, we can perform the sacrifice to further infiltrate the cult. And that was Oblivion. I think the problem starts with the assumption that this is literally the only way to infiltrate the embassy. Delphine may potentially be speaking to a Dragonborn who is already a master infiltrator for the Thieves Guild, or who has successfully managed to assassinate the Emperor. You can tell the differences in design philosophy. 
In Morrowind and even Oblivion's main quest to some extent, you'd do a variety of missions that involve combat and stealth. However, it was not balanced around the assumption that players had only done the main quest up to that point. If you were a stealth character, then the stealth missions were the opportunity to let your skill set shine. If you were a combat character, then the combat missions were your opportunity to do better than the other playstyles. Even magic had moments to hold an advantage. Rather than the main quest being for all playstyles, it's for every playstyle. The difference is that rather than having a stealth mission to infiltrate the embassy that stealth players would excel at, we instead get a heavily scripted sequence on the off chance that some players might get excluded. The sad part is that it later turns into a stealth sequence. I mean, you can just slaughter your way through the embassy, proving Delphine wrong in the process. So that's your plan, huh? Even if you could survive, by the time you got inside, whatever documents they had would be long gone. We're there for information, remember? Trust me, I've been doing this for a long time. My way is better. Well, I survived and the documents are still here. I guess if they had just one more minute, they might have destroyed the documents, but that's still just sad no matter how you look at it. If there are no consequences for just cutting a swath through the Thalmor, then the party sequence is pointless. Imagine for a moment that the party was just one way of getting inside the embassy. You simply present your invitation at the gate and are let in. I think Bethesda didn't do that because they were worried that if players gave their gear to Malborn, that they would potentially be unable to reach the embassy due to getting killed, hence why we're instead given a cart ride straight into the inside of the compound from the city. My big idea is a ledge. It's obviously not close enough for anyone to jump inside, but hey, maybe if we had some kind of dragon shout that propels you forward through the air. The exterior guards have to rotate shifts at some point so stealthy infiltrators could slip in through the gate, and actually have consequences for failure. This might not work very well if it's just player detected, documents destroyed, but maybe have like a strike system. I mean, the Thalmor aren't going to burn all their dossiers just because some snowman chucked a rock at the wall. I'm sure the Thalmor embassy gets attacked every week by some overzealous Nord. Once we're out of the party, Malborn guides us through the kitchen and returns our equipment. There is some interesting stuff here if you decide to stealth it. Good luck. You see those robes You're on your own this now. morning? Who are they with? More of the Emissary's treaty enforcers? No, they're high mages, just in from Alinor. I guess herself is finally getting worried about all the dragon attacks. Ah, good. I've been wondering how we were supposed to defend this place from a dragon. If a dragon does show up, Maybe we'll get lucky, and it will eat the mages first. Might give us enough time to kill it. Ha! I'd like to see those arrogant bastards taken down a notch. Always looking down their noses at us lowly foot sloggers. <laughs> this is one of my favorite background dialogues in Skyrim. It's actually refreshing to have a moment of humanization for the Altmer. It's obviously a mixed bag since we haven't gotten to the torture room yet, but it's nice to know that the Thalmor aren't all hyper-evil caricatures. That said, I don't think there are any High Elves in Skyrim who politically support the Thalmor that aren't wearing their war gear. I can easily imagine Imperial soldiers or Stormcloaks having this exact same conversation about the rival of their own battle mages. I believe this is supposed to hint to the player that a nearby set of Thalmor robes could be used to fool the guards. However, due to a bug, the base robes won't work and only the hooded robes, which either have to be looted off a wizard or smuggled in. Now, that actually makes sense. After all, compare the hooded version versus unhooded robes, and tell me which ones you think would be more effective for masking the fact that we aren't an Altmer. I think the unofficial patch actually makes the wrong correction here. Rather than making it so all robes work in addition to elven armor, which feels like a stretch to me, it would be much simpler to simply replace the free unhooded robes with the hooded version because, you know, it's a better disguise. The bug actually exposed a way to make the sequence better. Another thing is that this is one of those few instances where racial choice can be important. If the player is an Altmer or Bosmer, then guards won't question you, although they will comment that Bosmer players are pretty short. If you're a beast race, then guards will immediately call you out due to your tail. And if you are any of the other races, you have to keep your distance from the guards. There's actually some thought put into the sequence, only for most players to miss it because of a bug. And it's like, very simple to fix. Okay. Okay. There's a lot of resources on the internet to fix shit like this. Why aren't these people looking into it? You would think that somebody at Bethesda would be upset that their little stealth sequence that they worked on doesn't work and would have done the most basic thing of correcting this issue by switching out which set of robes spawn. Seriously, it's one thing for there to still be physics glitches in the game. I'm sure those issues are not easy to fix. It's another when quests are broken in such a way that content is missing. It's like with Mamolnir's lines. Someone took the time to write those, and someone else took the time to record them, and someone had to implement them. But all that work is wasted. 
You can overhear a conversation between a justiciar and a man named Gisser, who reveals that he is an informant who has sold out another man. Unfortunately, this is where this character originates from. What I mean is that Gisser is not an existing character in the world. When the Sixth House began controlling the sleepers, this manifested in commoners you would often pass in the streets suddenly being hostile towards you. But they won't utilize Gisser as a homeless man in Riften that you could potentially meet before this point. We grab some dossiers that I'll discuss later and head into the torture room where the man Gisser sold out is currently being tortured for information. We can either free him or steal a dossier with the relevant information. At this point, Malborn is supposed to be brought out, revealing that the Thalmor are aware of our presence. However, on one playthrough, this didn't trigger correctly. I always wonder how many people who review Skyrim experience various bugs, as Joseph Anderson calls it, Bethesda's bug, and it's fascinating. Rather than the stories playing out differently because of choices that the player makes, stories play out differently because entire sequences have the potential to just not play correctly. If this was my first time playing Skyrim, I might not even be aware that Malborn will attack the guards to buy time for our escape, or that we have the option to try and save him. There's even an extra quest if you help him out later on. I'll miss because there's a chance the quest will break. We make our escape, and now let's review the four documents we got our hands on. The Dragon Investigation document reveals that, well, the Thalmor are investigating the dragons. They've been interrogating people, a practice Elowen even participates in, but so far have nothing to report. In other words, fuck you, Delphine. Speaking of, we have her dossier. The Thalmor refer to the Great War as the First War, which... okay. The dossier reveals that the Blades have been carrying out operations inside the Altmeri Dominion, in which Delphine was a primary participant. She'll say that the Grandmaster of the Blades saw the Thalmor as the biggest threat to Tamriel, but that still implies that the Altmeri Dominion was actually justified in going to war with the Empire. I know that is a controversial statement because they're, you know, evil, but there wasn't really supporting lore prior to Skyrim that Bethesda had to comply with that the Almeri Dominion had to be ethno-nationalists aiming to exterminate mankind. They came up with literally all of this for this game. They could have taken this story in any direction they wanted to. Skipping 200 years is a pretty good way to liberate yourself of prior lore. How interesting would it be if the Almeri Dominion was actually a shade of grey, that the Blades may have actually been in the wrong? But they aren't, because they're evil, and every story involving them reinforces that fact. The dossier doesn't really elaborate on what exactly Delphine has done, and reads more like hype material for a wrestling match. Oh, she took out an entire assassination team, alone. She works alone, which means we can't find her. You need overwhelming force to stop her. She might actually be a wizard. Hey, have you tried fireballs? It's a shame because this is a great opportunity to really fill in the blanks on Delphine's character, especially stuff she might not have an interest in telling us. The next dossier to mention is Esburns. He's actually our next lead, and I've mentioned him before. He was the Blade's lore master, handled various intelligence operations, and it actually tells us that he was behind an incident, as well as a prison break inside the Aldmeri Dominion's borders. Esburns also stated to be an expert on dragon lore, and that the Blades had advanced expertise on dragons due to their Akaviri origin, and that Cloud Ruler Temple was destroyed by the Thalmor. Wait, you're telling me the forces of Mehrun's Dagon weren't able to assault the temple, but that the Thalmor successfully pulled it off? Yeah, chalk up another point of evidence for the Mehrun Stagon theory. Anyways, the document ends by stating that Esburn is in Riften, so we kind of need to hurry if we're going to save him. And of course, there's the final dossier about Ulfric Stormcloak, which I discussed during the Civil War. The only notable detail here is that the Thalmor say that they didn't have to interrupt his execution due to Alduin's coincidental arrival. Also, you can't show Ulfric's dossier to Delphine, who seems like she would absolutely be able to validate this information, and... Wouldn't really appreciate hanging out with, uh, Thalmor plants. She's crazy and doesn't like the fact that the Thalmor are actually behind the dragons returning. She suggests we get to Riften. If you're part of the Thieves Guild, she'll point to the Ragged Flagon, otherwise she points to Brynjolf and also gives us a passphrase for dealing with Esbern. Now, this is the first of three instances where the main quest will put you in a position of joining one of the side factions. If you're a Lemming who only follows the quest markers, then you're forced to meet with Brynjolf and have to go through his scheme that if you can't pass a hard persuasion check, requiring speech level 75 or 53 with the perk. I really hate Brynjolf's line for failing this check. Like, listen to how stupid this is. Besides, you look like your pockets are a little light on coin. Am I right? Let me find him first. Dragons are bad for business. Passing on a golden opportunity is worse. The only response to someone saying that is, what, are you stupid? However, this isn't as lock and stock an option as it seems. Who's the first person you talk to in an area where you need information? That's right, the local tavern keeper. Now, another YouTuber by the handle of Nocturnal Rambler mentioned this, arguing that because the quest marker points at Brynjolf, that players are discouraged from investigating and thus forced to join the Thieves Guild, even if that is outside of their moral alignment. 
My issue with this is that Elder Scrolls main quests have never been for the lawful good. In Morrowind, we bought a slave to earn the allegiance of an Ashlander tribe, and in Oblivion, we did the bidding of Daedra to acquire their artifact for a ritual. I've always read Elder Scrolls protagonists as being the type to believe in the ends justifying the means. Generally heroic, but prepared to commit moral evils for the greater good. Even then, however, Skyrim still gives you an out. Even if the white marker makes it impossible for you to think of asking around, you can just fail Brynjolf's scheme, keeping Bran Shea out of jail. Yeah, you'll have a bounty after, and Brynjolf will be upset, but the quest continues. Also, during the Thalmor torture session, he'll verbally say that Esbern's in the Ratway. The Ratway is an obvious feature of Riften, which can be found with casual inspection of the city. Trust me, I've been to Riften, it's not that big. And there are other conversations with more options, like the ones Nocturnal Rambler proposes. Fekel the Man can be bribed, while Dirge can be bribed or brawled with. You'll end up finding Esbern at the very bottom of the Ratway, locked behind a thick door which you'll open for an easy speech check. I did mention this earlier, but I want to reiterate, it is kind of weird that a man who's been living in a sewer for, I would assume, quite a while, is somehow better adjusted than Delphine. Delphine had two different tests to earn her trust, but Esbern? He just takes our word for it that we're the Dragonborn. Let me doctor this slightly. If we fail every attempt to earn Esbern's trust, then we use the passphrase as a last resort. But shock and horror, it actually fails as well. Then the Thalmor show up, we kill them, and Esbern, who watched the fight through the door, decides to trust us. Could be a Thalmor trap, sure, but at this point he knows his cover's blown. After all, if we really were a Thalmor agent, all we would have to do is just wait outside his door for a week or two until he starved to death, and maybe occasionally blast it with a fireball. I mean, I assume things like food are constraints for mortals like Esbern. I was blasting his place with firebolts when he said, I, I know, I know, hurry in the saddest old man voice possible. This is one of the few times I ever felt bad about doing something in Skyrim. This is the voice of the late Max von Sydow in one of his only video game appearances. Unfortunately, I cannot say it was his only game appearance, which would actually be kind of cool, because he played an exceptionally minor character in The Force Awakens, meaning that he was in LEGO Star Wars. And far worse has happened to you. Thanks, Disney. Anyways, while he puts on a great performance, it is fucking wasted on this character. Esbert is seriously pathetic. Let's consider his peers. Caius Casades hid from the secret police by pretending to be a skooma addict, and he was so dedicated to the part that he even got addicted. Meanwhile, Joffrey pretended to be a monk at a priory and was so dedicated to his part that he actually worshipped the divines. Esbert's idea of hiding is literal. It entirely relied on nobody noticing that at the bottom of the ratway was a man needing constant food deliveries. Unfortunately, obscurity itself doesn't work forever, and the story literally draws attention to the fact that his cover sucked. The big clue that was given away was that Esbern is old and lived in Riften. I'm sorry, but getting away could not be easier. Pretend to be a fisherman and spend your days angling. You get to live in a secluded location and don't have to involve anybody else in your sustenance. Can you imagine how many old fishermen there are in Skyrim? Okay, here's the inherent difficulty. Esbern has to be obscure, but not so obscure that it would be literally impossible for us to find him. One way to present Esbern as intelligent, but also possible to find, would be to have Delphine know where he's located. I don't think this is a particularly good change, because it removes the attempt at creating a sense of tension by removing the time component of rescuing Esbern. Perhaps then you create a reason for Delphine knowing Esbern's location, but electing not to make contact. I mean... There is already a reason. Delphine refuses to make contact with old blades out of self-preservation. Her paranoia is paid off and even the Thalmor acknowledge this. Perhaps Delphine keeps tabs on old blades members, but refuses to contact Esbern until absolutely necessary, when no other options are available. There is no story need for Esbern and Delphine to have a positive relationship, so here's my change. While we're raiding the embassy for information, Delphine's inn is actually also raided for information. She was compromised when she made contact with us because the Thalmor have been tracking our movements. She reveals that we need to find and warn Esbern because there were enough clues needed to piece together his location. I don't think this worsens Delphine's character because her only mistake was in contacting us. But it does mean that Esbern could only be found by one of his subordinates and not, you know, some homeless guy in Riften. I guess that doesn't include a soft introduction for the Thieves' Guild, but who cares? Plus, we get to see part of Riverwood get attacked, meaning that there are actual stakes, and it's still less evil than on Kano. So Esbern and Delphine are reunited. Just as a reminder, Delphine is in her 50s, and Esbern is in his 70s, which I think is important to remember when you mod Delphine to look like a sex doll. She's my father's age, and my father was many things, including a soldier. Soldiering's hard work, particularly in the knees. I doubt my father would be very effective against a dragon. I'm just saying, Esbern looks like he should be in his 80s, while Delphine is a, most a day from her 40th birthday. 
Paranoid people tend to age faster due to the stress of constantly worrying about the traffic cones that keep stalking them. Esbern's got that look nailed. You're telling me she isn't a wizard, but she clearly knows some illusion magic. Something I love about this reunion, beyond the awkward blocking, is that Delphine suggested we get Esbern to put us back on the right track to fight the dragons, and it is all, what does Alduin's Wall have to do with dragons? I don't know, is there a book on your table that discusses the relationship between the Akaviri and dragons? Something else I like is that Esbern loosely describes the location of Skyhaven Temple, and Delphine immediately intuits where it must be. It's not really a well-hidden location suited for establishing a base of operations if you can guess its location with a single clue, that it's in the Reach. That's only a massive section of land with many currently existing military camps. If you take Delphine's advice to take the cart to Markarth and approach it from the west, then you can see the temple from the ground. I thought that was artistic liberties because otherwise I would imagine scholars from all over Tamriel would have chartered expeditions to that area if it was actually just supposed to be something everybody who travels the road's familiar with. This is also going to be the only time the main quest ever involves the Forsworn. Actually, now that I think about it, this is pretty much the only time in any of the quest lines that the Forsworn are directly involved, and they're just cannon fodder on the way to our true objective. It's actually kind of funny how few quests would be affected by just deleting the Forsworn from the game files. How long would it take the average Skyrim player to even notice? So inside of this dungeon is another dungeon, which the Forsworn have just actively decided not to live in. It's not haunted. Even if it were, I doubt that would deter the magically inclined Forsworn. They just actively and conveniently decided that this open living space was not worth expanding into, or to try climbing up and moving into the ruins proper. Nope. They got stopped by this intense Akaviri puzzle, which is coincidentally the same as most Nordic picture block puzzles already in this game. Seriously, this is what stopped the advance of the Forsworn. Esbern tries to dress it up because the solution is that one of the symbols means Dragonborn and you need to hit three Dragonborns, which is the equivalent of setting a rotary lock code to 000, except at least most rotary locks have 10 possible options for each digit in the code. There are only 27 possible answers to this puzzle. The only other thing here is the pressure plate maze, which you guessed it. You have to follow the dragonborn symbols. I'm pretty sure a crow could figure out through trial and error how to solve this one. Let's complain about puzzles for a second. I don't really have anything to say that they didn't already say in the Oblivion video, so to reiterate, Bethesda needs somebody on their team with a background in puzzle games. Puzzles should be used in stuff like the College of Winterhold and Thieves Guild. And the games also need more mechanics that you can build puzzles off of. I would also incorporate puzzles in the broader dungeon designs, but communicate that doing puzzles is an optional side activity with additional rewards. The reason Skyrim puzzles are so bad is because the player is forced to do them, but Bethesda doesn't want to create a puzzle so complex that players get trapped. So the vast majority are just these spinning block puzzles of match the animals that we all graduated out of around the age of six. It's the worst of both worlds because the puzzles are still a speed bump for gamers who don't want that experience, but completely worthless for anybody who does. It's a curious thing. I don't really know what the designers played the week they decided they needed puzzles in a lot of their dungeons. Oblivion had the odd puzzle here and there that was simple, but it was spiced to endless fort ruins, caves, and alien dungeons. But I'm guessing they just came up with the spinning block puzzle and for a few weeks level designers were putting them in all the dungeons without any real regard for how they would appear in the complete picture. Remember, when a level is designed in this kind of game, it's usually done in a sterile environment without the rest of Skyrim. Bethesda themselves might have backed up from the finished mural to realize how ridiculous it is, given that Dawnguard and Dragonborn both eased off the idea. Even more ridiculous is how there's a chest at the end of this quote-unquote dungeon complete with loot. I love this, it's the most cynical of design decisions. There are a lot of ridiculous boss chests in Skyrim, but this takes the cake, because at least in a Nordic or Dwemer ruin it makes some sense for there to be loot to acquire. Sometimes you might run into an issue of a leveled list putting a book in an area that was visited in a year prior to that book's publication. First, you have the simple element that the designers assumed the players would reach this point, not see a loot chest, and their dopamine centers would immediately enter withdrawal. Then you have the element of wondering how this chest is even still here. See aforementioned problems with assuming that nobody can reach this point. Then you have to wonder who put this chest here, why, and why they decided to store these particular items in this location. Skyrim tends to gamify loot quite a bit. There's definitely an element of the game standardizing its formula to say that at the end of a dungeon, there is a big chest with big loot inside it. It's actually not that different from how Oblivion handled boss chests, although dungeons becoming hyperlinear corridors means it's much easier to tell that after the phase of the dungeon where you fight the boss, there has to be a phase of the dungeon with a big chest full of big loot. Part of the unmemorable nature of Skyrim dungeons is owed to their radiance. Morrowind incorporated leveled lists as a solution to the main problem of level designers often and loudly complained about. Random clutter. Rather than populating every single crate in Morrowind with preset loot, most of them instead pull from a list of items that randomly determines what's inside. 
However, the actual rewards from dungeons were still handcrafted, because that's the fun part. As an example, I'm going to read a quote from the UESP that describes the loot found in the dungeon Kogarun, which is explored at around the same stage in Morrowind's main quest that we're currently at. The halls hold relics of House Dagoth as well as fallen adventurers, one of whom carries the unique Claymore Fury and an incomplete set of glass armor. There is also a glass halberd beside the table near the dead adventurer. A dead Khajiit in a nearby cell is carrying an ebony short sword. Other notable items are a sixth house bell hammer in the Temple of Fae, an ebony spear sticking from a desk in the Hall of the Watchful Touch, and a dwarven mace lying in a crate in the Nibith waterway. Finally, in the Bleeding Heart section, you can find a pair of Daedric Gauntlets, an Orcish Warhammer, and the Shadow Shield. All of those items I just listed were deliberately placed in the game world by a level designer, and that's just one dungeon. A main quest dungeon, perhaps, but the fact is that in Morrowind, items were placed in the world with deliberate intention. You didn't find those items in a chest sitting behind Dagoth Uthul. You found them placed throughout the world like they actually existed for a purpose. Equipment on dead adventurers, a hammer next to a set of bells, equipment spread out like it's actually being used instead of just sitting around waiting for an adventurer to pick it up. My favorite instance is the only Daedric Spear in the game, which can be found skewered through a skeleton hanging over a fireplace in a Dunmer stronghold that's been overrun with Daedra. If this was Skyrim, then Daedric Spears would just start showing up in boss chests at level 42. The reason that Oblivion switched to its level scaled loot solution had to do with the change over to level scaling. You don't want enemies finding in-game loot in a dungeon they complete at level 6, right? Even though out of the list from earlier, there isn't really a complete collection of items for any one character. Having Daedric Gauntlets is good, if you happen to find them, but you still had many other gear slots that would need filling. It was an adequate reward for doing something adequately dangerous. However, because Skyrim characters are assumed to be comprehensive, that means there needs to be a start point and end point of the progression system. Start with Iron, end with Daedric. Add tiers along the way to provide incremental upgrades. Even when you find something unique, it often isn't. Red Eagle's Fury is still just a Draugr sword that does 5 points of fire damage. Compare that with Fury. This is still just a silver claymore, except when you wield it, it'll blind you 20%, drain your armor skills by 20 points, but fortify your attack rating by 20. That enchantment is literally the description of the concept of fury turned into a weapon enchant and placed into the hands of a dead adventurer. You're telling me that Skyrim innovated in environmental storytelling when an entire character's story is told by just the numbers on an item. So, not only is there an inherent lack of personality to Skyrim's leveled loot system, but it is also placed in such a way as to be insulting. No good deed done for free. It only worked for a multitude of near worthless items that ended up sitting in a cupboard and occasionally liquidated for no reason other than I wanted the gold number to be 6 digits instead of 5. I have to be rewarded for cave time. I have to loot all the urns for minor amounts of currency. Please, don't stop the dopamine drip. So we've arrived at Skyhaven Temple, which has yet to be breached due to a blood sigil requiring a healthy donation of Dragonborn blood. Whoa, why are you cutting your hand like that? Okay, so I just wounded my left hand through the gauntlet, not gonna be able to wield a shield for a couple days. Seriously, cut an open section of skin, or anything other than your fighting hand. Apparently the Akaviri are into blood magic now, or at least Esburn pulls as much out of his ass. The only basis for this is the Duskfan and Donfang sword from the Shivering Isles, which was called a blood drinking sword. You would think that if it was a type of magic that could identify blood types in the setting that this would appear much more frequently. Sounds like a fast way to ensure people aren't raiding the family tomb if you have a ward up that literally prevents anyone not of your race from entering. You might say Nords are anti-magic, and it's true, but they weren't always that way. During the days when most ancient Nordic crypts were built, the clever men were still around. What about the Dwemer? Why bother with the automatons and puzzles? Just put up a blood test. Good luck getting past that one when they're all gone. Actually, spoilers for later, but they did for one very specific thing, and it's even part of the main quest, so I guess magic blood tests are just part of the setting now. We head into the temple. Esbern's remarking on all the stone carvings while Delphine's going around lighting on the braziers. It's a good attention to detail that Delphine lights the room with her torch. I just wish they would show the same attention to detail in the rest of the dungeons. This is where Esbern reads off and explains Alduin's wall. Everything is couched in allegory and mythic symbolism. Yeah, okay, nice way to wave off questions. Esbern says the first panel goes back to the beginning of time, but then says that the dragons and the dragon cult were around for that, so I'm not sure if he's saying that he thinks that or that the Akaviri who carved this wall think the men were always here, but they weren't. And that's a plot point in Skyrim of how men were immigrants from Atmora. You hear that, Iskrimor and the Falmer? No point in the Night of Tears because men always lived here. Alduin's wall was a part of the game's marketing. It was one of the two framing devices of the official trailer that Esbern narrated over. So if you got excited about getting to see the full wall at your leisure and learning about all the details that were on it, prepare to be disappointed. So the left 60% of the wall is a historical recounting of basically the Dragon War. Not sure where Esbern got the idea that it represented the beginning of time. 
My first issue is that the dragons are already burning things at this point, meaning that this is likely an extremely biased perspective of the story. It makes sense on account of the fact that the Dragon War took place in the late Merithic era while the Akaviri invasion of Tamriel happened in the first era in the year 2703. However, there's a lore book in Skyrim dating the construction of the wall between the years 2812 and 2816, so because it sounds better, we'll call it even at three millennia having passed between the events on this wall and the wall's construction. To give you perspective, 3,000 years ago in our own world was a time period where most humans on Earth were still living as hunter-gatherers, and civilization was located pretty much exclusively around big rivers. This was the era of Solomon, who was the son of David, which if you can't guess were Hebrew kings written about in the Bible. Now trying to aggregate knowledge and understanding about people from a time period so long ago is extremely difficult. I mean to the point that there had been 3,000 years of things that happened in Skyrim, including an Akaviri invasion that destroyed a bunch of stuff. But then the Dragon Guard, which is what they were called at the time, decided to take their premier expert in dragon lore and commit their knowledge to stone. But rather than simply carving out an efficient explanation of their understanding of the history, complete with ciphers just in case, they decided to, what were the words? Coach it in allegory and mythic symbolism? Basically, they created a near-useless sculpture of an anachronistic understanding of events that Esbern can somehow intuit useful information from because the plot demands it. Funny thing is, remember that lore book I mentioned? It's from the specific era of this carving. It's literally a log of the events of Skyhaven Temple written in the first person of an individual recording the events of the construction of Alduin's Wall. They could have written the history in the margins and it would have been immensely more useful. Esbern reveals that the ancient dragonborn used to shout to defeat Alduin, which upsets Delphine because it means that they have to involve the Greybeards in our mission. Fortunately for her, that won't be for a minute as we have a Blades to rebuild. There's a pretty big reason why we're going to do this now, with the return of the dragons looming over us, rather than later. The place to start is to bring any follower to Delphine to induct into the Order. They'll even take an oath of loyalty. It's pretty cool, and it's one of the few advantages Skyrim's hireling system has over Fallout's dedicated followers. See, in the Fallout games, there is a limited roster of followers, but each one will be a fully-fledged character. At least, that's the idea, not necessarily commenting on the execution. Skyrim, however, casts a much wider net, with a wide variety of characters to be recruited, albeit at the cost of individual quality. We are approaching it in a, in a different way. I would not expect the deep personalities and uniqueness with a low number of companions. We are aiming for a much, much higher number of companions that you could hire, or they become your friends and they come with you. It's something we're messing with, um, and we'll probably talk about more later, but the general direction is to make it a bit more dynamic and have more people that you could decide to bring with you. In that, we sacrifice, we sacrifice them having a lot of depth or personalities or individual stories. We were playing the game a few months back where anybody could become your companion. Oh, yeah? Um, and I don't think we're going to do that right. after playing it. Um, there are some neat things about this system. For instance, every character in the game has a morality level, which affects their behavior in relation to crime. So, for instance... Findell in Riverwood refuses to commit crimes. I cannot order him to steal a book in Arcadia's shop in Whiterun for me. Sven, his rival, is willing to steal that skill book, but will not assault or murder anyone for me. Miol the Lioness has no such qualms, despite her personal crusade against the Thieves' Guild. She can be ordered to commit whatever crimes we tell her to. Okay, maybe the system breaks down a little in detail. Most followers either won't commit any crimes or will commit any crime, and Sven is actually the exception as he's the only follower with the flag distinguishing his individual morality. Sometimes the NPCs will have the correct morality for their character, unless the implication is that Mule is actually okay with crime and is just putting up appearances of being against it. Another thing is aggressiveness. Some followers are actually more or less aggressive than others, affecting whether or not they will initiate combat with hostiles. Followers also have different levels of confidence, meaning that cowards like Benor are more likely to run from fights. The biggest difference comes down to NPC skill levels, affecting what equipment or magic they'll use. It's not perfect. For instance, the reason I favor Jizargo as a companion wasn't just to fully recreate the Baron Zaya experience. Jizargo actually has no upper level cap, meaning that while most followers fall off around level 30, Jizargo will keep advancing with the player. That said, most of this information is not expressly told to the player in a spreadsheet of stats, meaning that without a guide, you just have to experiment and eventually notice that some companions are better or more compatible with your playstyle than others. It's one of those systems designed to be subtle, but it's so subtle it practically doesn't exist. This is how you end up with the majority of Skyrim reviews using the same companion. 
The problem with Skyrim followers is again, a lack of character. It almost would work better as a party system, where you could keep inviting new members to the party, but maybe the game would increase the difficulty or number of spawns per AI companion you bring into the squad. My favorite aspect of Jizargo was equipping him with gear. At times, it really did feel like he was getting more upgrades than I was. Having a crew of followers would mean that one character getting a gear upgrade could mean that everyone down the line also would get a gear upgrade. It could also make support magic much more useful. It seems like the logical advantage of having a quantity of companions over quality, but I doubt they will go that route in Elder Scrolls 6 simply due to complaints about how bland the companions in Skyrim are. Sometimes quantity over quality can be a good thing. It's just that if you keep it the same where you can only have one follower, like in Fallout, it makes it too easy to make the comparison. Serana and Dawnguard was definitely a response to issues players had with the default companions in Skyrim. We'll have plenty to say about her in the Dawnguard section. I'm gonna find you and put a bullet in that inflated fucking head of yours! So we need some followers to sacrifice to the Blades, and Jizargo is way too good for such a faction. Since the Blades use heavy armor, one-handed swords, and bows, it's best to pick followers that use that exact skill set. Goldir is a Nord hanging outside his family crypt, which has been defiled by a necromancer. His aunt is already in the ruin trying to deal with the problem, however one weird thing to note is that apparently his family and the necromancer never saw eye to eye on things. I mean, that's literally true, sure, but what exactly were your interactions with him prior to him taking your dead relatives as servants? Were you neighbors and upset that he didn't mow his lawn more frequently? Why introduce the idea that Goldir's family actually knows this guy? He's gone in to defile our family tomb by using our ancestors for his filthy dark elf necromancy. But you have a higher purpose in life, so I'll let it slide. It's funny that Goldir will actually comment about you looting. Hey! Those belong to my family! Also, Val's Varen during our fight with him teleports around the room. He's actually not the only boss in Skyrim to do this, which I completely forgot about. So the enemies can still teleport, and even some select friends, but not the player. I mean, at least they gave a cannon lampshade for levitation, no matter how stupid it is. So after we've done Goldir this favor and given him time to put his aunt to rest, we can recruit him and take him to Delphine to induct him into the Blades. Okay, that's alright. A short little side quest with some fun world details you don't typically see, like acknowledging that the bodies and belongings inside the crypts actually belong to people and aren't just free for the taking, at least morally. Alright, let's take a step down. Our next victim is Uthgird the Unbroken, a woman spending her days at the Bannered Mare picking fist fights. You've been talking to those companions? Too hot-headed, they cried. Weak, pathetic cowards, the lot of them. It wasn't my fault. I told them over and over that it was an accident. They wanted me to prove my worth. So they threw me up against a young whelp of a lad, hardly old enough to grow his first chin hair. Shut the fuck up. tougher than you look. I guess I thought a woman wasn't strong enough to hurt him. I didn't mean for him to die. Why would I want that? I just... I just lost control. I don't know. Sounds like you'd fit right in with the circle. Sorry, but I have immense doubt the same companions Ayala is a ranking member in couldn't handle the sight of a strong Nord woman and decided to pit her against some random. Anyways, you can put 100 drakes down in a brawl with her, and if you win, you can recruit her as a follower. It's funny the extent she trusts you as well, because afterwards her house becomes free access for us. Also funny is how she gets inducted into another militant order because she lost a wager. This strips the specialness back just a little. I mean, Gold Deer we could at least say was a friend. One more step down to go. Vorstag is a mercenary from Markarth that can be hired for 500 gold. As a character, he has pretty much nothing going on, making a single interesting observation tied to his skill set about a character in a quest in the city. When it comes to generic Skyrim followers, Vorstag fits the bill. He's a product of quantity. Well, because we dropped 500 Gs on him, he's willing to swear his life to the cause of the Blades. I like this selection because not only does each companion have a skill set good for the Blades, unless you play with the unofficial patch, but they also expose a pretty big flaw in how Skyrim handles disposition. None of these characters should have joined the Blades. Something I omitted from the Goldir story is that he's kind of a coward, but we can still make a man out of him yet. Uthgird? Well, her resume isn't promising, having already been fired from one of my other companies for reasons that absolutely pertain to her prospective position as a Blade. 
She also trusts too easily, which could be a liability when dealing with the Thalmor. Elder Scrolls traditionally handle disposition by assigning almost every NPC in the game a numerical value between 0 and 100 that represented how well that NPC trusted or liked you. A big thing is that the game generally told you what that number was, and Morrowind it would even tell you in the same panel as where all the dialogue was happening, so if you did something to improve or hurt their disposition, you would see the effect immediately. The system wasn't perfect, Morrowind didn't have a morality flag, so for instance you could be talking to a knight whose honor cannot be bought, and slip him 100 gold for a boost. However, and think about this honestly, how many people do you know that wouldn't do someone a minor favor for a Benjamin, or even a Jackson? No, the issue isn't bribery. In fact, bribery was great because it gave people a route of last resort at a mechanical cost. If you didn't have the skills like speechcraft or illusion to affect disposition, then you had to spend money. Imagine if Razalin demanded 500 gold as compensation for causing a scene. I'm sure the only reason Bethesda still doesn't do this is simply the idea crossing their mind that someone, somewhere, somehow, would not have 500 gold at this point in the questline. Oblivion would improve the system in theory by adding infamy. Reputation in Morrowind meant that over time you'd see disposition boosts simply by being a hero. Yeah, saving the world actually meant that many merchants were giving you a discount, or that other quests would be easier due to your, well, reputation. The reason the idea isn't given its due is because Morrowind doesn't plant a giant flashing neon sign over this mechanic. Oblivion would divide reputation into fame and infamy. NPCs would like you more the more fame you had, but would dislike you as you accrued infamy. However, immoral NPCs would have more complex feelings and may even like you more for being infamous. It had its flaws, but I think it had potential. And then there's Skyrim. Skyrim shifts the disposition to a spectrum from negative 4 to positive 4, with negative numbers meaning negative relationships, and you can guess what positive numbers mean. You cannot affect dispositions directly with speech. Instead, you either do quests to make the number go up or kill loved ones to make the numbers go down. This means that instead of NPCs having variable feelings about the player, NPCs will usually be somewhere between mildly annoyed and pleasantly surprised to see you again because most NPCs are either a negative one, a zero, or a positive one. Since the system is missing a ton of granularity, it means that Skyrim NPCs tend to be mostly like this. Well, I trust you. Like, to a weird degree, actually. Doing minor favors for people makes them far too trusting. It would be like saying that after I help get your car out of a ditch, that I go over to your house, sleep in your bed, and eat all of your food because I earned that plus one relationship with you. How about instead of minus four to positive four, we have a system that starts at zero and then goes to 100. And then that number would go up or down based on player actions. With followers specifically, maybe the number goes up each time we kill a boss together. And we'll call this system disposition. Because sure, recruiting Vorstag into the blaze after just meeting and hiring his services is pretty stupid, but what about after a few weeks of doing dangerous deeds together? A couple dragons later and Vorstag could be our best friend. The thing is, the system is emergent. My perspective on these companions is different than yours based on our experiences. And there are plenty of stories of heroes entering people's lives and changing their outlooks, to the point that they transform as a character. The problem is not that a cell sword became a sworn sword, but rather that it happened too easily. I think for this quest there should have been a list of companions who would flat out reject being initiated into the blades. Technically there is, but the list is just Serana, a vampire, and members of the Dark Brotherhood. Apparently you can recruit Dragonborn DLC followers into the blades though, meaning they had to go back and revisit this idea, at least in terms of writing the dialogue. It's just weird and I doubt anyone ever casually thought about doing it. There are a multitude of reasons why someone would decline our invitation but would accept the offer to adventure with us. People who have difficulty making long-term commitments, people who are morally or ideologically opposed to the Blades, and people who have already taken oaths for other organizations or purposes to start. I would then have another list of companions requiring a certain disposition level for initiation before they would qualify. They will do it, but they need to trust the player first. With three new recruits among our ranks, we can speak with Esburn, who will give us a task to go to a dragon lair to slay a dragon. While this is a radiant quest and can annoyingly target dragon layers on Solstheim, it's a good radiant quest because our new Blades members will come with us on our dragon hunts. That is, of course, mostly just for the spectacle of being part of an actual dragon hunting order. It's not like there are any dragons in Skyrim in which we desperately needed their help defeating. I also enjoy that they made the act of slaying dragons radiant, because it reinforces my earlier point about how stagnant being expected to fight 50 dragons becomes. 
Esbern also has a quest where we get him a dragon bone and scale, allowing him to research the dragons. Our reward is a potion which, when ingested, gives us a perk causing dragons to do 25% less melee damage. The quest is simple, but man, the prospect of rewarding perks for quests is a missed opportunity, and they awarded it to this nothing quest that it's easily missed. See, when Delphine sent us out to investigate the shout we needed to defeat Alduin, there weren't many opportunities during the quest line to return to Skyhaven Temple. Simply put, engaging with this content requires you to go out of your way, but the blades are going to betray us. Specifically, Delphine and Esbern are going to give us an ultimatum that, unfortunately, is heavily weighted against the blades. So what is that about? Well, let's get into it. Remember that shout we needed to defeat Alduin? Delphine somehow intuits that the shout is able to knock dragons out of the sky and... Wait, what, what's happening? Rather, Joan Allen knew that this was the gameplay-related effect that the Dragon Wind shout would have, and so she had Delphine say, knock a dragon out of the sky, even though Delphine had no way of knowing that. Okay, so let's get this straight. Joan Allen, who is the voice actress for Delphine, a woman whose only video game credit is Skyrim and who would have been 55 years old at the time of recording, had inside knowledge of the specific mechanics surrounding this shout and decided to improvise a line about those mechanics. That is a more likely explanation than simply assuming that either the writers messed up the continuity or that Esbern originally had a line explaining what he thought the shout would do that was cut. Anyways, it's back to High Hrothgar to ask the Greybeards about the shout, but Arngear's angry. Subscribe to my Patreon for more quality jokes. Anyways, he's pissed about the blades because they are always meddling. How old are you? Seriously, I don't think Bethesda has an understanding of, like, linear time? What exactly have the Blades meddled with in regards to the Greybeards in Arngear's lifetime? It comes off as jealousy that we were cheating on him with a younger old man. Anyways, one of the other tongues decides to lash him for this, which translated says that we're dragonborn and we need to speak to Parthenax. You should know who Parthenax is if you read the tablets on the way up the mountain, but if you can't guess from the context clues, or you've just been fast traveling up here, he is actually a dragon. First, we have to use the Clear Skies Shout to clear a path up to the top of the mountain, which... This section has always been off to me. It's possible its only purpose is to try and prevent players from heading up to the top before the right point in the main quest line, which is just... sad? Like in Morrowind, at any time, you could just go hang out with Vivek, or Dagothur. It was cool. You could even try killing them. Or, if you were powerful enough, you would. Oblivion didn't have anything like that. The closest was Shale Gorath in the Shivering Isles DLC, but they wussed out and had him kill you in a scripted sequence if you tried to fight him. I mean, the advantage of Parthenax being a flying dragon is that he could just, like, not be there. Anyways, my problem with Clear Skies is that it has little mechanical use. Apparently, you can stagger enemies with it if you were somehow having difficulty doing that in the first place. But since there's no survival mechanics or even really rough weather, it's pointless. It was kind of odd realizing that it doesn't really rain in Skyrim. We meet with Parthenax, and since he's a dragon, I think it's fitting to do this part out of chronological order because I have a rant. The Blades? Well, they are going to issue us an ultimatum to kill Parthenax. Unlike the Civil War choice, which is debated to this day, the Parthenax dilemma was settled pretty much in 2011. The problem is that the Blades section of the story was useless. You could actually cut that entire chunk of the story out and the main queue would largely be the same. Delphine forcibly inserts herself into the middle of a quest, takes us off on a side adventure for a while, leading us to a piece of information that the thing we needed the entire time was with the people we already knew and were studying under. Literally, all we had to do to meet with Parth was just ask. Arngir says we need to be patient initially, but literally all that's changed is that Einarth happened to overhear the conversation and decided to intervene this time. To give a comparison, it would be like returning to Cloud Ruler Temple after acquiring all the copies of the Mythic Dawn commentaries, only for Martin to remark that he already owned all the books, and the only reason he didn't mention it sooner was that nobody had asked. What exactly about Alduin's Wall made it so that Einarth happened to overhear the conversation, or decide that now was the time? The answer is nothing, it's purely coincidental. In fact, it's fair to say that the Blades bring nothing to the entire story. No, really, from this point forward, we never have to engage with them again. When we go to fight Alduin, the Blades aren't there, even if we do as Delphine bids. I just have a massive problem with the Blades. The originals were experts in dragon lore and slaying, for a species that was largely exterminated thousands of years before their founding. I don't think anyone at Bethesda even really considered this. I know they have a history of cutting through canon if it means telling a better story, but is this better? If Bethesda can't understand how long 200 years is in the Fallout games, then they definitely won't understand how long 3,000 years is or the fact that there would be another thousand years until the present. Yet somehow Delphine has decided that her purpose in life is now dragon slaying. 
to such a degree that she is actually brave enough to go against us on this issue, citing her oath as a blade. I'm not one of those people that will argue that their blades and blades have to serve the Dragonborn. However, it is definitely the case that the second you actually do what this stupid bitch asks, you are her subservient. Who works for who? Huh? It is sad because they drag Esbern into this, but Delphine receives pretty much 100% of the flack for this. Deservingly so. Let me follow your logic here, Delphine. You refuse to serve me until I kill one very specific dragon, so that means the blades now can't serve their functions as dragon slayers because there isn't going to be a dragonborn around to suck up their souls if I say no. Is there? You're fucked. Because even if you manage to put a dragon in the ground without me, Alduin could just get him back up in short time. You know that. You were there. Are you going to stake out every dragon burial site in Skyrim while your order is being hunted by the Thalmor? Fact is, there is no blades without the dragonborn. Not the direction Delphine wants to take it. How exactly are you preserving your oath? Parthenax is, well, a good dragon. There are, however, plenty of bad dragons still out there rampaging right now, not getting killed because the blades refuse to serve me. Is that not a violation of your oath, Delphine? The only argument I've heard against this is that if the Dragonborn dies while Parthenax is alive, that nobody will be around to stop him in the future. Okay, again, what about all the other dragons that are still alive? If we are, factually, canonically, set in concrete and preserved forever, the last Dragonborn, then that means that all it takes is for one singular dragon to evade us until after the time of our death for this to be the case. Except that dragon, and let's be honest, the ones around him, will not have Parthenax around to try and guide them. I wonder if we're going to end up meeting a dragon that we can't actually slay. See, Parthenax is the actual leader of the Greybeards, having been the dragon to teach men how to use the Thum. He spends most of his days atop the throat of the world meditating, although he admits that at one time he did visit another dragon. Spoilers for the end, but after Alduin's defeat, Parthenax will leave the throat to go discuss his philosophy with other dragons. His goal is to encourage more dragons to adopt his own lifestyle of meditation rather than dominance. But Parthenax does admit that it is a struggle against his nature to maintain this lifestyle. So the argument goes that all it takes is one bad day for Parth to become a giant murderous lizard again. My name is not important. What is important is what I'm going to do. I just fucking hate this world and these human worms feasting on its carcass. My whole life is just cold, bitter hatred. It hasn't happened in 4,000 years, but it's possible, so we gotta put them down and restore the peace. I'm sorry, but this logic is fundamentally flawed. It's human nature to bash people across the head with clubs and fucking murder them for their food. That's not a joke. The physiology of our wrists is literally adapted to using weaponry. Modern, civilized people still have visceral reactions to having their food taken from them despite there generally being no rational reason to do so. So, for instance, let's assume there's a human organization. Their origin was from a military campaign that involved a long trek across the ocean, but ended in a massive swath of devastation across the countryside, killing untold countless people. Their military brutality is infamous to the point of being remembered to this day thousands of years later. It's long past time for them to pay for their crimes, which are even as recent as 20 years ago during unsanctioned intelligence operations in foreign countries that sparked a continent-wide war. Now, this organization claims to have reformed, that they serve a nobler purpose now. They became dragon slayers in a world where dragons were mostly gone and where they managed to slay a single dragon in five years. They would later reform again into an organization that served as bodyguards of the Emperor. You probably have picked up on my point, but the funny part is that I included verbatim quotes from Delphine in my comparison of the Blades to Parthenax. The only difference is that Parthenax is a single continuous entity while the Blades are a collection of individuals. However, this is applying the logic of punishment to an entity outside of conventional punishments. In essence, can you really call it justice to punish people who are immortal the same way you punish people who are not? Parthenax has been alive continuously ever since the Dragon War. We don't know the extent of his crimes, which by itself makes Delphine's case dubious. It's undeniable that he did ill, but if Delphine can't actually quantify her arguments then it's effectively meaningless. She's read from records I've already showed are faulty that Parthenax was a lieutenant of Alduin, meaning that he must have done bad things even though I'm sure the local Nords at the time were all much more aware of that. Parth is actually pretty similar to the dragon Seath from Dark Souls, a dragon that betrayed his own kind to give people the tool they needed to end the reign of dragons. Except the gods in Dark Souls awarded Seath for his decision. But I mean, Parthenax is immortal. He could do most anything, yet he's decided to live alone for thousands of years. 
That is a historical punishment. It's called exile, and he's been living in it for longer than 99% of mortals have been alive. It's true that his crimes are long in the past, but justice does not count the passage of years. Um, it actually does. However, my biggest problem with this dilemma is that the biggest witness used to prosecute Parthenax is himself. Literally, his own honesty about his life and actions is the single biggest contributor to the case against him. I call it being hung by your honesty, and it unfortunately happens quite often. People who perform minor acts can be punished worse than people performing major acts simply because they came clean and were honest about it. It's a part of human nature, but it means that people are encouraged to lie about their misdeeds rather than being honest because the punishment for honesty is usually worse. Simply put, you cannot convince me that Parthenax needs to die if the core of your argument is Parthenax's own words. Even trying to play as ruthless a character as possible could not justify this action, because it literally makes too much sense to just let him live. I personally believe that every human on Earth is capable of redemption, but that the worst of criminals require more time than they have left to ever really achieve it. Immortal beings have no such constraint, so, logically, that means I believe that immortals could eventually be redeemed of any crime. Plus, Elder Scrolls is a setting with a confirmed afterlife, so it's not like all the people Parthenax killed ceased existence, like what potentially happens in our own world. And, well, it's a bit presumptuous, isn't it? Delta Fear, my mage character, is actually an immortal vampire. She's a powerful necromancer, she's participated in murders and assassinations, changed the course of wars, and is developing an unrivaled ability with the Thum. I'm just saying, if we're worried about the crimes of the future, you might want to do a little introspection with your character. He may have betrayed Alduin in the end, but that makes him worse, not better. I have a contact inside the embassy. He's not up for this kind of high-risk mission, but he can help you. His name is Malborn. Wood Elf. Plenty of reason to hate the Thalmor. You can trust him. Parthenax is one of the cooler characters in Skyrim, probably just because of his uniqueness. He is a dragon, and it's evident that they actually took the time to craft his character around that fact. His pattern of speech and philosophy sets him apart. <laughs> Do you have no better reason for acting than destiny? Are you nothing but a plaything of Dez, of fate? There aren't really many other characters in Skyrim written like Parthenax. It's unfortunate then that he must bear the burden of the entire dragon lore upon his back. Rather than us piecing together information about the dragons from the dragons we meet over the course of a quest line, Instead, the vast majority of lore is just exposited at the player during this conversation. It's through the voice of Charles Martinet, whose Skyrim credit is lost amongst a sea of credits as Mario and Luigi. He was one of the few Bespin cops in Jedi Outcast, funnily enough. I mean no offense by this, but the casting almost sounds like a joke decision that ended up working wonders. It's like someone in the casting department was spitballing ideas about who should voice this dragon character and someone proposed the guy who voiced Mario and everything. The problem is that he is moving in one direction, and pretty much everything else is going in the other. Dragons love conversation and do battle with their words, but pretty much all we ever see is them screaming hot and cold. Parthenax spends his days meditating on the meanings of words, yet rather than teaching us a cool new shout, he simply augments our existing combat shouts. Parthenax doesn't know the dragon wrench shout, as it was created by mortals and dragons apparently cannot comprehend its meaning. Apparently it turned the tide on the dragons though, which is confusing. What, did you only teach mortals how to breathe fire? That's nice and all, but it's not exactly much of an edge over what we can already do. In fact, our notable quality is that we can permanently kill dragons, not that our voices themselves do it. Kind didn't need Parthenax to teach the people how to use the Thum because it practically teaches itself once you start killing dragons. Parthenax reveals that the ancient Nord Dragonborn did not slay Alduin, but instead used an Elder Scroll to cast him adrift through time, which created a time wound that we could use to observe the event if we were to get our hands on the same Elder Scroll. It's not really time travel, thank god, but more of a remote viewing of the past. It is unfortunate, however, because we will need to find one specific Elder Scroll out of hundreds, if not thousands, that exist, which has likely changed hands many times over the last 4,000 years. At least we can say with certainty that it does still exist since they're apparently highly durable, but who knows, it could be sitting in a buried Nordic ruin or at the bottom of the ocean. First, we need a clue about where to look, which presents us a choice. We can ask Arngear, who is still mad at us and takes offense but points us towards the College of Winterhold anyways. Or we can ask Esbern, 
who is recounting a dream he had of Alduin destroying the world, and also points us at the College of Winterhold. What immense insight. It's not like there were very many institutions in Skyrim that could actually offer us advice in this situation. Not the kind of thing you will find in your local bookshop. Let me think. Perhaps the College of Winterhold. This is the second time the player is placed into a position where they will encounter a faction, and the first where you're actually forced through initiation. If this specific quest is the first time you're doing this, then you have an additional dialogue with Feraldo where she'll ask you to demonstrate your Thum, which, while cool, doesn't mean I necessarily want to be enrolled in your institution. Plus, I'm not really sure what this is for. At least the Thieves' Guild pretended to be hidden, so getting pointers to it could be useful. The college is transparently a faction, and you get pointed to it by all the court wizards, including Farangar, earlier in the questline. At least I can say about Oblivion that when it sends us to the Arcane University that it didn't actually make us join the Mages Guild. It's just weird that you can't access Skyrim's library without enrolling. Were you guys forcing all those Sigics and Synod members to enroll in the college as well? Like, the Mages Guild was designed around the idea that many people would become associates for safe places to practice magic, hence why they had guild halls all over Vardenfell and Cyrodiil. We head into the library and meet up with Urag. He flat out says the college does not have any Elder Scrolls, nor would he give it to us if he did. He also has a big spiel about how dangerous and esoteric they are. I guess if this was your first Elder Scrolls game, five mainline titles in, then this part's for you. Not that they really had a big presence in the older games. The idea was basically made up as marketing for Arena and then tacked onto the series, but nobody actually wanted to do anything with the idea until Oblivion, which simply used an Elder Scroll as a plot device to change the properties of the Grey Cow. Then Skyrim came along and made them central to the main questline. Unsurprising, really, considering the Oblivion Thieves Guild was done by Bruce Nesmith, who went on to become lead designer on Skyrim. Ureg gives us some literature on the topic, one of which details the effects reading the scrolls have. This is mostly just recapping stuff established in Oblivion with the Ancestor Moth Priests. The second book, however, is coached in mythic allegory and symbolism, which is code we're going to use for being effectively gibberish. Oreg will remark that, yeah, that is the case. He does actually know who wrote the book, and they apparently even work out of Skyrim for some reason. So back in 4th Era 180, right before the Great War, all the scrolls that were stored in the Imperial Library up and vanished, because it would be really inconvenient to say that the Thalmor had acquired all those Elder Scrolls during their occupation of White Gold Tower. I guess they picked a side. That said, I would imagine if you were an expert in Elder Scrolls that you would still work in Cyrodiil, around the Moth Priests who are going around trying to collect all of them again. It is really convenient that so many people are willing to travel out to Skyrim to facilitate these plots. That's kind of the problem. Post-Oblivion, Bethesda seems to feel the need to make Skyrim a multi-province story, but obviously Cyrodiil is not a part of the play area anymore. It's just bizarre how much is going on in Cyrodiil following the game that was actually set there. I won't be surprised when the most interesting parts of Skyrim are in Elder Scrolls VI. Anyways, we meet this expert in Elder Scrolls lore, but we have to find him first. Not to worry, as the omniscient quest marker knows exactly where to go. Actually, Ureg gives us some extremely specific directions, somewhere up north in the ice fields. Septimus, however, is crazy, stewing in this ice cave trying to open up some Dwemer artifact. As far as I'm aware, Skyrim was the game to include the idea that the Elder Scrolls can drive you mad if you study them. I'd almost say that Septimus Cygnus is a parody of Michael Kirkbride, who didn't get to contribute very much to Skyrim. His ruminations read like an attempt at emulating the writing style of the Mythic Dawn commentaries or the 36 sermons. How has Septimus survived out here for all these years alone? Don't worry about it, we only said years to really drive home that he's crazy about this. Septimus seems to think the lockbox contains the heart of Lorcan. I guess news didn't get out about that one. Anyways, Septimus wants an exchange for helping us get an Elder Scroll. I want to emphasize that we are really going out on a limb here. We would have to be cosmically fortunate for this plan to actually result in us getting exactly the right scroll. He gives us a couple items and points us towards Alftand. This leads to a fairly lengthy dungeon, marking the first Dwemer ruin of the main quest. There was a research group that was clearing the ruin, but they apparently got devastated. Then they try to hand wave away the fact that they could have just left by claiming there was a storm outside, so... Of course, they had to go deeper into the ruins to go get murdered, instead of just waiting by the entrance for the blizzard to subside. The Dwemer ruins are marginally more interesting than Nordic ruins, but barely. They've definitely lost their aesthetic edge. Dwemer ruins in Skyrim are mostly just carved stone structures with occasional bands of brass or metal sculptures. Compare that with Dwemer ruins from Morrowinds. Everything looked rusted and ancient, and most important of all, unique. The Dwemer ruins of Vardenfell were meant to contrast with the Dunmer strongholds and Daedric ruins. In Skyrim, there's too much emphasis on the stonework and not the metal, meaning that the cultural identity of the dwarves just blends into all the other stone structures we see throughout the games. 
Rather than selling us on the idea that the Dwemer were a civilization that were rushing the technology tree at the cost of everything else, it's more like what made them superior to the Nords and Falmer was that they had more stonemasons. Not better stonemasons, just more. This is literally the greatest opportunity you could hand artists in a fantasy setting, the opportunity to blend science fiction and fantasy world design. I grabbed this image from the Moro Oblivion Project, which is a mock-up of a potential redesign of Dwemer Ruins. Imagine trudging through multiple Nordic ruins and then suddenly finding this and how refreshing it would be. It's not that outlandish, these are the people who made Fallout 3, but then again, it's unsurprising that this is what they ended up making. These are also the people who made Fallout 3. Alftand is a pretty big dungeon, although at this point, you should know that Skyrim's standard fare for big dungeons is actually just really long hallways. Alftand presents another level design opportunity to take advantage of the dragon shouts. I mean, technically non-dragonborn players are supposed to be able to complete this dungeon due to the Dawnguard DLC, but that's only because Alftand's original design did not incorporate this limitation. In that instance, they could just make it so you use one of the other dungeon entrances to Alftand if you're doing the Dawnguard version of this quest. Our powers so far include Force Push, Forward Dash, Clear Skies, and Parthenax taught us a word of fire breath. All of those have potential applications inside of a Dwemer Ruin. Unclog stuck machinery with a force normal men don't possess. Dash across chasms or through traps mortals would not be fast enough to evade. Clear rooms full of steam from burst pipes. Melt frozen walls and start up a boiler using fire breath. Ironically, the most useful shout for this dungeon is Become Ethereal, which we are not guaranteed to have learned from Ustengrav, in order to negate fall damage and skip a very long vertical section. Right at the end, we run into Umana and Sola Trabadius, who are the heads of that expedition. It kind of comes out of nowhere. Like, yeah, the journals mention their names, but then there was a long stretch where the plot was just kind of dropped. Because it could be easily assumed that nobody from the expedition got this deep into the ruin. We need to use the attunement sphere Septimus gave us to unlock a staircase that goes deeper into the earth. This leads into an area called Blackreach, which, wow. This is an actually cool area, which required restraint on the part of Bethesda. Rather than creating these assets and plastering them everywhere, they left a surprise in the main quest to be discovered. There are three different dungeons that lead into this area, all of which require the attunement sphere, so you can't stumble onto it accidentally either. I think one of the reasons Blackreach particularly strikes people's interest is due to that surprise element. At first, this quest just seems tedious. You go through a lengthy and rather uninteresting Dwemer ruin, and right when you think the game is just going to have an Elder Scroll be in the boss chest because Bethesda's lazy, it suddenly surprises you with a whole other area to explore. I cannot stress how cynical the game makes you feel about the design, that the moment it does something mildly interesting it seems amazing. These people made the Shivering Isles, it's not like they're incapable of making interesting looking areas, they just don't. Blackreach itself is a hub area, connecting three large dungeons with a bunch of smaller dungeons inside the ruin. There are many ores here including unique geodes which give soul gems when mined. The big glowing orb actually contains a dragon which you can release by shouting at it. I... I don't know what he's doing here. And he doesn't really have much to say on the matter either. There's also a single quest down here. It turns out that after Oblivion, the Master Alchemist Sundarian came here searching for Crimson Nernroot. How he accomplished this is a mystery, but they want to reference that quest somewhere. The quest is, unsurprisingly, to collect 30 Crimson Nernroot from Blackreach and deliver them to one of Sundarian's old colleagues. This actually awards you an ability that gives you a 25% chance to duplicate crafted potions. This isn't a parody that Bethesda is doing of one of their old infamous quests. Tons of people hated the Nernrit quest in Oblivion because it was just running around the edge of water picking dozens of plants, and also not being able to drop them seriously what the fuck some of the only real life conversations I've had about Oblivion were about how you couldn't do this. If it was a parody, then wouldn't it just say, I'm going to get two samples because that's all they'll really need. Make fun of the fact that Sindarian needed such a ridiculous number of this plant. But no, it's literally just doing the same thing the original quest people complained about in Oblivion did. In fact, there are several other World of Warcraft quests in Skyrim. World of Warcraft quests refer to a quest where you either kill X number of generic enemy type or collect X number of items from enemies or in the world. Except World of Warcraft generally shows restraint and only asks the player to get like... 10 plants, not 30. Inside of Blackreach is the Tower of Mazark, which is the area Septimus said the scroll would be in. Luckily, this isn't a further dungeon, so really the long stretch of this quest is over. 
You may have noticed that this room with the large orb is almost an exact duplicate of the ocularry that was at Mizulft during the college quest line. In fact, it's so similar I mistakenly referred to Mizark as Mizulft in the first recording. So then one has to wonder, which came first? Or was their similarity intentional for... some reason? I checked the creation kit just to be sure, and these are the only two of these items in the entire game. Maybe the college quest line and main quest were even more tied together originally, until it was realized that it didn't make sense to have the Synod get into Blackreach. I don't know man, I, I just work here. All we have to do is figure out this puzzle and we'll have the scroll. Well, to be honest with you, it's been over a decade, and I'm still unclear on what this even is. You slot the ruined lexicon into the USB port, which opens the ceiling and unlocks the two buttons on the right. You press the second button from the right four times in a row, and the lexicon opens, which activates a button on the left. You press the second button from the left twice, and the lenses move, which unlocks the final button, which you press, and the puzzle's done. I do not know what the puzzle here is. Neither does the UESP, which I had to use to even be able to tell you what the exact combination of button presses is. There are a ton of guides on how to solve the puzzle, but not actual explanations of, like, what the puzzle is. In essence, if I put a gun to your head and told you to give me the correct combination without touching the controls, there is a 100% chance of your brains painting the wall behind you. There is no key information that I've left out to help you figure it out. It truly is just guessing until you figure out the answer. Why specifically do I need to press the second button from the right four times in a row? Who designed this? And why? Another thing to consider is the fact that the only thing stopping the local Falmer from getting their hands on the Elder Scroll was the ruined lexicon. I don't know how common objects like this are, but I would imagine given the extensive interconnected Dwemer ruins that at least one of these lexicons has to be floating around this area. I'm basing that entirely off of the fact that a guy living in an ice cave somehow managed to get his hands on one of these things. Septimus himself says they're used to store information, so surely they couldn't be that rare. So there should be some monkeys with typewriters going on here, except the Falmer are smarter than monkeys and they also aren't trying to recreate Shakespeare but just slot a USB stick into a USB port. We also aren't the first people to visit Blackreach. Sindarian got down here relatively recently. Plus the fact that the roof opens and light pours in kind of implies the Tower of Mazark is actually pretty close to the surface. There's also a shortcut leading straight to this part of the complex. Nobody, in thousands of years, ever tried to breach the Tower of Mazark just to see what was inside. The Empire literally had to make looting Dwemer ruins illegal because of just how common it was for people to go and get themselves killed trying to find rare items. I can only imagine how many Nords and Sovngarde could tell you about how they died in a Dwemer ruin. I don't buy for a second that this structure's just too sturdy to be broken through. It's made of stone, get a catapult, a battering ram, a wizard, a staff of fireballs, 20 good men, or even a dragonborn. But no, we have to have a fast exit here. What if people got bored? Man, if only there was a spell designed around the idea of being able to quickly exit dungeons. Septimus got a pretty raw deal. We got an Elder Scroll while he gets no guaranteed return because we could just ignore him and whatever entities we might meet as a consequence of that. I mentioned that because it's important for later. But surely this isn't the specific Elder Scroll, right? Well, it is, and it even says so. That's actually an addition to the Dawnguard DLC. In the base game, it didn't specify that it was about dragons, so I'm kind of upset about this. So first I want to say that it's not impossible that the Dwemer got their hands on the scroll, but it is unusual. You would think an artifact that was instrumental in the defeat of Alduin during the Dragon War would have ended up in a Nordic ruin buried alongside the heroes that used it. Yet somehow the Dwemer got their hands on the scroll and decided to hide it away. That kind of raises an awkward point that the Dwemer were just around during the Age of the Dragon Cult. And unfortunately, that means we really need to talk about the Dwarves. An enigmatic race of elves that Skyrim does next to nothing with. The dwarves were very important in Morrowind, having played key roles in the nation's history and their artifacts even being key to the central plot. Mind you, this was after Numidium's role in Daggerfall, Morrowind itself iterating on existing lore. Skyrim has nothing to add to that, which is probably smart. Unfortunately, Skyrim is one of the provinces where they lived, so they couldn't really afford the luxury of ignoring them outright. Knowledge about the Dwemer not only hasn't advanced, but it seems to have actively regressed. In Morrowind, during the Mages' Guild, we solved the disappearance of the Dwarves, yet this information was apparently never published and it's only paid lip service to in Skyrim. So here's the deal. The races of Elves are all offshoots of Aldmer, with a D. Each race was descendants of various religious schisms of the races of Elves. The Dunmer, for instance, used to be Kymer, who split off under the guidance of Veloth the Prophet, who taught his followers about Daedra worship under the guidance of the tribunal Boethia, Azura, and Mephala. The Orcs were faithful to the god Trinimac, transformed when their god became Malakath. 
The Bosmer were settlers who were transformed due to the difficulties of living in Valenwood. The Altmer actually didn't divide, but were forced to leave Aldmeris for reasons. The dwarves, however, were agnostics. They would be atheists if not for the gods existing quite literally in Elder Scrolls. The dragons are divine, at least I would argue so. They are described as children of Akatosh, although it's more likely they are slivers of Akatosh, hence why they absorb or recombine on death. The thing about Akatosh is that he's also known as Ariel in the Elvish pantheons. The reason I bring all this up is that we're supposed to believe that the dragons dominated Skyrim without opposition. Now, Dongard goes a bit into what exactly was going on with the Falmer during and after Iskermore and the Companions wrecked them, which TLDR is basically just nonsense and hand-waving away. For some reason, the Dwarves in Morrowind fought wars with the Chimer, yet apparently were completely uninterested in actually controlling Skyrim. They kept peace with the Falmer and then sold them on a raw deal when the Falmer needed help, for some reason. But the Dwarves had no input on the Dragon War, not even sending an emissary to help meddle in the conflict to wear down both sides, similar to another Elvish faction in this game. Yet after the war, they somehow got their hands on this Elder Scroll. If Skyrim was a new intellectual property, then people would not accept the premise of the dwarves. They are mysteriously absent, and the game focused little attention on their story, yet decided to have weird circumstances surrounding their motives. It's only acceptable because Skyrim is a sequel, but in my opinion, the idea completely fails to stand on its own merits. The game would be criticized for not just cutting the dwarven ruins entirely and just focusing on making the Nordic story better. It's weird because the dwarves in Skyrim are like the aliens in Oblivion. Their ruins are everywhere and you would think they would play a central role in the story of the province, but they don't. They are a dungeon setting. I even said as much during Oblivion's version of this quest. In that, we visited a ruin to attain an item we needed for a ritual, except rather than learning from the mistakes of Oblivion, they largely just repeated them. A fancy mushroom area is not going to make up for the fact that a fairly standard Dwimmer ruin dungeon crawl ensues. Then you have the fact that what was largely us throwing a dart at an empty wall somehow turned 180 degrees and hit the dartboard behind us. There are many levels of improbability that created this scenario. I know the Elder Scrolls are magic and can do whatever the fuck they want, or rather the writers want, without explanation because they ain't gotta explain it, it's in the title. Hence why all the good stories never involve them, because it's just asking for people to hate it. When they came up with the Elder Scrolls, it was literally just a framing device to say that the story was written down in a piece of old, rolled-up parchment. They occasionally had information inside them that would help the Eternal Champion find pieces of the Staff of Chaos. Here's the problem with Elder Scrolls. They can do literally anything, which makes you question their actions. We can assume the reason this complete shot in the dark worked was because the Elder Scroll wanted it to, because prophecy... At that point, you might as well ask why the Elder Scroll didn't will itself into being buried at High Hrothgar and then mysteriously a brick falls over and the Greybeards find it just in time for us to need it. In essence, the Elder Scroll is a character similar to the One Ring of Power from The Lord of the Rings, except the One Ring had a clear and defined motivation, and its actions and movements were sensical and easy to understand. It would gradually corrupt and manipulate its bearer until they were in the exact right position the Ring needed them to be. The challenge of defeating such an item hinged on finding the right people who wouldn't be as easily manipulated. Why did the ring happen to land exactly on Frodo's ring when he fell over? So that he would put the ring on and learn of its abilities, increasing the likelihood that the ring race could find him, and by extension, the ring. However, the One Ring of Power is nothing compared to an Elder Scroll. Parthenex can't help but just be in awe of how important and mystical and divine and amazing these things are, so why do they care about what happens in the world? Oh, it's just setting us up so we can go on an adventure inside a video game. Yes, I get it. The problem with that, however, is that it only really works if the story is, you know, good. I really like that they created a literal symbol of the fact that the game is a roller coaster ride. We are going on exactly the adventure the Elder Scroll wants us to go on. No pretense or illusion of choice, just a linear series of encounters and interactions until a preset end. A prophecy, in a series known for making fun of prophecies. The Eternal Champion from Marina was just some guy who was part of the Imperial Court that Jagger Tharn underestimated. In Daggerfall, you were a friend of the Emperor investigating some weird happenings in the Iliac Bay. In Morrowind, you were a prisoner who happened to meet the conditions of a prophecy, but the storyline often asks whether you meet those conditions because you're the Nereverine, or if you're the Nereverine because you met those conditions. In Oblivion, you were also just some guy who happened to be in prison the day the Emperor was assassinated, and you helped Martin Septim fulfill his destiny as the Chosen One of Mavrin's Dagon. Even the expansions fill this tone. You aren't the Chosen One in Tribunal, or in Blood Moon you're chosen, but that's due to your actions on Solstein leading up to the Blood Moon, not prophecy or born destiny. In Knights of the Nine, you're just a guy who went on a holy quest who ended up getting boons from the gods for your actions. Shivering Isles was especially about how prophecy is nonsense. 
Sheogorath's goal was to break the cycle he was stuck in, where he kept transforming into Jigalag, a Daedric prince who genuinely believed that every single thing that happens could be predicted. The story is directly about the idea of prophesized outcomes. And then you have Skyrim. Skyrim has little to no commentary about prophecy. You are the Dragonborn. Whether you were born that way or chosen at the exact moment Alduin showed up is not questioned by the story, only me. Characters hail you as the Chosen One, and now we have literally acquired an item of literal prophecy just to emphasize how chosen we are for this task. I will admit, it is technically a new direction for the series. Downhill is a direction. Thing is, there's an opportunity here. Nobody makes a video this long just for the sake of complaining. You can tell a story about how utterly chosen a player character is and have it be an interesting commentary on the nature of prophecy if you make the main quest about being the villain. The dragons are attacking, but they only try to kill us. They don't destroy villages or cities, and we don't hear about dragon attacks happening in areas we aren't actively in. Dragons are actually noble creatures. It's the dragonborn that are aberrations. Mortals unprepared for the true power of the Thum that the dragons are trying to stop. At first out of responsibility, but soon out of self-preservation. The dragonborn even corrupt and distort their language, creating a shout the dragons literally cannot understand. The meaning of dragonrend is mortality. It's death. A concept that is foreign to dragons. Dragons don't die, their soul gets absorbed into other dragons. The concept's so alien to them that it forces them to land just to try and deal with the image of it. Imagine for a second a character in a story whose main ability is to force images into people's minds of concepts so awful that it debilitates them. That actually exists, it's the crux of Lovecraftian monsters. The ancient dragonborn aren't heroes, not really. They showed up one day with dragon souls and began slaying and absorbing the souls of these benevolent beings, who then gathered their priests together to try and stop this threat. Eventually, the dragonborn won and supplanted the role of dragons in Nordic culture. After thousands of years, the history's been gradually revised and lost to leave out the less glamorous parts of the story. The Bard's College even acknowledges how the culture of the Nords has been poorly preserved. Then Alduin shows up, the only dragon the ancient dragonborn could not defeat. They cheated to send him forward in time. Alduin immediately begins trying to rectify the situation. There are a few dragons left on Tamriel, so the closest soul he can detect is a dragonborn in Helgen. He destroys the city in an attempt to kill them, but fails and our story begins. He's been gathering power and using it to reanimate his fallen comrades, the ones who weren't permanently killed in the Dragon War. He reanimates his dragon priests who in turn reanimate the Draugr. There's a sudden crisis in Nordic society. Nobody can visit their burial crypts anymore. The goal of this is to slow the Dragonborn down and prevent him from acquiring more words of power. The Draugr we see using dragon shouts were actually servants of the dragons, rewarded with knowledge of basic Thum, similar to how the Greybeards could master it. When the ancient Dragonborn won the Dragon War, they then forged an empire out of Skyrim and began conquering territory. The Nords kept their momentum until the Battle of Red Mountain where they met their match against the Chimer, led by Endoral Nerevar. It was in that defeat that Jürgen Windcaller created the Way of the Voice, a Nordic philosophy that came to be more in line with the original philosophy of the dragons. The Dragonborn, then balancing between the Greybeards and the Blades, is led down a path of eventual conflict with Alduin. Alduin sees what the Dragonborn have done to his world, he mourns all of his brothers that were lost in the Dragon War. This noble being, the firstborn of Akatosh and Ariel, is corrupted. Now, instead of simply guiding the world through time, Alduin has become the prophesized destroyer the Nords born after his disappearance wrote of him being. He was not born that way, but became it through the Nords' own actions. He says as much to Parthenax, his former trusted lieutenant. Parthenax's assigned duty after the Dragonborn began appearing was to try and shepherd humanity towards the Way of the Voice. He failed to do so before the end of the Dragon War, and Alduin blames him for this. Why did this happen? Well, it goes back a ways. Martin Septim at the end of Oblivion used the Amulet of Kings to defeat Meroon's Dagon. The Amulet of Kings was actually a vessel that contained the dragon souls of the Dragonborn Emperors and descendants of Tiber Septim. These combined dragon souls were powerful enough to help Martin mantle Akatosh, wherein he became and replaced him as a god. Now there's a new Akatosh, one that was chosen and placed there by the Prince of Destruction, Meroon's Dagon, and things are starting to happen. The Old Mary Dominion, whose primary deity is Akatosh, suddenly had a cultural resurgence and becomes a dominant power. Alduin's released back into the world. Akatosh is the god of time, so it's his domain. But why is any of this happening? Well, it goes back to the primordial conflict between Akatosh and Lorcan, which has come to a head after Lorcan's heart was released back into the world in Morrowind. Yes, this narrative really does go there. Septimus even draws attention to the fact that the heart wasn't destroyed. The Dwemer and later Dunmer were using the heart for blasphemous purposes, but now Lorcan has his heart again. He was slain by Trinimac, and his heart was shot across Tamriel by Ariel. This didn't actually kill him, he being the devilish little prince he is. Shor, who is the Nordic name for Lorcan, 
was busy looking after his followers from the shadows when suddenly his heart was found and contained. This stifled his ability to really be active on the world stage, only occasionally getting to influence things. The Nordic invasion of Morrowind and Battle of Red Mountain was partially motivated by the Nords attempting to recover Shore's heart from the elves. But now, Shore is back, and he's doing things again. He's got a new dragonborn, and he's pushing to have his own worship, aka Talos worship, defended from the Thalmor. That's why the prophecy mentions Lorcan's heart from Morrowind and the Oblivion Crisis, because both stories were key to placing pieces on the board for this conflict. Now that I've made Skyrim sound cool, let's go back in time and nope, the ancient dragonborn are exactly how the Nords remembered them being. The dragons are still just evil, and we are really the undisputed good guy. It doesn't matter how many sprinkles I put on top of this, Alduin is still a giant evil looking dragon. It goes all the way back to his concept art. They started this project knowing how evil this guy was. Mehrun's Dagon is still a 50 meter tall giant demon man pillaging the countryside. Dagothur is still a dude in an evil mask who says we need to get the first blow before immediately chucking a fireball at us. It does not matter how much lore copium we come up with, it is an immutable fact that Elder Scrolls antagonists sure are fucking boring. Except Almalexia, I guess. But it's so sad to see a game series that often toyed with concepts like predeterminism falter in this way. It's like they said, we're dumbing down all the mechanics of the game, better dumb down the story too. They make an attempt with this cutscene where we read the Elder Scroll and see the events of the past. It's often complained about because of its awkward blocking. However, most scenes Skyrim tries to do are just like this. In Oblivion, scenes where two characters talk to each other were pretty rare. I imagine it was probably too difficult to consistently do. Skyrim tries to make conversations more dynamic, but it really comes off as being similar to middle school theater performances. Hey, that animation didn't totally fuck up. Hey, Con! A glorious day, is it not? You have the awkward blocking, the mismatched accents and voices, you even have actors missing their cue, forgetting what their next action is supposed to be, forgetting their lines, or making mistakes. You also see bad direction, like the crux of the awkwardness of the scene comes down to Feldir having way too much dialogue, so the characters have to awkwardly fight Alduin while he exposits all his lines that should have been cut because clearly the theater department did not have the budget to fully realize the dragon fight sequence the way that the playwrights had originally intended back on Broadway. There is an awkward stillness to all of Skyrim's dialogue that was mostly patched out in Fallout 4. Fallout 4's dialogue is many things, including awkward, but I mostly attribute that to the bad writing rather than the technical problems that Skyrim's dialogue has. They were going for a system where characters could do things during conversations. Rather than intently staring at us, now maybe they're sitting in a chair, or running a forge, or maybe they crossed their arms. Basically, it's trying to incorporate body language into the dialogue in addition to facial animation. It was also aiming to make multi-person conversations possible and common. Beginning, we had a really shitty, uh, well, not shitty, very expensive, and but in hindsight, very shitty mocap system. <laughs> it looked insane because it had all these wires that were still tethered, like you know, like the old vibe. But imagine, like, on every like part of your limb, some people were still hesitant because they're just like hardcore, like hand animators, which is you know respectable because that's difficult. But I was just like, I need to get this shit in quick. So I'm going to go down there and just like flail my arms and do whatever until something sticks. Right. So that, that was sort of my approach because uh, I'm sure you remember the deadlines were pretty. Yes. <laughs> pretty aggressive. So what's going on in this scene? Well, these three ancient dragonborn are fighting dragons atop the throat of the world. This being apparently the final battle of the dragon war. They decide to not use the Elder Scroll and then use Dragon Run to bring down Alduin. We immediately learn the entire shout just from hearing it, which is definitely hand-waving. At least when we've been taught words in the past, there was still some ceremony to it. I mean, following this we fight Alduin, but I imagine if there was a gauntlet of lesser dragons we had to slay to gradually unlock the shout. I guess it wouldn't make that much sense because we are using dragon souls to unlock those dragons' knowledge of the words of power and dragons can't have this knowledge. It is funny that almost immediately after vowing to not use the Elder Scroll, they are instantly overwhelmed by Alduin and resort to using it anyways. If these guys didn't stand a chance then, how could we now? Well, we do, because Alduin's here. This fight's kind of awkward because we've just gained the shout and immediately have to get used to aiming it at flying dragons. Especially annoying since if we miss we have to wait for the cooldown. Alduin's basically just like any other dragon fight with two exceptions. He is immune to damage in the air, meaning that he really only has a combat phase, and he knows how to cast Rain of Fire. Okay, I have to explain this one. This effect he's doing is literally a Rain of Fire, which, if you remember, was also the name of the movie that inspired the dragon design of Skyrim. Bravo, Bethesda, what a brilliant play on words. I guess you can technically use Clear Skies if this somehow is actually causing you to have trouble with the fight. 
It's also unusual that the player never gets to learn this specific shout. We have a similar shout called Storm Call, so it's not fear of players getting this effect. Not even the DLC gave it to us. It's actually kind of amazing how much of a pushover Alduin is. The greatest, most powerful dragon ever is still a giant, uncreative, fire-breathing lizard. He acknowledges our newfound strength, which it's not newfound. We haven't fought before. You'd realize that I'd barely done any training-wise between Kynesgrove and now. But he reveals that he's literally unkillable on this mortal plane. Nah, we could just cut it off here, but no, there has to be more of this stupid questline. Pray tell, why exactly is Alduin invincible here, but not in other places? What immutable property has he been granted? Why are the dragons even immortal? If they're descendants of Akatosh, then they should be mortals just like Akatosh. Unless the secret implication the entire time is that they're actually Daedra. But then it's weird that Periite was taking the form of dragons. What, did he just not know this secret lore copium to explain their immortality? Easy fix. Alduin shouts ice form at us, Parthenax swoops down to protect us, and then Alduin flies away. That's the beauty of flying enemies. They can just disengage from combat when you need them to. But, because you gave us the power to stop dragons from flying, now you need to invent a reason why that just won't work. Then he flies off anyways, so it didn't matter. I have a better idea about how to stage this fight. Let's replace... I forgot his name, but the dragon at Kynesgrove. Let's replace his fight with Alduin. That's for mechanical reasons. I think the idea is that they want us to face off against the antagonist before the final boss battle. But typically, facing off against the antagonist happens way earlier in the storyline, so that when we defeat him later, it's self-evident that we have become stronger as a character. We've already proven we can defeat Alduin effectively solo. I mean, Parthenax was there, but I can't credit him as being a particularly big help in the fight. There's no tension facing off against an enemy you've already beaten unless you can show that in the interim they have also gotten stronger, but it's the reverse. We're going off to face against Alduin for a second time with more help than the first time. It would be like making it so that Rey defeats Kylo Ren in the first movie and then their next fight they say, you know what, this time Kylo Ren doesn't even get a lightsaber. Good luck defeating him now. I don't know why all my metaphors are grounded in the sequel trilogy. We have to ask one of the old men we know about how to find Alduin, which is weird. You're given the option to ask Arngear or Esburn, but Parthenax is not only right there, but the most knowledgeable about the subject. Rather than assuming that Alduin is stupid and just flying off in the direction Alduin took off in until we find something, it's determined that we should try and capture one of Alduin's servants. This is where Esburn will first try to ambush you over the Parthenax dilemma, although there's another circumstance where you're guaranteed to be forced into this encounter. Dragon's Reach was built for the purpose of housing a captive dragon, which of course obviously means they actually capture the dragons there. It's not like the story is that Olaf One-Eye defeated the dragon Numenex atop Mount Anthor and then brought it back to his castle in Whiterun. It's like saying the way you catch someone is by throwing the dungeon shackles at them. Jarl Balgr's problem is that the civil war is going on and he just can't spare the men because he's worried that a moment of weakness could threaten his hold. Given that at most three guards participate in this ploy, I think that's a lie. The player is not given the opportunity to tell Balgriff that they run the companions, or even the blades, and could have them participate in the capturing instead, because we are being forced into addressing the civil war questline. We either have to end the civil war or negotiate a truce. If you killed Parthenax for some reason, then you have no choice but to complete the civil war, as the truce requires Arngear's cooperation and the Greybeards to host the event. Okay, so imagine that during Oblivion, we gather all the items for the ritual to invade Paradise, the armor of Tiber Septum, a Daedric artifact, a Great Welkin Stone, and we've just fought a battle at Bruma to acquire the Great Sigil Stone. The fate of Tamriel is supposed to be on the line, yet Joffrey enters the room and yells, Hold on there, hero! We're worried about Mana Marco assaulting the temple, so you need to join the Mages Guild and deal with that threat first. It is really weird that at the penultimate moment of this questline, they interjected to say that the player needs to address another separate questline, especially considering how much more involved the Civil War was originally supposed to be. I know the idea is probably that we need to settle a relatively petty grievance of the Civil War in order to fight a bigger threat, except we're not negotiating peace, just a ceasefire for the duration of the Dragon Crisis. This leads to season unending. Although Arngear is uninterested in involving himself or the tongues in the Civil War, it's figured that we need to do it here as the Greybeards are respected by both sides. Even though we're presented with a speech check, you will eventually succeed in bringing both sides to the table. As a proposal, perhaps the speech check is the only way to successfully convince the leaders to bring the meeting to Skyhaven Temple should you have already slain Parthenax. I do have an issue with a peace conference being held at High Hrothgar. This is supposed to be a difficult place to reach, yet all the delegates not only arrived, but did so apparently without interference or issue. No parties, not the Imperials, Stormcloaks, or Thalmor, used the opportunity to ambush their opposition on the dangerous path up the mountain. I doubt that Ulfric or Galmar would do this, but Tolius would absolutely take the opportunity to end war here and now. He's not a general because he fights honorably. 
But I wasn't sent to Skyrim to fight dragons. My job is to quell this rebellion, and I intend to do just that. Dragons or no dragons. How about we hold the peace conference in Whiterun? The Greybeards can be the main reason that both sides agree, but they come down to Dragon's Reach instead of everyone else coming up to High Hrothgar. I mean, look at the Great Hall. It's practically built for two sides to yell across the room at each other. The Imperial side consists of Tolius, Legat Ricca, Jarl Elisif, and Elenwyn, the Thalmor dignitary. The Stormcloaks consist of just Ulfric and Galmar. Maybe they should have invited Jarl Lawgiver and Jarl Skald from Riften and Dawnstar. It would even the sides and really sell the idea that the Stormcloaks are a confederated force. Jarl Balgriff and Jarl Vignar Greymane will arrive depending on your progress in the Civil War. Oh yeah, you can do this quest while having already committed to a side in the conflict. You can even do this after having betrayed one of those sides during the Jagged Crown questline. I feel like the success rate of whether or not you can convince both sides to come to the table should hinge around the player's decisions. It makes sense if a Dragonborn is a neutral party, but if we're already loyal to one side, then that should really make it difficult for the other to believe in this conference. Also, the Blades show up. Actually, just Delphine and Esburn, which I think is the reason the Stormcloak side has two members. It's so that they can have room at the table. The very first part of the negotiation is a decision as to whether or not Ellen Wynne gets to stay at the meeting. I feel like they could have expanded this by having a phase where the Imperials demand that the Blades leave the meeting, because I really feel that they shouldn't be here. Delphine is citing old conflicts between the Blades and Greybeards that she was never actually a part of as just reason for their attendance, but I personally would have kicked them out. I decided against killing Parthenax, you're no longer welcome as long as you refuse to work with me. Also missing are guards for the dignitaries. It would be nice to see some of our blade recruits standing guard in the room in addition to soldiers for each faction. So the negotiation's really complex and kind of convoluted, but ultimately meaningless, and none of the choices really matter that much. It doesn't matter how hard you try to weigh a negotiation against a side, both parties will agree to whatever terms we come up with. The scoring system for how fair the arrangement is basically determines if your Civil War boss rewards you or not for the negotiation. You cannot fail the negotiation by being unfair. Phase 1 is Ulfric demanding that Elenwyn leaves, a really weird decision for the Manchurian candidate to kick out their brainwasher, but we can cope and say that they planned for that to happen beforehand. Elenwyn claims she's here to ensure that none of the terms of the treaty violate the White Gold Concordat, which probably means she's just worried about the Stormcloaks will demand free Talos worship as a term similar to the Markarth incident. Tolius doesn't want to have to make concessions before the negotiations start, while Ulfric sees her presence as an insult. It's such a big piece of drama that it's weighted the same as a territory exchange. After we determine her inclusion status, it's time to move on to the real negotiation. If Balgriff holds Whiterun, then the Stormcloaks will demand control of the Reach. If the Stormcloaks take Whiterun in battle, then the Imperials will demand control of the Rift. However, because there's a really good chance that Balgriff is going to be here, that means that most players are going to see Ulfric demand that Elenwyn leave, and then immediately demand again for control of the Reach. Just wanted to clarify why it seems like Ulfric's being super pushy. Who would like to open the negotiations? Our terms are simple. Riften must be returned to Imperial control. That's our price for agreeing to a truce. By Talos, the stone's on this one. You're in no position to dictate terms to us, Talius. That's quite an opening demand, Talius. Each side will take offense at the demand, but will acquiesce and accept it without our input. This gets a score of two, so for instance, if the Reach is given to the Stormcloaks and Elenwyn is kicked out, then the score will be 3 for the blue team and 0 for the red team. This leads to a counter demand, an exchange they want to hold, and we're given a choice what to give them. If the Stormcloaks demand, we can respond by giving the Imperials Riften, Dawnstar, or Winterhold. Riften will be worth 2 points, while Dawnstar and Winterhold are worth 1 point each. On the flip side, if the Imperials demand it first, then you can either give the Stormcloaks Markarth, Morthal, or Falkreath. If this sounds really complicated, it's not, it's just difficult to explain. What happens in the second phase will depend on the score up to this point. Whoever's getting screwed threatens a walkout and then Esburn gives a speech. At this point, the currently losing side will be given something to sweeten the deal and if they're still losing after that, they will again complain to be given another sweetener if possible. A lot of this depends on how much territory has already been exchanged in the Civil War, however. The first option is reparations for a massacre that took place at Karth Waston, which is flexible depending on the score. The other option is to exchange more minor holds, Morthal and Falkreath for the Stormcloaks, Dawnstar and Winterhold for the Imperials. The end result is pretty minor, however. You can't screw over one side and then have a noticeable difference in the Civil War questline. A lot of this negotiation seemed to hinge on the expanded Civil War that never came to be, and so what's left is mostly gutted. Just a dramatic shouting match. However, it's one of the better scenes of the Civil War, which makes the fact that it's not in the Civil War questline directly all the more hilarious. Also, apparently Ulfric knows Delphine, but not Esbern. 
It really is bizarre that the Blades play such an important role in keeping the treaty going with Esbern's speech, yet nobody has anything to say about their attendance. It seems like half of the people here should be asking who the Weeaboo sitting next to Ulfric even is, or where their loyalties lie. Are they still loyal to the Empire, even after the White Gold Concordat? Or are they neutral? Or do they align with the Stormcloaks? Why does Delphine take her vows against the dragon so seriously when the person she actually swore to at the time would have been the Emperor? All great questions I'm going to take the liberty of ignoring. I love the premise of this quest, but there are so many opportunities once you open your mind to the idea of a dynamic civil war. But man, when the civil war failed, so did everything else tied to it. It just feels like a waste of time to have such a flaccid scene. Again, Balgraf's fear is completely unfounded. We should have the option to say, you know what, if the city gets attacked, I'll pitch in and help out. Like what, are the Stormcloak spies going to tell Ulfric that they're trying to catch a dragon in Whiterun so they should attack right now? So we head up to Dragon's Reach. Balgriff and Irolith will participate in this encounter, unless Vignar holds the city, in which case Vignar and Ulfina Greymane participate. Ulfina is the town's strong Nord woman. I just find it funny that a barmaid for the Bannered Mare is participating in this endeavor, but not the companions. So we use a shout to call a dragon named Odaving. The way it works is that shouting a dragon's name is a challenge, and if they see us as worthy, they'll have no choice but to respond. I mean, that's technically what happened when the Greybeards did it, so... Seems like a really easy way for us to hunt down and exterminate dragons if we just happen to have a list of all the old dragon names. Sure enough, Odaving arrives and we force him down with Dragonrend and then draw him into the trap. Not only does this thing still work, but Odaving is dumb enough to actually fall for it. I thought these were beings of immense intelligence. Odaving will chat with us. He says that some of the dragons are questioning Alduin's strength, rightfully so considering how badly he got whipped at the throat of the world. Again, I'm not exactly clear about what it is that made us special compared to the other Dragonborn of the past. I mean, it is obvious that we're just the Chosen One, end of discussion. The only meaningful progress we've made over the course of this story is just learning how to force dragons to land, an ability we literally learned from the ancient Dragonborn. In essence, if the Elder Scroll had just decided to show us the vision of the past on the cart ride, we probably could have defeated Alduin at Helgen. It's one thing to level scale enemies, it's another thing to power scale enemies narratively. Look at it another way. Each Elder Scrolls main story typically shows why a character at the end of the story is able to do something they couldn't have at the start of it. All of them, except Skyrim. Skyrim instead relies on the player to explain their own character progression for the story. While that can work, Skyrim does not allow the player to actually showcase their progression in meaningful ways beyond how much damage your character does to the big, bad, black dragon. You cannot enlist any of the factions you lead to help you in your cause. Wuthrad, the Staff of Magnus, the Powers of Nocturnal, and the Blade of Woe are all not actually useful for fighting dragons. Compare this with New Vegas. The Battle of Hoover Dam changes depending on your faction allegiances and actions during the game. It's not the most amazing example, but then again a certain company that starts with B did decide to lower their production schedule by six months. Odaving tells us that Alduin has a portal at a place called Skuldafin that he uses to go to Sovngarde to consume the souls of the dead, explaining his source of power, I guess. Odaving does try to pull a fast one by omitting the detail that we need wings to reach this place. Lies of omission, kind of like someone else I know. You wouldn't happen to be voiced by Todd Howard, would you? You wound me, Dovahkiin. I may not tell the whole truth, but I am no liar. Thanks for rubbing in the fact that we've lost the ability to fly in Elder Scrolls. The deal is that if we release Odaving, he'll fly us up to the Eyrie. We basically only have his word for it, but he says that Alduin has proven he's unfit to rule, which he also said before he tried to lie to us, so it's probably true. We are given zero choice but to trust him. We cannot employ any other dragons we might happen to know or have any under our service. Altair is looking at this leap of faith with some consternation. You can do this if you sufficiently prove that the dragons have their own culture of honor. Okay, imagine when we were leaving the Tower of Mazark, there's only a couple places the Dragonborn can exit, so waiting outside all of them should be a dragon, except instead of attacking us, he challenges us to a duel and gives us the honor of the first blow, an honor he keeps. If he introduced the idea that dragons are honorable early, then this decision to trust Odaving and his word can make more sense. As it stands, it's just more salt in the wounds of levitation. Hey, the ancient dragonborn lived in a time where it wasn't illegal, so surely... Wait a second, is the implication that the dragon's flying is not an expression of the Thum? I mean, even the cliff racers were implied to have some magical properties to their flight, given that their plumes were a potion ingredient for the levitation effect. But apparently flying is just a physical property of being a dragon because they have wings. Skuldafin's pretty cool. The area can only be visited once, although there isn't really a whole lot to miss. I like that they make use of low-level dragons as fodder enemies, and fighting through this area is actually surprisingly fun. It's almost like the designers made some assumptions about what powers the player might have and created various opportunities to use them. Big gaps where you're vulnerable to archers that you can close the distance with whirlwind sprint. 
ledges to send enemies flying off of with unrelenting force, dragons to bring down with dragon rend. The area also works well for other shouts. You can become ethereal to survive the archers. You can use Stormcall in this big area without fear of killing friendlies. Draugr are especially vulnerable to disarms. At the end is a dragon priest with a unique mask you need for a side quest. Wow, Bethesda, you actually trust me to find unique loot in this area I can't revisit? I'm gonna blush. We plug the priest's staff in and go through a portal into Sovereign Guard. Sovereign Guard is one of those areas that always makes it into Skyrim videos. Again, it's that Black Reach effect of leaving a big impression on players that really captures the imagination. It's the same effect that Black Reach had. As unfair as it sounds, I actually think Sovereign Guard should have been the baseline for Skyrim. As in, we should have seen a lot more imagery like this instead of just shacks with thatch roofs. There's nothing special about Skyrim. Everybody here is just a generic human with stuffed up noses. A couple NPCs have the potential to show up here depending on what quests you've done. High King Torig and Scavnir are both here. Scavnir, if you don't know, was the bard who wrote all those scathing tweets about Olaf One-Eyes Rain. He's a part of the Bard's College, although why he's stuck outside is confusing. See, after Alduin showed up, he cast this mist over Sovngarde that made the spirits get lost in the fog. But shouldn't Scavnir already have made it to the Hall of Valor? Was his spirit trapped in his corpse for thousands of years waiting for us to do his quest? Sounds like hell to me. Other potential notable characters include Codlack Whitemane, Ulfric Stormcloak, Galmar Stonefist, and Legate Ricca. Ulfric has this line. Skyrim was betrayed. The blood of her sons spilled in doom's struggle against fate. And so in death too late. I learned the truth, fed by war, so waxed the power of Alduin World Eater. Wisdom now useless, by God's jest, in this grim mist, together snared. Stormcloak and Imperial, we wander hopeless, waiting for succor. The only reason people think that this is a sign that Ulfric is wrong is because Tolius is too much of a bitch to actually make it to the real afterlife. That leaves just Ricca to carry the slack for him once again. The bitter war of the world beyond was all for naught. We are all trapped in Alduin's web. For our allegiance he cares not, but devours us equally. Doom unescapable, sure as well. He welcomes all heroes to his kingly hall, if we could but reach it. So, in case you don't get it, the Civil War is a bad thing, because it was feeding Alduin's power. They speak of doom because everyone trapped in this mist believes that Alduin is unstoppable. However, that only happens if you actually play through the Civil War prior to this point. All the Empire and Stormcloaks do is engage in minor skirmishes until you actually pick a side, so if you just want to resolve the war at the end, then it's okay. Hey, you want to know what would result in a lot of dead men? The war with the Thalmor that we're supposed to be fighting instead of the Civil War. Can you imagine the Thalmor's surprise when they realized that they'd written their own destruction in their meddling? Wait, no, stop. Do not tell me about the Tower's theory and how the Thalmor actually wanted to destroy the world and how they totally knew about Alduin and wanted to get him powered up from Nord Souls. Again, that's just not fun. Boxing in the Thalmor is yet another group bent on destroying the world to the powers of racial supremacy is boring. It's the same old shit as just saying the Thalmor are behind everything, but this time you drew connections to all the past games. Remember all those towers in the past games? Wait, was Numidium the tower or Dyrini Tower the tower? Was Akulakon the tower or just Red Mountain in general? Wait, is the tower tied to the heart of Lorcan or really just tall structures? Like old towers, obvious. So obvious, in fact, they reused the asset for Dyrini Tower and ESO. But it's not actually tied to the heart of Lorcan, at least not obviously so. It's also pretty structurally liberal to say that mountains are towers. Part of what differentiates towers from other structures is the relationship between the height and the width of the structure. Towers are tall, but narrow, which is why we generally don't look at a mountain and say, I want to climb to the top of that tower. I have another question. Do all Nords go to heaven? By that I mean, does the fact that we see someone in Sovereign Guard by proxy imply that they are an honorable and valorous Nord hero? There's a book in Blood Moon which states that any Nord who dies valiantly in honorable combat goes to Sovereign Guard. However, that book also states that dismemberment is a small price to pay for eternity and isn't written by a Nord, and it glosses over how Rolf the Large actually told people about how he got into Sovereign Guard. Just saying, wouldn't be the first time I've heard about somebody outside a racial group encouraging reckless behaviors out of malice. I'm giving it too much credit, however. You actually can meet the NPC who wrote this book in Blood Moon. It's also almost assuredly a rare case of Immel lore, given that he started at Bethesda during side quests for Blood Moon. Anyways, the reason I bring this up is because a lot of people don't. Hey Ulfric, glad you could make it to the afterlife. Now sure, technically to enter the Hall of Valor, you have to pass a trial with Thune. However, I have a sneaking suspicion Thune tends to throw fights occasionally. 
Like, imagine Kodlak actually living through the Silver Hand attack and spending the rest of his years working to cure his lycanthropy, but he died super old and ended up losing his fight with Soon and getting thrown into the elvish afterlife as a punishment. That might explain why there aren't any old folks here. However, you could also just assume that maybe you get reverted to the prime of your life. Don't want to punish the greatest warriors of Skyrim whose only mistake was being so good at fighting that they lived too long. So if Ulfric, Galmar, Ricca, and even Torig are all here, well, that all has some implications. Wait, how is Torig here? He died before Alduin even returned. Unless the implication is that Alduin has been back longer than his appearance at Helgen. I figured the reason Helgen particularly was destroyed had to do with a pissed off Alduin emerging at the throat of the world and then immediately setting off to go destroy the closest human settlement. Wait, why wouldn't Alduin go after High Hrothgar? Kinda hard to miss. Torek being here implies he died under valorous and honorable circumstances. I guess I cannot answer the question of whether or not you get denied access to Sovereign Guard if you get murdered. His skin valorously resisted the blade stabbing into his neck, but fell in battle and gave way, leading to his death. I mean, look at the story of Rolf the Large I just mentioned. The guy got into Sovereign Guard by getting gangbanged by giants. He fought bravely but was quickly killed, implying that he was horribly outmatched. Still, I can't help but feel that if Torig is here, then his duel with Ulfric was probably a lot closer to Ulfric's account than Tolius's. It's not a slam dunk, but then you have to answer why Ulfric's here. Is any old Nord welcome as long as they die valiantly, even stretching that definition? Yingling Half-Troll dies in combat, but he's hardly Sovereign Guard material. Guy was the politician embezzling money from the temple and running a rat-fighting ring. Just saying, I think the walk up to the Hall of Valor is largely ceremonial. If you get into Sovereign Guard in general, I think you're gonna make it. So Ulfric being here implies that, well, clearly the accusations about his character can't all be true. At the very least, it says that Ulfric does genuinely believe in his cause, rather than simply saying the words to manipulate people into furthering his Thalmor agenda, as the Imperials will claim. We use the Clear Sky Shout to reach the Hall of Valor, or you just use the compass. Before we reach it, there's a large whalebone bridge being guarded by Soon, who was appointed by Shore to do worthiness tests. Even though we're just passing through, we still have to pass his test. You can claim your accomplishments to him, which is mostly just saying you completed one of the quest lines, except the Civil War. Well met, Mage of Skyrim. The Nords may have forgotten their forefathers respect for the clever craft, but your comrades thronged this hall. Here in Shore's house, we honor it still. Oh, well, how surprising. Someone who actually appreciates my efforts as... Do not mistake the night shrouded thief stealthily taken spoils, stolen and unearned. For a warrior's plunder won in honorable battle. Your doom already binds you to your dark mistress. Oh, thanks. They really thought people were going to be cool with the nocturnal thing, huh? You trespass here, Shadowwalker. Shore does not know you. Perhaps before the end you will earn the right to pass this way. Welcome I do not offer. Basically, if you're in one of the stealth factions, Soon will dislike you. While if you're a warrior or in the college, Soon will welcome you. I really detest the companion's response. It doesn't actually acknowledge your choice regarding the werewolf issue. I guess making the assumption that the player cured the companions and not just Codlack. It's also a lamer variant of the Prophet's dialogue in Oblivion. At least Soon acknowledges your claims here, whereas you get insulted for every answer other than one. But then you could also respond in Oblivion the Prophet would dynamically respond to your fame levels, having different dialogue for different combinations of fame and infamy. That's the sort of thing you can actually do with a game when it has mechanics. Design dialogue around them. Fame and infamy weren't great, but the fact that they were there allowed Oblivion to do more than Skyrim ever could. If you don't fight soon and just run by him, then you get struck by lightning on the bridge. I guess the god that tricked Ariel truly doesn't actually appreciate the clever ways. This leads into the Hall of Valor, which is well designed, but I feel it misses some opportunities. The Hall is full of generic heroes of Sovereign Guard, who will consistently interrupt dialogue and interject their own voice lines. While there are a couple of lore-significant characters here, I can't help but feel the Hall is a little... empty. You have Erindir, Hunrur, and Nicholas. These guys are a reference to a Blood Moon quest, where four people were trying to find the entrance to Sovereign Guard, but these three had died at the hands of a wizard. Ulfgaard's actually here as well, having been reunited with his friends in their long-sought afterlife. The problem is that they're all Nords with brown hair and slight facial hair wearing scaled armor. No, seriously, these are four different characters, and totally not just slightly edited copies of the same template. I didn't know these guys were even here because they literally look like all the other nameless people wandering around. This is what Ulfgar looked like in Blood Moon, and this is what they made him look like in Skyrim. The sad part is, that armor is in Skyrim. In Morrowind it was called Nordic Ringmail, and it's extremely similar to the Executioner robes. 
Also attending the Hall of Valor is Jurgen Windcaller, who is looking notably young and ungray bearded. For some reason, when you use this tomb after completing the Horn Quest, it gives you a free Dragon Soul. I guess the implication is not that we absorb the essence of Windcaller since he's still here. Windcaller exposes an issue with Sovereign Guard, which is that he has only two lines of dialogue. One of the most important characters in both Skyrim as well as the main quest line and we don't really even get a chance to ask him about his account of, say, the Battle of Red Mountain. My disciples still follow the difficult path. The way of the voice is neither wide nor easy. But if you stray from wisdom, then to sovereign God, the world eats a coward. Fears you. When people say Nords are boring, it's mostly because everything that's been written about the Nords to make them stand out as a culture was neutered in Skyrim. Sadly, this is precedented as Oblivion did not take the opportunity to flesh out Cyrodiil, the Remans, the Iliads, or Tiber Septum, and it will likely be the case that whatever province Elder Scrolls VI takes place in will be cooler today than it will be after the game releases. Let's look at Vivek for a second. I'm going to flash on screen just how much dialogue was written for Vivek, and deservedly so. He's one of the most significant characters in Morrowind's history and main quest. You can also ask him questions. Did he murder Indoral Nerevar? He says no. He explains how that story came to be, and provides the player with two accounts of Nerevar's death. Does he know what happened to the Dwimmer? You can ask him that, he was there. Hell, Vivek has a mortal fought in the same battle on the opposing side of Jurgen Windcaller. Yet Jurgen has no insights, no new shouts to teach, no meanings of words of power to impart. It doesn't really even seem logical that Windcaller would enjoy the festivity of the Hall of Valor. Wouldn't it be cool if there was an outlook in the Hall of Valor where things were quiet and they appreciated the breeze blowing in? And this is where all the Greybeards and Sovereign Guard like to hang out. Come to think of it, did they intentionally exclude the Greybeards from Sovereign Guard? Hard to imagine they would ever die in combat given their lifestyle. Still, Kine was supposed to be the wife of Shore, so it's hard to imagine he would just deny her adherence because they died of a heart attack in their sleep. Wait, dying of a heart attack is dying in battle against your own cardiovascular system. Shore would probably appreciate that one. Olaf One-Eye is also here, he being the guy that defeated Numenex and who Skavnir wrote about being a tyrant. I even claim that Olaf was actually the dragon Numenex in our revised version of his stories, just so that we could put on a festival in solitude. So, uh, I have a question. Why is Olaf a Draugr? When we're looking for the true story, true in quotes as with most things, we encounter King Olaf's corpse in Deadman's Respite. Didn't we retcon the Draugr to all be servants of the Dragon Cult? All great questions Skyrim will never answer. The last guest of honor is Iskramor, a minor character referenced in the College of Winterhold and major character, at least in name, during the Companions questline. He also has very little to say. Would be awfully inconvenient to get his perspective on Sarthal, or the Falmer, or the reason why he left at Mora, or that stupid storm matronic bear that ESO came up with. Nope, we've got shit to do and he's pushing us towards it. Those three ancient dragonborn that fought Alduin are here in the Hall of Valor. Under command from Shore, nobody was actually allowed to go deal with that Alduin problem outside. I don't know why, it's not like I'm that necessary. All it takes is Dragonrend and I see three people who already know it, plus other people versed in the Thume that could learn it. It's often pointed out that Shore is absent from the Hall of Valor. Some people interpret meanings from that, like that we're something called the Shezarine, or the mortal incarnation of the spirit of Shore. I personally think the Bethesda were just being, um, cowards, but in as, like, polite a way as possible. Look, if Bethesda were scared to write dialogue and answers for Jurgen Windcaller and Yskrimor, let alone portray many of the Nords who have been in the series so far, like Captain Bird, then they're certainly not going to be brave enough to actually try and even bother portraying Shore. That's just like asking for a 30-minute tongue-lashing from lore-obsessed nerds like yours truly. And there it is, friends! The ugly truth. Sovngarde is a visual spectacle, selling the idea of the Nordic afterlife, but it can only appeal to people who aren't actually paying attention anymore or don't care. I've heard two accounts of how long it takes people to complete Skyrim's main quest. It's either 2 to 3 hours or 15 to 30 hours. Bethesda themselves apparently held internal speedrun competitions for the main quest that clocked in at 2 hours and 16 minutes. Yet I think for the most part, people playing through the main quest line are sunk so far back in their chairs that they're just trying to get it over with and don't care anymore, or simply weren't paying attention in the first place. For people who were driven to apathy, the only thing left to stir them is visual spectacle. Why do you think people talk about Blackreach and Sovngarde? Because it pierces the veil of apathy and surprises you just enough to get you interested again, but that wears off. The characters and world is just so static. It's hard to say anybody in this questline actually underwent any kind of character arc, not even the player. Delphine and Esburn represent the Blades, past and present. They have every ounce of character in the early part of the questline sucked out of them and replaced with caricatures. Neither of these people have ever had conflict with the Greybeards. They only think they have because now, instead of representing the characters and their experience, 
They represent the concept of the blades. It's as though they've completely forgotten about the Thalmor. It's the same exact thing with the Greybeards. There's a decently high chance Arngear has never even heard of the Blades until the moment he suddenly intuited their existence, and resumed grudges that would have died centuries prior. Arngear doesn't represent his character, he now represents the idea of the Greybeards. There is a singular moment in the questline where Arngear is actually a character, and then it's over and he's back to being the collective psychic gestalt of the faction again. The ancient dragonborn are barely characters, more living plot devices existing purely to say three words so that we can gain a new ability to make dragon fights even easier. There is zero difference in the story if reading the Elder Scroll just taught us the Dragonrin shout. We already knew Alduin was sent forward in time, we already knew the effect Dragonrin had on dragons, and since we already defeated Alduin once, we don't actually need them in Sovereign Guard either. I don't think they should be cut, but we definitely should have learned more about these characters from playing the game than just seeing their representations carved on Alduin's wall at the start of the third act. That leaves three characters, all of them dragons. With our posse at hand, that being us, the Ancients, and Thune, we use Clear Sky's shout to clear the fog, to very little effect. The scene comes off more that Alduin is annoyed that he has to keep putting the fog up, rather than what we're doing is actually stopping him. Alduin is, you know, an immortal dragon. He could just keep putting the fog up and doing his thing. Then the reckless Nords go out to fight him, get killed one at a time in the mist, and he wins. He's still a flying dragon, even in Sovereign Guard. I don't see any reason why Alduin would attack us here. But he does, leading to the big epic boss fight that we already had. It's the same. Easier, actually, since there's five of us now. Alduin has no new moves, no allies, not even new mechanics. Sad thing is, it was probably either lose Skodolphin or not have a more complex fight. I doubt Bethesda wanted a repeat of Blood Moon where players suddenly being thrown into an extremely difficult and inescapable gauntlet. If Alduin is harder, then some players might not be able to complete the sequence. That's a joke, of course, because you would be hard-pressed to softlock your game even on the easiest difficulty setting. Let's do some comparisons. The final sequence of the Shivering Isles is a climatic battle, which eventually ends in us dueling a Daedric Prince. Jigalag is largely just a bigger version of the enemies we've already fought. Same thing with Knights of the Nine, although in that one we got to take our militant order with us to fight our foe. So the quest line building up to the Knights at least has a payoff. Oblivion's main quest ends in a large battle in the Imperial City. It's the least mechanically involved final quest of the series, but arguably that's because it's been trying to keep the tempo rolling since the Battle of Bruma. Mankar Cameron was the real final boss, and now it's Martin's turn to have his climax. Blood Moon ended in the aforementioned Gotland. It was a decent ending to the expansion, especially since there were two conflicting sides to play. If you were a member of the Skull, it was about survival, while if you were a werewolf, it was about proving yourself to Hearsene. The Tribunal's questline ended in a lengthy dungeon in a final fight against one of the titular members of the Tribunal, one of whom had been present throughout the entire questline and had undergone a, you know, character arc. You can clearly see Almalexia's downfall, how much of her identity is staked on her powers, and, and now that she's losing them, how she's gone a bit crazy. Morrowind's main quest is, and this is going to surprise some of you, the second worst ending of the series. Not because of context, but due to ostensibly being incomplete. Arguably it had the opportunity to be the greatest, at least with the story preceding it, but there really wasn't time to finish it. And I said as much in my Morrowind video, what a novelty, right? That analysis can be more than just sycophantic praise or unfair hysteria? Speaking of, not really, but how else do you transition from that? Alduin is not a character. Maybe he has the most license to be that way. Alduin should be a force of nature, the most primal of dragons in the sense of being rawly what he represents, but he's not. He could barely get a kite flying, let alone knock anything over. He's just not intelligent, nor is he particularly strong. He shows no signs of tactical acumen. His strategy is to spawn dragons and then send them one at a time to go fight the dragonborn. That's just stupid. The only reason the Imperial Legion isn't even bothering to fight the dragons is because somehow, they don't perceive them as enough of a threat. Skyrim's practically begging to be conquered by the dragons. If I was Alduin, I would have my forces simultaneously raise every single village in Skyrim. I would instruct lesser dragons to avoid confrontations with the dragonborn, and in situations where their soul is at risk to retreat. Have all the local villagers die fighting and then absorb that sudden swell of souls. Rinse and repeat until all that's left is the cities. At that point, faith in the dragonborn will be non-existent. Refugees will blame them for not being there when they were needed, and Alduin will have resurrected so many dragons at that point that the dragonborn can't possibly hope to defeat them all. Then issue all of the clans an ultimatum, serve their new dragon overlords, or have their cities destroyed. There should be enough clans clamoring for power that in the end you'll have a core population of Nordic slaves to rebuild your civilization. Who exactly is going to stop the dragons? The Empire? Tolia says most of their forces are marshaled near the Aldmeri Dominion's border. Most of Skyrim's neighbors are not in positions to be able to help much. The Dwemer are gone. This should be an easy win for Alduin. 
So what was Bethesda's mistake here? Well, it's an unfortunately common one in fantasy, which is that the process of trying to create the baddest villain of all time, you don't create enough inhibitors to explain why the forces of evil aren't already in charge of everything. So for instance, we see the event that allows Mehrunes Dagon to invade Tamriel occur. We are shown the limitations of Oblivion Gates, that you need Mythic Dawn agents to actually open them, and that with sufficient military force they can be closed. In Morrowind, we are similarly shown what Dagothar's restrictions are. The ghost fence is a literal barrier, slowing down the blight from spreading. The buoyant armatures are attempting to contain the spread of the blight through animals. The sixth house is outside of that containment, but is being fought by the Ordinators. Dagothar has the heart and two of the tools, but not Wraithguard. The Tribunal have Wraithguard, but are dwindling in power due to not having access to the heart. It's an ongoing stalemate that Dagothar is gradually winning. It's easy to understand his philosophy and goals. He's going to drive the Outlanders out of Vardenfell, and that's probably going to include a lot of Dunmercy and his race traders as well. Then he's going to take over Morrowind. Then he's going to try and keep expanding, threatening the Empire. Then you have Alduin. His problem's logistical. Most of his subordinates are gone, and he has to rebuild from basically nothing, but he's otherwise free. He has unrestricted access to a renewing font of souls, and he has the ability to resurrect his fallen comrades if they weren't slain by Dragonborn. Skyrim only has seven people capable of using Thum against him. Four of them are pacifists who will not fight dragons. One of them has only had basic training. That leaves Parthenax and us, both of whom are flight risks. Magic in Nordic culture has been on such a decline that most of Skyrim's primary magical institutions are foreign isolationists living in a low population settlement. Alduin has to make many mistakes for the sake of the plot. If the game designers need 50 random dragon encounters, then that means that the writers have to justify why those random dragon encounters are occurring. What the writers did have the luxury of was creating new scenes for Alduin, which they didn't do. Alduin does not get a line until Quest 7, and even then he just insults us for taking the title of Dragon without actually knowing his language. He appears again in Quest 13 and is slain in Quest 17. When he dies, we don't absorb his soul. That's actually a good idea. Imagine if we slew the greatest of the dragons and it was like, here's three dragon souls. It also leaves us fade up to interpretation. Dragons don't just die, their soul usually goes somewhere, either to another dragon or into their bones. No bones or soul left, so we can assume that either Akatosh grabbed him, or that he's simply in timeout until Alduin's needed to actually do his job of destroying the world. With our work done, Soon congratulates us, teaches us a shout to summon a hero of Sovngarde, and all those named characters start heading to the Hall of Valor. We're sent back to Tamriel, arriving at the Throat of the World. There's a bunch of dragons here who somehow have already heard the news about Alduin. It is cool they don't do it in the universal language of mortals since it means you can look up what they're saying. That leaves us with Parthenax. I'd say he's the real character of this story because he doesn't have a cadre of dragons that he represents as a concept, which is why he has decided to set out to recruit some dragons into his new order, because he understands now that as a Skyrim character he needs to represent the concept of a faction rather than himself. That's not a joke, Parthenax is departing for the final time. Shame we can't then go to the Blades and lie about his death. What? Go up to the throat of the world and look, he's not there anymore. It's not like the player has the ability to lie and die- oh. No way. Odaving will offer his allegiance, giving us the ability to summon a dragon in fights. So the Blades don't have an issue with Odaving, who was loyal to Alduin until yesterday. He's also technically a level scaled reward. As in, at this point his level is locked in place based on ours. And that's it. Skyrim's main quest has concluded. What have we actually accomplished? Yes, there is a lore impact of souls in Sovngarde not being consumed, but Sovngarde is not a part of the normal play area. If we assume our motivation was to stop villages from getting Helgens, well, there's still more dragons out there, infinitely so. In essence, Skyrim is not meaningfully changed as a consequence of completing the story. I have to wonder when the guards acknowledge our accomplishment, how do they know? Which of the main quest characters that would even know what happened has loose lips? You've shown yourself mighty, both in voice and deed. In order to defeat Alduin, you have gained mastery of dreadful weapons. Now it is up to you to decide what to do with your power and skill. Will you be a hero whose name is remembered in song throughout the ages? Or will your name be a curse to future generations? The latter, Arngir. What a weird way to end the questline. How does a story that ends with us fighting a dragon that represents destruction end so anticlimactically? It's weird too, because out of all the Elder Scrolls main quests, this is the one people talk about doing before saying that Elder Scrolls 6 shouldn't have a main quest. I disagree just because Skyrim's main quest was a failure doesn't mean Bethesda should abandon the idea. That said, I'm having a hard time coming up with ways to improve this questline that doesn't start with the words redraft. Perhaps it's a consequence of putting too much focus on the pre-production of making the dragons look cool and not enough focus on the pre-production of the storyline. It's weird that a questline that was so long has so little going on in it. 
You should not have three quests about the Thalmor and then completely drop that plot point. The Blade should have been an offshoot questline. It starts in the main quest and might occasionally provide solutions but otherwise functions like just another faction in the game. If the player wants to know more about the Blades due to playing the previous games or wants to learn more about the Thalmor, that's the space you do it in. Once you remove the Blade section, then the main quest is only 13 parts. I say we also combine the last three quests since it's one continuous sequence and it's about as long as the Elder Knowledge was anyways, and now it's only 11 quests. Once you get a bird's eye view of the main quest, you can see the problem. Let's compare that with Oblivion. If we go through the same quest combination process, you can justify combining the Defense of Bruma and the Great Gate, as well as cutting the Imperial Dragon Armor quest since it's not really part of the story, which means the quest line has 15 parts. Those parts send us all over the place and provide us ample opportunities to really see the world. The first four quests in Skyrim are all in Whiterun Hold. If you go by the numbers, Oblivion's main quest involves so much more exposure to the world of Cyrodiil than Skyrim, and it has more diversity of content. It would not even be fair for Skyrim to compare it to Morrowind and just how much of the world you have to interact with during that main quest line. It's not that Skyrim doesn't have enough quests, it wouldn't be fixed by stapling a couple more Nordic burial crypt quests to it. It's that Skyrim's main quest isn't involved enough in Skyrim, and I think Nesmith and Coleman learned this lesson which they demonstrated in the Dragonborn DLC, which heavily involves you in its world during the questline. Fallout 4, which was designed by Pagliarulo, half learned this lesson. It's like you get a tour of the world before it goes back to being an insular conflict involving a small spattering of characters again. So, Skyrim's over, right? Well, obviously not given how much runtime's left. I find myself having only a single question at the end of the main quest, and that's that I want to know what a Dragonborn actually is. Thankfully, there's a DLC that will definitely explore that topic. Skyrim is a game of side content. I apologize, as I am about to say the word quest a lot. Technically, that is the Elder Scrolls formula, but it's obvious just by playing the game that the designers looked at Oblivion's side quest situation and decided to try and do better. Oblivion was itself a change from Morrowind, which was also a big change from Daggerfall. Daggerfall had 227 quests, however the vast majority of these are actually just quest templates which are reused in order to fill out the world map. They were a basic model for a Radiant Story, but because they were entirely textual, the dialogue could be far more specific. Morrowind differed due to Todd Howard taking over by switching the game to a fully handcrafted style. Morrowind, including its expansions, had 483 handmade quests. Discluding the expansions still has the total above 400. Oblivion would slash that number in half at 274 quests including DLC and 223 without. However, that obviously is not the full story. After all, Morrowind technically has less quests than Daggerfall's infinite quests, but they, on a per-quest basis, are higher quality due to being handcrafted. Even Todd Howard agrees with the premise that the best quests are written by humans. And we, we started the game by making them all very, very uh, random slash dynamic, and you do see the holes in that. It, it doesn't tell despite its name, Radiant Story, it doesn't tell a good story. Uh, you know, good stories are still told by good writers who put them together, and we do most of our quest lines that way. But Sure. In the same vein, Oblivion has fewer quests than Morrowind, but they, on a per-quest basis, are generally better than Morrowind quests. A big change involved slashing the total faction count in half. You now only had the main quest, the Fighters, Mages, and Thieves guilds, the Morag Tong became the Dark Brotherhood, and the Imperial Legion became the Arena. The Three Great Houses, the Tribunal Temple, and the Imperial Cult questlines were not replaced in Oblivion. There were twice as many Daedric quests, but no Vampire quests. Comparing content is difficult because it would be largely cherry-picking dictated by whatever message you wanted to send. Comparing the best of one game to the worst of another, etc. Is a selection of memorable Oblivion quests worth the sacrifice of the Great Houses? I would say no because I found playing the Great House as a far more memorable experience than the time I tried to complete a list of best Oblivion quests. It is important to remember that Bethesda's staff count also grew between games. Daggerfall did not have credited quest designers. Morrowind's quest designers were credited alongside the writers, but the total count appeared to be only three. Oblivion had six dedicated quest designers as well as a lead. 
Skyrim, meanwhile, had two co-lead and one senior designer, and five dedicated quest designers. Yet Skyrim only has 273 quests. If we take all that information in mind, Oblivion actually quartered the number of quests from Morrowind, since it not only cut the number in half, but had twice as many designers to boot. By that same logic, Skyrim again cut the number of quests by 30%. Now this is all very reductive. Quests are not made by humans just staring at a computer screen for a set amount of time while a progress bar fills. You cannot say that Morrowind would have 40,000 quests if there were 300 people in the quest design division instead of 3. However, I do hope that this demonstrates my general point. Oblivion should have brought both quality and quantity to the table over Morrowind, or at the very least, matched quantity. And Skyrim should bring both quality and quantity to the table over Oblivion. But does it? Well, to be honest, I don't think so. I mean, there's the same number of factions, most with less content than their Oblivion counterparts. The names are different, but otherwise it's the same. The Imperials and Stormcloaks are the same faction questline, which itself is a surrogate replacement for the Arena, similar to how the Arena was a surrogate replacement for Morrowind's Imperial Legion. The Daedric quests are also largely the same, and for the most part there seems to be a similar number of notable side quests in Skyrim as was true with Oblivion. Why? Not only are there more designers, but all of these people are also experienced. There is only one member of this department who hadn't worked on a prior game at Bethesda, and most of them have prior experience working specifically on Elder Scrolls. They are also well into the era of voice-acted content, so if anything, developing Skyrim should have been their prime time. Well, the answer is that Radiant Story happened. Lead designer Bruce Nesmith detailed in a talk that a lot of effort in pre-production for the quest design guys was in their new Radiant Story system. And this is a diagram that uh, Todd Howard, game director for the studio, uh, put up for us in the very, very early days. And this kind of drove a lot of what we were looking at and focusing on and talking about for the next year or so. The game was about the player. The game only understood the player. That's the only thing they had available to understand is what the technology could support at the time. Then as games uh, got more sophisticated, Morrowind and Oblivion, the player was understood by and understood other objects in the world. Those are the lines radiating out from the player. And what he wanted us to do, the challenge that he put before us, was to make the rest of the world understand itself in the context of the player. The player is still the centerpiece here. He's still in that middle of that diagram. But now, all the pieces need to understand themselves in relationship to the player. While the programmers were prototyping the engine and the artists were developing concepts, these guys were building the framework of Radiant Story. Maybe I've spoiled this already, but this did not pay off as well as they had probably hoped. Not only are Radiant Quests tied to factions, they're also tied to the world. Bounties given by innkeepers are Radiant Quests, for example. There is some good of the system. This is also the framework Bethesda used to create a lot of new NPC interactions. The action, then, is going to be that the two bystanders begin to fight over the item, and those optional bystanders in the guard will stand around and gawk about it. Now this was kind of a medium side in terms of the, uh, the scale of your action, because it's kind of a big deal. You drop an item and suddenly half the town comes over and starts arguing about it. That's something that was kind of new and fresh. Plenty of games, you drop an item on the ground, somebody might throw a line at you. But now where they actually react and interact with the object that you dropped on the ground like that. There are also a lot of things to appreciate about the system. Oblivion is a very meme-worthy game in terms of NPC interactions, and while Skyrim gets its fair share of this action, it is clear that Bethesda was actively trying to improve this element of their games. I think it was worthwhile to do this, but it also means that instead of using their pre-production time to develop more amazing stories and questlines, we basically just got more mediocre Oblivion content. Radiant Story is just a method of conditionalizing quests. They wanted a system where, if a target was in a dungeon, that the game could pick a dungeon you have never done before. But the reality of that system is this world where details are telepathically implied to the player. So, to set the tone, we will start with a lovely letter. This is a quest in Riverwood you receive when talking to either Findel or Sven. Both are competing for the affections of Camilla Valerius, and each will ask you to give Camilla a fake letter and claim it's from the other. Unfortunately, it's a stacked choice. 
Findel is a skill trainer and follower, meaning you can get up to level 50 in archery for free. In addition, he is a wood elf with white hair, which means that the only appropriate thing is to recruit him as a follower and then either induct him into the blades or enlist him to run my farm. I'm just saying, Findel is probably a lot older than Camilla. So why start here? Well, most side quests in Oblivion and Morrowind do not involve choice. Skyrim side quests do occasionally involve choices, but they're almost always just an identical binary. You can pick Sven, or you can pick Findel. The chosen relationship does not advance as a consequence. Both men will give you 25 gold. Both men will become your companions. Findel being the archery trainer is nice, but it drops off in usefulness. It is the superficial illusion of choice. It is very easy to create an alternate branching path in a quest if that branching path is right at the end. And you will notice in Skyrim that most of its branching paths tend to be at the end. When you make choices in an RPG, you have to consider the downstream consequences of those choices. That's the kind of thing developers like BioWare and CD Projekt Red focus on in their games. There is no downstream effect of a love letter, nor any of Skyrim's branched quests. As a point of comparison, Paranoia is a fan favorite of the series, as it's the most developed side quest in Oblivion. What happens, the reward, and the morality of your decisions can vary greatly based on your decisions throughout the quest. There are no long-term downstream consequences of Paranoia, but it's still celebrated simply for being a quest worth doing a second time. You would think, like a sort of design version of Survival of the Fittest, that Skyrim would be full of quests like this, but it's not. What I am going to focus on is a selection of quests that have stood out to players over the years. This does not account for all the random stuff you can find out in the world, because this video is already long enough without comprehensively examining random side content. Sorry, Anska. The goal, rather, is to analyze the cream of the crop for Skyrim side content. The place to start would be a duo of quests which are the only ones in the game that are actually about the Forsworn. There are lots of quests involving the Forsworn, generally as enemies, but these two are the only ones to treat them like actual people with goals and motivations. Now, this is unusual because there is a lot of attention paid to this group. However, the Forsworn are an invention of Skyrim, which says a lot. They went to the effort of creating a distinct racial group of people, gave them a short history, tied them as a primary party to the Markarth incident that led to the Civil War and thus Alduin's return, but didn't actually think to give them any content. To most people, they're just flavored, slightly more dangerous bandits. Arguably, they're only slightly more developed than the Goblins from Oblivion, or the Falmer in the base version of Skyrim. Sad thing is, they repeated this mistake in Fallout 4 with the Gunners. I think the goal with the Forsworn was to flesh out the Civil War. Ulfric Stormcloak went in, oppressed a native group of people, took their culture away, and denied them independence. Can you see what they were going for there? But that was it. That was the extent of interest at Bethesda in this faction, to be context for another storyline that had most of its quests cut. I've got an idea. Instead of the quest in the Civil War mirroring the Riften quest to oust corruption, how about giving both sides a quest in the Reach? At a point in the war, Tolius and Ulfric decide it's time to deal with the Forsworn attacks on their soldiers. They offer a guarantee that Markarth will be allowed to have a recognized Breton king, but that they have to be a vassal to whichever side you're on. From there, you have many opportunities to make the Forsworn an actual facet of Skyrim's story. The Forsworn conspiracy begins when you first enter Markarth. You've just loaded in when you witness a man stab a woman in the back in the marketplace, and then die fighting. People panic about Forsworn being in the city, and the guards quickly start taking control of the situation. It is impossible to miss this scene, which means that Bethesda is right away establishing that this is an important quest for Markarth. We get approached by a man named Eltris who tells us that we dropped a note, which instructs us to meet him at the Shrine of Talos. Eltris says that his father was killed in a Forsworn attack and is desperate to find out what is going on, offering, of course, to pay us. This is one of the few instances where the lengthy time gap in the history actually adds to a story rather than detract from it. It has been 25 years since the Markarth incident, which is more than enough time for Eltris to have been just a boy when his father, who owned a mine, was assassinated by the Forsworn. This is also definitely a step up in terms of immediately establishing intrigue and stakes, and I think is a big part of the reason why the Forsworn Conspiracy is positively remembered. The place to start with this investigation is, of course, Margaret. 
Margaret is the woman that was just murdered. However, she is not hard scripted to die in the sequence, meaning that if you are quick enough, you can actually save her. However, let's be honest, she dies during everyone's first visit to the city. You would have to have advanced knowledge of this event to be fast enough to stop this from happening. Now, let's compare this with Hrogar's execution when you first enter Solitude. You are given ample time to understand what is about to happen, learn why it is happening, and make a decision whether you support it. Yet Hrogar is destined to die, no matter how hard you work to intervene. It's actually amazing how these two scenes contrast. How many of you even noticed I used the wrong name when referring to Rogvir? If Margaret is alive, we can persuade her to tell us her purpose in being in Markarth. And if she's not, then we have to go to the extra effort of breaking into her room to find her journal. This is actually surprisingly competent. I would expect both paths to be of equal difficulty, yet they're actually rewarding us for saving this character. Skyrim has two persuasion options which are flagged as impossible to fail, and three options which are numerically impossible to fail because they require a speech skill level that is lower than default. This is one of those options, as Margaret will spill for only having a speech skill of 10 when the default is 15. Margaret is in town under orders from General Tolius, assigned to investigate the local treasury house and clan Silverblood. Apparently she was even hoping to get the deed to send a mine, which again is interesting. This side quest is informing us about the Imperials. We know that Tolius is ruthless, but employing an agent to steal a mine deed from an allied territory that's on the verge of defection to the Stormcloaks is actually interesting. This quest is important for painting a picture of both sides of the Civil War and why the Forsworn hate both of them. One of the local guards warns us to stop asking questions. This aids the mystery by making us wonder what exactly the big secret is that the guards are suppressing. We learned that Wei Lin, the attacker, was a smelter at the mine and lived down in the public housing area. We either have to acquire a key or break into his room, providing options again based on our skill set. It's basic, but still. We find a note in his room from a mysterious inn character. <laughs> I just... Come, come on, you, you know the joke already. Telling Wei Lin to strike fear in the heart of the Nords. It is strange to me that the note says he'll know what to do. Margaret was a very specific target to leave up to interpretation. When we leave, we are approached again, this time by a man named Dreisten rather than a guard. No matter what, Dreisten picks a fist fight with us. We have to brawl with him as attacking him nets us a bounty. I'm on the fence with this one. Brawling is a very undercooked mechanic that is generally unfun for most playstyles to choke point people into, but I do like that the guards will lie and call this self-defense situation murder. If he survives the fight, he'll tell us who In is. If he doesn't, he has a note leading us to the same place. A mild pacing issue. We aren't even given the chance to find out who this In character is before we're just told. It reminds me of In Tribunal when we're looking for someone under the pseudonym of H, except there are two big suspects in Mournhold whose names start with H, so we have to investigate both to find out which one wants us dead. Our man is Nepos the Nose, who has apparently been handing out the orders. Eltris thinks we should investigate Clan Silverblood next, since he and Margaret seem to be both under the impression that they're in on this conspiracy. But joke's on you, I don't just read the wiki because the wiki, for some reason, thinks you talk to Thonar instead of Nepos first. Nepos is transparent about the whole situation, mostly because he's confident he can just kill us. I am not impressed with this. The idea is that the Silverbloods were in control of the Forsworn and using them as a cudgel to build their empire. But if the Forsworn are starting to act independently of the Silverblood interests, then shouldn't Nepos consider offering us an opportunity to work for them instead of just trying to have us killed? The conspiracy seems to be largely over, so why cover it up? We grab his journal because everybody in this world writes down their dirty secrets just in case they die before they can tell us specifically. Then we head over to the treasury house and steal Thonar's journal. I mean, you can. We again either need to break into his room or pass a persuasion check, but Thonar doesn't seem alarmed. We can ask him about multiple facets of the investigation, when suddenly the treasury house is attacked and Thonar's wife is killed by the Forsworn. Thonar says that, yeah, he had been controlling the Forsworn by holding their king hostage, but that they are now out of control, which again reaffirms what I just said about Nepos. Unfortunately, Thonar does not figure that since the Forsworn also want us dead, that we could ally in this situation, so we have to head back to Eltris, who is dead with three city guards at the shrine. 
the guards are in on this arrangement and this is where the quest really shits the bed. Markarth has no captain of the guard, and the guards should be loyal to Jarl Igmund, unless the implication is that the Silverbloods managed to bribe all of the guards individually. It's not impossible, but I consider this a weak point in the quest. Thongvor Silverblood is destined to replace Jarl Igmund should the Stormcloaks take the city, but I personally would give him the role as the captain of the guard first so that it is obvious how this arrangement works. Because otherwise Thongvor just sits in Understone Keep all day, browsing Facebook and telling anyone who listens to him about the merits of Ulfric Stormcloak. You see, Riften is a similarly corrupt city, but it's easier to understand the dynamic. Layla Lawgiver is a puppet Jarl being controlled by her council, who all answer to Maven Blackbriar. Maven will take up the Jarl ship should the Imperials take the city, but she's more than comfortable letting Layla hold that position as she does actually have a business empire to manage. The corruption we see in the Riften Guards actually does run all the way up to the top. The Markarth Guards tell us that they're going to pin all the recent murders on us and then throw us in Sydney Mine for life. We can resist, but the Guards at this point are scripted to only respond to us by placing us under arrest. You are basically barred out of Markarth until you're prepared to continue the quest, even if you liberate the city for the Stormcloaks. This is because the game is trying to force us into jail so that it can continue with part 2 of this story. It's a shame that a quest that did so well early on contrived a situation like this. It has to be this way in order for No One Escapes Sidna Mine to function as a story. Plus I think Bethesda is aware of just how hesitant most people are to actually go to jail in their games. I'm not a fan, but I'm also not bursting with ideas on how to fix this, other than offering players the opportunity to sneak into the mine to find Madinok. Just make it clear that he's the next person we need to talk to, and there is a convenient method to visit him, by being arrested. So, we're thrown in jail. The way Sydney Mine operates is that all the prisoners have to dig up a quota of ore, or they don't get fed. I find this quest less impressive, because I think it's for people who don't have magic. I would maybe reincorporate the Slave Bracers from Morrowind, which in lore prevent magic use, and I would really sell that that was what was happening. Don't just copy the idea, call them Slave Bracers, say they were imported from Morrowind. Really emphasize that what the Imperials and Nords are doing here is fucked up. Our first objective is to meet Madinak, although we're told we have to get past his bodyguard first. We're given a few options brawling for it, intimidating him, persuading him, or getting him a shiv. The shiv route is the longest, but is also the only way you'll get past him if you cannot win a brawl or pass the persuasion checks. Also, why do these guys use shivs when pretty much everyone here has a pickaxe? Shivs are popular in modern prisons because they are weapons the guards have a hard time finding, but by design, Sidna Mine puts weapons in everyone's hands and the guards don't perform searches. The problem with this quest is that it pretty much all hinges on dialogue options at this stage, which is not the strong suit of Skyrim. I guess since there are no journals to steal, they ran out of ideas at this point, and it's rather amazing how quickly it all peters out. Madinax all, what do you want? If you say revenge, then a fight starts and you have to kill him, then escape on your own. I doubt anybody ever really does this, though. Madinak tries to impart on us the effect the Nords have had on the Forsworn, but it comes off all the more contrived as you're reminded of how you were forced into this situation. To make a comparison, there is a scene in Red Dead Redemption 2 where Arthur's knocked out and has his money stolen, despite foreseeing the trap that was about to play out, and despite other instances of this not occurring, this time the game wrested control from me to contrive the situation the designers really wanted to have happen. If this was a scene that was only possible if you went to jail naturally after completing the Forsworn Conspiracy quest, it would actually be pretty amazing. Imagine for a second that the game kept a tally of every single person who died during the Forsworn Conspiracy investigation, and then when you found Eltris dead, it would apply that number times 1000 as a bounty on you. However, it still operates like a normal bounty. You can bribe the guards at the Shrine of Talus to let you go, because clearly their allegiance can be bought. You can use your privileges as a thane if you manage to complete the quest with only two people dying. You can pay the full bounty, or you can pay half if you've established your Thieves Guild connections in Markarth. However, the players who paid attention know that Madanak is in jail, and if they want to continue the story, they will have to meet him. Maybe you sneak into jail, bribe the Warden, or use your Thieves Guild or Stormcloak connections to get inside. Or you infiltrate it the classic way, getting arrested but lose all of your equipment. Then when you meet Madinak, it comes off more naturally. 
You have seen the institutional corruption in Markarth and may even be a part of it. Madanek might respond to your decisions, being hostile to you if you're the Thane or a Stormcloak. Sidna Mine can get away with being much simpler as long as it's a fun quasi-secret to be found rather than a forced sequence. Madanek wants us to learn of the injustices of the Nords by speaking to a man named Brag. Brag wants to hear our story first. This gives us a little wiggle room to define our character. Do you have any family? Anyone waiting for you on the outside? Uh, yeah, I have a wife. Her name is Yasolda, and I drink her blood every night. She runs some kind of side business, but won't tell me what it is, despite me telling her about all the criminal activities I do. She does still find time to cook for me, though, which I think is unfair for her, because I'm already drinking her blood, and, well... Anyways, she didn't bat an eye when I told her I was marrying someone else. We technically have an adopted daughter named Lucia, who refuses to stop begging for money in Whiterun. I have told her multiple times where my house is and offered to take her to it, but she still won't get off the homeless grind set. I have a cat boy named Jazargo, his Daedric armor isn't the only thing with sharp edges, and a pet dragon named Odaving who has no genitals. Plus, I run a bunch of organizations that are really like an extended family. Here's the companions, we used to play with each other's red rockets there. Here's the College of Winterhold where you can summon extra fun. Here's the Thieves Guild where I learned to undress people without their knowledge. And here's the Tight Leather Club, also known as the Dark Brotherhood. I'm also an avowed Stormcloak, but obviously I don't run that one. I have titles and properties in most of Skyrim's holds, and... Okay, so you can't tell them any of that. Not even the basic thing that's actually in Skyrim, which is that you can get married. Which is unusual because no dialogue option you pick actually changes things. It's all just text. You could just include a line saying that you're married. I'll just assume it wasn't in the game yet when they made this quest. Anyways, Brake tells us about how he was arrested for speaking to Madanak once and then his little Nord girl was executed when she pleaded the Jarl kill her instead. Was that Igmund? We need details, man. Anyways, they executed her and they threw him in here for life anyways. I'm not Madanak! Really? Well, they gave you the same voice actor, so maybe they thought you were. I was never a leader of the Forsworn. The only anger I can justify is my own. But every family in the Reach has a story like mine. There are no innocent onlookers in this struggle, just the guilty and the dead. I really like that line. It is a surprisingly nuanced take that is made all the more worse by the fact that we are about to conclude the last ounce of story content for this faction. Madanek wants a show of trust and wants us to shiv a snitch, then we'll be good to escape. So he's just been sitting on the escape route from the mine for what reason? Today isn't that much more special than any other day he could have decided to lead his men out of the city. He will say that our investigation on the surface reminded him that he should be on the surface fighting instead of trying to pull strings from prison. So he gives us our stuff and we escape through the Dwemer ruins they managed to dig into. The concept of Sidna Mine is thought out well enough to explain why the guards didn't know they had done this since the guards regulate the prisoners by controlling their food supply rather than actually going into the prison area. When we reach the surface, we encounter Thonar again. If we kill Madanak, he'll give us a smithing ring, which is not as alluring a reward as it sounds. If we side with the Forsworn, they'll give us a light armor set with an... eclectic selection of enchantments. I wonder how many people even knew about killing Madanak. Either way, we're free to leave at this point, our bounty cleared. The Forsworn will fight their way out of the city and establish a base at Druidak Redoubt, where the Forsworn become friendly. But this doesn't change anything else, as Madanak even says other Forsworn will continue to be hostile because we need them to continue staffing all those dungeons. And that's it. The Forsworn as a faction is finished. If Bethesda continues their policy of ignoring player decisions in Elder Scrolls, then chances are good the Forsworn will not be successful in reclaiming their kingdom. Or I guess reports will conflict. This quest matches my observation that branching points are always at the end of quests. Nothing else will play out differently now that Madanak is a player on the board of Skyrim politics. The Forsworn cannot reclaim Markarth and change the course of the Civil War, for instance. The Great Khans in New Vegas were a similarly small faction, yet your decisions in Boulder City Showdown could change the course of the main quest, and the Khans had multiple fates depending on your decisions and allegiances. Imagine if the Blades had a quest where, after claiming Skyhaven Temple, they wanted to establish a positive relationship with the Forsworn. It's actually a natural alliance, because it means there will be some protection against their Thalmor hunters. But the Forsworn are not immediately convinced of the benefits, so we have to prove it. 
The main path could be a dragon hunt, where we prove that the blades will be useful in defending the Forsworn from dragons. The other path, if you completed those quests, would be to ask Madanek, the, you know, King of the Forsworn, to establish the Alliance instead. This is not even a particularly complex quest I'm asking for. You already have the framework of a radiant dragon hunting quest with the blades. Most of the new additions are just dialogue as well as some alternate Forsworn characters. All it requires is a level of confidence in player choice. Yes, some people will probably only notice the alternate path on a repeat playthrough, but that kind of thing only makes replaying the game all the more special. Imagine how many people would be saying, I have a thousand hours in Skyrim and today I learned that you can ask Madanak to help you during the main quest. When I asked people what their favorite side quests were, the Forsworn Conspiracy was always at the top of the list. I think that is because Skyrim's potential was shining through the usual mediocrity. Having the Forsworn here makes the world feel so much more real, and people wanted to see more Forsworn content. The problem is that Bethesda did not learn and would repeat this mistake with the Gunners in Fallout 4. The Gunners are a faction of mercenaries in the Commonwealth with few, if any, quests. The game itself considers them to just be better equipped raiders. They play a key role in the history of the Minutemen, being responsible for their near downfall, but do not actually play a role in the story even if you decide to work with the Minutemen. Sound familiar? Because that's basically the same function the Forsworn served in Skyrim. Our next quest to cover is Blood on the Ice in Windhelm. That was the worst quest I've ever played. Oh yeah, that. We'll talk about it. While most of the cities have some form of roller coaster loudly dictating what quests you need to immediately start, Windhelm is actually different by being very subdued. Things happen, but it isn't until you've visited the area a few times that this quest actually begins. With a murder. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this introduction. While the start of the Forsworn Conspiracy is definitely strong for establishing how central that quest is to Markarth's history, this quest has an amazing start for a different reason. By delaying the murder, you're given the opportunity to get comfortable in Windhelm. You even get the chance to meet the victim, Susanna the Wicked. She's a sultry barmaid who works over at Candle Hearth Hall, but recommends the new Nisus Corner Club over in the Grey Quarter. She's also a progressive, not understanding her boss's bigotry towards Dark Elves. Another Dark Elf. Just what Windhelm needs. This is a pretty big step up from how Morrowind handled a murder case where at any time you could just break into this manor and find the guy dead well before you ever start the investigation. Her boss will also suggest that Susanna is particularly flirty as an attempt to get bigger tips. Also, Elda is in a relationship with Brunwolf Freewinter, the man the Imperials appoint as Jarl of Windhelm. So for all his progressive talk, he's still chasing that racist Nord pussy. With Susanna dead, there are some folks gathered round while a guard is looking over the body. He says that they're too busy with the war to handle the investigation, even if the war is over, or in a state of truce. It's not the first time in the series that lazy guards pawned a murder investigation off onto the player. If we want to, we can try and solve the murder instead. If you recall, this conflicts heavily with Brunwolf's case that the Stormcloaks are selective with their investigations based on race. Nord women are being murdered in Windhelm, and the guards cannot spare the resources to do anything about it. Helgerd is the local priestess of Arke, acting as the local coroner. The only thing she notes at this time is that Susanna wasn't robbed. Calixto, a local business owner, says that he saw a fellow running away, but didn't get a good look. Silda, local homeless union rep, says that she heard a scream, but the victim was already dead by the time she had arrived. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like you can actually ask about what kind of woman Susanna was. That's probably why they made sure to note that she was the Wicked in her name. Elda doesn't have much to say after she dies. If you somehow intuit that Susanna recommended the Corner Club, its proprietor, Ambaris Rindar, will say, None of that matters to me. Until someone takes a Dunmer, I'll let Windhelm deal with its own problems. Given her predisposition, we can probably rule out this being a racially motivated crime. It doesn't seem the local Dark Elves are murdering Nords just yet, but give it time. Susanna did work at a racist establishment, but that's probably just because jobs are scarce at the moment in Windhelm. Was it related to her job? Did some guy she was leading on end up killing her in a drunken rage? Well, her body is fairly mutilated, so we can also probably rule out accidental drunken homicide. Plus, there has been a chain of murders recently, and Susanna fits the bill. No, this was almost certainly done by the town serial killer. 
All three witnesses at the scene are carrying iron daggers. We can probably, however, rule out Silda. She's a pickpocket trainer and homeless, so given that Susanna's money wasn't stolen, this was not a case of a spiteful old woman being jealous of a younger girl in town. The guards point us to the steward, Your Life, who makes our investigation official. We start with Helgard, who notes that the wounds indicate that a curved blade was used, like an embalming knife. What about elvish and orcish knives? They have curved edges. She, however, states that she would not volunteer that information if she was actually responsible. Still, an ancient Nordic embalming knife is a very specific thing for someone in Windhelm to own. I don't believe that. They are fairly common in Nordic ruins, given how many preserved corpses are still walking around. I can more than imagine they would be owned for sentimental reasons, or by former adventurers. It's unusual to be sure, and it's good to know the murder weapon, but by itself, it doesn't really point to anyone. It does, however, suggest that the murderer is trying to frame someone else. Given that Helgert points this out as unusual, that implies the previous murders did not have this property. That, combined with the location, means that the murderer is clearly trying to make it look like Helgert is responsible. Remember this red herring, it's important. There is a trail of blood at the crime scene, leading through the estates into the richer part of town. It leads to a manor named Hiram. We could break in, but asking the steward gives us more information about the place. It is the former residence of Frigga Shattershield, which was the woman whose murder was a plot point in the Dark Brotherhood questline. This can actually cause an issue. If you decide to complete the bonus objective for Mururi and kill Nilsine Shattershield, then her mother Tova will commit suicide. Even though the game actually has a contingency for this outcome, it also requires that Tova be alive for it to arrange Susanna's corpse and the witnesses and thus start the quest. It is quite an unusual thing. You have to visit Windhelm to get the quest from Arantino to start the Brotherhood and a second time to turn it in. Then when you go to kill Nilsen, you have visited Windhelm a third time. However, Blood on the Ice requires four visits to the city. If you start the quest, but then kill Nilsen before solving Susanna's murder, then you can still get the key to Hiram from Tova's body. She doesn't even give us useful information for solving the murder, yet whoever designed this quest went out of the way to add her to the list of NPCs who have to be alive to start it. Quite unusual. It figures that on the occasion Skyrim does have consequences for a choice in a different quest that it would cause issues. My interpretation isn't that this is a bad thing, but rather that Bethesda is so inexperienced with branching quests, they don't really seem to have part of their workflow that exists to account for possible issues. And can we just appreciate that in a city of limited real estate space that Clan Shattershield has not only a manor, but that Frigga Shattershield also owned her own separate home? I looked into it and the family patriarch, Torbjorn, is the owner of a local trading company. That would make him wealthy, but not owning two manors wealthy. He's also a racist, refusing to pay his Argonian workers the same wages as Nords. He probably picked that up from his Dark Elf business associates. Ask a Dunmer businessman sometime what the value of Argonian labor is. We don't know enough about Frigga to know whether she was as racist as Daddy or if she was hooking up with lizards on the sly to make him angry. Probably the former, given that she had her own house. The reason I bring that up is that kind of information could be useful in understanding a motive for the murders. If the common trend between Susanna and Frigga was tolerance of minorities, then the murderer could be a local Nord. In Hiram, we're told to look for clues, but not actually given quest markers as to where to look. There's a bunch of pamphlets in the house warning people that there is a serial killer in town, as though people don't know. Windhelm is not 19th century London, everybody already knows there's a serial killer on the loose. The pamphlets are being distributed by Viola Giardorno, whose name should indicate that she is an imperial woman. I'm not clear what exactly she does for a living, but... Oh really? So that dark elf took my ring? So typical of his kind. I think the Jarl should hear about this. Maybe double his taxes. No, triple them. That should teach those people a lesson. Windhelm is a really funny place if you are a dark elf, which I am. Especially since, again, Viola is not a Nord. She's a Karen, but one of her main things is that she's single and unable to mingle with Captain Lonely Gale. Watch that tongue, Renda, or your whole lot could be down with the Argonian's holic ballast by tomorrow. So what you just heard is actually cut dialogue, which I didn't know until it came time to grab a clip of it. This is not the first time this has happened, and I usually cut it from the video when it does, but this time is not so simple. See, currently, Captain Lonely Gale is a retired sailor, hence why he's called Captain. 
However, at some stage in development, he was actually the captain of the guard. This is a notably missing position in this story, but once I started looking into it, I got dragged into a wormhole. Captain Lonely Gale is a widower, hence why Viola is interested, but her antics have a new context if Lonely Gale is the guard captain. Instead of simply being interested in the murders as a hobby, as is currently the case, it would make more sense that she was interested in the murders as an attempt of getting the captain's attention. My best guess for why this was changed is that it was decided he would serve as steward under Jarl Freewinter, but due to a bug that does not happen. Even if that were the case, it doesn't make much sense to cut the character of a guard captain from the city instead of replacing him. Anyways, the pamphlet getting torn down is a plot point in the story, although it's probably a fact that people in Windhelm have a problem with Viola and not that they have a problem with people trying to do something about the murders. We also found Butcher Journal number 1. I guess whoever is keeping it really enjoys serialization. Get it? Because he's a serial killer? The main clue here is that whoever is behind the murders is magically inclined and investigating flesh magic, needing parts for his research. That cuts down on the suspect list quite a bit. Unfortunately, we are not able to go to the College of Winterhold that we run and ask for a list of former and current members to cross-reference with our investigation. You're able to find a hidden area behind a false panel. This is reminding me of Where Spirits Have Lease, the anvil home that was haunted and had its own secret area. Butcher Journal number 2 is just a recipe for a flesh magic ritual, although it states that it originated as an Aldemar text, with a D. So, who added the note about Nord blood being preferred? The Butcher, the transcribing Altmer, the interpreting Aliads, or the original Aldmer? Honestly, this journal is not much of a clue. We can find a strange amulet in the house. If all you can find are the pamphlets, then you do have the option of asking Viola, who will search the house with you and try and help you solve the case. If you take this route, then Viola will guess the killer to be Woundfirth the Unliving, the court wizard. She also tells us to take the amulet to Revan Sadri, but he says that he wouldn't sell something like this and that the amulet is magical. It's just a shame that I'm having a bad day and difficulty figuring out what the enchantment is. Your life figures Calixto would know more about the amulet, being the owner of a weird item boutique, and if you ask him, he'll tell us that it's the type of amulet usually carried by court wizards, and then offers to buy it from us. At this point, the quest can go all kinds of ways, depending on your decisions. Technically, after we get into Hiram, it starts branching off in ways that make my format difficult, which is why I want to focus on one particular playthrough of this quest. Not mine, actually, but Salt Factories. Now, I want to clarify there's actually a very understandable reason for what happened, but it's useful to have proof that this quest was actually capable of tricking at least one person. Then I show her one of the journals, and she's like, Ah, uh, yeah, that's probably the court wizard. He's been experimenting with all sorts of crazy shit for a long time now. You know they call him the Unliving? Weird, huh? God, I hope it isn't the court wizard. Please be better than this, Skyrim. That was the worst quest I've ever played. Hey man, I just wanted to let you know that you missed a part of the hit Skyrim questing sensation, Blood on the Ice. You see, the quest tells you quest completed, Blood on the Ice, but it actually isn't completed at all. I know, it's pretty 200 IQ stuff. Looks like you aren't such a sharp investigator after all. So, um, spoilers. Woundfirth isn't the murderer. I actually think this is one of the best moments in Skyrim because it's an actually clever subversion of expectation, in that it uses the mechanics to trick you, instead of just saying that it's the rat quest from the previous game, but this time the woman is keeping the rats as pets. Basically, if you take the lemming path and do not investigate any deeper than taking Viola and Calixto's word, you are guided into implicating the wrong person. Not forced, you are free to confront Woundfirth and get his account if you want, just guided. However, it all works because as Salt points out, Woundfirth is plausible enough as a suspect. It's believable that Skyrim would make such a bad quest, which makes the trick all the more sweeter. Instead, if you wait around for a few days for no reason, you'll notice the murders continue. Yes, indeed, it turns out to be another guy. Well, of course it is. The killer already tried to frame one person for the murder, killing Susanna in the graveyard with a weapon only a priestess of RK would normally have, who herself is a reclusive neurotic that people might suspect. And the only reason you would wait around for a few days for no reason would be if you were recording the quest for a video. Anybody who's playing normally is going to go off and do other stuff for three in-game days, and then the next time they visit Windhelm, be surprised. 
If you kill him, that's the real ending. So you can obviously now see why Blood on the Ice is actually the magnum opus of quest design. It takes a lot of study of the finer points of quest design to really appreciate the subtle nuances of the murderer actually being another guy which no guards react to killing out in the open. And the concept of a quest ending, only for it to not really be done, is impeccable, like a fine wine, and definitely isn't really stupid. So, what are you asking for? Either the quest doesn't end, so when you point the finger at the wrong person it just stays in your quest log, being obvious. I can see you criticizing that. Huh, I wonder why this quest is still in my log. I even installed the unofficial patch, so obviously it's not bugged. That must mean I did it wrong. Better look it up and spoil a surprise. Or you can't point the finger at anybody other than the correct answer, which I can also easily see you criticizing. Why would you have characters accuse Woundfirth of being the killer if I can't actually accuse him? Jorleaf only accepting the accusation against Calixto makes the whole investigation fall flat. This is a problem I often find myself thinking about with my own media analysis and criticism. Believe it or not, but I often have bad ideas that I later cut out. To give an example, for a while, I had on my note list that before you complete Dragon Rising, there should be random dragon attacks, but that the dragons would retreat at half health. I had this idea on a walk at 3am and wrote it down, but when it came time to actually write about the dragons, I took one look at that and immediately realized that if Bethesda actually did that, I would both hate it and criticize it in my video. I think it's important to question if your proposals or criticisms would actually make the game better, or if you're simply saying something is stupid because it made you look stupid. No, having the quest end prematurely even if you accuse the wrong person is brilliant. It means that three days later, when you visit Windhelm and see that another woman has been murdered, that you actually failed at something. You failed. In Skyrim. Skyrim. An extremely shallow experience. Let you fail. To make a comparison, the quest Canvas the Castle in Oblivion also lets you accuse the wrong person. The only consequence for being wrong is getting paid less currency. Is that the preferable alternative? Now I actually understand what Salt Factory's mistake was that led him down this path. He supported the Imperials. Okay, fine. That's not the full mistake. In fact, it's not actually even his fault he got this wrong. I mean, mildly, it's impossible to talk about Skyrim and not have people recommend this quest. He tries to say it is unreasonable to expect him to look up quests for his videos, although he seems to hate the idea of even basic research. I don't know the development history of this game, if it received the amount of time that devs wanted, or funding, or whatever. But stuff like this screams that they had limitations that they needed to work around. This was the, the first project we made using Unreal 4. So a lot of our the tools and pipelines we were trying to get up to the speed that we needed to. And certain things we just assumed we'd be able to do more quickly than we could, so we had to make a lot of cuts. But I would figure with how many people love this quest, and how drastically different your response was. That was the worst quest I've ever played. That it might merit a cursory Google search to see if you either did something wrong or had the game glitch out. Even just for the sake of making fun of Bethesda's game being buggy. Now, so far this has mostly just been about his presentation on this quest, but allow me to indulge in some dirty YouTube drama for a moment. Not really, but since this is guaranteed to turn into a thing with some commenters, maybe even a Twitter scuffle or another threat from his Discord mods to have my server deleted, I might as well talk about it. I'll keep it brief. During the stream where I watched his videos, he hopped in and said he doesn't like his older stuff. Later, when we were watching the part on this quest, his wife hopped in and said they had received death threats over it. I didn't know it was his wife at the time, but if true, then yeah, it's really stupid to send someone death threats over something as minor as getting a quest in a video game wrong. Although if I had to wager, it was probably the comment and not the actual video itself that inspired it. If the pinned comment just said that he got it wrong and that a Skyrim bug was the reason, I really doubt that anybody would care. Then, in his Mass Effect 2 video, he included a part where he explains his style, but without providing context for why he's really talking about this. Just three and three quarters hours into his video, he explains why he does the plot recitation thing. It's dumb because it's neither an effective response, because I don't watch his videos and he didn't name me, nor is it at a good spot in the video. Nobody watching who doesn't know the context is going to gain anything from hearing about why you're recounting the plot 94% of the way through you recounting the plot. It's like that's what he was writing when the stream happened, so that's why it's there. Now, I don't want or need to be named in his video. If he wants to respond, then Twitter's the best place for that kind of thing. He really shouldn't have said anything in his video. 
I don't care about that. I find plot recitations boring, but clearly there's an audience that loves his videos. They want to hear somebody casually talk about a game for a couple hours. Mostly what I care about is the lack of basic research in his work. That Outer Worlds clip happened months after the stream, but another creator sent it to me because it really frustrated them that he didn't take that basic criticism into consideration. He got so hung up on the plot recitation thing, he missed the actually valuable criticism. If there was anything to take away from nine and a half hours of some dumb asshole streaming about you, lack of research was it. Now believe me, I'm well aware of how much work research is, but I have different standards of research for different videos. For my other half hour videos, I usually do very cursory stuff. I'm not bothered that Salt wasn't digging into archives, cross-referencing dates, and reading through game code. That would ruin the aesthetic of a guy casually talking about a game to suddenly get super specific and technical. And it would slow down his production to show that level of attention to every game he covers. What I'm bothered about is him not even keeping a wiki open in the second tab while writing about games. It's not a ridiculous thing to expect, especially if you bill your videos as evaluations. Imagine your boss doing a performance evaluation, and then telling you about how he feels based on your observations and speculation. And then he docks your pay. Okay, my part in this supposed drama is over, believe me if my goal was to insult your parasocial father, I would have made that its own dedicated thing. What happened was, when he went to do the quest, the very first guard that tasks you on the investigation wasn't there. This is because he had reloaded the save he had ended his first Skyrim video on, which was after the Battle of Windhelm. So he reloaded another save before the battle, did the quest, and accused the wrong person. Up to now is information he provides in the video. Then I have to report back to the guard and, uh, oh right, yeah, I, I killed this guy during the war between the Stormcloaks and the Legion. Welp. Alright, so now I need to start the investigation proper. Now this next part is my own speculation, but I'm going to assume that immediately upon seeing the words quest completed, he figured it was a job well done and then reloaded the higher level save to go do other quests for the video. Well, whatever, let's hit the next one. I am assuming this because it's exactly what I do when I reload old saves to replay quests. That is Skyrim's fault. And it's Skyrim's fault for not having a contingency for if the player started the quest after the conclusion of the Civil War. For instance, if you liberate Whiterun, then Captain Caius is replaced by Sinmir as Captain of the Guard, including during the Thieves' Guild quest to poison the Mead still. The issue seems to be a simple oversight. What wasn't Skyrim's fault was his response to being told he did the quest wrong, much of which I've already played for you. Please make sure to read the wiki article on all 30 quests you do per video to ensure no further curveballs are thrown your way, and consider reevaluating your life, you big fucking idiot. People who were mildly annoyed at your extremely shallow assessments, so I'm to question the witnesses here who yield nothing of value in the investigation. I did notice that her coin purse was still intact, so whoever did this wasn't after gold. I thought I saw a fellow running away, but didn't get a good look at him. I heard a scream and came running, but she was already... like this when I got here. Always sad when someone has to die. Yeah, why does he look all freshly bloody and mangled? Yeah, how do you end up like that? People who were mildly annoyed at your extremely shallow assessments are going to become angry if you engage in such condescending and arrogant behavior. Now I want to be clear, because Salt Factory's fans have historically been some of the thickest I've had to deal with. The goal here isn't just to put him on blast for getting something wrong. Rather, the point is that it's good to see that even someone who reviews video games as a profession could be tricked by this quest. Especially since his central thesis was about how shallow this game is. So who is the actual murderer? Well, if you talk to Woundfirth, he's able to identify the amulet. It is the Necromancer's amulet, an artifact that has been in every Elder Scrolls game. But only briefly in the one where its creator was the villain. What? It's pretty convenient that the player could not identify this one item, an identification of which could change the course of the entire quest. I mean, this would be a great place to implement an enchant skill check. Have an enchant a 50 year higher and you identify it on the spot. Otherwise, then you have to get it appraised. Woundfirth figures there will be a murder in the Stone Quarter this night, somehow. He says that he's noticed a pattern in the time and locations of the murders. Yeah, Windhelm, at night. This is definitely a stretch that screams of bad cop TV shows, where specialists can somehow identify everything about a serial killer from the exact way they bash someone's brains in with a claw hammer. There have only been three murders, four if you blame the wrong person. It's only necessary on the off chance you haven't figured out yet that the murderer is Calixto. 
He was at the crime scene, his business is the ownership of unusual items, and he is the one that obviously misidentifies the amulet. Always sad when someone has to die. Just from a casual glance, you can tell it's no wheelstone. Plus, again, one city official has already been nearly framed. If you can't tell, I actually really like this quest. By my estimation, there are four good suspects for the murders. Helgerd, Viola, Woonfirth, and Calixto. I also like how it resolves. If Yorlif just had a list of NPCs you could accuse, it would basically break the mystery. Oh, I guess if Calixto's on this list, then I better pay close attention to him. It is great that the lives of potentially two more victims are on the line based on your performance. You also have the chance to learn a lot about Windhelm that we didn't learn about Markarth and the Forsworn Conspiracy. The quest never sat us down for a lesson on the racial conflict in the city. Instead, how much you learn about that depends on how much, you know, investigating you actually do. Frankly, I think murder investigations are some of the greatest opportunities Bethesda has for storytelling in their format. It perfectly fits with their open world design and NPC scheduling principles. The potential of this story is a great foundation. Imagine if, instead of being a single quest, it was actually a short side quest line that developed alongside the city of Windhelm. It would advance as you did other quests here and learned about the city, and the motives and possibilities were expanded. The Nords point fingers at the Dark Elves, later a Dark Elf woman gets killed, and the Dunmer point fingers at the Nords. Every prominent NPC in Windhelm should be a possible suspect for some reason, but not others. For instance, Viola is racist against Dark Elves, and Helgerd thinks she's faking the investigation into herself as a misdirection. But then we find her journal where she states that she's been trying and failing to learn basic magic. Ambaris Rindar could be a former Morag Tong member and talks about how the serial killer is justice for the Grey Quarter until the Dunmer girl is taken. Then he starts pointing fingers at the Argonians. The Argonians could have a secret route they use to get into the city, and a fresh import of Nordic embalming equipment, except it's magically sealed and all accounted for. I'm not really suggesting that this is possible for Skyrim. I mean, the quest is super janky as is. For example, if you take Viola's word that Woonfirth is the murderer, then when you talk to him later, the dialogue suggests you talk to Calixto, but you never actually have to take the amulet to Calixto. This is more so demonstrating the narrative potential of a serial killer murder investigation thrust into a complex city environment. Calixto's motivations have to be investigated independently, by reading a journal in his house detailing that it was the death of his sister that motivated him into learning about necromancy and flesh magic. He was killing young Nord women because those were the parts he needed, although his final target will be a high elf woman. All of the racial tension and politics of the story was yet another misdirection from the most basic of character motivations. Trauma. Like Paranoia from Oblivion, Blood on the Ice is a quest that should be emulated and improved upon in future games. If you haven't noticed, a common thread amongst good quests is not the combat or dungeons, but the act of simple investigation. Our adventure takes us next to Solitude. This quest doesn't actually begin simply by entering the city. Actually, it, like Blood on the Ice, has a chance of not triggering correctly at all. This is because if you start the quest, but one of the core NPCs leaves, as happens in a number of other quests, then you'll get the scene of everybody just sitting around, awkwardly. What is supposed to happen is Varnius Junius is supposed to plead for Jarl Elisif to send someone to investigate a cave that has strange lights coming from it. Elisif initially suggests a legion be sent to investigate the cave, but is talked down to a few extra soldiers being sent to Dragonbridge. The court is obviously not taking this issue seriously, and this largely seems to be down to Sibella Stentor's statement that she hasn't detected anything from the cave. She's obviously wrong, but the quest never suggests that Stentor is intentionally lying to cover it up, nor do I believe she is. She's one of the few rare vampires in Elder Scrolls that has successfully set herself up with a safe supply of blood, so I doubt she would jeopardize her position. Falk Firebeard is willing to pay us to clear out the cave since something is going on there, but it's just assumed to be bandits or wild animals. What kind of name is Firebeard anyways? They made a whole design document about the dragon language, but didn't seem to write a paragraph on Nordic naming schemes, which leads to some strange... variants. Morrowind did have rules for naming Nord characters, which you can see being applied consistently with the game's 156 Nords, even applying to bandit characters. Many Nords have mononyms, or basically just first names. These Nords are mostly commoners. Some Nords have titles like Guardian the Bold, Velfred the Outlaw, or Hilf the Harrier. Finally, some Nords have clan names following a consistent formula. Hardheart, Flatfoot, Fireeye, Forkbeard, Bluetooth, and Elfhewer. 
Clan names were always two hyphenated words. There are two characters I have seen which break that rule, having the names Farseer and Highlander without a hyphen. Oblivion was fairly similar. You had the mononyms, the titles like The Outcast or The Cook, and then you had the clan names like God Hater, Oakenhole, Red Tooth, and Black Nail. As far as I can see, there weren't any Nords that had unhyphenated clan names, although there is actually someone who has a hyphenated title for some reason. Bitneld the Cursebringer. In normal naming conventions, it would just be Cursebringer as one word. There's also a couple odd last names like Yolfenhild, Uthgar, and Faithung. Morrowind did have similar rules violations, but that seemed to be because they were the wrong race. Varanius is an imperial name, Selatar is a Dunmer name, Albur is a Breton name. And then you have Skyrim, and things are all over the place. There are six times as many Nords now, so that is obviously going to be part of it, but even primary characters don't seem to follow regular naming conventions. Codlack Whitemane has an unhyphenated clan name. Is he a part of the Whitemane family, or is he called that because he's old and has a white mane? If the latter, why isn't he Codlack the Whitemane? Ayella has a title, she's Ayella the Huntress. The Grey Manes and Whiterun have that name because everyone in the family has grey hair, even while young. Falk Firebeard is obviously another example. Is he called that because he specifically has a firebeard, or is he a part of the Firebeard family? Are there Firebeard women out there getting made fun of? Is Horik Halfhand a member of a mutant family, or does it actually refer to the fact that he lost half his hand during the Great War? It is a minor thing, but once I realized it, I couldn't stop noticing the aberrations. You would think that Skyrim, the game about Nords, would take the opportunity to explain the rules about Nordic names. For instance, perhaps the Battleborns descend from a man named Kin, the Battleborn, a warrior whose mother gave birth to him during a great battle, before she went on to slay seven warriors. And that was the founding of Clan Battleborn. So clan names are created through literal titles of accomplishment or description. Then, maybe in Western Imperial Skyrim, you have more incidences of Nords taking up last names independent of clans. You can portray a literal cultural shift just by the names of characters if you take the time to write down the rules for naming those characters. If the rule is simply that they just need to have a Nordic sounding name, then you're squandering an opportunity. A good example of this oddity is in the names of Jarls. Some of the Jarls are clanless and titleless. Skald, Sidgir, Igmund, Korir, and Kraldar. We're not even really told the criteria by which one even becomes Jarl. In theory, the Jarls appoint the High King. In fact, the impetus for the Civil War was that the High King position seemed to have become a hereditary monarchy in the hands of Solitude. The reason I bring up the High King is that it's not a situation where Jarls are appointed by and vassals of the High King. There doesn't seem to be very much thought put into this process, or many of the Jarls. Skald has a mononym, but is referred to by some as the Elder despite having no children, and apparently is a member of the Felgai family. Sidgir does have living family, having recently replaced his uncle, Dengir of Stoon, due to old age. Stoon is not a location, but actually a member of the ancient Nordic pantheon, making Dengir himself an aberration. Stoon's son, as a clan name, would accomplish the same goal while also giving Sidgir his own clan name. Igmund is clanless and titleless, and we aren't given a reason why he's the Jarl, other than that his father was Jarl of Markarth prior to the Forsworn Rebellion. He also has no family or heirs. Korir does have a wife and son, but no clan name, despite being Jarl of one of the oldest cities in Skyrim. He gets replaced by some guy who also just has a mononym, although it slightly makes more sense why someone who wasn't the Jarl might be clanless. Then you have other oddities. Brina Morellis is an imperial name, despite being a Nord. It's really convenient that the character whose defining attribute is being an Imperial Legion veteran happens to have an Imperial name. What, did she change her name during her service to the Legion? Why didn't Horik? He was in the Legion just as long. Idgrod Ravencrone has a clan name, but they didn't hyphenate it. You can say it was intentional because she's a Legion supporter, but, well, Ulfric Stormcloak's name is also unhyphenated. Idgrad has a daughter named Idgrad the Younger. This is an approximation of a real-life tradition in Northern European countries where children take the name of their parents. It's why Jensen and Larsen are such popular names. Elder Scrolls approaches this by having children who take their parents' name take the titles of the Elder and the Younger. But Idgrad the Elder doesn't hold that title. She has the last name Ravencrone instead. It's one thing to point this out with minor characters, but we're talking about the regional rulers here. Then of course you have Ulfric Stormcloak. ESO would try to make Clan Stormcloak a thing, but in Skyrim, Ulfric is the only living member of such a clan. 
His lack of children makes mild sense. He was a monk turned soldier who spent a decent chunk of his life either in jail or fighting for a cause. But where are his siblings? He doesn't have any. So Hoag Stormcloak, the bear of Eastmarch, had a single son and then watched him go off to become a greybeard and said, I guess that's the end of my lineage. Remember when a central plot point of Oblivion was a succession crisis? The Counts in Oblivion were also inconsistent with their lineage, but that largely seemed to be because Oblivion had no child NPCs. Some of them did have adult children. It was also pretty obvious why all the Counts in Oblivion held their positions. But why is this important? Well, you can tell a lot by a character just by their name. Despite there not being a model for it, Horik Halfhand tells you that he has an injury from the war just by his name. There just aren't enough clans in Skyrim. Despite what Skyrim thinks, Great House Telvanni is not a family named Telvanni. Rather, it is a collection of independent Dunmer clans, many of whom hold positions as counselors in the Great House. Each house has a different perspective on family. Great House Redoran, for instance, holds the concept of family in high regard. They have the most quests that have to do with family members of counselors. Small things like not taking naming schemes into consideration can lead to bigger issues. It's just sad that Bethesda went from individually naming bandits to not even taking the time to fully build families for Jarls. Which brings us back to Falk Firebeard. Where's he from? Who cares, we just need a steward for the Jarl. Call him Firebeard because he's a ginger even though his hair's the same color as his brown coat. It's pretty lame too, like that beard is seriously notable enough to merit recognition. His name wasn't Blackbeard because it was October and he participated in No Shave November every year. When I hear the words Firebeard, this is what I'm expecting. So we head out to Wolf Skull Cave and it becomes obvious pretty quick that the issue is related to necromancy. Necromancy is in a weird place in Skyrim. It's not illegal. Not just in gameplay, how you can reanimate people's loved ones in front of them. I mean, even in the setting. It is a crime insofar as you mess with dead people's bodies without permission, but there are plenty of bandits and animals in Skyrim to practice your magic on without consequence. Yet there are still necromancers living out in the wilds kidnapping travelers for their experiments. Necromancy was one of the main plots of Oblivion during the Mage's Guild. They can't really abandon the idea, however Skyrim is not helping itself by putting conjurers in black robes as well. The college lampshades the topic. You can study necromancy if you want, they aren't archaic like the Mage's Guild, but nobody's actually doing it, despite how seemingly popular that style of magic is. Necromancy! I am a member of the College of Winterhold! In good standing! They haven't allowed necromancy for hundreds of years. I sure know. Those archaic policies died out with the Mages Guild, and were never enforced here. Necromancy, as any other type of magic, is a tool to be used. Of course, non-mages may not see it that way, so we don't go around flaunting it. Skyrim doesn't even really have a rule about whether or not Draugr are attached to necromancers. Sometimes the game uses Draugr to portray the idea that necromancers are reanimating the dead, and sometimes it doesn't. The necromancers are engaging in some kind of flashy ritual to bind the Wolf Queen Potema to their will. It's kind of cool because unless you're versed in the lore, you won't know at the time what exactly the implications of this ritual would be if successful. But you don't need to, just look at it. It's obviously not going to be a good thing. So who is Potema? Well, the story goes back to Daggerfall. Lore books. Potema started as a minor character in the story of Emperor Pelagius the Mad. Then in Morrowind, she got two separate lore books both examining her character. The Biography of the Wolf Queen is a shorter historical account. The other story, simply titled The Wolf Queen, is actually an eight-part series detailing her entire life, including several conversations. The origin and veracity of this document are not established. Still, it was interesting enough to merit its own quest in Skyrim. To summarize her life, she was a daughter of the Septim Dynasty who was married to the King of Solitude at the age of 13. She ended up having great influence in Solitude and would rebel against the Empire in the interest of taking the throne for herself and her son. This is actually the very same war that Sir Beric took the sword and greaves of Pelennor Whitestrike to, leading to the downfall of the original Knights of the Nine. Potema was actually a capable conjurer and necromancer. She would use Daedra and her armies and would reanimate the dead of both sides against her opponents. She would even be tended to by skeletal servants, and some of her generals were Valkalhar vampires. It's said that her residual spirit, even after her death, caused Emperor Pelagius to go mad. This is frankly part of what I love about Elder Scrolls. Most of that is just in a lore document, available for extra reading at your leisure. 
The people involved in this quest don't exposit the story at you, which is how pretty much any other fantasy setting would handle the story. In fact, a common criticism of Elder Scrolls is that it doesn't lore dump enough. My criticism of Skyrim would instead be that most of its best material came from other games. As interesting as the Wolf Queen is, she was just as interesting in Morrowind where most of that lore came from, and Oblivion which also had the same books. You'll come to see that the quest itself is not going to do the Wolf Queen justice for the description that I just gave her. So we cratch the ritual, although Potamus' spirit seems to leave the cave. Falk is obviously shocked at the news that not only was something going on there, but that he had nearly enabled the return of the Wolf Queen. He doesn't wonder why Sibella Stentor wasn't able to detect the ritual, or guess that we might be lying about what happened to try and get a bigger reward, but there are still some cool details that are easy to miss. For instance, the Ritual Master has bound the Draugr to his will, as in if you kill the Ritual Master, the Draugr will start fighting the Necromancers. But of course people aren't going to notice that because he's one of the last enemies in the dungeon. Another detail is that Falk Firebeard is going to send us a letter later, but he actually has that letter on his person before he sends it to us. I mean, he has the letter a little too early, but still, it's another intentional detail that's easy to miss that is cool. Of course, at some point the letters we receive would be in the possession of their senders. Someone had to intentionally put it in his inventory, it's more work. Falk is going to ask us for our help as the case is not over. Obviously, why would such a popular quest be over if it was so simple up to this point? Before that though, we need to talk to Elisif. She actually admires us for what we did in the cave and has a favor to ask of us. She wants to give Torig a traditional Nordic burial. However, she's only made offerings to the Eight Divines. She's yet to make an offering to Talos, which she personally doesn't believe in due to the banning of Talos worship. We take the horn to a shrine of Talos and then return to Elisif, who now greatly respects us, allowing us to purchase a manor in town and begin the process of becoming Thane of Solitude. Okay, so there is more to this little side quest, or there's supposed to be. Bethesda's bug and all. What is supposed to happen is that after we offer Torig's Warhorn to the shrine, you would get attacked by a pair of Thalmor Justiciers. It didn't happen for me this time, which is one of the reasons I always at least glance at the article for the quests I cover, just to be sure. It really is baffling that Bethesda has kept selling this as a core product, but can't even assign one or two employees full time to just go through with a comb and gradually patch the game up. Why would they? The community does it for free. The mod community is gonna do what they will. And sure enough, there's like a complete like thief plugin with all of Garrett's tools from Thief. You know what I mean? Like uh, water arrows and moss arrows and the blackjack and all this stuff. So I, I sort of knew that that was gonna, I, I was like, this is gonna happen anyway. It turns out we stopped the ritual, but not Potema. The local priest of Arkea offers some guidance on how to tackle the Potema problem. Apparently there's supposed to be a connection between us and her due to our attendance at the ritual. So is there a connection between Potema and Jizargo as well? Yeah, I'm not really a big fan of this premise. I am, however, a fan of Potema's catacombs. It actually makes use of assets in a new way, with the early part of the ruin taking place in the Solitude Building tile set. It's also a blending of vampires and Draugr enemies, which I don't think happens anywhere else in Skyrim. Sadly, it is still a linear Skyrim dungeon. A funny part is that you can't tell Ulfric about the secret back entrance of Solitude that leads directly into Castle Dower. Seems like while the Stormcloak army is fighting at the gates, we could send our best warriors through this entrance. Anyways, Potema wants us as an undead servant, and we have to fight our way through her little army to get to her. About the vampires though, shouldn't they all be blood-starved? It's been four or five hundred years. We have an interesting little boss fight with her. She's throwing a beam of lightning around the room while animating waves of Draugr. I realize that what makes a good boss fight in Elder Scrolls differs based on playstyle. Magic's a lot more fun when you have a lot of enemies to deal with because crowd control actually becomes useful in that situation. On the flip side, these encounters can be nightmares for stealth and melee characters because they lack the mechanical depth needed to make fighting multiple enemies interesting. Especially when those enemies are tanky, beefcake, Draugr death overlords with absurd health pools. Then we take her skull and return it to the Hall of the Dead, which he'll bless. I just noticed, but in my recording, I talked to Falk before returning the remains, which completed the quest and gave me the reward, meaning that you could actually hold onto the remains of Potema if you wanted. You can't do anything with them, but it's funny to imagine her rematerializing at some point in the future and Falk realizing that he probably shouldn't have trusted us. And that's the quest. To be honest, you can see how as we get down the list of favorite quests, the quality is rapidly dropping. 
In terms of quests about cities, this is the most irrelevant, choosing to be about a historical figure instead of anyone current. We haven't learned much about modern solitude, and I think I know why that is. This is the Shield of Solitude, and its stats are leveled. So yeah, this quest might be super basic because it was actually made early in development. Leveled quest rewards was a staple of Oblivion. They are in faction quest lines because the rewards were probably in the design document very early, but them being here means that this quest was likely prototypical for Skyrim. This does unlock a third leg of the quest line though. You might be confused if you've played Skyrim before. So let's talk about the third quest, Let Sleeping Wolves Lie. A while later we receive a note from a courier, this time from Elisif's housecarl Bolgir Bearclaw. The note tells us in one sentence that a necromancer is attacking the coastline and that he has strange minions. Sure enough, there's a necromancer accompanied by bone wolves. If you don't remember any of this, that's because it's part of the creation club. However, the note arriving after completing the Potema quests was actually a change. Originally, Bolgir would send you the note straight out of Helgen, which was quite amusing. I have a video on my second channel of how the game would add quests to your log for five literal minutes before the anniversary edition updated most of the creations to have more natural integrations. As far as the Bone Wolf goes, he's a typical creation club pet with one notable detail. He increases the effectiveness of your spells against undead when you have him with you. That includes reanimations. But having him with you is annoying because he likes to get in the way and doesn't contribute to fights. Anticipating this, Creation Club made most of these pets summonable. They can teleport to you on demand, mostly so you can give them stuff and then immediately send them home. That's convenient, but also really stupid. Now you may have noticed that I've been picking popular quests from each major city, which takes us next to Whiterun, because the quest about Riften actually just seems to be the Thieves' Guild. Locals in Whiterun are bothered by the Gilder Green Tree, particularly it's dead. Can't you tell? I always kind of forget about this quest. Skyrim is such a colorless game that I can easily look at the tree in its initial state and assume that's just how the tree is supposed to be. I mean, even when the tree is alive, it just still creates this sterile scene. Now the local temple in Whiterun is dedicated to Kinnereth, and its priestess, Danica Purespring, does want to solve the problem, only she's busy due to the war. Wait, what? So this is kind of a problem. She's swamped with wounded from the war, even though Whiterun is still neutral, even when the war is paused during the main quest, and even after the resolution. Seems like an easy fix would be to delay this quest until after the battle for Whiterun happens. This simple change makes things better in multiple ways. You would get to see a healthy Guildergreen first so you understand what was lost. You can say the tree is damaged during the battle, so there are actual tangible consequences to the battle that we now have to try and heal, and you make the city more dynamic. Just when you think you've exhausted Whiterun of its quests, the battle suddenly unlocks more. Obviously, the only reason Danica is so busy is to justify why she cares about the problem but hasn't actually done anything about it yet. If only the temple was across the street from a guild hall of a faction of mercenaries, I'm sure at least one of the companions actually liked the tree and would be able to help her out. I mean, technically yes, but it's us. Danica says that the tree needs sap from its parent tree named the Elder Glean. Okay, so to fix one ancient tree, we need to go find an even ancient Dur tree. The problem is that normal weapons can't cut the tree. Not to fear, we don't have normal weapons. Jazargo has a Daedric sword, which is not a sword created by Daedra, but is actually a Daedric spirit channeled into the shape of a sword. Is that abnormal enough? How about literally any of the weapons that the Creation Club adds? No, of course not. Because she has a very specific dagger in mind, which is obviously kept in a museum up at Dragon's Reach. Actually, it's in a dungeon, obviously. Its name is Nettlebane, and it's apparently created especially to sacrifice Spriggans. Wait, I've killed Spriggans before, and I didn't need a special knife. It's a very cynical quest, isn't it? Everything about it is justification for you to have something to do. Which is obviously just what quests and video games are for, don't get me wrong, but usually you try to be subtle about it, and give the right context for why the events are happening. The only reason we need a special knife is because the designers want us to go fight some hag ravens. After we get the knife, we are going to be going to another dungeon area. In essence, if the quest has been done only slightly differently, it could have been just one dungeon. Potema's quest had us run two dungeons, serving as a good point of comparison. We didn't go to Wolf Skull Cave to get a special knife to stop Potema, we went there for completely different reasons. 
It doesn't feel like a waste of time to run two dungeons because the quest is framed well enough to justify why two is necessary. Here's how I justify running two dungeons. After the Gilder Green is damaged in the Battle of Whiterun, Danica is puzzled why it isn't healing. It is Skyrim, and this obviously isn't the first time the tree was set on fire. It's a holy tree, and that includes the property of bouncing back from damage, but for some reason, this time, it won't heal. That's when a witch enters the room. A coven of witches has cursed the tree and are slowly killing it. They want gold to undo the curse, and then she teleports away to really sell that she's evil, because only evil people know how to teleport. Danica says that she can undo the curse in a ritual, but needs sap from the Elder Gleam. She figures that in order to curse the tree, the witches had also used sap, so they must have some tool purpose built for getting it. Thus, we go and kill two birds with one stone, quite literally. When we return with the knife, because Orphan Rock isn't notable, Danica's being harassed by a pilgrim named Maurice John Drell. What has happened to the Gilder Green? I have traveled long here to worship beneath its branches. It was taken by a lightning strike. Wish I had time to deal with it, but it's hard enough with all these wounded from the war. Please, don't just let it stay like this. It's disgraceful. I really don't have time to deal with you right now. Please just let me get back to my work. But this is supposed to be your work. Oh no, he does have a point. Two people shouldn't be this difficult for the master trainer in restoration to heal. That said, he does come off as a prick. I traveled so far just for you to tell me that the ice cream machine is broken? Like, yeah, it sucks that the tree is withered, but maybe that's intentional. Which of the divines do you think is also responsible for lightning strikes? Trees being struck by lightning and burning up is a natural part of life. You can still meditate on its branches, on the meaning of that, instead of being mad that you didn't get to have the same experience that every other tourist had meditating under the living tree. Danica instructs us that we need to go to the parent tree, the Elder Gleam, and use Nettlebane to retrieve some sap. Maurice overhears this conversation and asks to tag along, because he wants to see the Elder Gleam. I, I don't care for Maurice. There are a decent number of religious pilgrims in Elder Scrolls, most of whom are not very smart, but Maurice is something else. I think it comes down to his overly judgmental cadence. My instincts to bully people are just screaming at me to shove him in a locker for the good of everyone else. We need the Elder Gleam Sanctuary and it's all nice and peaceful, but the core of the conflict here is that the followers of Kinnereth don't want us using Nettlebane to retrieve the sap. They think it'll hurt the tree. Does tapping a tree for sap once hurt them? Well, it doesn't hurt maple trees, which are much smaller and tapped much more frequently. Is it because it's a special knife? Well, whose fault is that except the giant tree that could only be tapped by one specific blade? But we need a choice in the quest and some conflict. Maurice and the worshippers don't want us to hurt the tree because we should respect nature and be peaceful, man. That's why all those wolves and bears out there ignored us as we traveled out here. However, if we tap the tree, then a bunch of angry Spriggans show up and slaughter everyone. Good, I didn't like them anyways, and I needed some Spriggan sap. I appreciate the message that nature is something to be conserved and respected, but Kinnereth worshippers usually come off as the same caliber as YouTube comments on animal videos. Those kinds of people are misanthropes who value nature above humanity no matter how drastically misinformed about the natural world they actually are. The choice also comes down to the actual quest resolution, the primary consequence being how thick the tree you ignore as you run past it is. Maurice's path leads to him praying to Kinnereth, which gives us a sapling to plant. Our path leads to the sap which restores the tree. You should take it to Whiterun. Danica will want to see that the true blessings of nature lie in renewal, not a slavish maintenance. Okay, but your path isn't renewal, it's replacement. The Gilder Green isn't dead, Danica says as much. It's slumbering and the sap will awaken it. The only reason we're trying so hard to awaken it now rather than letting it naturally return on its own is because people like you were complaining that the tree didn't have leaves. You are entirely the architect of your own demise. Why is it valid to preserve this ancient tree but not a slightly less ancient tree? This is like saying the way I should handle my grandmother being on dialysis is to pull the plug and find a newer, younger grandma at the bingo parlor because the true blessing of nature lies in renewal, not slavish maintenance. Plus, Maurice's option bugs out because the quest isn't scripted to remove the tree. It really is funny to see how many minor, easily fixed bugs are still present in the games. It's literally no work to add the command to the quest scripting to remove the tree. So what do I think of this quest? Well, for one, why isn't she called Kine? 
You didn't use the name Kinnereth because that's what she was called by the Imperials during the Knights of the Nine quest, did you? Instead of taking the golden opportunity to use this quest to flesh out a patron deity of the Nords, it's just a generic quest about nature. One of the advantages of my proposed fix is that you would have to be dragonborn to complete this quest, which I think is important due to the relationship between Kine, Parthenax, and the Way of the Voice. The only reason this quest is rooted, <laughs> rooted in Whiterun due to, you know, giant tree, we don't really learn about how the tree is significant to the people of Whiterun because Maurice is the primary character speaking to the perspective of healing the tree, and he's not from Whiterun. How about this? Due to recent events, focus on Talos worship is central, which is actually causing issue with the worship of the other eight divines. Maybe the Nords see worshipping the eight divines as worshipping elven gods, and so the practice is dying down. Danica then notes that the sudden rise in Heimskir's service has led to a withering support for her own temple, contributing to her inability to deal with the Gildergreen. The Gildergreen withering is a consequence of Whiterun's abandonment of Kine over Talos. That way, the story actually has something to do with Whiterun other than simply being set there. The Book of Love is less a single quest and more three subquests built around the same theme. A priestess of Mara in Riften, Dinya Baloo, will give us tasks to spread Mara's influence. Our first task takes us to Iverstead, to a young woman named Fastred. Fastred is in love with a man, but her parents don't approve of the relationship. Her mother's apathetic, but her father disapproves, mainly because it would involve his daughter moving to Riften. He thinks the romance is fleeting, just like it was with her previous boyfriend, Klimek. This is pretty much the inverse of the Camilla situation, where we're starting from the perspective of the girl. Bassianus Axius is a Nordic man with flowing red hair who catches fish for Klimek, who is the man responsible for delivering food to the Greybeards. Klimek is far more Nordic than Bassianus. The whole affair is really a metaphor for the setting. Fast Dread is Skyrim being forced to choose between the more imperialized Bassianus or the more Nordic Klimek. That said, our choice ultimately doesn't matter. Balu and Mara will accept either outcome, so it's more about which man you think would be better for Fastred. You don't look like a pilgrim. Why bother visiting Iverstead? Hm? What do you want? <sighs> what a boring conversation. Wait, you mean I should just tell her? Tell her how I feel? No, no, no. <laughs> Rule number one, boy. You never tell a girl that you like her. <laughs> it just makes you look like an idiot. Ismir's beard, you're right. The only reason we're here is that she prayed to Mara, because I guess her parents wouldn't approve of Bassianus. She's really no help in establishing her tastes beyond the fact that she finds Iverstead boring and wants to adventure. But I don't think Riften's a step up for her, so I talked to Clemic and told him to be more insert uh, assertive. Alright, a bit basic so far. Priestess Balu sends us to Markarth next to speak with Kalsemo. He has been infatuated with Fowling, who is Jarl Igman's housecarl. Despite the obvious age gap, he, for some reason, needs our help in negotiating the situation. I get what they're going for, right? Kalsemo, like a lot of Elder Scrolls fans, is a massive nerd who doesn't know how to deal with women. But why is it Kalsemo and not his nephew Ikentar, who is much younger? This may also be a metaphor for the Aldmeri occupation of Hammerfell, although it isn't as strong upon closer examination. The worry is that Fowling is a tough case. You know, from the nerds I've hung out with, I've seen this kind of dynamic fail only about 100% of the time. I think nerds are attracted to women like this because they see them reject bullies, but it never really works out. But whatever, I only help out like that when it's someone I know. I just have to get this car running long enough to sell it to someone else. Kalselmo recommends we talk to Ingvar because he's popular with the ladies. Wait, isn't that what we're here for? Why are we subcontracting? Well, it works out because he knows that Fowling secretly likes poetry and can adapt something for us for 200 gold. But I graduated from the Bard's College, surely... Never mind. We have to deliver it for him, but it works and the couple's united. Okay, this quest plays out funny if you've done the Civil War because Ingvar and Fowling can both be exiled from the city despite serving opposite sides of the conflict. The final leg is to reunite two ghosts who were tragically separated by war, and our reward for this is the permanent 15% magic resistance effect, but man. I am amazed this quest was recommended multiple times, although one person only recommended it because of the novelty of its reward. I mean, it is a pretty wholesome quest, especially for a game that's first instinct is to make us fight undead in a dungeon. 
The priestess does have a second quest though. She just wants us to pass out 20 pamphlets to spread the word about the temple in exchange for a potion. Had only Mara saved that poor animal. Other than the amusing responses you can receive though, and the opportunity to talk to people in Riften, this quest is also pretty basic. And we have very quickly gone down the list of recommended Skyrim side quests. There seems to be less fan favorite quests compared to Oblivion, at least when you subtract the Daedric quests. As an addendum towards the end of editing this part, the Daedric section of this video is going to be talking about a lot of artifacts. Not just the ones in Skyrim, but the ones added by the Creation Club as well, so it's probably good to lay out some basic facts that are universal for all of them. The UESP, funnily enough, defines an artifact as having all three of these requirements. Artifacts must have a unique appearance, appear only once in the game, and have a unique and useful enchantment. The enchantment rule is dumb and broken quite a bit. For instance, the Sword of Jigalag is listed, but it has no enchantment in Skyrim. Many enchantments are not unique. The most generic enchantment a weapon can have in Skyrim is just fire damage. And most of the enchantments are rather weak. In my view, an artifact by necessity should be a unique weapon. It should offer something that generic weapons you can craft or loot in a dungeon do not. There should be a competitive reason why you would use that artifact over an equivalent crafted and enchanted item. Skyrim breaks that rule quite a bit, probably half of its artifacts are outclassed by generic gear. In past games, this would be accomplished by either making the artifact a best-in-slot item, giving it a unique enchantment, or giving it several enchantments at the same time. That last one is important and somewhat overlooked in Skyrim. By complete coincidence, I'm being genuine, I completely forgot about this bow while playing Skyrim until I revisited my Oblivion save. In the endgame of both Oblivion and Skyrim, I ended up crafting a Madness Bow enchanted to do a ridiculous amount of damage. The best I could do in Oblivion was to give it 25 points of Absorb Health, but because I can get a perk at Enchanting 100 to allow me to place two enchantments, and I can take potions to make my enchantments more powerful, as well as Temporary Weapon to do more damage, well, the fact that the bow has a value that has suffered an integer overflow tells you how ridiculous it is. There is no bow artifact in Skyrim that can compare to this thing one-shotting every enemy in the game. But that's an exploit, and boring. Even if you stayed within the confines of how the system is probably meant to work, however, the fact that you can temper and perform two enchantments invalidates a lot of the unique artifacts in Skyrim. I'd hate to call upon Dark Souls yet again, but that is a series that provides weapon progression for both generic weapons and powerful artifacts, without either invalidating the other. While I can try my best to give each artifact a fair shot, ultimately there are simply too many now for me to dedicate what would probably be enough time to really evaluate their usefulness. That's the domain of some dedicated Elder Scrolls YouTuber to go figure out. I'm just focused on whether or not the item is a good reward. A lot of them aren't. Another thing to note that is fairly universal is the charge cost system. Enchanted items have a charge and cost value dictating how many uses you can get out of that item. Once depleted, the only way to recharge that item is with a soul gem. Initially I thought that was it, but then I learned that this ratio is affected by magicka cost reduction effects. Depending on the school of magic, typically destruction, wearing gear that reduces magicka costs also reduces the enchantment cost of that item, increasing the amount of usefulness you can get out of it. Here are my problems with this idea. Firstly, you have the issue of needing to recharge items with only soul gems, so you either have to be capturing souls or buying them from court wizards. This can make some weapons annoying to use. My example would be Volendrung, but this generally applies to any two-handed weapon, or any weapon with a low charge cost ratio. But I'm fairly certain the game does not tell you how enchantment drain works unless there's some loading screen tip I missed. If you're playing a warrior character, trying to make use of a melee weapon, you would look at a ring that reduces destruction magic cost by 20% and assume that's purely for wizards casting spells because it doesn't really make sense that the ring would make the enchantment on your weapon last 20% longer. So for example, an item having a charge of 3000 and a cost of 150 has 20 uses but wearing the 20% ring would reduce the cost to 120, giving us 5 more uses. So if you strive for 100% reduction, 
then weapons will have infinite charge, at the cost of having more useful enchantments like fortifying the damage of the weapon outright. This is just the classic case of Skyrim not informing a player about all of its mechanics. Moreover, enchant as a skill is back. In Morrowind, this directly affects the charge cost ratio, as well as how quickly items would recharge their enchantment. Because using soul gems to recharge items was designed as a short-term option for keeping the enchantment topped off while in a dungeon, but it would come back on its own. This made enchant a valuable skill even if you weren't planning on actually trying to enchant anything. Enchant doesn't really do anything like that in Skyrim. Other than a couple perks providing slightly more efficiency to weapon recharging, there are not perks that make items use less charge. So if you see a disparity between how many charges I say a weapon has and how many times you see me swing that weapon in footage, you can thank Bethesda for being unclear with how their system works. I do not have a problem with the premise of enchantment charging. It provides some modicum of enhanced performance in exchange for maintaining my equipment routinely. What I do have a problem with is forcing pretty much every player into becoming a soul thief just to keep their gear topped off. People are dying out there just so I can keep doing 15 points of fire damage. This is exactly the same as forcing every player to learn how to lockpick because you removed the alternatives. Soul trapping is not a good mechanic, for several reasons. The first is that Skyrim preserves the tradition of making it so you can trap a lower soul in a higher gem. That would be fine because it means you have to pay attention to your supply of soul gems as well as learn which enemies give what level souls, except doing that is super fucking tedious in Skyrim thanks to its horrific inventory interface. If this is how I'm supposed to play, please put soul gems in their own category in order of magnitude. They also made it so you can't hotkey a Zura star anymore. In Oblivion, this was super useful for keeping weapons recharged. I had a custom spell that would soul trap souls and do 100 points of drain health hotkeyed in order to finish enemies. Spellcrafting is another component of why soul trap is not good in Skyrim. And then I would use the star hotkey to recharge my weapon. This was a very smooth system. Skyrim makes it so you have to go to the inventory and charge the items there, which just adds more to the tedium. And then you have to remember to actually soul trap. Your options are a janky spell, a different enchanted weapon with the effect, or a dragon shout from Leighton Dawnguard. Pick your poison. Imagine for a second needing to hop into the interface, equip something to trap a soul, and then killing that enemy, and then going back into the interface again just to charge the item you wanted to use in the first place. And remember, Morrowind and Oblivion had these problems solved already. It was something you could wait or spend money or use hotkeys. I laugh when people complain about the older games being clunky when Skyrim literally removed the smooth edges of the enchant system and for no reason. I find all of this extremely baffling. Artifacts should feel unique to use. But I think a lot of players turn down the difficulty to use them, which in turn means that whatever uniqueness they provide is lost because players are more focused on trying to make the experience less tedious to play through. Ultimately then, outside of a couple actually unique items, the reward of these quests is more so the experience itself than the actual reward. If you can call it that. The Daedric quests are a tradition with Elder Scrolls since Daggerfall, although Morrowind would only do quests for seven of the original 16 Daedra, those seven specifically were all members of the Dunmer Pantheon, and some received multiple quests. Each game, in fact, has had wildly different approaches to this content. In Daggerfall, the Daedra would have specific days out of the years which they could be safely summoned. Performing the ritual was extremely expensive and had a chance of failure, both factors being determined by your reputation. Then you would add that Sheagorath had a small chance of randomly deciding that he wants to be summoned instead. Witch Covens could do the summoning all year, but if the ritual failed, you would be attacked by Daedra. Morrowind would rein this in. Instead of summoning Daedra on specific days, since time passes much more slowly, now you would find the shrines where they would task you with a quest. I think this change was made for two reasons. Daedra worship is more accepted in Morrowind, so it's incorporated into the world as being something relatively normal. And Daedra quests would be rewards for exploration. Personally, I would have preferred if the Daedra who weren't part of the Dunmer Pantheon still had summoning rituals, as the idea of going out of your way to summon a Daedra is itself a good premise for a quest. I would probably tie it to the phases of the moon, though, rather than specific days of the year. Oblivion upped the count to 15, but took away the Daedric ruins and instead placed the shrines out in the world to be found through waypoint markers on the compass. Instead, it would gate the quests through level requirements, as well as requiring donations to the shrine. 
I like the donation idea, however I felt some of them weren't strict enough. It would be great if every Daedric Shrine also had a 1000 gold requirement, which the priests take to finance their services. It would actually give us something to spend our currency on. Having all 15 Daedric Princes represented in Cyrodiil did not require a huge leap in logic, considering the region is a cultural melting pot. But Bethesda likely realized they doing the same thing in Skyrim could be an issue. So they did away with the majority of the shrines and had many more seemingly natural ways to start the quest. However, many of these are very in your face. One of the common observations I've seen made about Skyrim is that the Dragonborn is a slut who has pledged themselves to every god ever. This is also true of the Champion of Cyrodiil, Nerevarin, or the Agent, but those quests didn't force themselves upon the player the way that Skyrim does. I think the fear was that Bethesda didn't want to invest in this content without some guarantee of a return, that being players engaging with it and hopefully praising it on the internet. So they implemented a variety of methods to make sure the player is aware of its existence. Some of it is fairly simple, like being approached in the street by someone who isn't obviously associated with a Daedric quest. For instance, Clavicus Vile's quest begins because a guard asks if you've seen a dog out on the road. Others are less subtle, like receiving a note or being approached by someone who is obviously attached to an important quest. I've decided to order the quests by how overtly they advertise themselves to the player rather than my oblivion approach of doing the quests in order of level requirement. To be honest, the level requirements in Skyrim are almost entirely superfluous anyways due to the changes in level pacing. Only a couple quests are unlocked after level 20, so you can unlock most of the quests in the first couple hours of playing, compared to unlocking Daedric quests over the course of an entire Oblivion playthrough. If we're going to talk about overt quest advertisements though, then we have to talk about... A new hand touches the beacon. Meridia's quest is well known because it's impossible to avoid. What's funny is that I found the beacon sitting next to a totem of Hircine. In a spider cave I was pointed to radiantly. Meridia's beacon has a random chance of spawning in any boss chest in the game you open after level 12, and when you touch it, she'll proceed to blow out your speakers or headphones due to terrible audio balancing. Oh yeah, terrible audio production for the Daedra is also an Elder Scrolls tradition, so it's good to see Bethesda still hasn't dumbed that aspect down yet. To double down, Meridia also has an easily located shrine on the road between Solitude and Dragonbridge, which you'll likely pass during multiple quests in this region. Since fewer people have probably heard this though, I will play it for you. A new supplicant approaches. Listen, hear me and obey. A foul darkness has seeped into my temple. A darkness that you will destroy. But first, you must restore to me my beacon. I shall guide you unto it, find it and return here, and great shall be your reward. If you start with the statue, then you're sent to a radiantly selected dungeon to go get the beacon. I find that pretty amusing. Running into the beacon the first time was a pleasant surprise that would likely be an additional reward for the dungeon you were already doing, but being told to go do a random dungeon that has nothing to do with anything to get the beacon is lame, even though it's technically the same thing. It's pretty improbable that players will do it that way though, given how much has to line up for you to arrive at the temple at level 12 without having done anything that could chance you getting the beacon first. Meridia is bothered that no one is maintaining her temple, so this is going to be a quest where we find some followers for her, maybe even a man who will carve a new statue in her honor. No, we're going to fix this problem by killing a necromancer squatting in her dungeon. Look at my temple lying in ruins. So much for the constancy of mortals, their crafts and their hearts. You will enter my temple, retrieve my artifact, and destroy the defiler. You see what I mean? Now you might ask, Pat, is this just going to be a dungeon? And the answer is yes, followed by a but. Technically, this is just another Nordic ruin. But, littered throughout are these desecrated corpses. There are Imperial soldiers and Stormcloaks, and it looks like someone ported them to the PlayStation 2, then sucked the life force out of them. The main enemy here are these Corrupted Shades. They are technically just reskins of normal skeleton enemies, but I think there's a pretty cool effect being applied to them. I think it's important to note that it's not the fault of this quest or its designer that there are so few enemy types in Skyrim. I think that all things considered, being able to make a distinct enemy type out of existing enemies 
just by giving them a new look and a fancy effect is pretty creative. Given the person who made this quest probably didn't have the time or authority to create an entirely new enemy type. And for some reason the desecrated corpses are loaded, like minimum 25 gold per body. What's a little more desecration if we just take the money out of their funeral fund? I've always thought each time I've done this quest that it was a missed opportunity to not have the quest play out differently based on the number of corpses you loot. Like Meridia straight up chooses not to reward you if you loot more than half the bodies. Obviously the problem with that is that the game has not established that looting corpses is, you know, a moral evil. Like it's pretty okay if that person attacked you on the road, but most people who play Skyrim tend to be fairly prolific grave robbers because the game only ever playfully calls the player out for it. It just seems like with the new Radiant system that taking things off the body of the dead in town would result in a confrontation. Like, imagine if a police officer died, and then someone ran up and started stripping his body. I think the other officers are going to have an issue or two with that. The dungeon is otherwise generic. There is a gimmick with a beam of light we're guiding through the ruin, but it's just a gimmick. We aren't given the option to manipulate the beacons to move the light source around the room, unlocking optional paths or completing puzzles or anything complex like that. If you have the Atronex stone, you can use the beam of light to train restoration, since you'll absorb a ton of magicka while taking small amounts of health damage, allowing you to constantly gain skill XP. Finally, we get to Malkaran, who was a surprisingly tough fight for me. He has six shades and a phase two where he reanimates into what I assume is supposed to be a lich. Unfortunately, the difficulty stems not from any kind of strategic complexity, but simply because his numbers were really big, and my numbers weren't as big yet in the playthrough. Yet by default, he's already a better designed boss fight than Mana Marco from Oblivion. When he dies, Meridia tells us to draw Dawnbreaker from the pedestal. Funny thing is that you can duplicate Dawnbreaker, which I did accidentally. It's a Skyrim original artifact, meaning that it looks like a paddle rather than a sword. It's a mid-tier weapon, barring its one unique property, Meridia's Retribution. It says that when it kills an undead, it will occur, but it can actually still happen even if the target hasn't died yet. When used against undead forces, the sword can create an explosion of light. Any undead caught in the radius are set on fire and begin to flee, disintegrating if they die from the effect. That's actually pretty awesome, and other than a minor labeling error, is a pretty creative effect to have for a weapon. The problem, which is applicable to Oblivion and other artifacts in Skyrim, is that Dawnbreaker is a mid-tier weapon. The effect is cool, but it's not enough to make it compete for the spot of best weapon. The issue, as always, is scaling and boring combat. Look at the Morrowind Mace of Molech Ball. It's one of the best blunt weapons in the game. It has a good effect and very good damage. Then you get it in Oblivion and wonder what idiot made the effect with a duration of 0 seconds. It's still pretty good in terms of damage, but it's a much slimmer margin. Then you have the Skyrim Mace, and it's now worse than stuff you can make yourself. You also have to look at the ease of getting these items. In Morrowind, the mace was a reward for a tough Daedric quest located in a remote ruin. In Oblivion, the shrine is a lot easier to find, but the quest is still high level. In Skyrim, you can unlock the quest at level 1. The designers seem to hold the weapons back out of fear that players might find a weapon early into their playthrough that they'll decide never to replace, who will then say that the game is boring because they aren't getting better weapons with bigger numbers. It seems like a catch-22. They want to make the quests available early on, which is why you unlock most of them within a couple hours of starting your character. That's a desirable goal because you want players to do these interesting quests before they get bored. However, you don't want them getting an uber weapon, so you make a weapon that is powerful for the precise moment that they do the quest, but later drops off in comparison to generic items found in dungeons. This is also predicated on faulty assumptions about players. I mean, I assume. I don't think people are as bothered about using the same weapon for a long time in these kinds of games, because there are many people who will get the sword Umbra in Oblivion at level 1 and use it for their entire playthrough. It's also faulty because it's implying that there are meaningful differences in weapons. The only two things that meaningfully differentiate an Iron Sword and Dawnbreaker is the damage number and the enchantment. You can randomize the weapon models in Skyrim and as long as you don't show weapon stats, you probably won't be able to tell the difference. Compare that with a Souls game. The Greatsword and the Uji Katana are two very different weapons, but Skyrim would just classify both as two-handed swords. As far as Dawnbreaker goes, its usefulness is situational to Undead Ruins. This is akin to using holy damage in an area with skeletons in a FromSoft game, except using a mace enchanted with holy damage will actually kill skeletons, while most other weapons just knock them down. It's an area where certain playstyles have a distinct advantage over others that they normally don't have. 
In Skyrim, you can just make up for not having specialized anti-undead weapons by having weapons that do lots of damage. I didn't mention it, but when Meridia talks to us, she pulls us up into the sky. A cool effect for Skyrim if you forget that Knights of the Nine did it first. It can also cause a ton of bugs. It's also strange that they placed the shrine here. In Oblivion, this scene took place in the center of the map, so you could look around and see the entire open world from a new angle. Whereas in Skyrim, we're near the western border, so there's a lot less for us to see. Meridia wants us to take Dawnbreaker and purge corruption from the world so that her religion will grow. We can affirm or reject this, but it doesn't matter or change anything. It matters not. You said it, not me. The plant cares nothing for the rays that bring it the warmth of the sun. As you carry Dawnbreaker, so will my light touch the world. Meridia is another on the long list of victims of Oblivion. She was supposed to be a fairly important deity to the Iliads, but was lost during the Great Glossian Over. Skyrim was not the time to contextualize her, because as far as we were aware prior to Skyrim, she had nothing to do with the Nords. It's a shame because she is interesting. It's true that she's kind of a generic, undeath-hating Golden Angel archetype, but she's unique among the Daedric Princes for seeming so benevolent. At least on the surface. She is actually an incarnation in the idea that heaven and the angels might be as horrifying as hell and the demons, a force of order and holiness that does not tolerate mortal imperfection. She could be interesting, being one of the superficial good Daedra like Azura, but in reality being as terrible a force as any of the others. A gateway drug of Daedra, but she's not. Other than a harsh tone, she's just a good Daedra. There are plenty of women in Skyrim with harsh tones, so that alone doesn't really communicate anything. Meridia's forceful insertion into the playthrough makes her a commonality in Skyrim discussions. If Bethesda had thought this through, they might have tried to make the quest or reward more interesting, which is why I think the beacon showing up in boss chests was a mild oversight. They didn't realize how early into a playthrough players would hit the level requirement and find this beacon compared to every other possible Daedric quest in Skyrim. The next quest to talk about is Hermaeus Mora. He's gone from being the last Daedra quest you can do in Oblivion to probably one of the first, as his quest begins during the main quest, specifically during the quest to retrieve the Elder Scroll. There's actually a really good reason they made this change, narratively at least. You also aren't forced to do the quest as part of the MQ, only to start it. So if you decide to ignore the crazy old man because you have a world to save, you're given the option to do just that. Funny thing though, the quest still has a level requirement. Which is confusing because the main quest does not, but yeah. Septimus will blow you off if you haven't reached level 15 when you return to him with the lexicon. I have never experienced this because level 15 is nothing and I usually hit it just by doing the main quest. I would guess this is a fairly common experience, unless you're doing the quest line entirely hand-to-hand, -hand, unarmored, letting followers fight everything, or not activating level ups. It's weird that there is a level requirement to this quest at all. So obviously, the first part of this quest involves a large dwarven ruin and a visit to Blackreach. I hope you didn't forget to grab the lexicon though, otherwise you're going to have to go back and get it. Honestly, I am surprised the lexicon isn't just automatically added to your inventory as soon as you complete the puzzle, but that's probably just an oversight. Septimus knows the Dwimmer puzzle box can only be opened with Dwimmer blood, a conveniently specific mechanism to associate with an extinct race of people. But wait, what if we just harvested the dried blood of the armor of a famous dwarf? <laughs> Does anybody else remember that part of Oblivion's main quest? Oh, that doesn't work anymore. Instead, Septimus figures that a facsimile can be created using the blood of modern elves. You might say, gee, that sure sounds familiar to Hermaeus Mora's quest in Oblivion, and you would be right. It's actually less commitment, though. You need half as many samples, and instead of stealing their souls, you're just taking a blood donation. However, that's not how blood magic works. If it was, there wouldn't be any point to doing it. If the goal of such a system is to prevent anybody outside your racial group from acquiring the item inside, maybe because it's too dangerous for the less advanced races, or you're just being a selfish prick, then being able to bypass that defense by smashing together the blood of other types of elves would defeat that entire purpose. There were already three different elvish racial groups in this area before the Dwemer even disappeared. Further, I don't track the logic here. When this system was designed, the Dunmer would have actually been the Chimer. Would their blood not have changed during Azura's curse? That same logic applies to the Orsimer, who were also transformed as a race. What about the Falmer? They might be similar to the Dwemer, except the Dwemer did something to them that changed their physiology. 
Why would the Altmer and Bosmer be able to contribute to this either? Both racial groups split after the Dwemer's departure and lived across the continent from them. If the goal was to create pure Aldmer blood, then maybe it's a sign that each racial group contributes a different aspect of that blood. But why do you need five different branches of elf blood to recreate a sixth branch? It's not even necessary, you didn't have to introduce this idea of blood seals, but now that you have, you have to answer how we're going to get Dwemer blood. That is a tough premise to write yourself out of, hence why you shouldn't have dug this hole in the first place. All Herma Mora wanted those souls back in Oblivion for was a divination that his followers were doing. How about this? Instead of needing the blood of a Dwemer, you need a bunch of black souls from non-Dwemer. It's like a sacrifice, a test of whether or not you're a dwarf. Dwarves would have no issue killing a bunch of pink skins to open it. This really only works in conjunction with my proposal to only have named NPCs give grand black souls, so you need to kill five named NPCs to complete this quest. The reason you need the NPC sacrifice element is, well, there are plenty of bandits and generic NPCs we're able to donate to the blood drive. Make no mistake, Oblivion absolutely had the same issue with this quest. It was easy to get soul donations from generic unnamed NPCs, so you never had to pick and choose amongst the civilian population. As we go to leave, we're confronted by a love curly tentacle monster. If you were wondering where Hermaeus Mora was in Hermaeus Mora's quest, he's finally arrived. Her memora indicates that once Septimus has opened the box, he won't be necessary anymore, and that we should take his place. We're given a binary dialogue response, and we either choose emphatic support or extreme prejudice. It changes nothing, which is why I wonder why there isn't a middle-of-the-road option. It's just one more line for Hermaeus Mora and an opportunity for the player to sit on the fence a little while longer. By the way, that wretched mass of tentacles actually used to be a void, but this was changed after the Dragonborn expansion. He has lines if you completed that questline first, but it's just an acknowledgement of having already met. I should mention here, because this kind of turns into a repeat problem with these quests, but the designers are big fans of writing the Daedric Princes as being treacherous in Skyrim, especially Hermaeus Mora. So much so, it's pretty obvious the player really should not be hanging around with these guys which is out of character. In Daggerfall, Morrowind, and Oblivion, if the Daedra wanted someone dead, it was usually either someone else's servant or someone who had pissed them off. In fact, the motivation of some of the princes was actually to kill someone who had been bothering their loyal servants. However, Mora says he intends to replace Septimus as soon as we get the lockbox open, and this won't be the last time something like this happens. It is a minor detail, but it changes the nature of the Daedric princes somewhat. The Daedra made sense to serve from the perspective that they take care of their own as long as you are both loyal and capable. But Mora presents the situation like his payroll is only allowed to have one regional servant. Surely having both Septimus and ourselves would be useful to him. Unless he's trying to save us the awkward conversation of trying to split the reward. Another thing to note is the presentation difference. Part of the change in perception of the Daedra can be owed to their more material presence in Skyrim. In Daggerfall you'd meet them in person, but it was sort of meeting them in the middle. Plus, nobody really remembered Daggerfall until Jeweler made his video. In Morrowind and Oblivion, you would talk to their statues. It made the rare few times you actually encountered an in-the-flesh Daedric Prince all the more special. You only met Azura at the end of the Morrowind and Tribunal main quests, and her scene at the end of the Blood Moon. You saw Mehrin's Dagon at the end of Oblivion's main quest, and you directly interacted with and served Sheogorath during the Shivering Isles, and fought Jigalag after becoming Sheogorath. In Skyrim, we are going to meet four Daedric Princes in person and meet aspects of another four. Nocturnal and Hermaeus Mora would be fine as the two princes we meet as part of questlines, but there are other princes we will be meeting in person for no real good reason. I do not recall any Oblivion videos complaining about the Daedric quest statues in Oblivion being structurally repetitive, even though you could make that claim. Now I don't want to get into any Catholic reasons why these changes to the Daedra may have been made, I think most of it can be chalked up to differences in presentation, but the gaps between the gods and the player character is certainly smaller in Skyrim than past games, and that is something that a lot of people notice. Searching for donors for our project is a rather free-form affair, which I actually do appreciate. We need a thing, it's up to you and your experience with the game to figure out where best you're going to get that thing. That's a good quest prompt for an open-world style game. 
It's simple, and it means that every person's account of this quest is going to differ. You can try to find existing corpses, you can try to find living hostiles, or you can murder people for their blood. It all hinges on you, your character, and your choices what happens. With the blood drive complete, Septimus opens the cube, which has a non-Euclidean interior, and reveals that it's not Lorcan's heart inside, but a book. Hermamora then kills him, gives us the book, and the quest is done. Why, both in-universe and narratively, was it necessary to say that Lorcan's heart was inside the box? In fact, why would Septimus even be interested in finding the heart? True, it is powerful, but without Kagranak's tools, there's not much you can do with it. Maybe he doesn't know that. Although one wonders how he would even know about the heart then. The heart of Lorcan was not public knowledge, and apparently since it's canon that the Mage's Guild character of Morrowind did not have their research into the dwarves published, then it's fair to say the relationship between the heart of Lorcan and the tools of Kagranak likely died before the turn of the Third Era with the Tribunal and the Nereverine. I don't quite track why Septimus, a scholar who had studied the Elder Scrolls, would be more interested in Lorcan's heart and less interested in a book the dwarves deemed necessary to lock away. Narratively, I also don't quite understand the point of all this, other than a callback. Most players aren't even going to know what Lorcan's heart is, or why it's significant. In fact, more players might actually respond if you said that it was the Ogma Infinium, because there's a higher chance people would know what that is from having played Oblivion than from having completed Morrowind's main quest. And now we have to ask what exactly the Ogma Infinium is doing here. Oh, of course, Daedric artifacts don't exist linearly. They can travel around and exist in multitudes. That's a really neat band-aid fix whenever you have a continuity issue. If the lockbox is truly dwarven, then the book has been here for centuries, not millennia. I'm going to chalk it up to Hermaeus Mora saying centuries instead of millennia, as Bethesda's usual habit of not understanding how calendars work. If the lockbox isn't dwarven, but in fact the fabrication of some entity faking a lockbox and putting a theoretically impossible to solve blood seal on it, then at most it's been here for, I don't know, 200 years? But who would do that? And why? The answer? Well, of course, that Daedric artifacts don't exist linearly and manifest and unmanifest at whim to service the need of the writers. It's basically the same problem with the Elder Scrolls having their own intelligence and performing necessary actions to facilitate the plot. If you're going to write that the items and gods are capable of doing literally anything, you're by proxy stating that the Elder Scrolls and the Agma Infinium are willingly trying to be in boring stories. Given the 200 year time skip, there are certainly ways to justify the book being there, even as simply as saying Herma Mora put it there as a test and he was just toying with Septimus. If Hermaeus Mora can just take the Agma Infinium out of the lockbox at any time in order to give it to adventurers that serve him, then why does he even care that the dwarves locked it in a box? Shouldn't he just laugh at them and reclaim it? Why do you even need it to be the Agma Infinium? It was in most of the games, except Morrowind, so I guess they just figured it was a tradition and they weren't going to let lore get in the way of the story. Why not create a new artifact? We aren't told the Infinium is inside, so it's not like Bethesda hyped us up for an item and then switched the item and- oh, wait, no, they did do that. How about this? Inside the box is a scroll. Septimus says that it's an Elder Scroll, then inspects it and realizes that it's actually a dwarven attempt at creating an Elder Scroll. Before he tries to read it, he turns to Ash and Hermaeus Mora tells us to read it. We do, and we're instantly taught a dragon shout called Stop Time. There are a lot of ways I think this works better. You've already tied this story to the main quest, which actually creates new opportunities because it means you can just assume the player at this point will accept that they're the Dragonborn. It also matches what was going to happen in the Dragonborn DLC, which I've always assumed Bethesda knew was going to involve Hermaeus Mora. Be warned. Many have thought as you do. I have broken them all. You shall not evade me forever. Stop Time is also a universally useful ability for all playstyles, as well as being a fittingly powerful reward that's going to make serving Mora in the future all the more tempting. If you're working under the assumption that Bethesda always meant for Dragonborn to play out the way it does, then you could even have a word of the shout be unlocked by each expansion. We learn the first word here, which is also fitting because you have to do the Elder Scroll quest in Dawnguard as well. Then maybe we see Mora again in Dawnguard, who gets another quest that can reward the Infinium and the second word, increasing the amount of time that is stopped, and you get the third word in Dragonborn. I know it's a bigger ask than I'm usually comfortable doing, but I feel like creating something new for Mora to give us is a lot better than reprising an old artifact that still generally does the same old thing, especially when having that artifact be there creates unnecessary questions. The Infinium itself hasn't changed much, but has gradually gotten weaker. 
In Arena, it would give you 50 extra stat points to assign to your attributes. In Daggerfall, it was reduced down to just 30 bonus attribute points. In Oblivion, it did just 20 bonus attribute points, but would do 30 skill points, but all in preset amounts rather than at the player's discretion. In Skyrim, we get 5 points for each skill in the specialization of our choice, or 30 skill points in total. You also cannot use the book to fortify skills past 100 anymore. Basically, you just determine which skills you find the most tedious to level and decide from there. Once you get into the late 80s in the skills, you get all the free skill ups from quests, then read the skill books, and then read the Infinium, and you should be pretty close to 100 in everything. Skill points are a lot less valuable than attribute points, but there are no attribute points anymore. No, oh, wait, fuck, they are in the Skyrim tabletop war game. You would think that you might also get a plus 50 or something to the juice of that specialization, like Path of Might gives you plus 50 health in addition to all the level ups. How do we get the most bang for our buck from the Infinium? Well, the magic tree levels up magic skills in general, which can be annoying to go from 90 to 100 without using free magicka exploits. The problem with combat is that it levels archery, one-handed, two-handed, and block, so you're likely to level combat skills you don't use just to get five points in one or two that you do. Smithing is under combat, but is actually one of the easiest skills to grind. Stealth has a couple of the more tedious skills, like sneak, speech, and lockpick, but then alchemy and pickpocket are some of the easier skills to level. Plus, stealth doesn't level any of its combat skills because one-handed and archery are in the combat section. So, yeah, I think Path of Magic's probably best. Anyways, this quest isn't too bad, although one would hope so given that this is likely what they intended to be the most obvious Daedric quest. Marin's Dagon's quest begins similar to most Creation Club content, through the Courier. I guess technically you could start it if you happen to be walking the streets of Dawnstar after level 20. The reason I've placed this third in the order of Daedric quest pushed onto the player is because it is literally hand delivered to you after level 20. Got something I'm supposed to deliver. Your hands only. It's the Dagon Museum Let's pamphlet. See here. There's a new museum opening yep. up in Dawnstar. That makes it one of the highest level requirements in the game, but level 20 is much quicker to reach in Skyrim than previous titles. An unintended side effect is that many of the pieces of Creation Club content begins in an identical manner. A courier runs up and hands you a note, beginning the quest. So, if someone were to be playing Skyrim for their first time, post-anniversary edition, there's a chance this quest might get lost in the myriad of times the courier comes running up to throw more quests into your journal. The pamphlet is for the Museum of the Mythic Dawn, which has opened in Dawnstar. That's... well, it's something to be sure. The fact that Silas Vesuvius has opened his museum, in his house, in Dawnstar, without charging money for admission, but paying to advertise, says that this is a man who has probably worked his entire life and is having a midlife crisis. It's no secret that my family were once members of the Mythic Dawn. One of my forefathers was even chosen to assassinate Uriel Septim himself. We hid from our past for years, became tradesmen, people of coin and influence. But I realize that the Mythic Dawn's importance, our importance, to history cannot be denied. Well, it's good that you have a passion for history. I'll see everyone in Tamriel remember that for a moment, we held the fate of the world in our hands, for good or ill. Yeah, it's definitely a midlife crisis. The local court wizard is trying to convince Silas to not do this, but she says that he shouldn't because his ancestors wouldn't want it. Um, his ancestors were members of a cult. They actually probably do want this. What's surprising is that the Jarl allows this. You would think both Skald the Elder and Brina Morales would both have an issue with how Silas is operating his museum. It's one thing to showcase a collection of items from the past, see any Civil War museum in America. It's another thing to have those items on display because you think it's time that people acknowledge your significance. Silas will give us a tour through his museum. Here's my issue. Silas has a small museum because it's inside his house. However, Skyrim's portrayal of an actual museum is not much more impressive. It fits that the Mythic Dawn Museum is small and pathetic because it's a reflection of its owner. But then you have a famous researcher of the Dwimmer, and his museum is both close to the public and has even less items of significance. Silas has the scabbard of Mehrun's razor and a page of the Mysterium Xarxes. There's more value in his shack than the entire Dwimmer Museum, at least without the Creation Club. This is an issue Skyrim runs into a lot. It wants to portray an epic battle, but it'll only have 10 people participate. It wants to portray a grand elaborate ruin, but it makes a really long hallway. It wants to create a complex puzzle and then has you mash buttons. I wouldn't be surprised if Silas in the design doc is supposed to be a wealthy, retired businessman living inside of his manor, 
and then this is how that vision got executed. This quest is, of course, predicated on a lot of Oblivion nostalgia, but I do not consider it to be nostalgia bait. The quest isn't trying to ride on the notion of, member Oblivion? It's fitting that Mehrunes Dagon's quest following the game where he was the principal antagonist is going to tie together the Mythic Dawn and Mehrunes Razor into one story, since the Razor was actually DLC for Oblivion. Speaking of, there is a piece of Creation Club content I want to discuss that is fitting with this storyline. It was originally $9 and titled The Cause, and is about a group of Mythic Dawn cultists trying to open a new Oblivion Gate. The amulet is shattered. Dagon is defeated. With the dragon's blood and the amulet of kings, we have sealed the gates of Oblivion. Forever. Listen, I know that Shea Gorath bent the rules to say that as long as his gate was just an invitation, that it wouldn't violate the rules of the ending of Oblivion. But I'm pretty sure opening an Oblivion gate to the Deadlands is a violation of those rules. The ending of Oblivion was actually about stopping specifically this from happening. This quest also starts with a letter from a courier, but this time at level 46. That's a curious place to put it. As you may recall, most leveled items in Skyrim reach their final tier at specifically level 46. And as I've noted before, most reviewers will not reach this point. I don't know if that makes it fitting to put this creation at this specific level, but sure. The Mythic Dawn are still kicking. It was mildly implied that the cult hinged around its leader, like most cults do, Mankar Cameron. He, um, died in the events of Oblivion. So them managing to still be around after 200 years is definitely kicking dirt on the legacy of the champion of Cyrodiil. I guess after the Nereverine, it's his turn to have his legacy ruined. Were the Blades not able to track these guys down? There is a difference between Silas's family managing to survive and the cult being able to reform and continue operation. The reason that Rush Nisa's cult Osho was able to reform and continue their operations after the death of their leader, even after a bioterror attack and an attempted assassination, was that the FBI didn't have the legal authority to exterminate their new leadership like the Blades would have had with the Mythic Dawn. And I mean, that's not to say that like the Osho cult is full of domestic terrorists, like the Mythic Dawn, then again, the whole point of the Creation Club seems to be to cash in on nostalgia, even if it means further corroding the legacy of prior protagonists. In essence, this is what nostalgia bait actually looks like, cashing in on things that should be, well, impossible, simply because exploiting nostalgia for cash is profitable. For starters, most of the story here is almost entirely told through written journals. Given that the DLC is the creation of one person, that being Rob Vogel, Hi, I'm Robert Vogel, uh, Vogel Dynamics, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about the draw. This quest is mostly just a showcase of levels, and the story just exists to justify why we're seeing this stuff. Which is pretty weird because there are ways to do that without bringing back the Mythic Dawn or an Oblivion Gate. Over the course of looking into these Mythic Dawn guys, who do not conjure their armor by the way, we end up in an alien ruin called Riel. This is kind of cool, however instead of using updated Oblivion assets, it's actually using Blades assets, which means that the parasitic relationship is now going both ways. Instead of Blades just stealing stuff from Skyrim, now Skyrim is also stealing stuff back from Blades. However, it does mean that I can easily show the difference in the two styles of dungeons. I would say that if the Iliad Ruin wasn't Skyrimified. By that I mean these urns have been placed everywhere that they wouldn't be in Oblivion and the enemies are all reskins of Draugr. I will say the reimagined Iliad assets actually look like improvements over Oblivion unlike the Dwemer Ruins. But it was gut-bustingly hilarious to enter this ruin, get excited that a Creation Club quest was actually doing something new and cool, and then realizing it was actually just Blade's assets filled with reskin Skyrim enemies and level design philosophies. It's cool that they added this tile set to the Skyrim SE Creation Kit because it means that people have access to these assets, but it is amazing that even a decade later, Skyrim's level design ethos is present in mods for the game. It implies that the designer was angling to get a job at Bethesda like this was his resume, and that he's trying to show that he can make the terrible dungeons too. So after we fight a reskinned dragon priest that is supposed to represent an alien lich, the Vigil of Stendar show up. I guess spoilers for Dawnguard, but these guys got wiped out. That's what I love about the Creation Club. I can't stop imagining someone's first time playing Skyrim being the Anniversary Edition, where they stumble upon this quest that's done entirely without dialogue, in an area type they've never seen before, and in an order they were told that likely doesn't exist anymore, shows up to take control of the ruin. 
It's not a stretch either. Again, based on the average level of reviewers, I can say that most players barely even reach level 46 before they've played most of the game's content. We came to Riel to claim a Great Welkin Stone, and now we head to the Mythic Dawn base. Okay, I feel like someone has misunderstood the story of Oblivion. The Great Welkin Stone was needed for the portal to Paradise, not the actual Oblivion Gates. We're given the option to sneak through the Mythic Dawn base by wearing a set of their robes, that's basically the extent of it. You wear the robes and they won't attack you. At this point, I should mention that this is very similar to the infiltration of the Dagon Shrine during Oblivion. However, copying that quest is a belie of the reference. There was a similar quest in Shivering Isles, Symbols of Office. One of our objectives of this quest is to acquire one of the eyes of the leader of the Apostles of the Light. While you can cut a bloody swath through the dungeon, you can also acquire a set of Apostle robes. However, the quest differs because you are given the option to supply some rebels among the apostles with weapons in order to take out the leader. Of course, that is nothing to say of the Thalmor Embassy quest. Copying only the robes aspect of the Dagon Shrine quest is to miss later attempts to develop this idea. Now this quest is certainly punching up for a creation club piece. My argument is not that its creator did not at least try. My argument, really, is that it should have never been created in the first place. Are we really supposed to celebrate what is almost a parody of bad design? Had I known about this creation when I was making the Oblivion video, I might have shown a greater appreciation for the effort involved. We defeat the head cultist summoning Maroons, but the journal informs us that it was a trick and killing him was actually the final step of the ritual, causing the Oblivion gate to open. Again, I was mildly excited by this. There is no way this creation is going to do an Oblivion gate, is there? There absolutely was, and this is not that bad. It's pretty cool to see a modern incarnation of the Deadlands, and it's not as badly Skyrimified. It is pretty small, and you don't get to close the gate, because I think they wanted players to be able to get the ported over Oblivion ingredients, but that means we don't get a Sigil Stone out of the deal. The Vigil of Stindar secure the cave, but I guess they're just going to watch the gate and stop things from coming out of it. Forever. And we get a couple of things from it. We get a new Daedric course that we can summon, and we get the weapons Torment and Scourge. They're pretty alright. Torment is a new creation, but it's based off the Daedric Longsword model from Morrowind. The Daedric weapons in Morrowind looked way cooler and less edgy than Oblivion and Skyrim's versions, and it's not really nostalgia bait since this is a new weapon. The other one is Scourge. With this one, I think they were trying to reference another weapon from Morrowind, not realizing it actually comes from Battlespire, and was notable for banishing a Daedra that once tried to wield it. The designers didn't know that, and they put it in the hands of a Dremora. So, yeah, a nostalgia beta creation that kind of did some cool things by adding in assets from the previous games. Not the worst, but not $9 in content. Dawnguard was originally $20, meaning that this is being priced at almost half of Dawnguard. Now that you've seen this, it should be immediately apparent what the difference between a quest like the Pieces of the Past and The Cause is. The Cause is entirely predicated on being excited to see stuff that you remember from Oblivion. But if Skyrim was your first Elder Scrolls game, then you might not even understand the significance of what is happening. You can't say the same for Pieces of the Past, which is a self-contained package. Knowing about Oblivion is nice, but unnecessary to understand what is happening, and not simply because Silas exposits about it. You don't need to have played through the Mehrin's Razor DLC, or have gotten it in any of the previous games to understand why it's significant here. It is significant because an order of men that split the weapon into pieces exists, if people are trying this hard to stop us from completing the Razor, then that suggests that it's a dangerous weapon. We're given instructions about the three divisions of the weapon and where they're located. Silas is paying us, of course, because he's interested in having the completed weapon for his museum. We can chalk that up to a historical misunderstanding, since Mehrin's Razor didn't actually have anything to do with the Oblivion Crisis or the Mythic Dawn, although Mankar Cameron did apparently have it at one point. There are three locations, and two of them are dungeons. The Pommel is in the hands of the Forsworn at Dead Crone Rock. The Shards of the Blade are kept in the vault of a stronghold of Orcish Bandits. And the Hilt is in the possession of a mill owner in Morthal. I've always liked that division. Sure, the pieces ended up with the descendants of each person, and two of those were militant orders, but one of those is also just some guy that you have to persuade. It would have been very easy for the designer to make us run a Dwemer Ruin or a Nordic Crypt for the third piece. I'm glad they didn't. With all three pieces, Silas will compensate us for the job and then offer us more gold to meet him at Mehrin's Dagon's Shrine. 
This part starts to grate on me. Don't get me wrong, it's a cool shrine and someone definitely put in the work. But why is it here? There's not even an old journal inside from the original builders explaining who built this place. In the history of surface shrines in Elder Scrolls, we go back to Morrowind. Both Boethia and Azura had open air shrines, although Boethia's was at the bottom of the ocean. Thing is, it makes sense. Both were considered to be the good Daedra in the Dunmer Pantheon. In Oblivion, most of the Daedric princes had open air shrines except Mirrod's Dagon. His was in a cave. This seemed to be a gameplay thing rather than an actual implication about imperial culture. They just wanted players to be able to easily find all the Daedric shrines for quests, and Mehrun's Dagons had to be in a cave because it's, you know, part of the main quest. In Skyrim, Azura and Boethia both have open-air shrines. Makes sense, a lot of Dunmer moved into the region, the shrines are in areas they moved to, and there was a cultural revival in the Dunmer worship of Daedra, and Azura's shrine is even stated to have been constructed as a consequence of the Red Year. And then you have Mehrun's Dagon, with this absurdly big and detailed shrine located in a difficult region to access. I know that the idea is supposed to be that Skyrim is massive, so there's bound to be something like this out there. It just strains my suspension of disbelief. Organized and morally accepted religions making massive temples and shrines is one thing, although even Talos or Shore have not received shrines this massive. Let's compare this to the real world. Mount Rushmore is a massive sculpture which has four faces of former American presidents. It was conceived to increase tourism to South Dakota, and is extremely controversial. The project had received federal funding, an equivalent of $17 million in today's money. However, it ended before being fully realized because the man in charge died in 1941 and the project ran out of money, probably because there was a world war being fought at the time. What's there is how much of the sculpture they were able to complete after 14 years, despite having the blessing of the federal government, adequate funding, decent seasons to work in, 400 workers, and advanced technology like drilling and dynamite. The project was ostensibly an expression of American expansionism. It was done by a man who was involved in KKK politics and contributed to the Confederate memorial carving, which depicts Jefferson Davis, Robert Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. However, the purse holders hated him, fired him, and destroyed his contribution to the project, and there was even a warrant issued for his arrest in the state. Gutsan Borglum would then, only a couple years later, begin working on Mount Rushmore, which ended up including Abraham Lincoln, an American president that Berglund was such a big fan of that he even named his son after him, who, if you don't remember, was the president of the Union during the Civil War. The guy was just a big fan of Americana. Mount Rushmore ended up being a massive point of contention with the Sioux Nation. A controversial response to Mount Rushmore was the Crazy Horse Memorial. It had started actually as a letter written by a Lakota preservationist named Luther Standing Bear to Gutzon Borglum, requesting that the face of Crazy Horse be added to Mount Rushmore, which was ignored. My dad gave me a book about Crazy Horse as a kid, so I was surprised at how few people actually knew about him or his history. He was a Lakota war leader in the 19th century who joined the war against the US government over treaty violations. He is best known for the Battle of the Rosebud, in which he delayed reinforcements to Colonel Custer, leading to a native victory at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. However, Crazy Horse generally refused to allow himself to be photographed, and was buried as such to prevent memorials ever being built on the side of his grave. Like a lot of revolutionaries, he wanted his legacy to be justice for his people, not remembrance of him. A common criticism of the Crazy Horse Memorial then is about whether or not it actually should exist. Its builders are allowed to construct it legally, but have refused funding from the government, instead sourcing their own money from visitors and donors. The real point here is to contrast these two real-life sculptures and the difference between the ease of their construction. Even with years of time and adequate funding, Mount Rushmore was a fraction of the intended final project. What is finished is still massive, however Washington's face is 60 feet or 18 meters tall vertically, which by my rough eyeballing is still larger than the entire Mehrun's Dagon sculpture which is at most 16 meters tall. But this part of Skyrim is extremely remote and would be difficult to work in. Whoever built it also didn't have funding like Mount Rushmore did, or the blessing of the American federal government. So it should be closer to the Crazy Horse Memorial, which is just a face. Granted, it's a big face at 28 meters tall, but it also took 50 years to carve. Yeah, between 1948 and 1998, all that was accomplished was just the face. This is because the project is done entirely by donations, but even with modern advancements is still extremely slow going. Now sure, the people in charge are not cultists trying to secretly construct an unsanctioned monument out in the wilderness. This is all just a fun excuse to have a little bit of history mixed in with the statement that the sculpture of Mehrun's Dagon is silly. 
You might answer that the builders had magic, but that isn't really an applicable excuse. Fireballs, I guess, could be an adequate replacement for dynamite, but Elder Scrolls is low fantasy in the sense that its magic isn't just a do-whatever-you-want solution. Unless the secrets of rock-carving magic has just been lost with teleportation and flight. We actually participated in the creation of a Daedric sculpture in Morrowind, and it was done by a barely literate orc who was certainly non-magical. He just needed a giant rock and some money to pay workers. He did get it done in three weeks though, which is more a gameplay thing than an actual statement about the grind set of sculptors in this setting. If the banders inside are supposed to imply that the mythic Dawn built this shrine, then hilariously this could be a pretty big piece of evidence that Mehrin's Dagon got what he wanted out of the Oblivion main quest. Hard to imagine he would lose the Oblivion Crisis and then commission a giant, difficult to build statue of himself. I have no doubts he would want the statue built, but would he allocate those resources and followers to it if he hadn't just achieved a massive W? Mehrunes is not thrilled to repair the we- wow, the Weezer. <laughs> Mehrunes is not thrilled to repair the Weezer for a weak man like Silas, so he asks us to kill him. Mehrunes is not thrilled to repair the Razor for a weak man like Silas, so he asks us to kill him. It's technically a choice, but it's one of those choices that's overwhelmingly one-sided. Sparing Silas nets us 500 gold, and that's it. Killing Silas results in us receiving the rebuilt Mehrunes Razor. Seems like an obvious choice to me. I'm personally in need of a new letter opener. You can make it a self-defense situation by not answering Silas, which causes him to attack you. So, funny thing, the razor is completely unchanged from Oblivion. It doesn't disintegrate armor anymore because armor durability is no longer a mechanic. It has a chance to instantly kill the opponent, but that chance no longer scales with your luck value because luck as a mechanic is removed. Since that means we have the lowest luck value possible, the chance to kill is still just 2%. It's still a novelty, it has infinite charges on its enchantment, it does decent damage, so it's just a fun little combat dagger that isn't actually suited to assassinations because of how stealth damage works. Dagon also sends two Dramora to kill us as a final test, which opens another reward of the quest, the Shrine. It's a one-room dungeon full of valuables as well as some Dramora, which you can kill for their hearts and use as death thralls, allowing you to have a wild posse. All that said though, it's hard to really claim that this is somehow better than the Morrowind era of quest design. We're just running two dungeons and bringing a knife back to him, which is slightly more ceremony to distinguish the Skyrim version. Whatever upgrades in voice acting and quest scripting loses that element of getting the knife being an actually dangerous endeavor back in Morrowind. Sanguine's quest starts in the first tavern you enter after hitting level 14. It doesn't immediately present as such, so if you're busy, there's a chance you might just miss it. It's kind of unfair placing Sanguine fourth on this list. I mean, technically it's one of the most intrusive quests since Sam Guavine will show up at any inn you visit after level 14, a low bar. But it also doesn't make it obvious that it's even a Daedric quest. You might perk your eyebrow up at the black robe, or the fact that the Sanguine quest starts with a guy named Sam Guavine. But I don't know. It's still a good kind of subtle. Sam challenges us to a drinking contest, offering us a staff if we win. The main thing I like here is the lack of urgency and the ease of which you can just blow this off. Sam just kind of hangs out until we get around to doing this. It is not important or time sensitive. It only becomes so if we agree. Sam loses after two drinks, which is pretty amazing. Skyrim's alcohol isn't exactly impressive. Blackbriar Mead is a beverage produced in the city of Riften. Circa 2nd era 582, Blackbriar Mead was an especially potent drink popular with the local nor- Wait, what? HOLY FUCK IS THIS WRONG! This is the kind of thing that really makes me hate ESO. It has Blackbriar Mead because Skyrim had Blackbriar Mead, no matter how little sense that actually makes. ESO takes place in the 2nd era, 300 years before Tiber Septum conquered Tamriel. That conquest itself was over 400 years prior to the first four Elder Scrolls games, which themselves were over 200 years prior to the events of Skyrim. If you're doing the math at home, that's over 900 years between ESO and Skyrim. Remember further to add another 50 years to that. And also remember that ESO establishes Blackbriar Mead as having already been provincially popular during ESO. There are many things to hate here. The main thing I dislike about this is the slap in the face to Maven Blackbriar. It's obvious she inherited the meadery and has no personal passion for brewing, but she is an extremely dangerous girl boss who took a family business and made it an empire. 
If the mead had over a thousand years of history, you best believe she would print that on the bottle. But if we take ESO at face value, then Maven is just the latest inheritor in a long line of nobility, coasting off the value of a business so old she doesn't even know who started it. Can you see the impact that shoving nostalgia in one game can have on the actual characters from that game, and why I often choose to ignore it? How about the fact that 70 years ago, Riften actually burned down to the ground? ESO gets that detail right, but this means that somehow the meadery and family business survived through a city-destroying fire. No, I firmly believe the reason the Blackbriars became a thing was due to that fire creating an opportunity. It's like a forest fire. The old growth burned away and made room for younger families to come in and blossom. The family business being at most 70 years old means that it's old enough for Maven to have inherited the business, but not so old that it undermines her accomplishments. It also explains why we hadn't actually heard of it in the prior games, or about the Blackbriars and accounts of the city of Riften, such as the famous story of Queen Baron Zaya, the very story the city of Riften in Skyrim was built upon. I apologize for getting off topic, I almost started discussing millennia-old wineries in the real world, which do actually exist. The reason I got sucked down this rabbit hole was that I was looking into Skyrim's alcohol, particularly how strong it is to give up after two drinks and black out after three. Now I've never actually had multiple drinks in one sitting, or even in the same year, since my genetics are a history of violent alcoholism that I've taken steps to not repeat, so most of my thoughts here are from reading from other people who do drink. There is a story that is told that Emil Pagliarulo actually made mead during the development of Skyrim, which might have been a research thing. Emil Pagliarulo, who okay. is the yeah, well, lead designer right and writer on Fallout 3, uh, great writer, mm -hmm. and tasked him with coming up with the dragon language. Okay. And uh, he literally went home one weekend and made mead and uh, came in the next you know, Monday and said, here you go. And it was, they were like, wow. What he probably didn't realize in doing so is that mead, even homebrewed, is much stronger today than it was even a few centuries ago, let alone during the era of Vikings. And that the Vikings preferred beer as a day-to-day -day drink and treated mead and wine as drinks of opulence. Here are some things that modern mead recipes have that make a big difference. Chemical sanitation, filtered water, airlocks, and commercial yeast. Another big thing is honey. People have attempted to recreate mead using historical methods, resulting in weaker products, but even then it's not the best those experiments can be as they generally still make use of modern yeasts and honey. Yeast has not changed too much, but it is important to remember that it wasn't being manufactured until the 18th century. Before it was sold commercially, there were many different methods of trying to make use of yeast because distillers understood that they needed it, but not really what yeast was or how it could best be propagated. I was not able to conclusively answer if honey itself has meaningfully changed either. Selectively breeding honeybees seems to be a dubious concept. Unlike dogs, horses, or cattle, honeybee reproduction is not intuitive to humans, easy to manipulate, or long-lasting. It wasn't until the 18th century, again, that we even knew how or when queen bees were fertilized. This was despite beekeeping having been common thousands of years before the domestication of cats. Being able to extract the honey without killing the colony only became ubiquitous after the 18th century, when it was rediscovered how the ancient Greeks managed to do so using movable honeycombs. I say all of this to really emphasize that we are a massive lightweight for going down after just three drinks. Of course, we don't know what we were drinking, and given this ends up being a sanguine quest, we can just assume that it was the highest possible quality alcohol fermented with Daedric yeast or some other excuse. I can chug Blackbriar meat all day and not feel the effect, which means this quest could have been a great excuse for the developers to implement actual drunkenness. It's not as big a missed opportunity as cold weather mechanics, since pretty much every civilization on Earth figured out alcohol. But we are a world away from the days of Sajama and Flynn. We won our drinking contest and Sam invites us to a place where apparently, wine flows like water, before we black out and wake up with an angry priestess yelling at us. Sina gives us a few hints at what happened, but we need to convince her to give us more information, otherwise we need to clean up the church for her. The oddest thing is that for some reason, Sina thinks said information is important enough to stop us from just leaving and going on with our lives. Missed opportunity to have her press charges if we don't resolve our mishaps at the Temple of Debella. Or maybe a Knight of Debella will track us down. Speaking of, it's interesting that this quest deposited us at a Temple of Debella, an Adra associated with love, or for people who aren't prudes, raucous sex. Sometimes they even give her statues nipples. 
Anyways, it's funny that our sanguine adventure took us to this temple. I've never actually cleaned the temple, so I didn't know that the items strewn about are clues as to the rest of the quest. A giant's toe, two bottles of alto wine, and a note from Sam telling us to bring those items plus a hagraven feather to fix the staff. I had no clue about any of that because I always just passed the speech check. So retracing our steps, we head out to Rorikstead. I'm... I'm from Rorikstead. We'll quickly come across Ennis, who is angry about us stealing his prized goat to sell to a giant. Again, he doesn't press charges if you just leave, but he's much harder to convince than Senna. If you aren't me with a maxed out speech skill. Grok the giant only gets mad at us if we take Gleta from him, but I usually just compensate Ennis for his missing goat. Apparently it's a prize winner, which... What contests are there in Skyrim for this kind of thing? Seems like maybe this goat should have a unique model, or at least be much bigger than normal goats. Our next leg is to a woman we owe money to named... Yasolda. Yeah, our wife. Even funnier is that we owe her 2,000 gold because we purchased a wedding ring from her on credit. Okay, many things. We're having this conversation in our house, after which she will cook us dinner and give us lover's comfort, or for people who aren't prudes, raucous sex. I guess she's just canonically okay with this outcome. I actually think it would be better if she had additional dialogue if we were married to her already instead of fixing this by just making it impossible to marry her. It's also strange that we're specifically using a wedding ring here when in Skyrim they use amulets of Mara. You can convince her to pass us on, otherwise we have to reclaim the wedding ring from our fiancé, who is a jealous hagraven. Quite literally. Either way, Yasolda sends us to Morvenskar, which is where our wedding was supposed to take place. Sam's note indicates that we need the giant toe and the hagraven feather and we were at the temple of Debella for holy water. I am mildly confused why we already made the treat agreement with the giant and had the toe but had not gotten the hagraven feather yet. Morvenskar is a generic conjurer dungeon but inside it is a magical gateway taking us to a misty grove where we meet Sam and some other partygoers. This is when Sam reveals he's actually the Daedric Prince Sanguine. He also didn't need the materials to fix the staff, which makes sense. He just gave us the list so that we could go out and spread... merriment. Right, because Senna, Ennis, Yasolda, and Moira were all happier after we came into their lives. And that's the quest. I've never been a particularly big fan of this one, probably because I have a general issue with stories built around retracing the steps of a character's wild night, aka, I hate fun. Yeah, it's really interesting all the crazy shenanigans my character got up to while I wasn't in control of them. How about, instead, we go through the crazy events ourselves? Put a slight vignette effect on screen while Sam gives us a to-do list, we follow it and then pass out right as we go to get the holy water. Then we wake up and our character in dialogue has no recollection of what happened, and the quest has us retrace our steps, but this time showing there is a big discrepancy between what we saw happen when we did it and what actually was happening. Sort of like the Hist Sap reveal in the Oblivion Fighters Guild, but less overt, we shouldn't slaughter Rorak's dead. Maybe it starts with us asking Yasolda for Hagraven feathers, and she points us to Witch Mist Grove and we kill a Hagraven only for it to be revealed that we didn't ask Yasolda for feathers but the wedding ring, and we didn't kill the Hagraven, I wouldn't have the biggest issue with the quest not doing that if it was actually creative with the mechanics or implications. We should get a jail sentence for public drunkenness and some of the outright crimes we committed. Instead, it's all just brushed off because it would be terribly inconvenient to penalize the player for something that they weren't a witness for, even though half the fun of the quest could be actually trying to navigate the consequences. Take Sanguine's quest in Oblivion, simple but effective, only annoying because it broke another quest when I did it. In that one, you sneak into a dinner party and then cast a spell that strips everyone down and causes them to start partying hard. It tried to do something mechanically creative, and if you weren't clever, you'd actually land a bounty with no gold to pay it off, meaning either an escape from Leowin or a day in jail. Fast travel deflated the quest a little bit, but it was a good foundation. This is just quest markers and speech checks. The Sanguine Rose is also made worse. I never thought to see this again. Right item, wrong game, Martin. Where in Oblivion, the Rose would summon a random Daedra for 20 seconds, which was not friendly, Skyrim's Rose summons a level Dramora for a full minute, which is just another ally for the roster. You can give it to a follower so they can infinitely summon even more friends for the party, 
But the fact remains that being able to summon a helpful Dramora is not as cool as throwing a wild card into fights. Obviously, the Rose has questionable usefulness for anybody already able to summon Dramora Lords in combat. The Valkanaz the Rose can summon after level 46 has 200 more health than Conjured Dramora Lords, but the Lord's Sword will do twice as much fire damage. Either way, the Rose can be a pretty big edge for anyone playing on higher difficulties and not already making use of Conjuration Summons. There's also apparently supposed to be a random encounter with an Argonian, claiming that we owe him 10,000 gold for a bet, but I have personally never seen this actually happen. I would probably say that's because I don't often do this quest, more than it being a sign that Skyrim always has some new surprise for the player. And yeah, it's surprising how little there is for how highly rated this quest is. Maybe Skyrim is such a boring game that being pleasantly surprised by a Daedric drinking game is enough to stir people from their stupor. By Azura, by Azura, by Azura! Oh, Azura. She's had quite the journey. She went from being the most important Daedric prince in a game, to having a sideshow in the mountains where we kill a couple vampires, and she skidded back into relevance thanks to the Red Gear. You can chance this quest in three ways. Meet a wandering Dunmer who says he's on his way to the shrine, hear a rumor at an inn about the shrine, or investigate it yourself. The last one is unlikely as despite its gargantuan size, the LOD model doesn't actually load at that far a distance. This has been fixed as part of a mod since February of 2012, unless Azura's shrine is supposed to be hidden. Well, it was built by Dunmer refugees as a beacon, and Azura's quite prideful, so no, I doubt it's intentional. And you've heard my bit about ridiculous statues, although this one is far more plausible given its location and, you know, significance. I've heard the devs talk about how the horses originally went too fast for the engine to keep up, so I'm going to imagine that this is simply a hardware limitation that wasn't ever really fixed, as per usual. I rank this one pretty highly on the intrusive list just because of it being an in-rumor. I would go so far as to say Azura has been used both in Oblivion and Skyrim as a gateway to the Daedric quests. In Oblivion's main quest, when you needed a Daedric artifact, you were pointed to Azura's shrine, which is still funny to me. We journey up to the shrine. This is where survival mods usually tend to break down, because while it seems like Skyrim was built around cold weather dynamics, that doesn't mean it actually is. It is close to Winterhold, yet I usually almost always freeze to death on the way up. And there is someone living up there. I think this is a scale issue, like time moves faster in game and distances are squished. But usually the end result can still be annoying because certain quests just are not meant to be played with survival mods on. Granted, the cold isn't the only thing that's killed me at the temple. But his soul still resides within, protected by his enchantments. Until he is purged, my artifact is useless to me. You must go to a fortress, endangered by water, yet untouched by it. Inside, you will find an elven mage who can turn the brightest star as black as night. It oh, right. Azura is doing that thing Mephala did back in Morrowind of not speaking to us. Granted, I think what's actually happening here is that Azura has given her priestess this vision and is waiting for someone to actually follow up on it, at which point Azura will retroactively claim that we were destined all along. I've played Morrowind, I've seen this scam before. It doesn't take a Daedric Prince of Prophecy to foresee that the Ministry of Truth was going to destroy Vardenfell. That actually was the goal when Sheagora threw it in the first place. Azura just loves to take credit. Our big clue is to ask over at the college, although my first time I started at the inn, which was the answer. Most of the college people just cryptically hinted there being an experiment that went wrong and resulted in the people responsible getting exiled from the college. One of those people being Nelikar, which if you remember was the High Elf living at the Frozen Hearth who was probably supposed to play the role Inthir played in the Thieves' Guild. You're working with the Daedra? I understand right. The couriers, but now tell me the one about the Argonian Maid and the Lusty Baron. It. Wait, why is that hard to believe? It's really weird that this is his response to a failed speech check given his intimate involvement in the original events. Also, the speech check is against his own speech skill, not ours, so it actually always succeeds. For him. Good job. Malin Varen was a teacher at the college that was researching Azura's star as a potential solution to become immortal. He was obsessed with it and eventually killed a student for her soul, after which he got kicked out. Wait, so why was Nelikar banished over this? 
would we have gotten kicked out if Tolfdir decided he was tired of having his Alembic stolen and decided to blow up the Hall of Elements? Even if Nelikar was a member of the little cult following that Varen had, I don't quite track the punishment. Varen's cult took off to Fort Illinalta, which is now Illinalta's Deep, because the engineers were not kidding when they were talking about terra firma. This dungeon is like 50% of the reason people like this quest, because it takes the typical mold of a necromancer Fort Rowan and makes it more interesting than it has any right to be. The fort is sinking, so we have to see how the necromancers are working around that. Plus, people like the spooky skeletons. Malin Varen has to be the coolest guy ever to still have a cult following sacrificing souls to the star after he died. I sure hope we get to meet him. With the broken star in hand, we are given a choice, which was hinted at back at Nelikar. We can take the star back to Azura or to Nelikar. He does not want us to return the star to Azura on account of all the trouble it ended up causing, and Azura obviously just wants her stuff back, in a way that is amusing and punishing for everyone involved, as is often her style. Either way, we end up being sent into the star to exercise the soul of Malin Varen. He's not very cool. He's just a generic evil necromancer, so we don't really understand what it was that made his cultists want to keep his soul alive, given the amount of effort involved in doing exactly that. Plus, most people would probably look at living inside of the star as a prison sentence. Yet Varen was apparently so cool that someone will send necromancers to kill you as an act of vengeance for doing this. Was he the last man born with a personality stat or what? The encounter within the star has the potential of being one of the more difficult fights during the Daedric quests. This is a mix of the fact that this is a level 1 quest, as well as the high number of high level caster enemies. Illinalta's Deep has a level of 8, meaning that is the minimum level of enemies in the area. Not a big deal, but high level necromancer enemies make heavy use of Ice Storm. It is, however, manageable. Inside the star is a different story. You're locked inside and given little chance to hide, your followers don't come with you, and notable are three random Dramora warlocks that are here, for some reason. Past level 19, these guys start using mid-tier ward and armor spells and fireballs at the same time, and there are three of them. Combine the barrage of fireballs with the tight space you're trapped in, and this becomes a surprisingly hard fight. I don't have a problem with this being a difficult encounter. In fact, as a Daedric quest, I would prefer it to be difficult. Rather, it's the inconsistency of it that bothers me. This is pretty much the only time the game does something like this. Suddenly, you are expected to completely change the tempo of how you play, but only this once. It would be great if the Daedric Quests leaned into the style of design regularly. The Daedric Quests in Morrowind are some of the most difficult in the base game, usually because they employed Daedric enemies. Malin flees to the middle of the star, so you can hang back and snipe him from the start without needing to fight the Dramora, though. If we take the star to Azura, then we're awarded Azura's star, and Ariana will be willing to become our follower. If we take the star to Nelikar, then we're awarded the Black Star. As usual, there isn't much of a choice. Infinite White Souls or Infinite Black Souls. It's that general problem with Black Soul Gems times, well, infinity. Generic low-level bandits have higher soul levels than most creatures in the game. When you want to get a Grand Soul, are you going to go fight a Mammoth or Bandit number 68,031? I continue my position that named NPCs should have Grand Black Souls and generic NPCs should have Lesser Black Souls, depending on their level and difficulty. That way there's some measure of actual evil involved in using the Black Star beyond what is told but not shown in the Dawnguard DLC. This quest is pretty basic, but it also didn't really make the list of favorite quests because of its content, but rather its reward. It was the same way in Oblivion, Azura just had us run a vampire cave and the real benefit was the infinite soul gem. At least in Morrowind, Azura's quest, her secondary one, not the main quest, had us stopping Sheagorath from interfering with a bet by slaying a bunch of Daedra. Plus, Morrowind didn't have Black Souls. It had different levels of Grand Souls, so Golden Saints and Gods would power artifacts at different levels. By sure. Is that... is that Azura Star? How did you come to possess such a rare treasure? This one deserves to be high up on the list. The second time you enter Markarth, after the dramatic scene at the market, a vigil of Stendar shows up asking about one of the houses here in town. Tyrannus here is sitting on one of the few routes through the city, which is only a problem because Markarth is so small. 
I was watching a video of someone doing the Book of Love quest and it included Tyrannus just because of how intrusive he can be. This is the only quest to focus on the Vigil of Stindar in base Skyrim. So who are these guys? Well, they are a religious order of Stendar, obviously, and their primary mission is to hunt Daedra. They'll claim other causes, but their primary focus is Daedra, having been founded post-Oblivion Crisis. So they're the Knights of the Nine then. Oh no, a, a different religious order. They are a bit of a curiosity. You can run into them on the road quite a bit, either patrolling or getting into confrontations with various undead in Daedra. However, their most interesting interaction never actually happens. It was supposed to be that if you were carrying a Daedric artifact, which I often was, then they would confront you and demand you turn it over, which if you did, they would hint where they would take it, I assume, so you could go recover it. But then this event never actually happens. I can only speculate upon why, however I have to imagine that it was decided that the player should not be punished for having Daedric artifacts. Personally, I would consider this a pretty cool price to pay for having super powerful items. If all the artifacts were the best of their respective category of items, but you had to constantly deal with witch hunters or jealous worshippers harassing you, that's a pretty cool trade-off. It might even make the Vigil's destruction at the start of Dawnguard all the more interesting. Imagine hating these guys for constantly bothering you, and then suddenly a force comes along and wipes them out. It might make a fellow curious about joining the ones responsible. All you had to do was say that they were an offshoot of the Knights of the Nine. Stendar was the god to perform a generational curse. So maybe Sir Casimir decided to create his own order of Daedra Hunters, and they have generally turned into the fanatical order they are now. Speaking of Knights of the Nine, I have a quick creation to discuss. The Divine Crusader at creation adds the armor of the Crusader to a random overworld dungeon area. Used to be you would immediately have the quest, but someone took the extra effort to bang out a journal entry and side quest to perform a pilgrimage. This one is still absurdly lazy, even with the changes the Anniversary Edition made, and they wanted around $5 for it. I guess outside of beating Umaril, the Knights of the Nine story was pointless because it didn't take long for the Order to fall apart again and lose all their artifacts. But if you really hate money, you could spend $6 on the Vigil Enforcer armor set, which adds some armor sets for the Vigil that you have to retrieve from a cave where a vampiric Vigil was sacrificing his comrades while seeking a cure to vampirism. Man, his task was more straightforward than in more- uh, Oh, they actually referenced that quest by including the book you needed to find the clue to start the vampire cure quest in Morrowind. Never mind. Anyways, Tyranus thinks that one of the houses in Markarth is being used for Daedra worship and wants to investigate it. But he won't actually do it without us. Unlike Sanguine, who could have reasonably been left hanging, Tyranus has to awkwardly loiter until we decide we're tired of hearing him talk every time we go down Main Street of Markarth and actually oblige his request. Weak. He's weak. You're strong. Crush him. Surprise, the house is haunted. I guess it's a pretty cool effect they made for it, having all the clutter go flying around. Tyrannus is getting the same DMs and eventually attacks us, and had to be put down to restore the peace. Yeah, that was the Vigil's only quest, and he died in Act 1. You can't even report his death to keep her car set at the Hall of the Vigilant. Get out of my head, Daedra! You will kill. You will kill, or you will die. I can't die here. He is Pedro fucking you up. It's you or me. The disembodied voice offers to reward us before putting us in a trap. This is always funny with followers. Plus, you could just leave. The bards are wide enough to escape. But we decide to indulge Molag Ball, and all roads lead to him complaining about how Boethia has been sending a priest to desecrate his shrine and how he wants revenge. We need to rescue the priest from the Forsworn from one of six radiant locations. That means there isn't really anything special about this part of the quest. We find the priest tied up at the end of a Forsworn dungeon, and there's a speech check. He's naturally suspicious since he figures nobody knew he was gone. Also, funny thing, he's not essential, and you can't actually fail the quest if he dies on his way back to Markarth. He usually doesn't, though, which is why him being non-essential is notable. Here is an important quest NPC that is non-essential, that gets killed by random events so often I have yet to see a single Skyrim review or analysis even mention his untimely passing. Logroth goes to desecrate the altar, which Molag Ball uses as a trap. Molag Ball, you think you can best Boethia's faithful? 
I have won this contest before! Ah, but I have my own champion this time, Logroff. We beat him to death and then Molag Ball revives him and we do it again. This is a quest that actually works better in VR. Played flat, we're just left clicking on a guy and going through the motions. In virtual reality, we actually have to physically beat him with the rusty mace. It's really cool. Until it breaks. When Logroff goes to get back up, he will step backwards out of the trap. I mean, Molag Ball can just lock the doors again, but this was a replicable bug within the sequence. Which is hilarious because this was one of the few times playing a quest in VR actually enhanced the experience, and it was immediately undercut by a bug. With that, we're given the Mace of Molag Bal. I give you its true power, mortal. When your enemies lie broken and bloody before you, know that I will be watching. Now, I have a soul in oblivion that needs claiming. Take care of the house while I'm gone. <laughs> and that's the quest. If it weren't for the use of radiant locations, I would say that this is an oblivion tier quest residing in Skyrim. No random branch off and not particularly interesting. In oblivion, Molag Ball had us get killed by a man that swore an oath against violence, which was a far more interesting premise. I guess they didn't want to outright copy that quest, so they switched things around. But most of Skyrim is just beating people to death anyways, so we need to add the trap element. But there were places where we could have taken this quest. Maybe we turn the shrine over to the Vigilant, or we protect Logroth for the benefit of Boethia. If you had just played Skyrim, you probably wouldn't really be able to tell that Molag Ball was one of the bad Daedra of the Dunmer Pantheon. I know this is the Nord game, but if you are going to heavily focus on the Dunmer in other areas, then maybe their respective gods should have something to do with their culture. I do not see a good reason why Molag Ball's quest is in Markarth. It has nothing to do with the broader story or culture of the people who live here. It's like there was a list of generic Daedra quests to be passed around cities without enough content, and Molag Balls just happened to end up here. Which is funny because Morthal would have actually been a much more appropriate setting. It's closer to the Hall of the Vigilant, it has a vampire problem, and it's more plausible to believe there would be an abandoned house there. And so, it is time for the return of the Mace of Molag Ball. In Oblivion, it was broken. Not overpowered, but literally broken, because his enchantment had a timer of zero seconds. Thankfully, they didn't repeat that mistake. Unfortunately, they did take away Absorb Magicka in favor of Damage Magicka. Also, it has Soul Trap now, and only has 35 charges, so I guess you'll want Azura Star to constantly keep recharging it. Otherwise, it'll run out of charge after just a few enemies. There are other ways it's broken. For one, it has no upgrade perk, meaning that it cannot be upgraded as highly as normal weapon types. It also has fire damage associated with it, meaning that it benefits from perks that increase fire damage. It also just looks stupid. Morrowind had a clean design that still sold the idea that it was Molag Ball's weapon. Oblivion's mace was a little gray and it looked like it wanted to be a tower in the Lord of the Rings. Skyrim's mace looks like it needs a weight loss program. That mace, get it away from me, get it away. <sighs> I have not been looking forward to this moment. So, at the time of Skyrim's release, the last Elder Scrolls thing was Shivering Isles, a DLC focused on Sheogorath. Obviously they need to pay that off, although I and many others have long lamented the lack of a Jigalag quest in Skyrim. So, what have you got for us? There's a new homeless man in Solitude, although most people probably didn't realize he was actually new to the city. Apparently, his master is up in the Forbidden Wing of the Blue Palace. You can ask Falk for the key, which given our assistance in other matters, he will grant. Otherwise, you can just ask the help. Firebeard doesn't want people going into that part of the palace as it's associated with Pelagius the Mad, a Septim Emperor from Solitude who earned that title. Do I even need to explain how long ago that was, or do you get the point already? Well, when we enter the wing, we find ourselves transported into a realm, and confronted by Sheogorath and Pelagius having lunch. Me. Besides, I have so many things to do. So many undesirables to contend with. Naysayers, buffoons, detractors. Why, my, my headsman hasn't slept in three days. You are far too hard on yourself, my dear, sweet, homicidally insane Pelagius. What would the people do without you? 
dance, sing, smile, <laughs> grow old? You are the best septum that's ever ruled. You may have noticed that we have increasingly been seeing direct manifestations of the Daedric Princes. But of course, we have to see Sheogorath. I mean, come on, the Shivering Isles happened. Just like how in Oblivion we had to see Azura and Hircine. Right? You may also have noticed his unfortunate state of Skyrimification. His regal new Sheoth clothing has been replaced with a boring two-tone doublet. Get it? He's split down the middle? Because he's crazy? His cat eyes got replaced with generic blind eyes reused from other NPCs? His slicked back hair is just generic long hair now, and his beard is remarkably unspecial. They didn't even give him a cane. If you aren't going to go the full mile to recapture the character from Shivering Isles, then maybe it's better that we don't see him. Instead, we get this lame redesign. Further, remember how I said Sheagorath was responsible for the Red Year? He's actually a Dunmer god, yet he's out here playing second fiddle in solitude and being used for old Skyrim lore. And then you have that cock thing. Well, except for that Martin fella. But he turned into a dragon god, and that's hardly sporting. But you would know. You've covered me in depth in your videos that are all so very long. I sat down to watch one, and the next thing you know, there was gray in my beard. Gray in my beard. Not 12 hours. 12 hours is nothing. That's what you devoted to one. But then, what, 48 hours to another? How about an entire week? A month? Two year long video YouTube. There's your challenge. Two years. I want to see from you, Patrician. You know, I was there for that whole sordid affair. Marvelous time. Butterflies, blood, a fox, a severed head, ho ho ho, and the cheese to die for. What was fairly obviously just a fun reference to the events of a previous game is now, of course, lore justification for why every cock everywhere had to become Sheo. Well, if this is my Oblivion character, then he's holding out on me here. Where's my stuff? Do you still have my spellcrafting table or all those sigil stones I duped? What about my royal guard armor? I've been missing that. How rude! Oh yeah, the quest. It's just a retread of Through a Nightmare Darkly. That one in Hineteer's Dream where you complete a bunch of trials while deprived of your equipment to affect someone's mentality. The premise is that we're given the Wabajack, which has a bunch of scripted effects you use to affect Pelagius, like making him more confident or justifying his paranoia. This quest is novel. Once. Nobody even mentioned it when I asked for a list of favorite side quests. One problem is the lack of impact on the world. We're in the head of a man who's been dead for centuries. Imagine instead if this quest took place in the head of a currently living Jarl, and we saw the drastic impact we had when we came back to reality. The potential creation of a new Pelagius the Mad. In Oblivion, we permanently scarred a town by trolling them into believing the end times had arrived. I think there was a grand vision to this quest, and it just didn't pan out. My consistent observation with Skyrim is that it just lacks the mechanics needed for interesting quests that are not built around combat. If they could not spare the artist's time to do Sheogorath's model justice, then I doubt the quest designer had time to really flesh out his mechanical ideas, because I think there's a strong foundation here. You could have the therapy session go many different ways, just keep adding things the Wabajack can do and consequences. Add a second ending where we actually make Pelagius even worse than he was before, instead of better. I mean, it doesn't even really make a whole lot of sense that Sheo's task is to make Pelagius better. This goes beyond the label of him simply being the Mad God. In Shivering Isles, he's outright depicted as being interested in inflicting madness upon people. Remember when we psychologically tortured an adventuring group, or fed into someone's paranoid delusions? Wait, that was regular Oblivion, but still. If we have to go by the canon that the Oblivion player character is Sheagorath, then you've opened an extra dangerous can of worms, which is why I generally operate by the rule set of every questline being done by a separate version of the player character. But more than that, it kind of speaks volumes that one of the main quests to call back to Oblivion is so... low effort. I mean, this is probably a good instance of being able to tell just how low effort this area is just by the footage alone. Low effort doesn't imply laziness. There are a whole host of factors that could have led to this quest being this way. But because this quest wasn't given priority over others, despite its obvious importance to fans of Oblivion, well, that does say something. The only new assets in this area are Sheogorath's clothes and the Wabajack. Otherwise, everything else is repurposed from elsewhere. 
Are Pelagius' guards wearing Dwemer armor and intentional detail just to suggest he was weird? Or an oversight? The majority of the runtime of this quest is spent on dialogue. Very little time is spent on travel, and there is no combat. Well, when I say dialogue, I mean exposition. And lots of it. This is just not a very graceful follow-up to the creativity that was on display in the Shivering Isles. Instead, I want to talk about the six different creations built around Sheagorath. Shadowrend and Ruin's Edge are both simple creations, basically just adding their respective gear to the game. Shadowrend has us fight a shadow of ourselves, which we're drawn to for no reason. The quest is just deposited into our log. Like in the Shivering Isles, the shadow knows everything we know. I don't know why RPGs obsess with this idea. I have consistently stomped every shadow clone of myself in games. Shadow Rend is pretty lame. It has infinite charges, but for 15% weakness to magic. L like, what the fuck? Am I supposed to hit them with the axe and then switch to using magic? The Enchanted Shivering Isles was weakness to magic and damage health, so follow up swings did more damage. $3 for this. Ruin's Edge was 4 bucks. It adds the bow to a random cave, which I was actually radiantly sent to as part of another quest. Like the original bow, Ruin's Edge randomly does a magic effect from a list. Like the original bow, the list of effects is kind of lame. Except 1,000 points of Drain Magicka, holy shit. Actually, it does that to fake a silence effect. Staff of Sheagorath is 2 bucks 50 which basically recreates the Morrowind Sheagorath quest, where you are tasked to kill a Bullnetch with the Fork of Horripilation. It gives the titular Staff of Sheagorath, which... what? The Staff in Shivering Isles was integral to Sheagorath's power, not some artifact he gives out willy-nilly. It's pretty powerful too, paralyzing in an area of effect of 75 feet for 10 seconds. It's kind of a typical creation, awarding a super powerful item for next to no effort. Rare Curios was originally just a dollar and adds a bunch of miscellaneous ingredients from Morrowind, Oblivion, and the Shivering Isles. As far as I tried, you cannot grow any of these, only purchase them from Khajiit Caravans, randomly, which heavily limits their usefulness. You would think they would have given that a second pass, given that one of the other creations in Anniversary Edition is about setting up a farm. Plus, it is a bit weird, like the big thing I was supposed to be nostalgic about from Morrowind was... bitter green petals. Dawnfang and Duskfang was $5 and added, again, the titular sword. There's a short dungeon you have to run in the Rift and Ratway, and the reward is the sword. Minor storytelling via journals, as per usual. This one is probably on the better end, honestly. There's also another blood drinker named Bloodthirst, which you get from a side quest by reading a note and then finding the sword. Finally, you have the big one, Saints and Seducers, for $15. This one adds quite a bit, although if a statement ever needed a caveat, that is one of them. This is one of the ones that was made free for owners of the Special Edition when the Anniversary Edition came out. You know, to really sell you on the idea. Balance of Power is a quest about some bandit gangs that are using Saints and Seducers war gear and apparently are having a similar rivalry. It's a really stupid way of trying to explain why we're cramming Shivering Isles equipment into Skyrim. Like, Golden Saints were out and about in the Vardenfell countryside. Each gang has a camp and then a journal which leads you to another camp, and that's it. There's also a few Elytra nymphs you can claim as pets. I think the craziest part is that after wiping out two separate bandit gangs armed with Daedric equipment, we are awarded 300 gold. It's a flat fee, no level scaling. One of the five dozen journals will tell you that the gangs are being funded by a guy named Thoron, and we're led to the Solitude Sewers, inside which is a root cave modeled after the ones in the Shivering Isles expansion. This creation is just flying through the justification for all this. He's got the Ring of Disrobing from Shivering Isles, while in this cave is the Sword of Jigalag, which I thought we weren't mentioning, and from here you can start the quest to unlock the ability to craft Amber and Madness equipment. Also, we can summon Golden Saints and Dark Seducers now. Yeah, that power that was limited to the nobility of Mania, Dementia, and Shea Gorath? Ours. That powerful conjuration spell to summon a deadly golden saint? It's just down in the sewers, dumbass. A courier comes up to us with a note requesting we meet under the Solitude Arch, and it's Stada. Yeah, her. Here's a supercut of her dialogue. Speak quickly. Indeed. Fool, what do you think you're doing? You're dead. Hey, remember that thing where I showed that Oblivion Horse Armor had no new dialogue because it was super lazy? I mean, that's the Creation Club standard, if not the high watermark. 
Horse armor is actually in Skyrim. It's exactly the same. Well, either way, you have to have them to uh, sell horse armor, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going another... to do that regardless. You can also get Nerve Shatter. Yeah, that weapon that had a useless weakness to Shock Enchant for zero seconds. It's here too. There's Amber, Madness, Dark Seducer, and Golden Saint gear, and that's it. That is the $15 creation given for free to sell people on the idea of Creation Club. You'd think Bethesda might have stepped in and gotten them some voice talent for that one at least. The thing is, I think the rules for Creation Club might have been too strict or something. You have to find some unused corner of the world to stick things, but you don't really have the resources to flesh your creation out to make finding the new gear interesting, so you have to make sure it's not too powerful. The end result is that my armory is full of novelty toys that go unused because most of it is trash and is only notable for its unique model. Like, thanks for adding the Sword of Jigalag so I can have a constant reminder that he didn't get a quest in this game. I should actually talk about the Wabajack before I move on, given that it is the reward to Sheagorath's actual Skyrim quest. The Wabajack is a staff that has a listed effect of an unpredictable effect. It did this in Oblivion as well, but poorly explaining magic effects is now just par for the course in Skyrim. In Oblivion, its effect was to transform creatures into one of several other types, sometimes much weaker and sometimes stronger. While it can still do that, Skyrim adds additional effects like elemental damage, absorptions, invisibility, healing, and instant kills. Its most interesting, i.e. broken effects, are to transform the target into a sweet roll or shower of coins. However, it's an otherwise exceptionally unnotable artifact. This is because in Oblivion it would have a random transformation, but would consistently be a transformation, allowing you to use it for crowd control. Because there's no guarantee of what can happen, unless the enemy is a giant or a dragon, and the hassle involved in recharging staves, there's a lot of bias you have to work against to justify ever using this thing. They also changed its appearance. In Oblivion, it looks like a gray crystal, which actually fit due to Sheogorath's relationship with Jigalag. But now it just has soy jack faces on it. The Wabajack as a reward, combined with the tedious nature of the quest, is probably why nobody recommended it to me. In Dawnstar, everyone is having trouble sleeping. It's just kind of an odd quirk of the town, unless you happen to head inside the Wind Peak Inn, where a priest of Mara is giving reassurance to the townsfolk. He then gives us reassurance that everyone in town is not, in fact, alright. You might want to do that somewhere more isolated. Arandir has a shrine set up at the Nightcaller Temple, which he wants us to head up to in order to help deal with the problem. This is another one of those quests where you freeze to death as Arandir takes a leisurely stroll up to the temple. Arandir reveals that the giant tower on the hill overlooking Dawnstar is not, in fact, a one-room shrine. It was actually a military fort, later used by a cult of Vermina. This is a reference to the side game Dawnstar, which was created for mobile games as part of the series spanning 2003 to 2006. Just kidding. This quest has nothing to do with the events of the standalone Dawnstar game. This quest has us progressing backwards to the events of a day, gradually peeling back the layers of the story. In summary, there was a cult of Ermina, they were engaging in general fuckery with memories and dreams, in the process they angered an orc tribe by messing with them the same way Dawnstar is currently, the orcs invaded the temple, and fearing defeat, the cult released a miasma named... the miasma, which put everyone into sleep mode, including a lack of aging, Arandir was actually a member of this cult, originally having the name of Casimir. We use another alchemic creation of the cult called the Dreamstride to gather most of this information, even seeing events from Arandir's perspective. As we fight our way through the awakened cultists and orcs, we eventually confront the leaders of the cult and finally the school of corruption causing all of these issues. This quest is a character piece on Arandir more than anything, although the clunky Skyrim dialogue creates some issues. Here are three different branches of the same dialogue option. And what would you have me say? Sorry for following the misguided teachings of a mad divine? Sorry for stealing memories from children? Do you realize when the orcs attacked, I was only concerned with myself? Yes, you're right. I should have. But I didn't know what to say. But the third empathetic option gives us this. When the orcs invaded the temple, I fled. I left my brothers and sisters here to die. Problem is, I didn't play the full parts of the dialogue. I was the only concerned with myself. I fled. I left my brothers and sisters to die. We are given 
three dialogue options, but they all end at the same point and the best response is given to the worst option. This is all too common with Skyrim dialogue. You could have a single option that is really good or three options that lead in different directions, but instead we get this awkward middle ground where we get three options that lead to the same point and sometimes one of them might be really good. This quest is about Arandir, so having options should be getting different in-character perspectives on this person. Maybe you think he made the right decision in abandoning his cause and seeking redemption. Maybe you think he should have stayed loyal to his brothers in the cult and stayed behind. Maybe you don't care and are just seeking a reward. The Randir could stage a part of his story to you and how you respond could shape his evolution through the quest. Instead, there is a preset end, so every branch has to quickly return to the main line as quickly as it started. It is Oblivion dialogue, just with a layer of makeup to make it seem more like Fallout. As per usual in Skyrim, we are presented a branch right at the end as to our reward. We can allow Arandir to complete his ritual to purify the shrine, destroying the Skull of Corruption and opening him up as a follower. This is actually more tempting as he has a lot of unique dialogue compared to the other followers that the game offers. I was a student at the Bard's College for a short time, until my affiliation with Vermina was discovered. I haven't been back to solitude since. I've always wanted to make a pilgrimage here to the Temple of Mara. Thank you for bringing me here. You've made me quite happy. The College of Winterhold is an amazing sight. I've never set foot on the grounds, but always wanted to. No, you really don't. You've already helped me grant one final wish for my life worshippers. My fellow priests were called. I was suffering so from vampirism. The other option is the Skull of Corruption itself. It's been changed quite significantly, likely because its oblivion effect tended to cause issues. Where before it would create a clone of its target, now it just does damage. It can be charged up to do more damage if you use the staff on someone who is sleeping, but it's not very impressive. Given that it has to be charged with both a soul gem and a crime, you would think it would do a ton of damage. But there are generic staves you can find in boss chests which can easily do more damage for less hassle. This quest is overall a letdown. It's called a waking nightmare, yet it doesn't take the opportunity to utilize any of the strange imagery of Vermina's quest from Oblivion. The first time you enter Falkreath after level 10, one of the guards will ask if you've seen a stray dog outside of town. The local blacksmith is looking for a companion and gives us bait to catch this dog. You can even ask for gold up front. When we head out looking for the dog, we are approached. You are exactly what I was looking for! Ah, fuck a talking dog. This means nothing has to be realistic anymore. Might as well stop obeying gravity and needing to eat food and start teleporting everywhere because there's a dog that talks in this universe. I mean, uh... Good boy. This is Barbus, also known as Clavicus Vile's dog. He wants us to settle a disagreement between him and his master, for some reason. Reads like a scam, I bet you guys heard about my exploits and want me to go do some boring dungeons, so you made up that you're having to fight to manipulate me. We make the journey to Haymar's Shame, which of course is a vampire dungeon, and... By all means, let's hear it. It's the least I could do since you already helped me grant one final wish for my last worshippers. They were suffering so from vampirism and begged me for a cure. Then you came and ended their misery. I couldn't have planned it better myself. How literal is the expression, your last worshippers? What's the deal with the monkey's paw thing in this game anyways? Sure, the origin of the mask is a story about an ugly woman he gave the mask in order to elevate her position in society, only to have the mask taken away and for her to be banished. But I don't recall Clavicus making deals that put himself in a worse position. One of Clavicus's little Jess, a wizard named Sebastian Lord had a daughter who worshipped her scene. When the daughter became a werewolf, it drove Sebastian over the edge. He couldn't stand to see his little girl take on such a bestial form. The wizard wished for the ability to end his daughter's curse. <laughs> Clavicus gave him an axe. Yeah, see, like, why wouldn't you make a deal where you'll cure the daughter, but you have to sacrifice the wife's soul? You'd get something out of it. Oh, because the axe he referenced is a literal item we are being sent to retrieve. You know the thing I love about no fast travel playthroughs? Trekking across Skyrim repeatedly to do quests that give me items that either sit on my wall or in my chest. 
Like, I don't know why anyone would want this thing. It's a two-handed weapon. Even worse, its enchantment does stamina damage. Tis a wicked axe you wield there, friend. That blade looks sharp enough to cut through a god. Really? Because it does the same damage as a glass weapon. And this thing is supposed to be tempting enough that Clavicus Vile thinks we'd actually want it and tells us that we can have it if we kill Barbus. The alternative is not killing Barbus, which he will then reunite with Clavicus and will receive the Mask of Clavicus Vile. Daggerfall, improve reputation, Morrowind, fortify personality 30 points, which means a blanket 30 points of extra disposition, especially good with merchants. Oblivion, fortifies personality, but only 20 points. Skyrim, prices are 20% better, fortify speech 10 points, 5% faster magic every generation. Obviously, this is a byproduct of the related mechanics being cut. No disposition and no haggling, so now we just have this 7 pound hunk of metal for whenever we go out and sell loot, if you even bother to remember to bring it or put it on. Plus, like Oblivion, you can't spend money on training, so the only way this is even really useful is if you have some kind of economic overhaul mod installed that creates mechanical value for gold again. But what about the quest? Really? Power? You are a dragonborn. You already have more power than most people who aren't immense fire-breathing monsters. As much as I hate to say it, you're almost as powerful as I am right now. Wow, thanks for noticing. This is an extremely middle-of-the-road daedra quest for Skyrim. It's not too intrusive, but it's also not terribly interesting. Which is kind of funny. Clavicus Vile's Oblivion quest featured Todd Howard as a voice actor. Immortal! Wonderful. Always a pleasure. And there were two novels, The Infernal City and Lord of Souls, where the outcome of Clavicus Vile getting his hands on Umbra was the inciting incident of the story. Hell, Lord of Souls was published just a few months prior to Skyrim's release, so you would think anything from those two books would actually get mentioned in this game. Instead, we have a Daedric quest which involves running a dungeon, then doing an errand to go kill some guy in a cave on the far side of the province, and then returning and making a choice between two items the player isn't really given enough information to make a decision about. Really, the problem comes off that the quest isn't fleshed out enough. As evidence of this, we have the Oblivion Walker achievement. The goal of this achievement is to collect 15 Daedric artifacts, which should be pretty easy considering how many of them the Creation Club adds, but those don't count. You can 100% Skyrim without acquiring this achievement, depending on your choices in a number of quests. Now, of course, that's pretty straightforward with something like the choice at the end of Vermina or Mehrun's Dagon's quests. But it's also true of this quest, because while the Mask of Clavicus Vial is counted as a Daedric artifact, the Rufal Axe is not. The choice is also influenced by three factors. The first is your moral decision about whether or not to kill Barbas. That's actually fine. It's better than the game simply demanding I kill Barbus without any choice in the matter. The second factor is whether or not you actually examined the Rufal Axe or used it before this point. I'm going to guess that most people just picked up the axe, left the cave, and immediately fast traveled here. It would be a more tempting offer if we had actually used this weapon to kill Sebastian instead of simply picking it up off his coffee table. The third is how much you're willing to gamble. We are not told up front that we'll get the mask, but his statue is holding it and this is Skyrim, of course we're going to get something for all this effort. But it is still a gamble even if you know it's the mask because you don't know how valuable it may or may not be. That actually also would be fine if the story understood Clavicus Vile. Remember how this all started with us looking for a dog in the woods? The Falkreath blacksmith asked us to do that, and we can in turn try to pass a persuasion check to get paid an advance for doing the job. In reality, this persuasion check is impossible to fail, literally. But there is a good foundation here. Clavicus Vile is a sort of mercantile god, but for people with looser moralities who might be uncomfortable with Xenathar. As such, there should be a more mercantile presence in this game. Lodge should actually have a mid-level speech check. We should have the option to bribe our way into the shrine and buy the Rufal Axe off of Sebastian Lort. Clavicus should also not be written as this devilish trickster god. He can be shifty with the terms, but a deal is a deal to him. I find some of the details of this quest interesting, particularly the fact that Lort's daughter was a werewolf. Vile's Daggerfall quest was to kill a werewolf. However, if this quest is referencing that one, then the designer missed the part where Clavicus Vile offered the mask up front as terms of the arrangement. Instead, we are doing all this so Clavicus will take his dog back. 
Barbas tells us we will be rewarded, but not to trust Clavicus. So is Barbas supposed to be the good-natured aspect of Vile, so him running things into the ground is an intentional part of the story? The other detail I notice is that the two wishes we hear about in Skyrim both have to do with curing a divine disease. The worshippers wanted to cure their vampirism, while Sebastian was looking for a cure to his daughter's lycanthropy. It's possible this is his solution because he can't actually perform those types of cure, otherwise they wouldn't be such prolific problems. But the story never goes there, it's as straightforward as it seems. We can only speculate on the true meaning of what is a bad quest with worse rewards. Which brings us back to those two books I mentioned. In those books, the sword Umbra that Vile was lusting after in Oblivion got destroyed. Morrowind had the sword be in the hands of an orc warrior who reduced his life down to the blade he wielded. Oblivion then suggested that Umbra was actually a soul inside of the sword that Vile had dealt with before. Clavicus Vile's relationship with the creation of the sword was furthered in the novels. Well, sure enough, we can get our hands on it in Skyrim thanks to the power of the Creation Club. No one's ever really gone. The mod adds a Draugr Crypt. <laughs> Wonders never cease. We progress through this dungeon that is actually an in-universe theme park. The journal at the start, written of course by a member of the Vigil of Stendar, actually says that's what this place is. See, Nords want to prove their machismo by fighting with each other, here specifically. They did it so much that the Dragon Cult came up with this arrangement. You can go left or right at the bottom or some Draugr in a picture block puzzle. Then you do the other side, which is identical. And once both sides are lit, you progress to the next stage while the Draugr reconstitute and reset everything for the next Nord warrior trying to prove his worth. Welcome everyone to Bethesda land. At the bottom is the Ghost of Umbra. I think this fight broke my first time because he just stayed permanently invulnerable. He's supposed to summon these soul spirits that allow you to damage him after they're killed. Ah yes, a classic, ending your invulnerable state for the benefit of the player. We have to do this while listening to Oblivion combat music anyways, even though the Umbra that they implemented is a two-handed sword, which would have been the Morrowind version. Honestly, this creation is the most in line with the original Skyrim. We ran a dungeon to get an item. The only thing that's missing is the story. I had to really resist the urge to put Boring in front of all three of those parts. You can return to the Falkreath blacksmith, who will give you another amount of gold despite not returning with his dog. Is ripping this guy off supposed to be part of Clavicus' story, or is he just a really good guy? And then there's a creation that adds the bitter cup. Oh god, it never ends. Actually, it's only $2 and adds three quests in the bitter cup, but e even I have my limits. I didn't do this one. But all is not well in Falkreath. The first time you visit, potentially before you even unlock the last quest, you can stroll on over to the city graveyard to find the last rites being performed. Turns out the village little Nord girl was murdered by the village migrant worker. It stands out because instead of your routine village murder, this little Nord girl was ripped apart. Well, we can try to investigate by paying a visit to the village jail to meet the village murderer. Come to gawk at the monster. The little girl is dead because of me. Believe me, it wasn't anything I ever intended to do. I just lost control. I tried to tell them, but none of them believe me. It's all on account of this blasted ring. Wait, they didn't confiscate the ring? Or did you hide it? Well, just you wait, because he's going to give us the ring, and then... Uh, we're not far in, and we already have problems. So the Falkreath Jail doubles as the well, which is a recipe for a cholera outbreak. This well is completely escapable from the top, and the only defense is assuming people don't have the agility to climb out, or a friend that can throw them a rope, or maybe it's like that jail from The Dark Knight Rises, where you're allowed to leave if you can climb to the top. I guess if you're capable of doing that, you're too dangerous for the guards here anyways. It's a cell for drunks to sober up, because Falkreath is such a small village that it never has any kind of crime. Sending's ring is actually the Ring of Hearsing, last spotted in Blood Moon. It was notable for allowing the player to manually turn into a werewolf instead of just waiting for the moon to rise. Only here, it's corrupted and causes random transformations instead, apparently because Hearsing was mad that Sending took it. 
It's a bit of an odd story, because outside of the Companions, the case can't really be made that lycanthropy is a curse that can't be controlled. Why would Hirsi need the curse of the ring if Sending wanted to control his transformations? That's how it works by default now. That was absolutely the case in Blood Moon, though. You would meet raving lunatics in the wild that would turn into werewolves at night. It was obvious that people's nightly bloodlust was creating trouble on Solstheim. It wasn't until Dawnguard that there were even world interactions involving werewolves, like for instance, an encounter where a guy turns into a werewolf and then murders his wife and fights you. But, and I'm being completely genuine here, I have never seen those interactions. And I realize, by looking at their requirements, why? They require the quest, proving honor from the companions to be complete. That's before the hazing quest, but I generally don't ever do any companions quests, so of course, I have a far lower chance of having ever seen this encounter, and even then, it took the vampire expansion to remember that if you want people to believe that lycanthropy is a problem, you need to, you know, show it. Because as it stands, it's hard to believe Sending's story about him losing control. Everything else we've been shown in this game indicates that lycanthropy is completely controllable. Funny thing is, people I would consider Elder Scrolls plebs actually know the names of the moons of the sky in these games. Masser and Secunda are a pretty prolific part of the skybox. I understand why you wouldn't want the player transforming every night like in Blood Moon, because it was really annoying in Blood Moon, but forced transformations tied to the phases of the moon like, you know, typical werewolf stories would go a long way in helping sell the danger of werewolves. Once we take the ring from sending, it forces itself on our ring finger, and this causes us to randomly transform into a werewolf. Just kidding. It only does that if you are already a werewolf. Now that sounds like an interesting premise, honestly. Why don't we make it so that unlocking this quest requires having been initiated into the circle as a werewolf, or that wearing the ring forces everyone to become a werewolf at some point, like when they get near the stag? You know, give the player some perspective on Sending's plight. Alright, so to stop the curse, we need to hunt a white stag to appease Hearsing. Alright, cool. I won't fast travel. Let's go on a great journey and have some hygiene. Oh. Now you decide to not make me trek across the map to complete an objective, when it would actually be interesting to do so. You can tell with how close the stag is to Falkreath that Bethesda didn't want to annoy players with the random transformation earning them a bounty, so it's practically as safe as possible. It's a 10% chance every in-game hour if you're outdoors, so it's extremely likely you will not experience a forced transformation. For context, the fast-forwarded clip you're potentially watching is about 100 seconds to get from Falkreath to the stag by foot. However, an in-game hour is 210 seconds. There is a 1 in 10 chance per hour of suffering a random transformation, not counting the first hour. And of course, this doesn't include fast travel, or the probability that a player completing this quest would even still be a werewolf. Again, Sending must be lying. He says he was going to hunt the stag and had tracked it down, but then the random transformation happened. Why would you track an animal like this only to retire for the day and go back to your regular ass lumber mill job? Hell, why did you take the job in general? Aren't you a worshipper of Hearsing? Can't you hunt animals? Oh, right, so the murder could happen and Sending could be put in jail for the player to meet. Well met, Hunter. I am the spirit of the hunt. Just one glimpse of the glorious stalker that your kind calls Hercene. You know, there was a lot more ceremony to this in Blood Moon. You have proven yourself a worthy hunter, and so you have been given this honor. You and the others are to find your way to my hunting grounds. Take great care, as only one of you will earn the glory of facing the hunter himself in battle while the blood moon lights the sky. Hirsing didn't pop out of a random animal. He made all of his servants participate in a battle royale, and then fought us as the last survivor with only a fraction of his power. This quest is a combination of the blood moon questline as well as Hirsing's quest back in Oblivion. I doubt it is a coincidence that we are hunting a white stag, considering his Oblivion quest was to hunt the last living unicorn. At least until the Sigix randomly decided to bring a unicorn forward in time to Skyrim, so we can tame it and use it as a mount. Wild Horses is one of the more bizarre creations, $5 to basically add some Red Dead mechanics to the game. You can find a journal at the college pointing you towards the unicorn. This biologist guy, yes in a fantasy setting that's the premise, got tired of documenting animals and decided to track down an elusive unicorn. 
He says that Tolfdir said the Sijiks brought it forward in time because they thought it was a wrongdoing that the Oblivion Hearsing quest happened. That doesn't make sense on three levels. It contradicts everything we were told about the Sijiks in the College quest line, about their non-interference policies. While the Sijiks had time powers, they were not time travelers. Even if they decided to interfere, they likely would have transported the unicorn to Arteum, where they could protect it. This is also in violation of ESO lore. Yes, the Creation Club and ESO are at odds about what unicorns are. According to Elder Scrolls Online, unicorns are actually a native species of the hunting ground, Hirsin's Plain of Oblivion. So if the unicorns are something native to Hirsin, why would the Sijiks care about preserving this species? Ultimately, we have two non-canon sources trying to retcon the mistake an Oblivion quest made of killing off this species. The unicorn itself cannot be killed for its horn, believe me, I tried. Instead, all you can do is tame it. Thankfully, the Creation Club writes an injustice that is 15 years old. Back in Oblivion, you could technically keep the unicorn as a mount, but the game did not consider it as such, so you couldn't equip it with horse armor. Well, now you can. Thank Todd someone made sure to include this. Anyways, while the hunt for the White Stag is a partial recreation of the Oblivion Hearsing quest, the latter half is a recreation of the Blood Moon. But you must first do a service for my glory. The one who stole it has fled to what he thinks is his sanctuary. Just as a bear climbs a tree to escape the hunt, but only ends up trapping himself. Seek out this rogue shifter. Tear the skin from his body and make it an offering to me. By Azura, by Azura, by Azura! Her scene wants us to participate in a hunt for Sending. Sure enough, a hunt is underway, although Sending makes a counteroffer. Help him, and he'll never return to civilization. Also, I have to say, I have always loved the framing during the conversation with Sending, placing him high on a rock in his silhouette against the Blood Moon. It is unusually creative imagery for Skyrim that goes beyond pretty much everything else that came before it. It's a brief glimpse into what could have been. Hunting Sending results in us getting the Savior's hide, while helping him results in us getting the Uncursed Ring of Hearsing. However, this quest can actually be exploited to get both rewards. If you help Sending kill the hunters, initiate the dialogue with Hearsing, then kill Sending, and then turn in both branches, you get both rewards. It would actually be cool if Hearsing acknowledged you playing both sides instead of just trusting the player to honor the binary choice that they were given. I mentioned the ring when discussing werewolf mechanics, because the ring is only a reward for werewolves. It's weird to present a moral choice to the player and then have the rewards be tied to mechanics. Some players who do the totems of Hearsin quests as part of the companions might decide that loyalty to Hearsin is the correct option, yet you would get the Savior's Hide as a reward. Other players might think that helping the literal underdog in the situation is better, and then get a ring they have no use for as a reward. It also reaches into a broader issue with this quest and the broader mechanics of lycanthropy. If it seems like the quest hasn't really acknowledged us being a werewolf, that is correct. You cannot talk to Sending about being a fellow werewolf, even though werewolves can smell it on each other. Hearsing will not acknowledge your progress collecting totems for Aella, nor you slaying the Glenmoral Witches or curing the Companions. Outside of random transformations that don't ever seem to happen, and the fact that the ring is only useful for werewolves, the actual narrative itself does not address what would actually be a pretty major detail. The Blood Moon, which this hunt directly calls back to, also had two competing narratives based on your lycanthropic status. But the narrative itself referred to it, not just the mechanics. This is likely because, as I stated during the Companions, werewolves did not seem to be a guaranteed feature of Skyrim during development, so this quest was likely created before the Companions, and then retroactively the player was given the option to assist Sending for the Ring. But that's not the full truth. If that were the case, dialogue would not have been recorded for the other option. If you pay attention, however, it is noticeable that the ring is never directly mentioned as a reward. Hearsing simply says that you have his blessing. So maybe Bethesda figured that this would be a stretch goal which could be cut if needed if werewolves mechanically didn't work out. Either way, the end result is that we're making a moral choice instead of a mechanical choice. Savior's Hide is a light armor chest piece with a fairly low armor rating, but sporting 15% magic resistance and 50% poison resistance. The Savior's Hide was the only item in the game to sport magic resistance. That was until the Lord's Male Creation, which has much higher stats as well as 17% magic resistance, 75% poison resistance, 
and a unique cloak effect that absorbs health from enemies around you. I, I love the Creation Club so much, it's just, it, it's such a beautiful thing. Savior's Hide is a pretty situational item. I guess it's useful in the early game for fighting Falmer since they use poison and magic. 15% magic resistance is pretty lame, and the only reason it's notable here is that Bethesda tried to make it difficult to use as an enchantment effect. Difficult, but not impossible. I've done this already in Oblivion, but Savior's Hide has become progressively weaker as the series has gone on, probably because Bethesda has continued to refuse to rework enchanting into a better system that actually implements negative effects or has any kind of system to prevent stacking huge amounts of magic resistance. Like, 60% magic resistance in Morrowind is a lot. Once you hit 100%, you would be immune to magic. Skyrim hard caps the resistance to 85% to prevent this, but that's a lazy man's solution. Make it so that stacking magic resistance is difficult and comes at the cost of other essential effects. Or that you would have to add negative effects to give yourself enough points of magic resistance to make a difference. Or, instead of a percentage system, have it work off of point negation. So 15 points of magic resistance lowers the damage of a magic spell by 15 points. Obviously, you would have to play with the numbers a bit, as an effect like that would mean that destruction spells often used by wizards could be negated by low levels of magic resistance. It would take some design work, hence why it's easier to just artificially cap magic resistance and try to limit players from ever getting their hands on it. Overall, given how important a role werewolves were supposed to play in Skyrim, and Hircine's role in the Blood Moon expansion, this is definitely just an instance of Skyrim doing what Skyrim does and making cool things lame. Speaking of... Goblins. Four dollars to port goblins over to Skyrim, and not cool tribunal style or even lanky oblivion style goblins, but as the game jam style goblins. To start this creation, you either have to find the new dungeon or a letter at the inn in Riften. The dungeon is Grom's Pass. Is that supposed to be a reference to Grom from the Oblivion Dark Brotherhood? Anyways, the dungeon plays Oblivion music, features some steel blue Intoloma, which was immensely useful for fortified destruction potions, as well as Gog. Gog is a champion. Literally, he wields the Spear of Bitter Mercy because he's a champion of Hircine. That's not a joke. He also summons Stormatronax, which is supposed to be an effect of the spear, but it doesn't actually do that, nor can you get the spear from him. If you have actually been watching the video, you've likely spotted Gog and his pet Stormatronax. They make for good companions early on, especially on a magic character since they draw aggro away from me, but the Stormatronax eventually turns into a liability, as any form of friendly fire, which is common for magic characters, will set the Atronax against you. Four dollars for this. And in all honesty, what you're buying is the Steel Blue Intoloma, since it can be grown unlike most Creation Club plants, allowing you to farm Fortify Destruction Potions. While there are a few reasons to visit Understone Keep in Markarth, the conversation at the door appears, like any other, to be about the Civil War. What are you hiding, priest? I'm not hiding anything. It's closed for a reason. Typical Imperial lies. First, you take away Talos. Now you're keeping us from seeing our honored dead? Namira's quest does a good job of hiding amongst the standard Skyrim quests. Only in a standard Skyrim quest could I walk up to someone having a problem and try to intimidate them into letting me help them. Rest assured, the Jarl hears everyone's concerns. You will be able to visit the dead again soon. I don't like being ignored. Then my answer is the Hall of the Dead is closed by the order of the Jarl. Understand. Let me help you. Let me help you! Vampire hunters or something. Let me help you! Apparently, someone has been eating bodies in the Hall of the Dead, and when we head inside, we are confronted by a woman, basically accusing us of being a repressed cannibal. Note that up to this point, we haven't actually started the Daedric quest yet. As of now, it just seems like a bog-standard miscellaneous objective where we might walk inside to find skeevers eating the bodies. And if you kill Aeola now, that's all it ever will be. I really enjoy this element of the quest. The quest journal indicators tend to reveal what's going on. Aeola is feasting on bodies in Markarth because her old haunt recently had the dead all reanimate randomly. Time for a Draugr Crypt dungeon. So this mildly implies that the Draugr are supposed to have been reanimated recently, right? Like the Draugr being able to walk around after thousands of years is tied to the dragons. Every now and then we get hints at this idea, like it was written down in the design document somewhere as the explanation for the Draugr, 
but the game never clearly communicates whether or not it's true. Something that happened both times I ran this quest was that I asked Aeola to wait outside while I clear the dungeon, but as soon as you kill the boss, she telepathically knows and begins to make her way inside. However, there is a shortcut to a secret exit rather than a loop back to the entrance, so I went out of it and around to where I had left her, and then had to run through the entire dungeon again to catch up to her. I personally would just have her come in through the secret exit as soon as the boss is killed, teleport her if necessary, and just say that she followed us a room behind as we cleared the place out. With her shrine cleared, Aeola wants to initiate us into the coven. Wait, wait. What if I just wanted you to return to your shrine but didn't necessarily want to join your coven? That doesn't seem like an unreasonable decision, but the game glosses past that. If we help clear the shrine, that means we obviously want to feast on human flesh, and Aeola thinks Brother Verilis will be perfect. Which is strange, because there is actually a branch off at the end. If you bring Verilis to the shrine but then kill the coven, Verilis will reward us with between 5 and 1500 gold. So obviously Bethesda was somewhat keyed in when it came to people potentially not wanting to become cannibals, but did not think that there was a world where someone might want to let a cannibal cult live, but not necessarily join it. I mean, there is, as always, the leave and never return option of letting the quest sit in your log. That's the nocturnal solution. Our reward for going through with the ritual is the Ring of Namira. It allows you to eat corpses, which will give you a 5 minute buff providing 50 extra hit points and 50% health regeneration. Despite carrying it around for most of the game, I never actually made use of it. This artifact is basically nullified by apprentice level restoration magic and alchemy. There are two other uses for it. One is to use a glitch involving the cursed ring of Hircine to acquire the ability to consume corpses without wearing the ring of Namira. Seems like it would be annoying when trying to loot bandits, but sure. The other use is to be able to eat people for the survival mode creation. Originally, when planning this video, I was going to subject myself to doing a full playthrough of Skyrim using this mode. It didn't seem like a bad idea, because I've enjoyed using the Frostfall and I Need mods for Skyrim in the past. In fact, when it comes to modding Skyrim, I consider survival mods essential, although it's been a few years since I've actually done a modded playthrough, so it's possible better alternatives exist now. It basically turns the game into a survival game. Something as simple as crossing a river becomes dangerous, and you have to manage your needs. Another YouTuber, Private Sessions, remarked that he was negative towards Skyrim, but playing with a similar mod setup gave him a greater appreciation of the game. So, you would think survival mode would be an adequate replacement for these mods, right? Survival mode is... terrible. Prior to the announcement of Anniversary Edition, when I was test running for Skyrim, I actually paid $5 for this piece of shit. This came out in late 2017, and then in 2021, they repackaged it into the Anniversary Edition, as far as I can tell, completely unchanged. And you have to wonder, will it ever be updated to be better? We don't even know who made it. Moreover, can it ever be replaced on the Creation Club like it could on the Skyrim Nexus? Maybe it's a good thing. It means that free alternatives will always be superior to this mode, which was staple to everyone's copy of Skyrim Special Edition as a means of advertising the Anniversary Edition. So what is so bad about this mode? For one, it reduces hunger, thirst, sleep, and cold down into hunger, fatigue, and cold. It is also more intrusive with the user interface. If any of these stats are missing, it adds a little red bar to the UI on your health, stamina, or magicka meters. It also means these UI elements are no longer contextual, instead just awkwardly hanging on the screen, at all times. These meters also affect singular stats, so for instance having low fatigue impacts your total available magicka. Yes, fatigue used to be how we referred to stamina, so that might be confusing, and you may also wonder how someone who hasn't slept doesn't have their stamina impacted by not sleeping. Survival mode practices a punishing mode of survival rather than a rewarding mode. What that means is that you're made weaker for not eating, sleeping, and staying warm instead of being made stronger when you are fulfilled. It's a strange thing, but these modes almost always work better in this manner. To contrast this difference, let's look at the differences between food in Minecraft and Valheim. Minecraft has a punitive system. If you don't eat, your satiation decreases, reducing your ability to regenerate health. Valheim has a rewarding system. The better the food you eat, the more health and stamina you will have. Not eating in Minecraft will bring you to the brink of death. Not eating in Valheim returns you to a baseline that you can only survive in the meadows. 
While on paper it is identical, Valheim's system makes food a more fulfilling mechanic rather than simply a point of maintenance. Now, there are positive states in survival mode. If you're warm, you can pick locks and pockets 10% easier and are 10% resistant to frost magic. If you're well fed, your stamina regenerates 10% faster. But if you aren't, then it's all debuffs. Now the thing is, that is not ideal. It is an archaic setup even for the era this creation was released in, but that's not the reason I decided against playing survival mode. Everything is blurry, all the time, for no reason. I am literally typing this sentence out right now in the morning before I've even had breakfast. Oh, and it's cold, and I'm wearing a blanket, and I can barely make out the words on screen due to how blurry my vision is from being hungry and chilly. Oh wait, that's not how reality works. One night, I was riding my bike home from work, and I had to ride through a freezing windstorm. Despite only being out for 20 minutes and wearing winter gear, I was showing symptoms of early frostbite. And you know what happened to my vision? It actually got sharper because my body was trying to get me out of that situation. Blurry vision from being tired isn't terribly unrealistic, but as somebody who has pulled plenty of all-night riding sessions, I can tell you that it actually only lasts about an hour. Once you get past the wall of wanting to go to sleep, your body wakes back up and things stop being blurry. The other physical conditions where I've noticed blurry vision had to do with either too little water or too much water, although the latter was because I was drowning and thus suffocating. The dehydration may have been because it was also above 100 Fahrenheit outside, or 310 Kelvin for those in countries that think they're superior. Plus, it doesn't matter because survival mode doesn't have a thirst meter. Also, don't take my anecdotes as some sign that I'm living a dangerous life. I still haven't experienced exsanguination, broken bones, car crashes, and I've never been shot or stabbed. Survival mode does add in freezing water, and you can even use flame cloak spells to deal with that, which I find a fun decision. Most early survival mods basically shunned magic altogether because they didn't want to answer the question of how someone proficient at destruction magic can freeze to death. However, as we go down the list, you start to see issues with the mod. Survival mode is a binary. You either play with it on or off. But there's no reason. There's no competitive leaderboard of people playing with the mod, so being unable to tweak settings or disable features makes survival mode extremely archaic in terms of Skyrim mods. For some reason, Bethesda made it so you cannot earn achievements on modded versions of the game. Who cares? Actual survival mods tend to feature comprehensive setting sections to allow you to custom tailor the mod to your personal taste in survival games. For instance, some people only want a mechanical incentive to sleep because they find buying lodging and planning their days to be interesting, but do not find hunger or thirst good additions to their game. For me, I have an issue with the fact that survival mode disables fast travel. But you hate fast travel, uh, yeah I do. I also hate only disabling fast travel in Oblivion and Skyrim. Without any additional reworks to travel, disabled fast travel makes the game worse with little upside. Skyrim did add carriage drivers, but only to the major hold capitals. Dawnguard would also add ferrymen traveling between the coastal cities. Except Winterhold. Because for some reason, Bethesda just hated the idea of being able to hire a travel service to get out of Winterhold. You know, one of the major questline hubs. Like Oblivion, Skyrim's quests are not made with the idea in mind that you're going to be playing without fast travel. In fact, they seem very much designed around being able to fast travel. Take the Civil War. After each battle that you have to travel to, you have to return to General Tolius or Ulfric Stormcloak, who do not travel between their military camps, but, in fact, just stay in their capital cities. What about all the radiant jobs for the Thieves Guild rebuilding the faction? It's like changing the INI setting that will disable quest markers. That alone doesn't fix the problem. But what about horses? Morrowind didn't have those, and that's true. But Skyrim doesn't have speed fortification either. I have everything those attributes did are still in the game. They're just in other places, whether that's a skill or whether that's a perk or whether that's want either magicka, health, stamina. Plus, you have that classic problem where the Skyrim horses are terrible. There's no fluidity to mounting and dismounting. It's all very blocky. Take Red Dead Redemption, which came out a year before Skyrim. It, I'm showing the second game because that one is on PC, but it's the same general principle. When you mount a horse in Red Dead, you are immediately able to start moving. Depending on the situation, the horse might even be a little eager to get moving and barely wait for you to saddle up. In addition, you can call your horse to you, and it can follow you around unless you give it a command to stay or hitch it to something. Dismounting is similarly fluid, which is important in Red Dead because it means that rather than horses just being a tool for travel, they become an actual extension of your mobility. In Skyrim, horses fully stop when being mounted and dismounted. 
It's not so much an extension of you as it is an alternate state that you have entered, similar to becoming a werewolf. In addition, Red Dead horses are an order of magnitude faster than you can go as the player. Even if they worked as they did in Skyrim, they would still be worth using due to how much faster they travel compared to running on foot. Meanwhile, in Skyrim, horses travel at 450 while we run at 370. These are the values ascribed by the engine, hence why they don't have units, but the raw fact is that horses are only 19.5% faster than running on foot. Mounting in Skyrim takes 1.75 seconds, while dismounting takes 2.5 seconds. Using these numbers, I was able to project that you would need to travel for more than 20 seconds to actually make up the lost time involved in mounting and dismounting. So for instance, if you want to do stuff like pick herbs, loot bodies, mine ore nodes, or anything else you might do on the ground, it's actually better to just travel by foot in Skyrim than it is to use horses. Horses in Skyrim also have a minuscule stamina pool with which to gallop, so much so that higher level players who invest in stamina will be able to outrun them. However, a quirk of horses is that if the player has zero stamina and cannot regenerate it, usually due to being a vampire during the day, then the horse also can't regenerate its stamina, meaning it can no longer gallop. There is zero reason to find the numbers and do similar math with horses in Red Dead because it is undeniable in that game that they are superior to walking. It's true that there are less reasons to stop in Red Dead compared to Skyrim, but it's also true that horses are very fast in that game. Now the reason for this was sadly unsurprising. In fact, Bethesda almost cut horses from Skyrim. Which means that very narrowly we could have had alternating horse presence. Arena only had horses during fast travel, Daggerfall had horses, Morrowind did not, Oblivion did, and Skyrim almost did not. And now you see games come out like Red Dead, or, you know, there are more horses in games than we, we feel like just the basic implementation we did in Oblivion isn't going to be good enough. During the marketing of the game, there were multiple instances where Todd and friends were cagey about whether or not the game would have horses. Are they going to be in there? Are you going to be able to uh, mount a horse? I would say we, we want to do that. Something we are definitely messing with. Um, and we just want to make sure we do it right. So if it's a feature we think is really good, adds a lot to the game, we'll leave it in, and if we think right. it's rough and we can't get it there, we'll probably take it out, but it's... I don't want to promise it yet, but it's something we would really, really like to have. It's like looking it. good. Well, it was revealed in a documentary created by developers of Skyrim that... I remember for a while the horse wasn't working out. You know, there, like, we were having so many troubles with it, trying to, like, ride the horse. You know, the horse sometimes was so fast that the uh, the world wouldn't load in time. And I, I remember, like, there was almost, like, an ultimatum <laughs> at a meeting where, like, Todd was, like... We'll cut the horses if we need to, because what's most important are the dragons, the exploration and playing how you want. You know, like he knew what the game was about. I love the whole power fantasy thing. So I was like, you know, I want to make this werewolf a big time power fantasy. The fear was that it would break a lot of shit and it did break some stuff. We wanted this thing to just run like a beast running. And I remember even the running, they were like, no, you can't do the run. You'll outrun the loader. We had to basically do a trick. Jeremy came up with it, this trick where he did something with the zoom, he pulled out the camera, and you'll see it to this day, the camera pulls out in a certain way that makes it look like you're running faster than you actually are. And we pushed the limit on, I think, close to what horse speed, as far as the werewolf could run, to make you feel like this galloping beast. Similar to the horse story, werewolves were also something Todd was hesitant to confirm. Followed suit asking about similar things, if you could kind of like change form or anything like that. Is there anything along that those veins that you can talk about? I mean, I can say that we are, we're fans of that stuff as well. We are currently messing with all of that. I don't want to commit to, here are the things you can change into and, right. and what they're like right now, um, not because we're not doing it or not attempting to. I just don't know, honestly, where that's, where that's going to end up and how, how deep we're going to get into that. From the mouths of multiple developers and clues from the marketing, it's easy to conclude that this issue of the renderer was consistent. But why? Red Dead Redemption 1 had faster speeds on the same hardware, and the prior games had faster speeds on the same engine. It appears that something they had done in the creation of Skyrim's game world created a soft speed limit in terms of how fast Bethesda could actually allow the player to move. Well, the answer is that the game was built around the limitations of 7th generation consoles. When the game came out on PC, Bethesda actually had to release a patch to utilize more than 2 gigabytes of RAM, but even that was cavernous compared to the consoles. The Xbox 360 had 512 megabytes of RAM, while the PlayStation 3 only had 256 megabytes. Is it any wonder such a memory-intensive game as Skyrim had troubles on the PlayStation? Funnily enough, another creation adds in the Boots of Blinding speed from Morrowind, which allows the player to run very quickly, but you're blind while doing so. 
You can use Night Eye to see a bit, but it would be hard to gauge with these on if you're actually outrunning the engine's ability to render in the Special Edition. But the fact remains, this is a clear, objective example of how the game being designed around consoles impacted its design. There's no reason Bethesda couldn't have had a PC horse speed and a console horse speed. They made a high resolution texture pack for PC, why not implement features that were too powerful for the 360? Having too many NPCs being processed at once would simply put way too much strain on console and PC processors. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Acer Thorn. Possibly even to the point of overloading them, causing permanent damage. Yes, yes, thank you. That's quite enough. And in extreme cases, literal explosions. <laughs> Um, anyways, disabling fast travel in survival mode sucks. No health regeneration. Why? I mean, okay, but it seems like something people would want to disable because they don't want to use the solutions provided. You can only level in beds. Honestly, good. It means I won't be forced to level just because I want to look at the skill menu. Reduced carry weight. Oh good, even harsher requirements to dump points into stamina my mage character doesn't use. That said, Anniversary Edition also gave away backpacks for free, so you can offset that lost carry weight with a hideous backpack. I feel like Bethesda didn't really understand why people liked these mods. They simply threw backpacks in without regard for style. Cloaks of Skyrim is one of my favorite mods. It's such a simple idea that makes backpacks look better. I also usually get a mod that repositions arrows to the small of the back, although I also like the mod Bandolier, which adds a number of other options to the game. It was horribly unbalanced, but did a good job of making the backpacks look more natural. Obviously, the issue is that none of the default gear was ever really made to complement backpacks, so you end up with a character wearing full Daedric armor looking like they're waiting for the bus on their first day of school. The Steedstone was also nerfed, having its carry weight benefit slashed in half. Again, why? What is with the fetish for reducing carry weight? Is survival mode also supposed to be a realism mode? I suppose we should be grateful that hunger and fatigue don't also reduce carry weight then, since that would also be realistic. But the thing about encumbrance is that it's as fun as the mechanics provided for it allow. While it is one of the core problems you have to solve when planning a trip, Skyrim doesn't actually make solving that particular problem fun. By its original design, over encumbrance was never really a problem. Because Skyrim cut the feather spells, your options are to have a set of equipment to assist with carry weight, while also having a follower and pet who can lend you additional pounds of encumbrance. You can then make use of carry weight potions, but that's a short-term solution, likely meant just to get you from the boss chest to the overworld so you can fast travel home. It's not a real solution because for every one minute of fortified carry weight, you have to carry half a pound of potion. There are new diseases, and these diseases progress with time. They also made it so shrines require gold offerings. I approve of these changes, but some people don't. That's why options are important. Vampires and werewolves can satiate their hunger by feeding, and most of the races have some changes to provide benefits. Example given, Nords can resist the cold while Argonians are weak to it. The biggest issue with survival mode is that it's official content. It's as much a part of base Skyrim now as legendary difficulty. Yet unlike legendary difficulty, it is incongruent with Skyrim's design philosophy. Even if that design philosophy is terrible, it does not matter. It means that survival mode has to do more work to adapt Skyrim's design to fit into its paradigm. Real survival mods have no issue with doing this. I think a good way to demonstrate this is to look at survival mode's more extreme cousin, Fallout 4 survival difficulty. Like in Skyrim, Fallout 4's incarnation has a whole host of changes to the game. Even going farther is to limit saving to beds and tie game difficulty in with the mode. Compare that with something like a FromSoft game. FromSoft games are designed to be even more extreme from the start of development. There's no save system and encounters are difficult, yet the games have done extremely well due to the effort on display from the developers to make sure the experience isn't tedious. When you retroactively add these rules in, especially with a general lack of grace as these survival modes have, then you have only added challenge in for those who don't look up a good strategy. There are maps out there of all the beds in Fallout 4 complete with lines indicating the best route to take in order to save often. In essence, people are playing the same game of Fallout 4 where they save wherever they want, because likely what attracted them to the mode was the hunger meter or the modified difficulty. Most survival games have no save system, and this is true. Seven Days to Die is a comparable experience, except it's a lot harder to actually die in that game than it is in Fallout 4 survival mode. But when you do die, seven days is far more punishing. You respawn back at your bed, having lost all of your items. 
And I've never had a problem with that or wanted to stop playing because it was usually pretty easy to understand what I did wrong. Fallout 4 is not designed that way. It is designed as an action shooter, and action shooters have the tendency to kill the player often so they can restart a section to do it right. It is a fundamentally different design philosophy. What's funny is that my first experience with a hunger meter was in a Fallout game, in New Vegas. Hardcore mode adds survival elements, but do you see what it doesn't do? It doesn't change the game difficulty. That setting is independent. It doesn't change the save system. The biggest difference, however, is that hardcore mode was meant to be in the game from the very beginning. During a charity stream, Josh Sawyer said that the survival mechanics were heavily inspired by the game's stalker Call of Pripyat. Not only was there a clear inspiration, but hardcore mode was integrated well. I always play Morrowind at max difficulty, and I always play New Vegas with hardcore mode on, but I do not enjoy survival mode in Fallout 4 or Skyrim. What is sad is that this infection has spread back to Obsidian in the Outer Worlds. Supernova difficulty is ostensibly just survival mode for that game, but even then, the Outer Worlds was designed to work around this difficulty mode. In fact, my opposition to playing the mode had more to do with me finding Outer Worlds difficult to replay than actually disliking the rules that it imposed on me. Although like Fallout 4 and Skyrim, the player gets no options for which rules they do and do not want without mods. I understand the appeal of commitment modes, but I don't understand why players can't be prompted at the start about which rules they want to commit to. To me, the companions being killable is a terrible rule to have. It means I refuse to recruit them, which in turn means I don't get to see their content, which is some of the best in the game. But the game is still built around that. There are perks you can take that make you stronger if you haven't recruited any companions. While difficulty customization is a quality feature, Souls games prove that some games are better off without them. However, they should be in Skyrim, because survival mode is a retroactive feature. There's also one final reason, and that is the thesis of Anniversary Edition. The Creation Club has been pitched as a celebration of the modding community. The thing is that mods are built around a high degree of customization. However, once again, it seems that Bethesda's answer to the problems of survival mode is to allow the player to mod it if they don't like it. And I don't fucking care if there's some kind of mod that fixes this. I don't. I hate when people use that as a defense. Games, I think, should be evaluated on how they play out of the box. I mean, some mod that some guy made that adds all this kind of stuff back in doesn't excuse the fact that it wasn't there to begin with. That's the real celebration. Here are more things that you need to patch. What was sad was that as I was looking up mods for this section, I was finding dozens of various patches to the game. I looked up backpacks only for the top mods to all be rebalances of the backpacks creation instead of new backpack mods. But if you want to be more cynical, there are two creations designed to complement survival but were actually paid solutions. Camping allows you to rest and warm up in the wild. Backpacks, as already mentioned, allows you to alleviate the carry weight rule. Camping was $3, and backpacks were $4, while survival mode was $5. So if you aren't on board with literally every single rule of survival mode, you have to buy more creations to solve these problems. Make your game worse for $5. Reclaim your lost carry weight for $4. Sleep in the wilderness again for $3. Is the reason that survival mode has no built-in difficulty options to softly encourage spending more money, I mean credits, on other creations? If that is the case, then why did that design philosophy survive through to the Anniversary Edition? Alright, now do you feel like murdering somebody? Good. We're starting to reach into the more obscure Daedra quests, which is interesting as Mephala is one of the good Daedra of the Dunmer people. This quest, without the unofficial patch, may be impossible to acquire depending on if Holda is still alive. Holda is essential for starting this quest, but isn't actually flagged as essential. Typically, the argument is made that essential NPCs are necessary because they might die early, rendering quests impossible to acquire. However, when looking up if Holda dying is a common issues player have, ironically, the leading cause of Holda's death was murder at the hands of the player. How interesting. I thought these NPCs were supposed to be at great risk of being murdered by bandits or dragons or glitches. Yet there are players out there who randomly decided to murder an important quest NPC. It's pretty easy to understand why. Yasolda is a common waifu for Skyrim and has a line about wanting to buy the Bannered Mare, so some players kill Holda, its owner, so that Yasolda can accomplish her dream of running an inn. As you saw in my footage, Yasolda had no problem immediately stepping up into the role within seconds of Holda's heart attack. Now, Holda is less susceptible to dying randomly due to the fact that she spends her days exclusively inside the Bannered Mare. As far as I can tell, the only time she goes outside is during the Battle of Whiterun. So, if Holda can be the bottleneck of this quest, why isn't she at least protected? 
Well, because she is supposed to be replaceable. See, Bethesda had this idea that they could make it so that if a shop NPC dies, there are other characters that can fill in their roles, which is an amazing idea. However, when it came to the Bannered Mare, it seemed there was no consensus on who was actually supposed to take over the inn. Now, maybe this is a common issue I just didn't notice because I don't go around murdering merchants, but I noticed due to the related bug. When Holda dies, Yasolda, our wife, is supposed to take over the inn. She has dialogue related to her grinding so that she may one day be an innkeeper, and Holda has dialogue related to selling the inn to Yasolda. Great. Except she doesn't actually behave like an innkeeper, no services, and no rumors. If Yasolda owns the inn, she can't start this quest. The unofficial patch fixes this by making it so that Mikhail, the bard, takes over as innkeeper. That's not very girl boss. And in the creation kit, Ulfina Greymane, a tavern girl, has scripting to also act as a backup barkeep. But Ulfina ends up being the house Carl and Dragon's Reach if the Stormcloaks take over, unless she dies, in which case Irolith switches sides to play that role. Balgrup and I share a battle bond. We met as youths and forged our friendship in the fires of war. When he became Jarl, I insisted on serving as his protector. He had no cause to argue. What do you want? Needless to say, whatever the aspirations of the system were, the execution leaves a lot to be desired. Again, I don't think it's a bad idea, I think the problem is that there aren't enough NPCs to really make it work. The problem with Skyrim is that every named NPC is supposed to be a unique character. Alfina is more than just a barmaid, she's a proud woman who is rude in conversations and having a secret affair with a member of a rival family. If you have played Skyrim, I could randomly draw an NPC from Whiterun out of a hat and you would likely know who they were. That doesn't mean they're good characters, in fact it's actually a negative. There are so few people and conversations in Whiterun that you will inevitably start hearing repeats of the same dialogue over and over. In this respect, Skyrim is even more extreme than Oblivion, which itself was trying to address a supposed problem for Morrowind. Morrowind NPCs lacked distinction because many had no unique dialogue, instead pulling from a shared pool of generic dialogue. Well, clicking through random NPC pages on the UESP reveals that most have at least a unique greeting in Oblivion, even if they aren't tied to any quests. But that wasn't enough, as people complained about the bizarre behaviors of NPCs in Oblivion, so Bethesda continued trying to improve them. Admirable, yes, but it seemed that there was a proportional relationship. Similar to how if you decrease the volume of a container, it increases the pressure of the gas inside. Bethesda apparently had 1,000 points of NPC development for both games. Increasing the characterization of NPCs meant that there had to be fewer overall. And that is not even getting into the execution of the idea. I'm sure when I said that Skyrim NPCs were better than Oblivion NPCs, some viewers simply laughed because better doesn't necessarily translate to good. Especially when you get out of areas that obviously received additional attention due to being near the start of the game. Another thing is that there is a haves and haves not divide in Bethesda games, which is becoming increasingly obvious. In Morrowind, 95% of NPCs were haves not. If they were boring, they were consistently boring. In Oblivion, it was more random. Many NPCs would have custom greetings and potentially custom dialogue, but it was all still pretty obvious that Bethesda was in a cutting fever due to file space limitations. At best, generic NPCs have only a custom greeting. In Skyrim, some NPCs have lots of custom dialogue. They can talk about all sorts of stuff and answer questions, and even have more dialogue you can overhear if conditions are right. That itself creates problems because for some NPCs, those conditions are impossible, or they're badly scripted and never play. But the system is somewhat replayable because there is always a chance of overhearing dialogue you had not in the past. However, in Skyrim, it is glaringly obvious when an NPC is a haves not. Let's look at a game that was even more extreme, Fallout 4. The haves in Fallout 4 have dialogue that is impressive for Elder Scrolls, but kind of disappointing for Fallout. The haves not in Fallout 4 are jealous of Oblivion NPCs. And you have the same proportionality problem, more fleshing out, but less overall. The Commonwealth is smaller than Skyrim, with less settlements, and less people living in those settlements. And, as far as I can tell, Fallout 4 did not continue the practice of NPC redundancy, so now Skyrim is the one game in the lineup to have a mildly interesting idea that was ultimately beaten down, likely due to bad implementation. You don't have to have essential NPCs if you implement some level of redundancy. I wouldn't go too crazy, I don't want to murder someone only to immediately have their replacement standing over my shoulder. If I kill a quest NPC, I should fail the quest, not wait until the replacement arrives for work. And I would probably have QA hire a murder hobo to test this stuff out. Haha, ha, Bethesda QA, etc. Anyways, 
Holda has heard strange tales of the Jarl's children, probably straight from the horse's mouth. Balgrov, did you slip out again last night for a drink at the Bannet Mare? An annoying quirk of Holda is that she likes to gossip about other things before finally getting around to sharing the rumor of the Jarl's children. This is because innkeepers serve as rumor mills for content, both radiant and handcrafted. Holda will tell you about the companions, the Gilder Green quest, as well as general innkeeper rumors such as the College of Winterhold, Shrine of Azura, Aventus Arantino performing the Black Sacrament, and the Face Sculptor in Riften. I don't know if they're intentionally burying the Mephala quest, or if simply because Mephala's quest is the highest level requirement rumor that she has. This quest is kind of an abnormality, because by necessity it implies that Balgriff is still Jarl of Whiterun. This is why the saddest room in the game exists, which is funny because it means visiting Balgriff in exile to talk about his son, who is still living in Dragon's Reach. Melkir has recently started browsing Discord and getting groomed by someone much older than him. I know that he still worships Talos, that he hates the Thalmar almost as much as the Stormcloaks do, that he worries about being chased from Whiterun, that he... that I'm... that I don't have the same mother as my brother and sister. I find this sentiment rather interesting and I have no reason to believe that Mephala is lying about these things. It makes one wonder why Balgriff sides with the Imperials. He'll say it's for the people of Whiterun, as though Ulfric is some monster planning on killing everyone in the city. I think, like everything about this quest so far, it's just poorly thought out. We never even meet the Lady of Dragon's Reach, nor are told much about her if she's dead. Moreover, obviously Mephala is manipulating Nelk here, but I think she is telling a lie of omission, meaning that Nelkir has a different mother, but it could be for a valid reason. For instance, he could actually be Balgriff's brother, as the CK indicates, or he could have adopted from another Jarl, similar to Ned Stark's adoption of Jon Snow, or he could have been born out of wedlock, although worth noting is that Skyrim doesn't really seem to put a premium on legitimacy of heirs like typical monarchies. There's no answer, because half of this quest ended up on the cutting room floor. What was supposed to happen in this quest was that Mephala would influence all of Balgriff's children and presumably we would be the agent of this influence, maybe even given a choice between doing this and saving Balgriff. Then the children would murder their father and Hrongar would take over Balgriff's position as the Jarl. What actually ends up happening is that we're sent down into the basement to find the whispering door that Nelkir has been learning all this from. I forgive your not knowing my name. Few can hear my whispers anymore. You are literally one of the principal gods of the Dunmer people. You have a temple on Solstheim. You have an organization of assassins legally operating in service of your worship. What do you mean exactly? She wants us to open the door, which requires us acquiring the key. You can kill Farangar to acquire it, but you can also just pickpocket it. Nothing changes if you do it the non mafala way. Excellent work. No. I trust you're sharp enough to see that the sword doesn't match the description of the ebony blade you may know. Yeah, it's uh, two-handed now. Basically useless as a consequence. That's the quest, by the way. Technically, there is more in that the blade needs to be restored, which is done by using it to kill NPCs that trust us. We need to murder ten people, which I like. Sure, you can cheese it and get four kills through the Dark Brotherhood targets, but eventually you have to murder some named NPCs that trust you. I just wish the sword wasn't two-handed. Hell, it was originally considered by the game to be a one-handed sword, benefiting from those perks. And its damage is scaled to be a mid-tier one-handed sword, but weaker than an iron greatsword. I find this disappointing due to how much fun I had in Oblivion using this weapon with the Zura Star, since in Oblivion it also had a Soul Trap effect in addition to absorbing health. So what exactly went wrong with this quest? Well, we can figure its relative obscurity might be owed to its incomplete nature. In fact, the next quest for Boethia also had content cut from it. I think there are a few elements here. Whoever designed it was obviously a big fan of the redundant NPC feature. The quest giver is redundant, and Balgriff was supposed to be as well. However, the bad implementation of that feature might have been the quest's downfall. In essence, the design team didn't have the resources or ability to adapt other quests to account for Balgriff's death. Remember that Balgriff plays an important part in the beginning of the main quest and the Civil War. The Civil War handled this by requiring his part of the main quest to be complete, but that came with the side effect of every Civil War character being Dragonborn. Obviously, they don't want to imply that every Dragonborn did the murder quest for the murder god, so they didn't implement that requirement. 
meaning that if Harangar has to take over for Balgriff, then everything else involving Balgriff has to account for that change. Plus, how do you do the patricide scene if Balgriff has been ousted from Dragon's Reach? Personally, I actually think Balgriff's side in the Civil War should be the same as the player. While you would almost certainly have some guy on YouTube complain about how cheap it is that Balgriff's opinion aligns with the player, it actually works pretty well. We are the Thane of Whiterun. Balgriff has a homegrown dragonborn in his court. Us picking a side in the conflict is the slightest force needed to finally get Bulgriff off the fence. It makes his murder scene all the more dramatic as well. As an artifact, the Ebony Blade is empowered by betrayal. How fitting then that its acquisition requires the betrayal of an NPC that many reviewers admit to liking. I am Jarl Bulgriff and I be Balin. With the cutting of its main content, this quest went from potentially one of the most interesting Daedra quests to extremely simple and boring. Boethius' quest is the highest level Daedra quest in the game. By itself, that has no guarantees of making it obscure because the requirement is only level 30, which is chump change in Skyrim. There are two ways to start the quest. The first is that you can read a copy of the book Boethius Proving. It gets around. For instance, you can find it during Molag Ball's quest, which involved a Boethia cultist. You can also find it as part of the College of Winterhold, the main quest, or as part of a radiantly generated quest. Or if you wait long enough, you'll eventually get attacked by a Boethia cultist carrying the book. But his soul still resides within, protected by his enchantments. Until he is purged, my artifact is useless. No more. Ah! Even with this in mind, I still consider this to be one of the more obscure quests. It's reliant on random encounters and players actually reading a book in the game world. Which is fine, but you have to admit that is more obscure than a dog literally walking up to you in Falkreath Hold. The other way to start this quest is to go straight to the shrine, or I guess they call it a Sacellum. If you're the right level, then a bunch of NPCs will be here. Interestingly, you can wipe out everyone here and still get the quest, which is mildly appropriate since everyone here is going to engage in a battle royale later down the line anyways. Either way, we're instructed by the priestess of Boethia directly on what to do. We need to bring a follower to the shrine and sacrifice them. I found this to be an interesting use of Skyrim's new follower system. It also doubles up as proof that if you add more mechanics to the games, that you can do more interesting things with those mechanics as part of the quests. You can actually double up here, getting one of your ebony blade kills, since followers all have the dispositions needed to do both, and you aren't actually forced to use the given blade of sacrifice. Hey, unofficial patch, it's clear this quest is supposed to require the blade of sacrifice, so why don't you fix that? I'm joking. Boethia then tells everyone that she has a task for the last person standing, which is to go kill her old champion and reclaim the ebony male. She wants it done quietly, but doesn't actually check if we follow that order. One generic bandit cave later and we equip the ebony male, with Boethia declaring us her new champion. Two fun facts about the champion of Boethia that we just killed. One is that he's flagged incorrectly as Forsworn, so he'll end up fighting the bandits that he lives with. Now stop right there, contrarian scum, you were about to comment about how that's intentional because Boethia loves betrayal. Well, the other fun fact is that if you manage to calm the champion, he actually has dialogue. I told you, I'm done with all that. There's enough blood on these hands. I'm interested in creating things now. Mind my words, or I'll mind them for you. I'm slave to no man, no god, and no Daedra. Boethia talks about leaving your mark, a sign of your passing. Well, you can make a mark on the world without treachery and murder. Whenever a man's life is saved by armor made with these hands, these hands have changed that man's destiny and his family's. So you can tell that heartless Daedra bitch I'm done doing her dirty work. So yeah, he's not into Boethia anymore. Which means fighting the bandits he lives with is an oversight. I don't know what to make of him having dialogue. It's neat, but it also makes his hyperaggression unusual. You would imagine he would not be hostile until attacked based on what he says. I want to love that there is a hidden detail about this quest, but given everything else about it, it just comes off as something Bethesda forgot to cut. Despite its simplicity, the reward is actually decent. The Ebony Mail is one of the best heavy armor curuses in the game. It used to be medium armor, and it actually used to be a lot better. 
Constant effect. Resist fire 75%, shield 50 points, resist magicka 20%. Its armor rating is over twice that of the highest generic medium armor in base Morrowind, the Endoral armor. It gives the Lord's Mail and Dragonbone Curus a run for their money despite those both being heavy armor. And in Skyrim, it... Muffles. Something you can get a perk at level 70 sneak to do or use an apprentice illusion spell to apply on yourself for 3 minutes. Alright, so my first draft was a bit harsher on the Ebony Male's enchant than I probably should have been. The reason for this is its secondary effect, which is a poison cloak. Initially, I was of the impression that the cloak was constant, which would mean as soon as you snuck close to somebody, which is what the muffle effect implies you should be doing, you would start damaging the person you were sneaking up on, making the muffle effect pointless. In reality, it'll only start applying as soon as the enemy activates, which can happen if they sense your presence. So not totally useless for stealth, just almost totally. The question is though, why has it been geared towards a quasi-stealth approach? Boethia is associated with plots and murder, but that aspect is satiated by our execution of our follower. Maybe the idea was not to make an objectively best-in-slot heavy armor artifact for the highest level Daedric item, even though a lot of people favor the male due to its low weight already. But, not to be outdone, there is a Creation Club quest tied to Boethia as well. It adds in the titular katana, Goldbrand. This was Boethia's quest reward in Morrowind and Oblivion. In both games, this sword is considered a contender as one of the best in the game, and not just because it is a golden katana. Meanwhile in Skyrim, it's up there, but has to now contend with crafted weapons that are likely straight up better in every way. It's also not scaled correctly, as in literally, it is too small. It actually looks like they modeled the size after Deadpool swords. Which is strange because there were already katanas in the game to use as a baseline. As an aside, I don't know why people mod Harkin's sword into not being a katana. Akaviri's swords are blood drinkers, so it fits somewhat that he would have one. I guess it's just that usual thing of people hating katanas because of weebs. Anyways, the gold brand quest is, of course, very basic. You find some research notes of the Shrine of Boethia or the Arcanium. I actually had the game bug out and keep repeatedly spawning these cultists that are scripted to attack you after you read the note, which made visiting the Arcanium very annoying. The note points us to a new Nordic crypt, but to get inside we need to talk to a guy and run an existing dungeon to acquire two items. You're not supposed to be in here! You're not supposed to be in here. Can a man have a bit of privacy? Get out of here! Also, a couple notes to insert in editing. As of now, about 10 months after Anniversary Edition's release, the UESP still has a grammatical error in referring to Lars Battleborn's clan name. The article also doesn't link to Lars' page as is standard on their website, so in writing, I did not remember that Lars is one of the literal children in the Battleborn family, yet for some reason his father has given him an amulet that is essential for sealing away a Daedric artifact. This is actually very common with UESP articles for Creation Club content. Even stuff that's older than the Anniversary Edition release has bare-bones articles. Now, that is not a slight against the site. Ultimately, the wiki is a product of community contribution, but we are talking about a Creation Club piece in what is undeniably the most popular Elder Scrolls game, which features an artifact that appears in Morrowind and Oblivion and played a part in the lore for Skyrim. What you have to understand is that these people will put up with Elder Scrolls Online and Blades content and write detailed articles and walkthrough for everything in those games, but cannot be fucked to do the same for half of the Creation Club. When some of the most diehard fans of the series are turning their noses up at this shit, it really speaks volumes. I am getting sick of explaining these super basic creations, which is funny because I'm actually writing this part after writing about a bunch of Creation Club stuff in Dragonborn. I mean, if the appeal of this is supposed to be that you added an item from previous games into Skyrim, then maybe the sword should actually be at the correct scale. Isn't that the point? The boring content is just context for why you dropped the sword into the world? So shouldn't the sword be accurate? Plus, there is a reason Boethia gave us the ebony mail in this game instead of Goldbrand, and that's because Titus Mead II was stated to have wielded Goldbrand during the war, so if the sword was in the game, you would obviously have to have an actual answer about that. Obviously, if making swords the right size is outside the scope of this creation, they obviously couldn't do anything like that. Let, please, let's just move on. I suppose I should mention the cut Elisif quest, where Boethia would task you with slaying Elisif the Fair. 
The plan was that after getting our hands on the Ebony Mail, Boethia would send rumors of an assassin, placing the Blue Palace on alert, and the challenge would be to access Elifsif's chambers and do the deed. A number of NPCs could help with this task depending on our relationships, and afterwards, several things would change to accommodate Elisif's death, including her replacement by Eriker and all of the scenes where Elisif appears. However, why this quest was cut is a matter of speculation. Boethia's quest already had quite a few stages, so maybe it was felt that the quest was too long compared to the others. Perhaps assassinating Elisif was not seen as fitting Boethia. And obviously you have the consideration of actually trying to implement all of this. Filthy she-hound Elisif got what she deserved. Let her serve as High Queen of Oblivion for all I care. Although honestly, nothing sounds terribly difficult in terms of just raw implementation. It's more so testing Uruker's replacement of Elisif that was probably too intimidating to justify the effort. Especially since the Dark Brotherhood ended up having an even higher profile assassination. Out in the middle of nowhere is an orcish stronghold under attack from a giant. It's actually one of four orc strongholds in Skyrim. If you don't stumble on them in your travels, you may end up getting pointed to them by city orcs after doing favors for them. To be welcomed into the stronghold, you need to become Bloodkin, which you can get for helping orcs out. I like the idea of the orc strongholds. Orcs in Arena were generic enemies, while Daggerfall introduced the idea of orcs actually being civilized in their own way. King Gortwog ended up establishing the Kingdom of Orsinium after that game's conclusion, which led to orcs achieving a modicum of respect and gradually entering Imperial institutions. The Imperial Legion you join in Morrowind, the Death's Head Legion, is actually primarily made up of orcish legionaries. An area I really liked though was Valenvarion, an old Dunmer stronghold that is now occupied by a clan of orcs. Despite seeming like a hostile bandit gang, they have a master alchemist living with them, and some of them will even serve as trainers. Oblivion would iterate upon this idea by... well, it didn't really. Orcs were just another race in Oblivion. Other than Lord Rugdump LARPing as a noble in the mountains, there wasn't really any distinction or diversity to their characterization from Nords who they shared voice actors with. Skyrim allows the orcs to actually breathe as a culture again. I am waiting for a good death. My time has come. I am old. Too old to become chief. It would be wrong for me to take wives at this age. So I will die. Malakath has given me a vision of a glorious death. I am to wait here until it finds me. As you can see, it has not yet arrived. Indeed, one should find his death while he can still call himself a proper man. We orc men are not like these Nords and Imperials who carry on until they are gray and feeble and their hair falls out. To cling to something past its usefulness is unseemly. How much more so when that thing is you? Each culture places honor in different places. Dunmer place their honor in ancestral worship, while Imperials place honor as service to the state. Nords see honor as a function of the glories achieved in battle. The thing that unifies these cultures is the value of age. Family elders, veterans, and statesmen, and old warriors all live long enough to reflect on their lifetime of achievements if they have become honorable. Orcs instead see honor as direct utility value to the clan. Orcs are ruled by chieftains. Their mothers typically serve as wise women. The women of the clan are wives to the chieftain, while the men take no wives. Because of the nature of their society, many orcs then decide to leave the clans. Orc strongholds make an interesting spice in the world design that you wouldn't expect from a game as static as Skyrim. I mean, can they really spare the time to make a map icon for a type of area that only appears four times? Apparently, yes, they can. As petty as that sounds, the idea of Orc Stronghold seems like something that would absolutely have ended up on the cutting room floor. Or at the very least, we would have had several quests sending us to be sure that we don't miss the content. And, sure... I'm not going to claim that they are insanely developed, only that I find them interesting. One of the strongholds is under attack from a giant, and the wise woman suggests that perhaps the help of an outsider is necessary. The chief's weakness has led to giant attacks, and he has disallowed the clan to leave the stronghold. She wants to contact Malakath, which requires troll fat and a daedra heart. Ah, uh, vintage Oblivion style questing. Find a place in the middle of nowhere, and then be told to get stuff not immediately available to proceed. I like the Morrowind style more, where the shrines were obscure, but finding them was your resume for getting a quest. Like at some point I want somebody to ask us to pick up their lunch before they give us their quest. Now we begin the ritual. Great Malakath, 
We beseech you, aid us in our time of need. Why are we bothering with this? You pathetic weakling! What's that? Malakath has heard my pleas. He speaks to us. You dare summon me, Yamars? What? What is this? You don't deserve to call yourself an orc. You're weak, you're small, and you're an embarrassment. You let giants, giants, overrun my shrine. Bring me their leader's club as an offering, and I might release you from this Our curse. tribe has survived this long without you interfering. We'll be fine. Malakath has spoken, Yamars. Your path is clear. Very well. You, outsider, come here. I will say that Bethesda is making effective use of their new system for dialogues. Where before we would just talk to a statue, now it is a story about a wise woman and a weak chief. It's pretty straightforward, so of course that puts it in the upper echelon of Skyrim quests. That said, Skyrim does have a bad habit of background NPCs continuing normal operations at the worst possible time. The God of the Orsimer is currently communing with the Chieftain, Shaman, an Outlander, a Goblin wielding a Daedric artifact and a Khajiit clad in full Daedric equipment, and they're still banging away at the forge and chilling at campfires like it's another day that ends with S. Yamars wants us to help clear the giant cave with him. Literally, this cave is huge. This is coincidentally around the time my mage character started making use of 100% destruction spell cost reduction, so there were a lot of fireballs being thrown. It even causes problems as at one point I hit Yamars enough for him to break and refuse to stop attacking me. Your crimes offend the code of Malagan, and we demand payment. Choose gold or blood. Weirdly, Yamars figures he needs to take on the final giant alone and then offers to pay us to take care of the giant for him. Why would you have us fight the giants up to this point only to try and imply that the giant here is too overwhelming for him to take on? Your Mars also doesn't even flinch when we say no, just gets right to getting killed. Which works well since he will betray us if we help him out anyways. Malakath asks that we return a hammer to the stronghold after which he gives our reward, Volendrung. Ah, no thanks dude. Yamars was a coward and a weakling. His deceitful ways have cost you all greatly. So he has been punished. And what of us? What fate shall we suffer? You'll have to prove yourselves, but I'm willing to give you a chance. Gullerzo's in charge now. Let's hope he's a better chief. Pretty straightforward. I like that Malakath is characterized as having an almost personal relationship with the clan. He is not a god that prides himself on regalty or being some untouchable deity. Arguably, I would say the curse isn't even real, it's just a reflection of Yamar's weakness as a leader, made manifest when the giants took the shrine. But you know what time it is. It's time to dunk on Volendrung. I think a problem is that Bethesda balances artifacts in Oblivion and Skyrim around a level value. Malakath's quest can be picked up at level 9, so of course every player that might want this thing is going to get it at exactly level 9, and sure, it's useful at that low level. Most of the artifacts are, in fact, useful for the levels you unlock the quest around. But Volendrung really is just a giant hammer that does a lot of DPS. Maybe that's all it is. It's one of the few artifacts to be in every single mainline Elder Scrolls game. If that's the case, then maybe it should be unenchanted like it was in Morrowind. Here's my case. We have a hammer that has a charge value of 3000 but uses 129 points of charge per swing. How many swings it takes to kill an enemy varies per difficulty value but that makes for an interesting relationship. At low difficulty you can use pretty much any weapon in the game that you want to, even a wooden sword. DPS only matters at high difficulties when enemies have lots of health, but at high difficulties it takes lots of swings to kill things. So using a weapon that depletes its charge in only 23 swings means constant recharging, which is hard to do because to trap a soul you need to have a hand free, which you don't with Volendrung. At least in Oblivion, with its independent cast button, you can try to justify a low charge weapon by saying that you can cast Soul Trap while using it. And in Morrowind, the time to kill is so fast that a couple swings is likely all it will take. 
Plus, weapons slowly recharge on their own, and the enchant skill is an actual mechanic, causing weapons to use less charges the higher it is. Not only did they relegate the skill to just crafting, they even cut all of the NPCs you could pay to charge items for you from Oblivion. The real question is, why did the enchantment change so drastically? Each game has had a different approach, but generally the idea was that Volundrung paralyzes opponents and saps their strength. Whether that is literally absorbing their strength, their health, or draining their health, that's the crux of what the hammer does to opponents. So why does Skyrim's version just absorb stamina? Okay, okay, sure. You could use it to spam power attacks, but paralyze as an effect still exists in this game. Like, if it has to be such an inconvenient weapon, at least keep the one thing that made it fun. Paralyzing people is fun, especially with ragdolls. Then, only having 23 swings per charge is justified. The Empire is in shambles. They've banned the worship of Talos. Aw, oh, shit. You've gotta be fucking kidding me. <laughs> I'm fucking... I touched him by accident. I took it for a spin on my VR character, taking the long walk from Largesh Burr to the Shrine of Periyte for reasons I'll discuss later. Initially, I discounted the Absorb Stamina effect, but in reality, it allows you to spam power attacks, which I underestimated. That said, Hearthfire added Vegetable Soup, which restores one point of stamina per second for 12 minutes. One point of stamina is all it takes to do a power attack, invalidating the usefulness of any absorbed stamina weapon, as that enchantment could have been used for more damage instead. That said, you have to read the wiki to know that's the true effect because Skyrim just lists the health restoration component. But if you think that's bad, wait until we get the Headsman's Cleaver. Oh, wait. Headman's Cleaver. I... I just... General Talia, sir. The Headsman is waiting. Okay. So this is a port of an item from Blades, and I read the quest page you get the cleaver from in that game, and I don't know why it's called the Headman's Cleaver. The Headsman is another name for an executioner, and I just showed they literally say the name in the first five minutes of Skyrim. My theory is that they misspelled the name in Blades, because as far as I can tell it's never actually said, and then that misspelling somehow survived into the Creation Club. Unless there's some guy named Headman that I don't know about. The item is gracefully added to the world in the form of an already existing bandit cave. If you don't buy the anniversary edition, they want one dollar for this, and I think that is massively overpricing it. I might be picky with a dime for this thing. I suppose the first question is, what is it? It's a polearm, obviously, but in the game it's considered a battle axe. Apparently, it was supposed to do 20 points stamina damage and 2 points bleed damage for 5 seconds. Someone was smart enough, however, to cut that enchantment. Unfortunately, Someone was dumb enough to disallow enchanting entirely. It is faster than other battle axes, but without an enchantment, it just becomes a weird oddity. It doesn't help that I'm pretty sure I've actually seen this item in World of Warcraft. Alright, we have made it to the final Daedric quest. Like I said with Sheogoreth, there is no Jigalag quest, and Nocturnal's quest is rolled into the finale of the Thieves' Guild. So, which prince has the most obscure quest in Skyrim? That would be Periyte. Technically, it should be mid-tier because afflicted refugees are supposed to show up and be able to point you towards the guy named Kesh to start this quest. But I usually have never seen these guys, and I was trying to make them spawn, but they never showed up on recording. Otherwise, your only option is to find Periyte's shrine, which is genuinely in the middle of nowhere. Malakath's quest was just off of a main road, but the shrine of Periyte is a ways out into the reach. So, there are two contenders for me. Mephala's quest, if you stop asking for rumors from innkeepers because they keep giving you radiant quests, and Periites, for requiring either a random event to trigger or for you to stumble on the shrine. Oblivion style. He is the pass in the wound. Oh, proper ones curl their noses, but it's pass that drinks foul humors and restores the blood. I worship Periyte, yes, because sometimes the world can only be cleansed by disease. Not everyone has the stomach required to entreat, my lord. But Cash likes you, friend. There is a way Periyte may speak to us who will take him in. If you wish to commune with him, we'll need the incense.
Oh no, is the incense a list of things I need? Real Oblivion style. I have to wonder if maybe more Daedric quests were originally like this and they changed the introductions of the earlier quests in this video to make them more Skyrimified. Kesh needs a Deathbell flower, a silver ingot, a flawless ruby, and some vampire dust. One trip back to the house later and it's time to meet Periite. Breathe deep, mortal. I would have you hear me well. Oh man, it's Craig Seckler. That's the most vintage Oblivion part yet. Okay, in fairness, her scene was also voiced by Craig for some reason. Same with a bunch of ghosts, actually. I was really only bothered by his performance of the Dark Elves in Oblivion. I thought his voice was fine for the Wood and High Elves. Apparently, Periite was spreading a plague in some Breton settlements and one of his priests was supposed to gather the afflicted but he ended up abandoning the cause. Now we need to take care of the problem. I would show you that, but somebody forgot to record it. Ritual Stone is pretty funny. This might have caused an old console to explode, but these days show that under enough layers of balancing and artificial restrictions that there could have been a fun magic system had anybody actually cared enough to make it happen. Instead, everybody was obsessed with the new kill animations, which instead aged like dog shit. Bethardams is a dungeon, all right. The afflicted that occupy it are mostly reskins of bandits and warlocks, all given the ability to projectile vomit poison at us. That's cool. There are a few conversations to overhear, but nothing particularly interesting. Perry isn't picking up the phone, and the afflicted appear to be making barrels of their illness to spread around. I think the way that Orkindor lost was an appreciation of the natural order. The afflicted were created by a disease from Periite, but one that spread naturally. Or Kindor is trying to make the disease a more active plot. He wants to intentionally spread it as far as possible. That is the difference between Periite and Nurgle. Nurgle is a chaos god from Warhammer that represents concepts like death, destruction, and disease. However, that last part is what he views as binding all mortal lives together, which is how he chooses to spread his influence. Periite doesn't want to force the issue. He wants his growth to be organic. He'll drop a new disease, and if it's virulent enough, people are going to hear about it. He doesn't need his influence spread because his influence is just a natural part of life. Orkinder is kind of tough. Obviously, he doesn't stand up against 40 afflicted cultists. He's one of those teleporting bosses that didn't get the memo that we don't do that anymore. Hey, yeah, Bethesda, it's a good mechanic for bosses. You know who else teleportation is a good mechanic for? Starts with a P, ends with layer. Orkindor is also 100% resistant to magic and can heal, which led to a hilarious scene where I spent 15 minutes watching my army of undead try to kill him. He would often teleport up to an area that the fighters could not reach, but the casters wouldn't attack him there and nobody would use their vomit ability, so the only people who could damage him were two archers that would often miss him standing completely still. His necklace is also a passive buff to his health regeneration, leading to an endless battle. Even after dropping several Daedric artifacts, which the minions would pick up to use, they just couldn't do enough damage to him to actually kill him. But he also couldn't kill me or many of my minions fast enough. It reminds me of that Lich in Morrowind that I couldn't kill because his passive health regen was faster than my death spells, but I was also immune to his magic. Eventually I just turned the difficulty down, so Urkindor won the battle of attrition against my patience. Well done, mortal. Oh yeah, the quest is over. It may have been just a quest to run a dungeon, but at least it was... interesting? Hey, wasn't that the premise of Periite's quest in Oblivion as well? That we basically just ran another Oblivion gate? And also like Oblivion, for the 20th time this quest, our reward is Spellbreaker. This continues to be an oddity. One day, Periite got his hands on the shield and now it's just one of his artifacts. To give a history, when the ancient Chimer and Dwimmer formed into a council in the First Era, a clan of the Dwimmer decided to leave. Their leader threw his hammer, which happened to be Volendrung by the way, to the west and moved to wherever it fell. If you haven't pieced it together yet, hammer fell. At some point later on, these Dwimmer were in a war that involved Archmage Shalador. Shalador is on the shortlist for most powerful wizard, impressive for a Nord to be sure. He sits among the real Mana Marco, Divithfear, Vanis Galarian, Sothasil, Mankar Cameron, Zurin Arctis, and Kagranak. The thing about the most powerful wizard contest is that past a certain point, the actual strongest wizard doesn't matter that much, mostly because it would get into a boring power scaling conversation. 
I'd hate to say that Shalador is responsible for the College of Winterhold. I want to say that he's responsible for it from a lore perspective, not that his actions directly led to that terrible story. Anyways, point is, Shalador was powerful and the Dwemer in battle used Spellbreaker to counter his magic. But how that is reflected has varied throughout the series because also like Volandrung, Spellbreaker has appeared in every game. In Skyrim, the shield creates a ward effect. Wow, and just like that, it went from being a staple in the Oblivion video to almost useless. But okay, maybe it's useful for fighting dragons. Well, my sword and board fighter could stunlock dragons with shield bashes, so no, not really. Same thing with wizards. Given the current state of combat in the game, I have a hard time imagining a situation where this shield is actually useful. In fairness, I will say that the Morrowind iteration wasn't exactly useful either, and the Oblivion iteration is only useful because its constant 30% spell reflection was actually absurdly powerful. I just find this to be a very niche shield for solving a problem that I don't think exists in the current version of the game. Your don't shield, like those ice you dwarf got. make, is it not? But yet it seems so much more. As we wrap up the Daedric quests, we are effectively wrapping up on vanilla Skyrim. It's clear that more work was put into the presentations of these quests to make them stand out, rather than into their writing or design. They made talking to the princes more interesting, they tried to integrate them into the normal world better, they tried to take the quests in interesting places, and they added some small choices to a lot of them. In a lot of ways, the Daedric quests seem to be a resume of what Bethesda could potentially accomplish when they weren't just trying to fill areas with radiant content. Nothing impressive, but nothing I would say that is as mediocre as standard Skyrim fare that you would pick up in an inn. Looking back, it's interesting that so much time and effort went into creating a series of quests focused around Daedra worship. Again, it made sense in Oblivion, both in terms of geography, but also in terms of premise. Skyrim seems like a province that would have been far better suited towards seeing these quests focus on the Aedra. Something I would like to see in Elder Scrolls VI is the ability to roleplay the Witch Hunter or Paladin who seeks to undermine Daedric plots. You can only do that sometimes in Skyrim. Thus, it lends a sort of vestigial nature to these quests. All I can think about is the untapped potential. None of the Dunmer Daedric princes actually have quests related to their current situation. The closest is Azura, and even that spins to be about necromancy instead. Periite takes the form of a dragon, yet his quest has nothing to do with dragons in the dragon game. We've covered, fairly extensively, Skyrim's base game content up to this point. As we move on to the game's expansions, it is important to consider that evaluating expansions seems like an important piece of the puzzle. It's a direct opportunity for Bethesda to demonstrate what lessons they have, or have not learned, from the base game, and what criticisms they have taken to heart. After Skyrim released, there was a lot of patching. While Bethesda games have always had issues, it seemed that as time was going on and, more importantly, post-launch patching became more commonplace, that their QA department was starting to let more and more issues through. And that's not even getting into community-made unofficial patches. Original Skyrim came at a time when Bethesda and Valve seemed to be the best of friends. The box copy of PC Skyrim required a Steam account and online connection to play, and there was the Steam Workshop. And you know, for us too, it's always been like, like, it's a little... I don't know, it, it's mysterious to me why more studios don't embrace it. Yeah. Because for yeah. us, it's not just like somebody might play mod and they get interested in authoring, but it's like the step beyond where like somebody who's good at authoring might one day want to become a developer themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I would mod for Morrowind and Unreal back in the day. Even further, Bethesda would release a high resolution texture pack for Steam, and an official crossover mod between Skyrim and Portal was made. Space, best place. <laughs> All the time. No dragons, just space. <laughs> Archery. Mm -hmm. Smithing. Mm -hmm. Don't need him. Yeah, good. Go into space. Space. <laughs> Only skill you need. Off to hang myself. Off and left. Patch 1.1 was the day one patch for Skyrim, with 1.1.21 adding Steam DRM to the game. Yeah, they actually forgot to add that. 1.2 actually added some new issues to the game that would persist for a week, themselves eventually being fixed. Patch 1.3 made the game able to use up to 4GB of RAM, yes, that was an issue. 
although it only delayed the issue since the game was still 32 bits, so it wouldn't be until the special edition that you could use more than 4 gigs of RAM. 1.4 would iterate through a few beta versions before being released in mid-February of 2012, with a number of fixes for quest issues. A month later in March, 1.5 was released, with more bug fixes and an implementation of new kill animations and debuting kill cams for ranged combat. A later version of 1.5 would add files to the game hinting at Dawnguard content, which was either an accident or marketing. 1.6 would be Dawnguard's update, which also added mounted combat to the game in addition to more bug fixing. Dawnguard's trailer billed the DLC as having a vampire focus, even going so far as to show off a vampire dragonborn character. Dawnguard is the first official game add-on for the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, the 2011 game of the year. Whoa, getting ahead of yourself there. Game was only out for six months when you made that claim. Despite the surface-level friendship between Bethesda and Steam, Dawnguard would come out for the Xbox in late June, while PC would get it a month later in early August. Meanwhile, the PlayStation version got delayed until late February of 2013 due to performance issues. The PlayStation version in general was pretty busted, which at this point is a pretty common story for third-party developers not used to making games for the PlayStation. I heard they're reforming the Dawn Guard. Yeah, apparently you and every other guard in Skyrim. Of its compatriots, Tribunal and Knights of the Nine, Dawn Guard is fairly active in changing Skyrim. It adds many new random events to the world. It's also a bit active in advertising itself, having a Dawn Guard representative track you down and ask you if you want to help them fight vampires. If you are a vampire and are confused on how to start the content, that is natural, because for some reason the questline starts with you joining the Dawn Guard. That would be so great! Aren't you excited? We're going to be Jedi! Learning the ways of the Force, building a lightsaber? Ah, of course, you already have one. <laughs> I'm sure Isran will sign you right up. I'm not sure he'll take me. I hope so. Never seen a crossbow before, eh? Not surprised. Kind of a Dawn Guard specialty. Yeah, especially after Kavach's destruction, Tamriel's only Imperial crossbow manufacturer, and Dagon destroyed it in the opening hours to keep such a dangerous weapon out of the crisis. There never was a lore reason given for Crossbow's temporary disappearance, and you would think the designs would proliferate throughout Tamriel, like they did in the real world. The Empire was using imitations of Dwarven-style crossbows, and if the OG Dawnguard had them, then that places their non-Dwimmer existence as far back as the Second Era. Crossbows were more of a stylistic issue. They aren't hard to mechanically implement because they're just bows with a draw time of zero, but a delay between shots for reloading. Morrowind had them, and Fallout 3 had outright guns and it's the same engine. Likely what it is is that crossbows and other machinery of war were associated with the forces of evil in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, while the forces of good would just use normal bows. Now, there are still spears, of course, which they showed off they could potentially implement in the Skyrim game jam, but nothing ever came of it. You could even say the Dawnguard likes spears because it helps them keep vampires at bay. Nothing better for putting down vampires. Crossbows were an addition that were easier to interface with the existing skills. This little stretch is like a short advertisement of what the faction's about. It has a human element, the cool kids use heavy armor, and crossbows. We enter to find a conversation going on in the fort. Why are you here, Tolan? The Vigilance and I were finished with each other a long time ago. You know why I'm here. The Vigilance are under attack everywhere. The vampires are much more dangerous than we believed. And now you want to come running to safety with the Dawn Guard, is that it? The Vigil of Stendar was destroyed. I think that's less a testament to the vampires being strong and more proof of the Vigil being weak. Isran even stops his conversation with Tolan to induct us into the Order. I'm sure there's still unresolved details, like what Tolan's gonna go do now that the Vigil are gone. I'm glad word's finally starting to get around. But that means it won't be long before the vampires start to take notice as well. Uh, what was your game plan? Hope the Dawn Guard can recruit faster than the vampires find out that you're here? Isran wants us to take the fight to the vampires, I assume, to try and delay them. Right, send us a total stranger out to delay a group of vampires. I'll meet you at Dim Hollow. It's the least I can do to avenge my fallen comrades. Tolan, I don't think that's a good idea. You vigilants were never trained I know. For uh, Tolan's not trained for this. Motherfucker, this is my first day here. Might as well send Rosh with us at this point. I do like Isran and Rosh's conversation, but I can't help but find the entire situation perplexing. 
Ishiron has no idea who we are. We're some guy Durak plucked off the street. And now he's sending us out to Dim Hollow Crypt where he knows there are vampires. And where he knows said vampires are looking for an artifact. And then he tries to stop Tolan from going with us, citing a lack of training. Am I supposed to interpret that he wants us dead? Or that we're already established as a hero and Isran does know who we are and thinks that we are by default capable? This is weird, because Isran is later going to be shown as a fairly paranoid person. When Knights of the Nine started, we were allowed to establish our resume, while Tribunal was, in principle, establishing our notoriety by having an assassin attack us, but the trigger gets pulled too early, and, and so assassins end up trying to knife some ex-con in the wilderness on their first day in Vardenfell. Obviously, this is a common issue with downloadable content. How do you naturally integrate it into the existing world? Apparently, Dawnguard thinks that the answer is that you don't even bother trying. We head out to Dim Hollow, which is actually a pretty annoying spot to find, and Tolan is dead. He managed to take down two vampires, but that's it. What chance do we stand? Dim Hollow Crypt is a vampire dungeon, and also shows off some new dungeon area assets. Vampires are sort of a mix of bandits and necromancers with the added ability to absorb health. Dawnguard would also give them these death hounds, which are undead dogs that can do frost damage. The main thing Dawnguard would do is, according to Bethesda themselves, make the vampires look more monstrous, aka ugly. Dialogue overheard, however, indicates that this is no ordinary group of vampires, but likely an actual vampire clan. Sure enough, we find their leader interrogating a vigil member. No, you cannot save him. Remember when, if you were fast or clever, you could actually save people? But we'd have to give them dialogue, better to just hard code their deaths. This area was definitely what the vampires were looking for, but alas, there is just a brain buster of a puzzle here. No, seriously, some people could not figure this one out. I guess if Skyrim lured you into a stupor, then asked you to do something other than picture block puzzles, even if it's just as easy, then it might be a tall order. Something something, if you run a community where people turn their brains off, don't be surprised when some members have never actually had their brains on in their entire life. I am surprised that a spike pokes our hand for a generous blood donation. You would think that this would be some kind of blood magic, testing us to see if we're the correct person to unlock this tomb, which we're certainly not. Because inside the tomb is a mysterious woman. And I draw attention to that, as this may well be the first time Bethesda has used a live name change to obfuscate a character's name. It has the potential to be a really neat trick, as sometimes the subtitles can spoil things. I was expecting someone from my family. I don't recognize Shut them. Are you one of my father's little This is Serana. I doubt she needs much introduction since she's the main character of this expansion. She is an answer to the criticism Bethesda received about Skyrim's followers. At a surface level, it simply appears to be an issue of quantity versus quality, but Skyrim was going for a system where you could become friends with an NPC and then recruit them to go on adventures with you. So there ended up being a few dozen followers compared to Fallout 3 and New Vegas, which both only had eight. That smaller pool would instead represent various factions and have more development with their own quests and reactions to events. Serana is a Fallout-style companion in Skyrim. She's got a lot more dialogue than most characters in the game, with a career voice actress in Laura Bailey. Since her character unfurls throughout the quest line, I'll discuss most of her characterization later. Obviously, it's a bit weird to find a goth GF in an ancient tomb, but I'm not one to complain. She upfront establishes she's a vampire, because that's what vampires do, right? Duty to inform. She has an Elder Scroll and she wants us to take her to her father, the Patriarch of Clan Vokalhar. This is where the questline gets real raw. We have just joined a group of vampire hunters and here's a vampire. And now she wants us to take her to Vampire HQ. Just because. Well, I tried taking her to Fort Dongar. Turns out they anticipated that and for one of the only times she gets weirded out and waits outside. You can actually talk to Isran about her who tells you that you need to play along because we need to know what's going on. Right then, guess I'll go become cattle for a vampire clan. Or worse. Somehow, the mortal watchman of the castle knows who Serana is, despite her having been gone for... We have to talk about that later. We get a positive reception on account of bringing Serana to the castle and are greeted by Lord Harkin. There is but one gift I can give that is equal in value to the Elder Scroll and my daughter. I offer you my blood. 
Take it and you will walk as a lion among sheep. Men will tremble at your approach and you will never fear death again. How about cash? Perhaps you still need convincing. Behold the power! This is the power that I offer. Now wow, I'm still not impressed. As I was saying, cash. It kind of looks terrible, like it was made in a week or something. I guess play with monstrous powers have an ugly character, but it's pretty funny that the visual aesthetic alone is supposed to entice us and not the actual powers that it gives us. Now, we don't have to choose. You can turn Harkin down here, siding with the Dawn Guard, and after the questline concludes, still receive the Vampire Lord power. You will lose out on some decent upgrades by not siding with the vampires, however. It would be cool if they added a bloodline system where being sired into Clan Valkahar's bloodline was more powerful than the generic vampires out in the wilderness. One would be loath to forget the three vampire clans in Morrowind, each with its own distinct advantages. Still, vampire lords have some power. It is a transformation, which means a wind-up period and being locked into third person and not being able to access inventories, dragon shouts, or dialogue. But you can do it infinitely. You're given more red, blue, and green juice as well as faster magic regeneration. However, as a vampire, you are massively weaker in the sun. The mode alternates between a floating magic mode and a grounded melee mode, and your damage is scaled to your level as well as augmented by perks. There are two amulets and two rings you can acquire, but you have to side with the vampires to get the quests. The Amulet of Bats applies an Absorb Health effect to your Bats ability, which works similar to Whirlwind Sprint. The Amulet of the Gargoyle allows you to summon two Gargoyles at once. Ring of the Beast augments your health and melee damage, while Ring of the Erudite augments your Magicka and Magicka regeneration. I had to play an extra 90 minutes after my playthrough concluded to actually play through Vampire Lord, and while decently fun, I wouldn't exactly say this is something you need to reinstall Skyrim right now to go do. It has the werewolf problem of taking away all your utility, so whatever potions you're supposed to rely on to make your character functional aren't available. Controlling this thing in third person is unwieldy, and the only thing I liked was Vampiric Grip, which is just Force Grip, complete with the reasons why Force Grip is overpowered and fun to use. But I already have a way to throw people off ledges, and that way doesn't require me to go through a transformation animation or use magic in third person. So, any other reasons to side with the vampires? No, not really. After playing through the vampire side of the questline, I can easily say that Clan Valkahar must have been an internal stretch goal at Bethesda. As in, if they had time after making the Dawnguard questline, they would add in a optional vampire questline. The main story is practically identical for both paths, barring one quest. And the extraneous quests, uh, they're mostly just more radiant content except for the vampires. The vampire quests are all radiant. I guess the one where you turn your spouse into a vampire technically isn't. While the Dawnguard are bolstering their ranks and slaying vampires, Valkohar is having us run dungeons, kill nameless NPCs, and also slay vampires. My guess, however, was wrong. Dawnguard's creative origin was in the Bethesda Game Jam, when one of the developers created the Vampire Lord mode. Yeah, they decided to create an entire expansion around vampires solely because of the Vampire Lord mode, and then Bruce Nesmith remembered that choices are a part of the Elder Scrolls games, and they made the Dawnguard faction. No, oh, really, he said that. We had this wonderful game jam, and out of the game jam came all these great ideas, and one of the ones that really stood out was this vampire lord uh, character that the artists had created. And that was sort of the genesis of all of this, where you look at that and you go, boy, I'd really love to play that guy. Well, you have to, we have to realize early on that while the Vampire Lord is cool and our immediate reaction is, boy, I want to play that, that there's a lot of people out there who don't necessarily want to play the monster. They want to play the monster hunter. And vampires, by their very, ne very nature, have a dark side. And that dark side is not always appealing to everybody. And the vampire hunter, the Van Helsing-style character, if you will, uh, is equally as appealing and exciting to a lot of people as Dracula, as the vampire character. We decided to make the commitment to do both sides, uh, which was a bit of a stretch because that's a lot of extra content, but it was definitely well worth it. Uh, we definitely got great reaction from everybody on the team who got to play both sides. They got to be the vampire hunters or they got to be the vampires. And you get to choose what you want to do, and that's kind of at the core of a lot of Elder Scrolls content is that player choice. 
The dining hall is also a red flag for the vampires. It establishes pretty quickly the type of vampire clan we're joining. They drink blood and apparently eat corpses, but they're also very messy about it. Perhaps the idea is that this is a Nordic vampire clan, so it's the brutishness of Nords combined with vampire motifs, but a big chunk of the clan are foreigners, and most of the Nords that are here hardly act the part. Valkalhar is an evil faction, there's no qualms about it. Well, that's fine, I'm just pointing out that we aren't sleek Hasseldor style vampires. Shorin joined the Dawn Guard, while Delta Fear joined Clan Valkohar. Lord Harkin initiates us and we awaken a vampire lord. He gives us a quick run through of how the mode works. He also tells us a bit about himself. A shrine to Molag Bal, the mighty Daedra prince who is father to all our kind. Our power is a blessing from him. It is he who first bestowed the gift of the ancient blood upon me. In an age long forgotten to history, I ruled as a mighty king. My domain was vast, my riches endless, and my power infinite. And yet, as my mortal life neared an end, I faced a seemingly invincible enemy. My own mortality. I pledged myself to Molag Ball, and in his name I sacrificed a thousand innocents. In reward, he gave everlasting life to myself, my wife, and my daughter, and so I have defeated mortality itself. Fort Dawnguard is under attack by a few vampires, in broad daylight. While this does validate Ysron's concern that vampires would attack when word got out, these guys are not Clan Valkohar. So Isran wasn't just racing against Skyrim's organized vampire clans, but randos that live in caves deciding to risk everything to fight specialized vampire hunters. There is supposed to be a sort of vampiric crisis going on in Skyrim right now, which is weird. Fighting Shadow Wars, sure, but you chose to do a vampire crisis in the Nordic province. What was the tipping point? Where are all these vampires coming from? It's not Clan Valkohar because they actually have been taking steps to control the vampire population. They want to stay under the radar, but they also want to reduce the active competition for food in Skyrim. Feral vampires are all around bad for business. There's just an unexplained uptick in feral vampire attacks pretty much solely to create this faction conflict, which was unnecessary considering Valkohar did destroy the Hall of the Vigilance, but they actually did that because Adelwald had found the location of Serana. Like, the biggest obstacle to Harkin's game plan is that there was coincidentally an increase in random vampire attacks at the same time. The story would be more interesting if it was the product of an uncontrolled conflict escalation. Valkohar takes out the Vigil, the Dawn Guard forms and begins anti-vampire operations, which in turn causes Valkohar to take increasingly drastic actions. You'd show the conflict as a feedback loop that's constantly escalating to the point that it spills out into the broader population. You can see the start of that. The vampires have a quest to frame the Dawn Guard for the murder of a civilian, while the Dawn Guard have quests to eliminate vampires that are blending in with society. Instead, there has to be a vampire crisis, just like there had to be a dragon crisis, and before that, Jigalag destroying the Shivering Isles, the Aurorans wiping out churches, the Oblivion crisis. Morrowind was about preventing a crisis, but then Tribunal was about characters, and Blood Moon was about Nords. The Blood Moon wasn't a crisis, bad things were happening, but it was going to end, and things were going to go back to normal afterwards. Bethesda seems stuck in a crisis crisis, probably because they think that's the only kind of story they can write that seems interesting to their player base. What is Dawnguard really about? It's primarily about Serana, and secondarily about characters like Lord Harkon and Isran. You don't need the vampire attacks to incentivize people to want to play through this story, and the story can build tension aplenty without them. More focus should instead be poured into the characters and their quests, in telling the story of a shadow war. Both factions decide to build up their strength. Isran needs more specialists and sends us to recruit a few old colleagues of his. Lord Harkin, meanwhile, instructs us to refill the Bloodstone Chalice. Gunmar is an animal specialist who is working on taming trolls, which we can find at radiantly determined locations hunting a bear. While I understand the appeal of designing a radiant system for quest generation, I do not understand the appeal of applying radiant story for quest locations. This is a pre-made quest which is then randomly applied to one of nine caves, 11 when you install Dragonborn. It's like the designers are saying the quest is so generic that it could be set literally anywhere. Also, Gunmar believes in the eight filthy f 
fucking Thalmor bootlicker. You've helped me, so I suppose the least I can do is find out what Isran wants. He's still at that fort near Stendar's beacon, I assume. If Isran is anything, he's stubborn. Serene Gerard, meanwhile, is always in a fixed location. She's researching the Dwimmer, but some mud crabs made off with her satchel and has slowed her progress. She needs a gyro to get back to work. I need at least one intact dwarven gyro. Ugh, damn gyro. No, you must be mistaken. I know, I tried. What do you want me to go to fucking Greece? After we round these two up, we return to Fort Dawnguard. Isaren shut the main entrance down. I figured this would happen, but not so soon. Actually, he hasn't gone full schizo yet. He's just showcasing a sunlight trap that he's made. It's like Chekhov's gun, except the person Chekhov shoots didn't get to see the gun in their storyline, and Chekhov didn't use it during the home invasion. A common theme between Serene and Gunmar was that Isran is a fairly toxic individual who drives people away. He's like a second attempt at Delphine's character, but addressing the criticisms. People actually call him out for his behavior, but you can also see that his paranoia isn't entirely unjustified. He also doesn't demand we murder our vampire friend as soon as he finds out about her, which was just now as Serana just showed up looking for us and Isran wants to find out why. Lord Harkin, meanwhile, sends us to Garen Morethi to refill the Bloodstone Chalice. The chalice is an artifact the clan has been sitting on, pretty much out of apathy. Harkin was plenty powerful without it, so his decision to begin using it implies that he's starting to make moves. This is also an introduction to the court politics of the clan, as we run into Vingalmo and Orthjolf, both curious why we need the chalice. We're sent off to Redwater Den to refill it. A reviewer named Genji spent a lengthy amount of time analyzing why this dungeon is good, which I would summarize for him as, the bandits aren't immediately hostile, and the area isn't entirely reliant on journals to tell its story, although there is a journal explaining why the vampires are here. I would agree with that assessment. I've often felt a common problem with bandit dungeons is that they're all immediately hostile to the player. Wary is reasonable, but occasional surprises like this are good. The premise is that a small vampire coven is using the den as a front to acquire blood, by feeding on drug addicts who come to the den for redwater skooma, which is just normal skooma with added effects since they added the magic redwater to it. So, question, skooma is ingested orally, which means it goes to the liver and from there the bloodstream, so whatever deleterious effects the vampires were trying to avoid from drinking from the bloodspring directly should still be felt by drinking the blood of the skooma addicts they were using as cattle. Apparently this place was a temple of RK in the first era, when the man in charge got turned into a vampire, killed everyone here, and then filled the bloodstone chalice. I'm not really sure what that is supposed to imply since the boss vampire notes that the history of the place seems to end after the chalice's creation. It doesn't go anywhere, and only really exists to justify the quest being here. After we fill the chalice, two vampires enter the room discussing how we're about to unexpectedly commit suicide. These guys are lame, both naming their respective masters in court that gave them the order to kill us. We add one of their blood to the chalice since I guess they're both ancient vampires. What? They can't be ancient vampires and still be pulling lackey duty. Plus, it was a missed opportunity to give the player the option to affect what the chalice does. Like, if you use Selonia's blood, the chalice improves stealth, while if you use Stolf's blood, the chalice improves magic or something like that. You know, uh, Shivering Isles did that all the time. With the chalice returned, Marethi tells us what happened is just usual court politics. Now that can't be something that happens every day. Vingalmo and Orthioff both want to take Lord Valkalhar's place and both want the chalice to improve their own power. Garen then places the chalice just out in the open, hope none of these treacherous vampires try and steal it for themselves to use exclusively. Lord Harkin wants a word, starting the next leg of the quest, both titled Prophet. He doesn't really have much to say other than he left a key detail out during our initial conversation. Then he heads to the dining hall and gives a speech. He says that he found a prophecy that vampires will no longer need to fear the sun, and that with the return of Serana and the Elder Scroll, he seeded rumors to manipulate a moth priest into coming to Skyrim, and that the court is to go and search for any moth priests investigating those rumors. This is where Serana re-enters the story for its remainder. If we side with the vampires, then she'll tip us off to the college. If we side with the Dawn Guard, then she'll come to the fort and inform us of Harkin's plan. Either way, we have to track down this Moth Priest. Now, let's try to reverse engineer this Moth Priest's movements. For starters, the Priest has asked every single carriage driver in Skyrim to take him to Dragonbridge, which they all declined because it's not one of their usual stops. 
Even though the main road between Solitude and the rest of Skyrim passes through Dragon Bridge, and stopping a carriage is not like stopping a train in a random small town. By the way, this includes carriage drivers that personally work for us as part of the Hearthfire DLC, who still want us to bribe them. Maybe that makes sense actually. I mean, we are the ones who actually found and are sitting on top of an Elder Scroll. Actually not, I sold it to the college, but the point remains, if the priest got around Skyrim, maybe he was visiting all of my houses looking for me. Not sure which of my house Carl's or Stewart's spilled, probably Findel. We also know the priest visited the Winking Skeever and the Bannered Mare, since those are the only innkeepers to have any additional information. After failing to summon a flame Atronach for the bridge test due to not having enough magicka, and Serana refusing to lend a hand, we go to the College of Winterhold. Urek Groshub, the college librarian, tells us that moth priests live in the White Gold Tower, yeah, thanks, I played Oblivion, and that he stopped to do some research in the library, then left for Dragonbridge. Wait, did he have to pass for all this test back there? And you didn't sell him that Elder Scroll, did you? Why wasn't I informed that we were visited by a moth priest? I'm the goddamn archmage. Oh, well, the guy that failed the bridge test isn't, but the vampire playthrough is the archmage. Unless he was rude enough to not even send a letter in advance telling us that he was gonna visit. It is kinda weird that Ureg will tell complete strangers where the priest is going. Like, why is that the route of last resort? Unless he was really rude and Ureg doesn't care if he gets kidnapped. So we head out to Dragonbridge. Asking around, we are eventually told that he rode through town with an escort of soldiers and they didn't stop, they just kept going. Wait, then why did he want to stop? <sighs> Never mind. Where did he get an escort of soldiers? Or a wagon? Why did he want the carriage drivers to take him to Dragonbridge if he came with an escort? If the escort is a local detachment from Solitude, then why didn't he just go to Solitude directly? How does this all work in Stormcloak-controlled Hafingar? I think they played fast and loose with what was really happening because they figured players weren't paying enough attention to notice these details. Which is true. Most Skyrim videos that actually have to budget their time prioritize making jokes about Serana sex mods over trying to call out a $20 DLC on minor details. But minor details stack up and eventually start to clot, which can lead to a heart attack or stroke. Just like Serana sex mods, in either quest you find that the priest's carriage was ambushed and have to follow a blood trail to figure out where they went. Or you could just read a note on the body of a vampire at the crime scene. Starting to think joining Clan Valkalar was a mistake given it was apparently always amateur hour there. How the fuck are you guys this bad at clandestine operations? You make the Thieves Guild look competent by comparison. Stop his bleeding, dispose of the evidence, burn the note. Either way, we head into where the priest is being kept. He'll be in the possession of the vampires for the Dawnguard side, while the Dawnguard will have already been on scene having cleared the vampires out if we're part of Valkalhar. Malchus, the only orc vampire in the game, doesn't hang out at Castle Valkalhar prior to this quest. He apparently found the priest first and has been trying to break his will to make him more compliant, which gave the Dawnguard enough time to find him. How come the Dawnguard don't back shoring up like they did in the alternative timeline? Either way, we have to clear the cave out and fight the priest, who is combative due to us killing Malchus or Malchus already being dead. So it's a great opportunity to talk about Dawnguard gear. It looks pretty good except for the light helmet. Oh, and is yet another example of an armor set that's broken because the perks built around wearing matching sets of armor don't work with the Dawnguard heavy armor set. The main thing is that the armor decreases damage and spell magnitude from vampires by 25%. The shield increases bash damage against vampires while the Dawnguard war axe and warhammer do additional damage. I guess if you had to have a sword, you could go grab a silver sword from the silver hand, or Dawnbreaker from Meridia's quest. Their main weapon though is the crossbow. The main consensus I've seen about crossbows is that they're really good in the early game and great for stealth archer playstyles, or anyone who opens up with a single shot from stealth before transitioning into melee. The Dawnguard path also has options for improving the crossbow, although this is just a radiant quest to run dwarven ruins for generic schematics, but you can eventually unlock the enhanced dwarven crossbow as well as exploding dwarven bolts. Now you could do that. Or you could call it quits when you get the bolts and opt instead to just outright buy a dragon bone crossbow from the Fletcher and Solitude for $8 thanks to the expanded crossbow pack creation. And if you don't want to do the quest and craft the exploding bolts, there's always bone mold bolts instead from rare curios. The game has a thing going for it where the Dawnguard have a unique item that actually progresses through quests. And then a creation club creation just comes along and drops eight new crossbows into the world just willy-nilly. 
That's a pretty accurate recreation of the modding experience. Thing is, you'd have to feel like a fucking idiot doing six random dwarven ruins only to stumble over better crossbows for sale at a shop simply titled Fletcher and Solitude, which is a base game shop that I guess they forgot to name. Never mind that crossbows were a dwarven invention that modern people were just imitating, so they're supposed to be the best crossbows in existence, because some guy figured out how to make one out of dragon bone, so now that's the best crossbow in existence, because dragon bone is the strongest material ever. So why didn't the dwarves think to make them out of dragon bone then? There's no care or craft with these things. The modders are encouraged to rush this shit out, and Bethesda just says, yep, that doesn't conflict with anything else, just shove it in there. Does it make sense? It doesn't matter. We made area of effect arrows for Morrowind, and now we charge people money for the same garbage content, but this time we don't even make it ourselves. We pay some guy a pittance to do it for us instead. Oh man, old man Patrick's got himself worked up again. Who asked him about Skyrim this time? I told the nurses to not engage him whenever he brings that shit up. Where were we? Oh yeah, beating some nerd up. He'll be happy to return with us to Fort Dawnguard, but he'll need to be hit with vampire seduction to return to Castle Vokalar. I thought you'd just tell prisoners to come with you and they follow you wherever you go. Dexian reads the scroll for us, and the main new piece of information is that he needs two more Elder Scrolls to have the complete prophecy. Is that really true? Like, wouldn't the last scroll have the relevant information since the early part just seems to be the preamble explaining what actually is going to happen? My traitor wife stole one of them away, and then disappeared. As for the other, the last that I heard, it was lost in the bowels of a Dwemer ruin. It seems- How is that something you've heard about? That is one hell of a piece of information to just have and not have acted upon. Given Harkin's age, you would imagine he would have gradually had every dwarven ruin in Skyrim scoured, unless he heard about this rumor recently. So, one of the scrolls is just the quest Elder Knowledge, straight up. If you've done it already, then you already have the scroll. If you sold the scroll to the college, you can buy it back. And if you're the Archmage, you can cut the price in half. However, if you haven't done the quest already, then you have to go do it, which, if you recall, was a rather lengthy affair. College, Septimist, Oftend, Falmer, Legion, Blackreach, Nonsense, Puzzle, Elder Scroll. As far as I can tell, Serana doesn't have anything interesting to say if you decide to do this quest with her, and that's probably because short-term thinking Bethesda figured all their players buying this DLC must have already completed the main quest, so it would have been a wasted effort. Here was a prime opportunity to add post-launch commentary on a vanilla quest, and they didn't take it. Serana has a lot more to say about the other scroll, however. She reveals that she and her mother Valerica were concerned about Harkin's obsession with this prophecy, so they made a plan to deprive him of the Elder Scrolls that he needed. Don't you know the scrolls do whatever they want to? Makes you wonder why the scrolls like us, but not Harkin. That was why Serana was hidden at Dim Hollow. However, Serana wasn't told where her mom was going to hide. I like that the player's two proposals for where she may have hidden are like an infant thinking of only the most recent things. Is she with the Dawn Guard? Is she in the castle? It has been, according to Serana, at least a thousand years. She could literally be anywhere on Tamriel or beyond. She could be dead. But all we can think of are the two most immediate locations in the story, and Serana actually entertains one of them. That being the castle, since there was apparently a part of the castle her father hated and closed off. Yeah, Clan Vokalhar is only residing in maybe 10% of the actual area of the castle. The only reason being that Harkon is still really mad about his ex-wife and never got over it. While that's more than enough information to start the next leg of the quest, the conversation can continue into the more personal, probing Serana about her relationship with her family, which in turn she responds with questions about her own family. You can define your parents as either being alive or dead, as well as good or bad people. But I guess we say it in a really awkward way because Serana decides to ask zero follow-up questions, because we're already in risky waters as it is. This is how maladjusted people perceive relationships as being similar to a visual novel where we learn all about the girl and almost nothing about the guy. Serana says that the castle's previous owners had a dock that they used to get supplies into the castle as well as a secret exit. Is that supposed to imply that the vampires never used it for that purpose? As in they were already vampires by the time they moved into the castle? Even if that were true, I can only imagine having a dock is still useful. Those fresh bodies have to come from somewhere, and the cattle the vampires feed on still need their own food supply. And vampires do leave the castle to attend to business on the mainland. All great reasons to have a secure and functional dock. Castle Valkalhar raises all kinds of questions for me. We know it's been under vampire control for at least a thousand years. 
which means a thousand years of history where ships would have passed the castle off the coast of Skyrim and nobody ever thought to investigate or go conquer it. It is sitting atop the shipping lane between Skyrim and Northern High Rock. I doubt it would have even been a difficult feat on account of how Lord Harkon has allowed the castle to crumble into disrepair. We're also supposed to believe that the vampires have kept this location under wraps all this time. They haven't, seen as ferrymen added in the Dongard expansion know about the castle, thinking that it's cursed. Fort Dongard is a pretty similar concept. It's well hidden, but not historically obscure. It's a second era fort that was built by the Jarl of Riften, sitting on the border between Morrowind and Skyrim, nations that have warred as recently as the time of the game Oblivion. The fort was repurposed to imprison the son of the Jarl, inflicted with vampirism, his warden serving as the original Dawnguard, although there is no direct connection between that order and Isran, as Isran refounded the order and reclaimed the, for some reason, abandoned fort. To give a comparison, this is the Crack de Chevier. It was built during the Crusades to serve as an administrative area and was central throughout the conflicts, but even after the Crusades ended, the castle was still occupied and utilized. As late as 1894, the Ottomans were considering garrisoning troops there, but the changing nature of warfare finally outdated the castle. But even as recently as the Syrian Civil War, the castle was utilized by rebel forces and then subsequently hit with an airstrike. All this is to say that Bethesda's fetish for abandoned forts is pretty silly. It's nice to see characters in the story show appreciation for the in-universe craftsmanship that the fort displays, with Dexian suggesting that he has friends in Cyrodiil who would love to study the fort. Typically when sites are abandoned, it's because there was little utility value in reconstructing them. This is typically seen in cities and the like, and when castles were abandoned, they would often have their building materials taken to be used for new developments, because you aren't going to let that stone go to waste, are you? Plus, the last thing you want to do is abandon the fort so some bandit gang can just move in and start organizing themselves. The lower area of the castle is a pretty cool area. My favorite bit is the body dumping room. I guess the odd feral vampire that decides to move in down here is doing them the favor of moving the bodies from the center of the room, since I imagine the pile would be largest under the hole. While I get the decrepit state of the castle is supposed to reflect upon Harkon's obsession with prophecy, what exactly does he do that actually prevents him from maintaining his home? It's not like he was waking up every day and making just a little bit more progress on finding Serana. Given that later when we control the castle, our subordinates clear the rubble blocking the courtyard without any complications or real exertion, it just comes off as Harkon being lazy rather than obsessed. Like he lets some trash pile up on his desk and he justifies it by saying he has to get his script done soon, and it's still there weeks later with the same excuse. As we make it to the courtyard, Serana starts waxing nostalgic before suddenly noticing that the moon dial is messed up. Oh no, she's a paranoid schizophrenic and she's starting to see patterns in the numbers. Serana does reveal that her mother had tended to the garden in the courtyard for centuries, so that implies that the family was mildly functional far longer than most families are alive. Even worse, once we repair the moon dial, it reveals a hidden area to explore. So was the moon dial always damaged, or is there some contraption where it was complete but stayed closed until the day that Serana's mom wanted to leave cryptic clues about how to find her? Well, let's go find out. We go through the hidden part of the castle which has a couple skeletons and gargoyles inside it. Gargoyles have been a recurring enemy of the DLC because they're cool and someone actually put work into them instead of just reskinning Draugr into generic zombies and selling that for four bucks on the Creation Club. At the end of the dungeon is Valerica's study which is apparently far more impressive than the alchemy station she had in the public castle. Apparently she had gone to great lengths to conceal an entire wing of the castle from Harkin. I guess it does take two to break up a relationship. Although Harkin in a thousand years had not managed to find this place through the power of levitation. I guess he really believes in following imperial law. Good for him. We find and give Serana her mother's notes, which give her a big clue. The circle in the middle of the room is actually a portal to a plane of oblivion named the Soul Cairn, which Valerica speculated was where souls used to for enchanting go. But then Serana states definitely that necromancers absolutely send them souls in exchange for power. It's just weird for Serana to be making statements about the place just after establishing her mother's own lack of understanding. Did you, or did you not, catch up on advancements while you were asleep? This leads us to the Soul Cairn, but there is a complication. Shorin can't just walk in on account of the Cairn trying to take his life essence. Vampires are fine because they're already dead, but he has two options. Become a vampire or get his soul trapped. The latter's only really a downside mechanically in the Soul Cairn. I don't really see how partially trapping my soul and donating it to the Cairn makes me weaker in there, but not everywhere else. 
Seems like it would be the other way around. Obviously, letting Serana turn us into a vampire creates problems later down the Dawnguard line, which is great. The player isn't coddled here. You have to make a choice. Turning someone is a very... personal thing for vampires. Come on, pussy! Gay. Wait, I was playing a girl when Harkin turned me. Fucking breeders. So Serana is an object of romantic and sexual fixation in the Elder Scrolls community because the relationship between her and the player character has the option of becoming increasingly personal. Even if there is no actual payoff, the mutual struggle between her and the player is one more of romance than camaraderie, far more so than any of the characters we can actually marry. This harkens back to the origins and rise in popularity of vampire literature. It began during the Romantic movement, which was not a movement of romance stories, but rather a style of literature that favored pathos and symbolic representation. It doesn't make sense that the dead can rise again to kill, but the idea is romantic, especially if, instead of reanimating to kill, you reanimate out of affection or injustice. There being a sense of intimacy and siring the vampire is logical, although it could either be familial or romantic. Dongar draws a lot of attention to Clan Vogelhar being a family. Even if we aren't genetically related to the Vogelhar family, we are a half-blood vampire lord. Harkon's gift was effectively accepting us as one of his direct children, and other vampires who weren't sired by a pure blood show a lack of appreciation to us flaunting our gift. Serana siring us, meanwhile, appears to be catered more towards a romantic implication. She has that anime blush while doing it. Especially for the Dawnguard path, since it's a forbidden romance. It seems poorly thought out, though, given that what we're told about the origin of vampires in Elder Scrolls. Pureblood vampires are products of Molag Bal the same way that all those Greek heroes were products of the gods, and not in the nice ways that they make movies about. The first vampire came from Molag Bal. She... was not a willing subject. But we all took part in it. Not really wholesome family activity, but I guess it's something you do when you give yourselves to a Daedric Lord. And my childhood has just been crushed. Molik Ball is the Daedric Prince of Domination, although Vivek had a less pleasant name for him, and there's a reason he's in with the bad gods of the Dunmer Pantheon. So it would seem like Elder Scrolls vampires would be less of a romantic loving style vampire and more of an obsessive cycle of victimhood style of vampire. What I realized is that Bethesda has a fixation with morally justifying to the player why it's okay for them to do everything. You aren't murdering anyone who didn't deserve it, etc. Serana is that same justification applied to a character. She's not evil. Arguably, she's the most morally righteous vampire since Count Hasseldor. You wouldn't know that she was a worshipper of Molag Ball. She's fairly old to simply have gotten wrapped up in it with her parents. It's clear she was aware of what was going to happen. She uses past tense and never outright admits if she continues this practice. Although, if you tell her about her own Molag Ball adventure... I have to admit, I'm impressed. I didn't think you had the spirit for it. No, that's cool. I was beginning to think you turned all cold bitch on us, honey. She also doesn't really state her own motivations for opposing her father, only her mother's motivations. Her mother, pragmatically, opposed the prophecy because she figured it would draw attention of the mortal world to them. Serana also only mentions her need to feed as an idle threat to Isran. We don't know how Serana is sustaining herself, or how she even survived her time at Dim Hollow without becoming bloodthirsty. I say all of this to really draw attention to the fact that Serana is written to be a universal waifu. Any evil she commits is only implied. She's an exception to the Valkalhar family's problems with obsession. Her opposition to her father is self-defense. She believes that she is in danger, so it's justified. She is ancient, even before her long nap, yet she is a naive young woman who cannot navigate the rapid waters of her own family. Which is why people either fall for her or realize that's what she's meant to be and hate her for it. See, the reason Serana is important is that the blood of a daughter of Cold Harbor, which she is, is necessary to complete the prophecy. Serana herself never reveals this, instead leaving it to her mother to reveal this little fact. That's because the easiest way early on to solve this problem is a Dawnguard firing squad. No Serana, no pureblood vampire. Valerica says this like Serana already knows, that she had already had this necessary piece of information to come to the same conclusion that Valerica had. In essence, they are doing a reverse Martin. Serana is the chosen one, but in a really, really bad way, and it seems like most vampire hunters would rather get the job over with than keep her around. We only tolerated Serana because she had essential information, yet we're forced to continue tolerating her after her usefulness is expended and her dangerousness exposed simply because she's supposed to be our waifu now. 
She is a female Edward Cullen, but modified to change the target demographic from horny teenage girls to horny teenage boys. She's a girl, but she doesn't do that thing that all the annoying girls in my class do where they start talking about themselves. She always cuts herself short. She needs me around to protect her and guide her through her rocky relationship with her parents. Yet despite her lack of familial acumen, she's educated enough to help me accomplish my goals without being overbearing or insulting my own intelligence. If that sounds stupid, then yes, I was a stupid teenage boy during my first Dawn Guard playthrough. If I were to rewrite Serana, I would give her a character flaw in that she is an obsessive Sundere who becomes attached to the player character. That would be in part a commentary on how Skyrim characters obsess over the player character already. She was looking for someone to save her from her horrible home life when we walked in and rescued her from the prison her mother put her in. Despite initially wanting to return home, she's eventually compelled to tag along with us, no matter the danger to herself because of her compulsion. It's not that she sees turning us into a vampire as an option, it's actually what she wants to have happen and may even intentionally exaggerate the horrible effects of the soul trapping just to convince us. I would have her become increasingly emotionally abusive. For instance, if the player is part of the Dawn Guard and refuses to deal with her, she might threaten to return to Harkin to be willingly used as the prophecy. If the player is a vampire, then maybe she threatens to kill herself so that her blood can never be used. I would give the player ample opportunities to call her out on her bullshit, as well as condemnation from Harkon or Isran if the player just allows Serana to walk all over them. Especially if the player character's already married. Obviously a character like that couldn't exist in a corporate product, and I can already hear the accusations of sexism. Personally, I wouldn't care if Serana was a male character, had her gender based on the opposite of the PC, or randomly determined at the start of the game. People in real life are abusive in these ways, so having the character behave in this manner, if you give the player the opportunity to oppose it, seems empowering to me. The main thing is that she needs that element of obsession, and it seems like her being obsessed with the player character is an obvious direction for a potentially good story. Because otherwise, Serana is a vacuum of intrigue. Her mother, despite her short appearance in this single quest, has far more character simply because she has things that she believes, she's willing to challenge us, and she's willing to listen to those that she loves, realize her own faults, and implement changes. It's no masterpiece. It would be hard to do so in a single quest, but my point is that Valerica is far more interesting a character as a consequence of her foibles. Valerica has been here for a while, trapped inside this building in the Soul Cairn. She's been playing what she herself calls the ultimate waiting game with the local keepers, in charge of trying to capture her soul. Both parties are immortal, just waiting for the other to break. I guess the only reason we don't see this more often with Daedra is that they could always just kill themselves and reconstitute outside of wherever they're trapped. The Keepers are just an excuse for us to fairly comprehensively explore the Soul Cairn area. The Soul Cairn is a general continuation of the idea of Blackreach, that being a more open world dungeon area. It runs somewhat contrary to the constant obsession with linear donut dungeons that Dongard is more than willing to continue the trend of. There's a couple quests and other points of interest to do. For instance, there's a quest to find the skull of a horse. I guess whoever killed it and its rider had multiple soul gems they needed to fill. The reward for this is the ability to summon the horse. This was another one of those products of the Bethesda game jam. I always felt like this was a great reward for making it this far in the quest line, since being able to summon a horse as a wizard is way cooler than owning a regular immortal horse. No horse cock, though. The Creation Club of course added on to this by adding another summonable horse, one that's easier to get. Thanks Bethesda. The question is, how do you balance the overpowering convenience of a summonable steed with other normal horses? I think the answer is that you make the fastest horse in the game a loyal, mortal steed. Summonable horses. You don't have to worry about them eating shit after refusing to jump over a rock and then dying. They also aren't loyal. While you're running the dungeon they could be summoned and ridden by someone else. A mortal horse, however, is codependent on you surviving. It'll get you out of danger with enthusiasm, but obviously carries the risk of getting killed. I think that's a great trade-off. The other quest is... Oh no, 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 no. I am Jib. Some call me Saint Jib. Others call me Jib the Eradicator. Perhaps you've heard of me. It's the Saint Jib quest. Okay, so as you explore the Soul Cairn, you'll gradually accumulate these pages of a manuscript, which it turns out was written by Jib. Now if you don't know who that is, then hello, I am Patrician TV, and I made an 8 hour Morrowind video that isn't as good production wise as the Oblivion video, but is still very much worth watching. Jib is the first NPC in Morrowind, the guy on the prison ship who wakes you up and asks for your name. 
By the time of Oblivion, he was turned into a saint of the Dunmer people for the eradication of the cliff racers. This was a little joke you might hear that was meant as a nod towards both Morrowind as well as the fact that cliff racers are a commonly hated enemy. Well, Dungard continues that joke by saying that Jib was killed at Kavanch. What a coincidence that three different player characters happen to be within close proximity of this seemingly irrelevant NPC. I hate this quest for both its nostalgic component, despite being in the target demographic, and because it's a rather annoying quest that reminds me of the Green Hills of Stranglethorn. I can never manage to find all of the pages just by doing Soul Cairn content without eventually having to look up the location of at least two of them. The reward is the book itself, fetching a fair price since it's an original work by a saint, as well as Jib's locket. Really, its only notable quality is that the locket is considered light armor and actually has an armor rating, and for some reason the unofficial patch fixes this by making it so that you can temper it. I should also mention that Jib is voiced by Jeff Baker, the voice of the Morrowind Dunmer as well as Haskell in the Shivering Isles. If it wasn't such an annoying quest, I might find it a more tasteful reference, since it's easy to understand without needing to have played the prior games. The Keepers in the area themselves employ minions of Bonemen, Mistmen, and Wrathmen. I have been told this is supposed to explain why necromancers can summon the undead in earlier games as well as Creation Club Skyrim. Necromancers have been trading summon spells in exchange for souls. But these are not the undead we've seen getting summoned. They're not even really undead, they're just Daedra that are taking the form of undead. And the only real notable summon are the Wrathmen, who have big health bars and use good weapons. The other two are just kind of lame. They're reskins of Draugr and skeleton enemies that already exist in the game, but purple. Speaking of reskins, the Keepers are also Draugr, but they're wearing Dragonbone armor while using the new Dragonbone weapons that Dawnguard added. I think this is supposed to convey that they're just creatures of bone, and not that they literally have Dragonbone equipment. I don't know why you would make this such a cool area and then cheap out on all the enemies. Speaking of cheaping out, when the Keepers are down, the barrier falls and we go with Valerica to where she's been keeping the Elder Scroll, but we get attacked by a dragon. In fairness, they actually gave this dragon two different shouts other dragons will not have, one of them being to summon various enemies to attack you. But even with that, he's still just another dragon encounter, mildly distinct. After it dies, Valerica tells us that she didn't think it was possible because... Volumes written on Dernivir alleged that he can't be slain by normal means. It appears they were mistaken. Um... What volumes? Who's writing about Dernavir? The ideal masters that run the Soul Cairn seem completely treacherous. Every single encounter we're told about was one-sided and ended badly, and it seems like the Soul Cairn is just a trap for necromancers to fall into. Yet somehow, someone's not only written about this, but had done so prior to Valerica's entrapment here. I also find it funny that Valerica's entire conversation is punctuated by constant loud lightning and grating ambience. It really speaks volumes to her character that a scene so annoying can stand out so much. As we go to get out of this shithole, we're confronted by Dernavir. You can actually kill him, which causes him to drop five dragon bones. But he wants to talk. Like most dragons, he fought quite a bit. However, while they were studying the dragon breath, Dernavir was practicing the dark arts. He's a dragon necromancer, which ended him pursuing the ideal masters and making a deal. Unknowingly, the deal was to besiege Valerica until she dies, him being unaware that she was a vampire. He has spent so long here that he's become bound to this place, incapable of outright leaving. However, he can briefly return to Nern if we summon him using our Dragon Shout. Note that Skyrim's main quest is not mandatory to begin Dawnguard, so he'll teach you the words to the Shout without knowing why. Forgive me. My instinct was to grant you this title. I am uncertain why. Perhaps one day it will become clear to both of us. Alright, now can we leave? Well, there is a re- Okay, now can we leave? Well, there's still the merchant- We have all three scrolls. Even though it's dangerous, Valerica is mildly convinced we may be capable of stopping Harkin. She will not return yet on account of her also being a daughter of Cold Harbor, and no, there's no real acknowledgement if you happen to remember her after the questline is over. It's just funny to think of most people forgetting to bring Valerica back out of literal hell. She also doesn't contend for control of the castle after Harkin dies. She just gives it to us. Turns out Dexian is blind, however. 
Apparently he rushed reading the Elder Scroll and has paid the price for it. While that mildly makes sense for Thrall Dexion, Dawnguard Dexion is no excuse for doing this. Maybe if the game had elaborated on the fact that all the scrolls disappeared from White Gold Tower so the Moth Priests haven't had ample opportunity to get to read the scrolls, so Dexion arrogantly jumped at the opportunity. Obviously going in he didn't know there were going to be two more, but blindness after reading the scrolls is supposed to take a while, not after reading it once. In order to move forward, we need to head to an Ancestor Glade, where we can perform a little ritual with the Ancestor Moths the priests take their name from to read the scroll. We grab a draw knife, take a cutting from the canicle tree, then run around drawing moths to us until we have enough, then read the scrolls. A lot of why here, given the way Skyrim presents the Elder Scrolls, you have to wonder why we even need to bother with the ritual other than they want us to. The scrolls show us a map of western Skyrim hinting at the location of Ariel's bow, which is the weapon needed to cause the tyranny of the sun. Oh shit, I know where that is. It's buried in the Ashlands at Ubereth's grave. I should have mentioned that when we were looking for it sooner. Could have saved us the whole Soul Cairn adventure. We are, subsequently, attacked by either the Dawn Guard or vampires. How do they find us? Also, you may have noticed that this whole Ancestor Glade adventure was considered a quest of the same caliber as exploring the castle, or our entire trip inside the Soul Cairn, so they had to throw in some kind of battle related to the theme of the expansion. It is also the game's last chance for a while, since we're going to set off on another lengthy adventure with Serana. At this point, she confirms her resolve to kill her father, although she has much more dialogue should we have sided with the clan. She guesses that once Harkin has the bow and Serana, he'll want to kill us due to us having expended our usefulness and becoming a threat to him. As far as I know, though, it's never been held by a vampire. That would be a new one. A girl deserves to be pampered sometimes. Well then, you probably should have caught up on your history and watched my Morrowind video. I suppose this was going to happen at some point. We have to talk about the question as to how long Serana was at Dim Hollow. And from what I could tell, a thousand extra years of obsession haven't made him any better. I should have found him a hobby. You'd figure a couple hundred years locked away with one would have given me some insight. But no. It's like we're the first to set foot here in centuries. This stranger has done more for me in the brief time I've known her than you've done in centuries! Cyrodiil is the seat of an empire? I must have been gone longer than I thought. And in a single line, Serana managed to fuck everything up. Coming to a definite conclusion about how long Serana was asleep, or how old Clan Valkalar is, is folly because I doubt that even Bethesda internally had an answer to that question. Her line about the Empire is stupid because she asks a question she has no possible way of actually understanding the answer to. She asks who the High King of Skyrim is, as though she's gonna know whoever we even tell her it is. It's akin to Rip Van Winkle asking what's up with all this new Americana he's seen. You would think the very first thing Serana would do upon returning to Castle Valkohar is ask for a quick history lesson spanning the time that she's been gone, and maybe she did that because she pretty quickly settles into acting like she was gone for centuries, not millennia. However, Cyrodiil has had a human-controlled empire within it in some capacity longer than she implies she was gone, at least in every other line than the last one I played. And before that it was controlled by the Aeliads who themselves had an empire controlling the region and some additional territory. Well, this question has been asked more than a couple times. Matt Grandstaff, Bethesda's senior community manager at the time, stated, The intention was that Serana went to sleep in the late Second Era, between the Riemann and Septim empires. Her initial dialogue is just her surprise that there's an empire in Cyrodiil, as there hadn't been when she went to sleep. That actually sounds fairly reasonable and what I would have guessed was the case. Given the Dawnguard's origins in the Second Era, as well as Castle Valkalhar, I would have placed Harkin's transformation in the 2E. However, the ESO team was asked twice, and in one answer, they said she was already asleep at that point, which was the Second Era year 582. Another answer, however, would state, Probably not, unfortunately. Serana was imprisoned in a stone coffin in Dim Hollow Cavern from sometime in the First Era until the time of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim in the Fourth. So, who to believe? Well, Bethesda, both because it was their employee who said it, as well as the fact that it was stated in 2013, which means the information's far more likely to come from a primary source. It's as simple as Serana, a woman who had just woken up from centuries of slumber, badly communicated what she meant and not that she's over 4,000 years old. But of course it can't be that simple. Valerica went to the Soul Cairn after Serana went to sleep and Dernavir made the agreement to be her warden after that, so that implies that Dernavir had managed to survive the Dragon War and Akaviri dragon hunts an unusually long time in addition to being an oddity among dragons due to his own necromantic practices. 
Serana is also unusually comfortable about us being the Dragonborn, which is something she'd be more familiar with if she was from the first era, not the second. However, if she was from the first era, then she might have some questions, like who these dark-skinned elves are, or where the Dwemer, Aeliads, or Falmer went. She also asks no questions, like who this Talos guy everybody's talking about is. Serana is an amazing opportunity to really get an outsider's perspective on the state of modern Skyrim. She should be confused why the Nords are so mellow these days, or surprised that they had offered the Dunmer refuge instead of just taking advantage of the Red Year to claim new territory in Morrowind. Yes, but when I was here it wasn't so... crumbly. This used to be a city. It's a fucking horrible idea. Instead, Serana and Valerica's long-term ordeal is simply a plot point that exists to characterize Harkon as an obsessive maniac. At this point, it really shouldn't be a surprise that Dongard misses opportunities like a lazy high schooler. We head out to Darkfall Cave, and the bridge is supposed to be a trap, but it's really easy to bypass. We have to ride this water current that miraculously doesn't break all our bones before being spit out into a cave, leading to a small shrine and a rather pale elf named Gelibor. Alright, now brace yourself. Gelibor is a snow elf. He's one of the last living members of his race and has been living at the shrine for thousands of years. He's also an exposition machine, sharing quite a bit of information about the history of the Falmer. And since this is post-Lame Bethesda, obviously there's no question as to the truthfulness of his statements. He tells the story of his people. The Falmer controlled Skyrim until some Giga Chads came along and went to war with them. He doesn't mention this part, but Sarthal was established as a human colony before being wiped out so the Falmer and or Dwimmer could control the Eye of Magnus. Iskermor and the 500 Companions came along and went on quite a campaign across Skyrim as men increasingly colonized the area. Gelibor says the Falmer turned to the Dwimmer, who for some reason decided they would help the Falmer, but that they would have to blind them. The weird thing about the Falmer is that they lack a religious schism to the parent Aldmeri people. They just seem to be normal elves who decided one day to leave Aldmeris and colonize Skyrim. The Falmer were blinded and then, I don't know, just hung out with the dwarves until the dwarves disappeared, at which point they started taking over their ruins and gradually evolving into the creatures they are today. Thing is though, the dwarves disappeared a long time ago, like 3,700 years ago. So the Falmer have been twisted blind creatures longer than they were these elegant snowmen who were unjustly slain despite their mortal nobility. Because remember that this happened likely a while before the dwarves even disappeared. Gelibor says that he and the Chantry of his people managed to survive due to being isolated in the mountains, but eventually the Goblin Falmer showed up and started slaughtering the surviving regular Falmer, leaving only Gelibor and his brother, Archcurate Verther, alive as the last members of their race. Of course, you're here for Oriel's bow. Why else would you be here? For the thousands of years I've served as the Chantry's sentinel, there hasn't been a single visitor here for any other reason. Elder Scrolls has gone back and forth a bit on how long elves in the setting live for. However, generally, it seems that common elves will get old and die after a couple centuries, and only wizards have managed to live past a thousand years. Vampires can violate this rule, obviously, although I guess the implication is supposed to be that as potentially the last worshipper of Ariel that he's been granted some divine extension to his lifespan so that he might serve this purpose. But yeah, I guess he just lives down here, eating a diet of mushrooms, spiders, and troll meat, and maybe the odd veil deer. He also says that he has encountered others before us, but that all of them were seeking the bow. I guess none of them figured that it might be worth it to leave the cave, report on his existence, and find themselves a company of mercenaries to take with them on their quest to recover Ariel's bow. Also, how did they all hear about the bow? We learned about this through the immense effort of bringing together three different Elder Scrolls that had been lost to the world for centuries. Gelibor wants us to slay his brother, who he speculates has been corrupted in some way by the Falmer. If we can do that, he'll give us the bow. To do this, we need to reach the Chantry, which means completing the initiation ritual of the Falmer, which will entail visiting several way shrines and filling in Ewer. All that just to end up dumping it out? It makes no sense to me. It's symbolic. I don't expect you to understand. You are such a fucking nerd! As simple as it is, it's punctuated by a lengthy Falmer dungeon. The Falmer are a sequel enemy to the goblins from Oblivion, making heavy use of poisons and some limited shamanistic magics to be... really annoying. People find this part of Dawnguard very weak. Personally, I find just the Falmer cave part boring, but it eventually leads to the Waste Shrine of Illumination. In addition to this cool-looking cave area, we're deposited into the Forgotten Vale, and I love this area. It is another open world dungeon, but it makes exploration appropriately dangerous, without being tedious like the Soul Cairn was. 
I find the area a particularly fun standout with survival mods, and it's quite the beautiful little corner of Skyrim. There's a couple books to be found, which can be taken to Ureg Gross Shub and translated, each revealing pieces of Falmer history. There's also a Paragon portal that takes you to various hidden areas in the Vale using Paragons found through exploration. As you progress through the Vale, you reach these way shrines, which allow you to fast travel around the area, which has no actual fast travel waypoint markers to use ordinarily. However, playing a no fast travel run of Dawnguard is super annoying given how much ground you have to cover due to the locations being distant from each other. There is a missed opportunity with the prelates, since they are only here to recreate the ritual. You could have given the player the opportunity to try and speak with the prelates but not have them respond. When you reach the elevated lake, you find a word wall, but get attacked by a pair of twin dragons living under the ice. They do have a unique mechanic where they will dive through the ice, and it's a great opportunity to summon Dernavir here to even the odds even if he has a bit to say before he'll actually start contributing. It makes you wonder if the dragons were living here peacefully with the Falmer, since they were worshippers of Ariel. Overall, I find the Forgotten Veil vale to be Skyrim exploration at its strongest. It's a shame too, it's basically showcasing that Bethesda can do better, but they simply don't. I don't understand why the piece of content immediately preceding and following Skyrim both have more interesting world design than the actual mainline title itself, but I guess Skyrim had to be that boring to become accessible. I also, rather interestingly, find the Falmer far more interesting to combat on the surface than I do underground. This gauntlet where the Falmer have built up a settlement in the crevice that we fight through has been fun on every character I take it through. Which is weird because one would imagine that the Falmer, a race of blind elves, should be interesting creatures to fight in their native underground. Inside the Sanctum, there are many frozen Falmer enemies who can be avoided as long as you avoid the temptation to loot whatever they're holding. Honestly, I'm surprised base Skyrim didn't have this snap-frozen enemy idea. Hell, it explored new blood magic ideas more than it did ice magic. The Ewer can also be used to access a few hidden areas, although the interior of the Sanctum is far less impressive than the exterior implies. Did you really come here expecting to claim Ariel's bow? You've done exactly as I predicted, and brought your fetching companion to me. It's a stu- No, I'm, I'm not even- I'm not even going there. Which, I'm sorry to say, means your usefulness is at an end! Oh no. Ariel himself may have been beyond my reach, but his influence on our world wasn't. All I needed was the blood of a vampire, and his own weapon, Ariel's bow. The blood of a vampire, Ariel's bow. It was you? You created that prophecy? A prophecy that lacked a single final ingredient. The blood of a pure vampire. The blood of a daughter of Cold Harbor. Verther is a mildly interesting fight, spawning waves of Falmer and even blowing up his arena, but this revelation is quite the doozy. He is seeking revenge for having been infected with vampirism, even though curing early stage vampirism is as easy as visiting a shrine. So his plan was to create a prophecy that would allow him to affect Ariel's relationship with Nern, which is apparently the sun. I have a question. So we can just utter random shit into the air and the Elder Scrolls go, yeah, that's a prophecy now. It's not like saying if you drop a chunk of potassium in water, it explodes. What you said was nonsense. If you shoot the sun with Ariel's bow, tainted by the blood of a daughter of Cold Harbor, it'll darken the sky. Why? It's symbolic. Now shut up, Gelibor. Well, the reason why is that Emil Pagliarulo said so. But it's not even permanent, which is not Emil's fault. There was also a really nice little nugget that uh, Emil Pagliarulo gave us for a story idea that uh, the vampires are looking to extinguish the sun. Uh, his idea may have gone a little further than what we wanted. It was just going to go away forever and ever. Uh, but we like the we like the general theme of that, and that kind of fit with Oriole's bow. Hey, let's shoot out the sun and fits with vampires, and all these pieces started to come together. Emma wanted it to be permanent, and I assume you would then shoot the sun with the sun hallowed arrows to turn off the eclipse. It was the other developers who pushed back on that element, leaving the characters in writing mildly confused on the goal or impact of Harkin's plan. I cannot help but imagine the player character sitting all of the characters down and explaining this prophecy, how the color would drain from the faces of the Vokalhar family who realized they wasted everything on something this stupid. 
Valerica opposes Harkin because a permanent eclipse would draw the attention of the mortal world, and because Serana would have to be sacrificed to accomplish this. Unless Harkin was planning on strapping a tank with five liters of Serana's blood on it, he's going to need to keep her alive to actually make consistent use of the bow. Harkin is a vampire. He understands the need for a recurring source of blood, and the fact that you have to keep someone alive for that to happen. It really shows that Bethesda internally didn't know what Harkin's plan was, only that they needed to tell the player that their new waifu was in danger. Well, at that point, the uh, vampire story was more difficult to come up with. It's really easy to look at a really cool piece of art and say, wow, let's put that in. Obviously, it took them a lot of effort to create it, but it's easy for me as a designer just to look at it and go, wow, that's cool, let's do something with it. Then the harder work is, well, what would be the cool story we have? And we started casting about for other things that we could hook into it. And the whole idea of Oriel and Oriel's bow, to me, was kind of a, an interesting thing because it was a new Daedric artifact. There's a, a principal Daedric uh, lord or god that we had not used recently, and it fit really well with the whole vampire story. Serana has no problems giving us, an effective stranger, her blood without hesitation. She'll even do it for you if you side with the Dawn Guard. She will give us three weeks of blocked out sun, add zero inconvenience to herself. Gelibor, on the flip side, can give us sun hallowed arrows, which when shot at the sun causes it to rain holy fire. This is mildly useful in the final quest for the Dawn Guard section, but very mildly. Isran will make you get cured as a vampire first, though, if that's how you handle the Soul Cairn, but he gathers together all the lads and leads a force to Castle Valkohar. If you attack during the day, then you can leverage the vampire's weakness as well as the bow in the initial battle. For Clan Valkohar, however, we just return to the castle. Yeah, the vampires don't destroy the Dawn Guard in the finale of the expansion. That's just a random side quest with zero ceremony, which even erroneously refers to the Dawn Guard as being in the Reach rather than the Rift. I am above the petty squabbles here. The Dawn Guard will, no doubt, soon become even more of a nuisance now that Auriel's bow has been recovered. We need to strike a crippling blow against them before they muster more men against us. Good. They've holed up in an abandoned fort in the Reach. Killing their leaders should discourage them from an out-and-out -out war with us. Ancestors guide you. I didn't realize that was what it was doing until I saw the quest marker pointing at the fort. He said the reach. You fuck. You fucking idiot. Like you could do this if Harkin was like decided to go attack the Dawn Guard while we were gone. And so we have to go to Fort Dawn Guard and like fight a bunch of Dawn Guard people there and then confront Harkin. And I, you know, you could do something with that. The Dawn Guard cuts through the vampires, which is where I mentioned I had one of the vampire hire thugs to teach me a lesson due to killing their friends. This is a lot less climactic for the Valkohar playthrough where I just walked in and confronted Harkin in the chapel. It's funny that you can actually just give the bow to Harkin, which makes the fight more difficult, but it still causes this boss fight to happen. The difficulty of the fight is scaled to the player level, although I will say there's much more competence on display than Mana Marco had. Harkin fights in his vampire lord state, summoning skeletons and gargoyles, absorbing health, going invisible, and teleporting around the room. He also has a unique sword that can absorb attributes, but only for vampires, which he doesn't use. During the fight, he'll teleport to the blood altar and heal, which you can use Ariel's bow with sun-hallowed arrows to stop. His final confrontation is also pretty lame. He seems aware of our betrayal, even though from his perspective, the last thing we went out to do was read the Elder Scrolls at Ancestor Glade in order to recover the bow. Saran is all, I'm not afraid of you anymore, and Harkon deflects by confronting us. First he asks our intention as a faction, then secondly asks our intentions with his daughter. It's kind of pathetic how he tries to call us out for being a hypocrite, like he actually needs to justify himself to us. It's also pathetic how we don't bother proposing using Serana as a short-term edge against the mortal world, rather than trying our luck in full-scale warfare. Wow. Well, anyway. And with that, the story is over. Garen or Isran will enter the room, congratulate us, and Serana will tell us that she's going to stay at the headquarters of the faction of our choice, unless we want her to come with us. And that's it. Pretty disappointing. Almost entirely because the story utterly fumbled the ball and got confused about what it was supposed to be. Is this a tragic character piece and are we even saving the world? You don't want players confused about the stakes of a story like this. However, even more frustrating is that Serana basically just stops. 
You would think she would taper off to let the player wean themselves off her as a character, but she just turns off. Had to make a horse reference, didn't you? Bye bye hideosity! If you're nice, you can ask her to get cured of vampirism, but otherwise that's it. If she's meant to be a waifu, it's amazing how drastically she returns to being a generic character again. All that is left is mopping up the remaining side content. One of the Dawn Guard quests has us recruiting a priest of RK into the ranks, notable as he apparently hears the voice of RK directly. The priest is being held hostage by Vigil of Stendar, charmed by vampires. Not only is he a master trainer in restoration, he also sells the spells Stendar's Aura and Vampire's Bane, a pair of restoration spells which do damage specifically to the undead. He's also the quest giver for three radiant quests to find the Dawnguard Rune Hammer, Rune Shield, and Rune Axe. You have to do a lot of Dawnguard radiant quests to get everything though. The UESP guesses somewhere between 5 and 18. The Rune Hammer can create fire runes when bashed against surfaces, making it one of the most unique melee weapons in the game that can be easily missed because it was hidden amongst the tedious grind of radiant quests. You can even increase the range the runes are placed if you unlock the perk in the destruction tree and create runes with its level of destruction. It's rather interesting because it means that this is more than just a sledgehammer that does sun damage or 15% extra damage to vampires. It's more like a weapon in Elden Ring, having a unique function that can distinguish it. The rune shield does more bash damage to vampires and can create a magical shield of sunlight that harms the undead. The Rune Axe does 10 sun damage for every 10 undead killed since the last sunrise, up to 100 extra sun damage. Which sounds incredibly useful, less so for vampire hunting and more so for Draugr crypt grinds. But yeah, that's the bulk of the Valkohar and Dawnguard content. I still like this expansion more than Knights of the Nine, mainly due to some of the areas we visit during the quest, and how much more ambitious this expansion was in general. There are only a couple things left to mention here. In Riften, there is now a woman who will change your appearance for 1,000 gold, provided you aren't a vampire. This was released in the Vampire expansion. This is entirely cosmetic and serves no utility purpose. The Solitude Guard will not be dropping that murder charge due to you having a different face. That said, I'm still amazed that Skyrim has a way to change your hairstyle, but not the launch version of Cyberpunk 2077. Another addition of Dawnguard are these books littered absolutely everywhere titled The Ethereum Wars. For a while I forgot this was even an addition to Dawnguard because it starts in such a generic manner. There are already quests in Skyrim that start with a book, so I had assumed that this one is simply one I had missed and never actually completed due to the tedium involved. I guess that means the quest successfully integrated into the open world. Reading the book sends us out to Arkenthams, a ruin in the Reach in which we'll find the ghost of an adventurer telling us not to explore the ruin, as we explore a fairly standard cave dungeon full of Falmer and automatons, we'll find her bow, which is a dwarven bow that is enchanted to shoot 30% faster than normal, making it a favorite in the community for some reason. The only notable thing about this ruin is this giant wall that is like a combination lock, but the sequence is input with a ranged weapon, and doing it wrong sends automatons to attack us. Inside we find an ethereum shard, which the ghost tells us is one of several that we should try to find. This leads to us going to several existing Dwemer ruins which are marked on the ghost's map. We find one shard at Deep Folk Crossing, another at Raldbathar, which is the ruin where Muri's ex-boyfriend was living in the Dark Brotherhood questline, and one at Mizulf, which is the ruin where we encountered the Synod while looking for the Staff of Magnus. Once we have the shards, we head to the fifth ruin, which we use the shards as a key to raise an elevator leading to a small ruin inside, of which is a giant centurion titled the Forge Master, serving as a final boss encounter of this adventure. I like this fight as well as the area it takes place in, since they actually made it look cool and not just another dark grey and brass Dwemer ruin. I am a sucker for environmental lava, however. We've discovered the location of the Ethereum Forge, but unfortunately we only have the resources needed to create a single artifact. The circlet is best, which I detailed why when explaining the ritual stone exploit. Beautiful. That crown. It's everything I could have hoped for. And with that, it's done. No one could possibly deny what we found now. Yeah, they can. Turns out Terran Dreth, who was the guy that stole the ghost's research, is wandering Skyrim. 
As a random event, if you run into him while wearing the item we crafted, he'll demand the artifact and then attack us for it. Although this ended up bugging out my first time as Dreth just ignored me. So yeah, he can deny what we found. Patch 1.7 which fixed some Dawnguard issues, including issues related to the Kinect. Yeah, during the game jam, Bethesda implemented voice detection using the Kinect, where you could actually shout the dragon shouts to activate them. As lame as that sounds, I don't know why Bethesda didn't just implement that as an option using microphones in general, probably because most people would die of embarrassment if anyone ever walked on them actually shouting while playing Skyrim. I would doubt, I don't think that's gonna happen. But both of those systems, 3D, I would be surprised. Uh, both Connect and Move, they're fairly new systems as of last year. And you look at something like the Connect, you know, Microsoft's still updating what it can do, how it handles things, how the libraries work. Same with Move. Um, so there might be something that we end up doing. Fus Roda. Fus Roda. 1.7 was also the patch to add Hearthfire to the game, which I am rolling into this section on Dawnguard due to the nature of the DLC. Hearthfire is an evolution on the Stronghold's idea from Morrowind, where you can acquire a plot of land in the middle of nowhere and build it up into a settlement, although the main concept of Hearthfire is having far more customization options while building your house. They sold three houses to the player that could be customized, complete with a few new mechanics like adoption, farming, baking, and fishing via a hatchery for only $5. And even then, apparently some people thought that that was overpriced. Whenever you think about the asking prices of Creation Club content, remember what Bethesda actually provided as a point of comparison. There are three plots located in areas where you previously could not own homes in the Pale, Falkreath Hold, and Hjalmarch. Sadly, there is still no Winterhold home unless you count the Bloodchill Manor creation. They, and by they I mean known mod diva Eleonora, charged four bucks for this vampire-themed home in the middle of nowhere. The creation adds a dinner invitation at level 12, inviting us to a manor for a dinner party, which turns out to be a ploy run by vampires to lure morons into the middle of nowhere for consumption. If you're a human, you have to defend yourself, while if you're a vampire, then the Dawn Guard will show up. This was one of the first creations I played after the Anniversary Edition release, so it was a bit rusty because the enemies I ended up fighting had such a ridiculous amount of health that I ended up using a console command just to see how much they had, which was 1100. That's equivalent to fighting Lord Harkon, at level 48, but I was doing this at level 12. The house is nice to look at, but impractical as it involves this lengthy walk into the actual manor from the entrance. It is appalling that they were charging almost as much money for this lazy piece of content as they were for the entirety of Hearthfire. In Hearthfire, you have to become the Thane of a Hold and then purchase property, like normal. It's actually integrated into the game world to appear almost seamless with the content that already exists in base Skyrim. Whereas Creation Club houses are thrown at the player in the same lazy style that the Oblivion House DLCs would throw the houses at the player. As it's the easiest, most players will likely build their Hearthfire home in Falkreath. Dawnstar requires completing the local Vermina quest as well as slaying a giant, while Hjalmarch requires completing the quest Laid to Rest. Since it has to do with vampires, it's fitting to discuss in this section instead of the side quest section. People in Morthal are rumor-mongering about Hragar's house that burned down, and how suspicious it is that he immediately started living with another woman as soon as his wife and child were dead. It's not surprising, I've lived in a swamp town a lot like Morthal, and I can say I've heard this story multiple times. Once we start the investigation proper, we find the ghost of Hragar's daughter in the ruins. Yeah, it's one of those investigations. This calls back to the first Imperial Legion quest in Morrowind, which also had us investigating a murder, in which the ghost of the victim came back to implicate his murderer. Helgi's a bit more obtuse because she's a stupid child, so we have to track her down to her grave plot. Turns out a vampire has been messing with the ghost, for some reason. This is where I have to showcase the difference between pre- and post-Dawnguard vampires, because I feel it's a little too obvious that Layla is a vampire when you have Dawnguard installed. Thonir, Layla's husband, arrives at the scene to find us having just killed his wife. He is shocked that she is a vampire and tells us that she had told him that she had left to go join the Stormcloaks. Apparently the night she left, she was supposed to meet Alva, the same woman that Hragar moved in with after his house burned down. Yet for some reason, Thonor takes offense at us suggesting that Alva is a vampire. Well, sure enough, she is. It is a bit disappointing that this quest doesn't play out differently for vampires, although it works pretty well if you're a member of the Dawn Guard and are looking to play out the fantasy of being a traveling vampire hunter. If you break in during the day, Hragar will be out of the house, but Alva will be sleeping in a coffin. If you break in at night, Alva will be away, but Hrogar will be there. 
Either way leads to us finding her journal, which reveals that Alva herself was turned by a vampire named Movarth, whom the Jarl asks to have exterminated. A wild mob of townspeople will come with us to his lair, although most of the citizens will decide against actually joining us to fight vampires. Movarth dies and the ghost returns to thank us. Now we can purchase a swamp house and run a fish hatchery. The end. Funny thing is that Movarth had his race radiantly determined, although with Dawnguard his race was changed to consistently be a Nord. Movarth is actually the vampire hunter featured in a book from Oblivion titled Immortal Blood that Vigilus Stendar often carry. The story is told from the perspective of someone who is revealed to be a vampire, coaching a man named Movarth on the varieties of vampires found across Tamriel. We learn about the Valkalhar vampires as well as vampires native to North Valenwood, and the final type being the Cyrodiilic vampires, which the book retroactively establishes as being so able to masterfully conceal their identity that it's impossible to locate their clans. That's why they weren't there, they were just invisible all along. Turns out the guy was a Cyrodiilic vampire and eventually turns Movarth. The problem is that Movarth, after Dawnguard installed, is turned into a Valkalhar vampire. The story doesn't elaborate on what happens after the narrator is revealed to be a vampire, but apparently he survived. And rather than using his newfound vampirism to further his hunt, he instead decided to just become a bog-standard vampire, taking victims from a small swamp town and eventually getting killed over it. It's like one developer wrote Immortal Blood, and another dev said, Hey, you wrote that vampire book back in Oblivion, right? What was the name of that guy from that book? And he was told Movarth, maybe not realizing that Movarth was the hunter, not the vampire, hence why they made his race random. But we aren't told anything about the vampire in that story. I had more than a couple people suggest to do this quest, but I wouldn't say it's anything impressive. I do want to mention on the topic of the fish hatchery, one of the main features of the anniversary edition being the fishing creation, which I think puts a bit of unfair pressure on it. Ashley, there's something else that we were adding in Skyrim that you've been excited about that's free for all players. What is that? Yeah, you know what? I think um, 10 years is, is a long time to wait, but I think it's worth it. We're putting a fishing mechanic in the game. It's something that, you know, I've always wanted to do in Skyrim. You're, you're running around the world, exploring the wilderness. Um, you don't have to dive in the water and click blindly anymore, right? You can now grab a fishing pole, uh, do some fishing quests. It's a great addition to the game. It'll be free to everyone. Uh, and it really adds to, again, the immersion of the world of, of just running around Skyrim. You can now go and fish. But what is the big deal with fishing? Well, for one, it was released for free to owners of the special edition. So even if you're completely uninterested in playing the content, the content does not agree and feels welcome to insert itself into your game. And it is boring. Angling is a pretty boring sport in general. That's why adding it as a mechanic is always a challenge, because it's like saying you're going to add a new mechanic around meditating for 15 real life minutes. I mean, there is effort on display here, but I'm just not interested. I tried multiple times to pick up the creation and found myself bouncing right back off it, despite enjoying fishing in Red Dead Redemption 2. But I think a part of the controversy has to do with the unresolved tension surrounding the paid mods fiasco. Art of the Catch was one of the mods made available for sale, which ended up being a poster child for an issue with the modding community. See, when everything is free, permission can be a little lax. But it was pointed out that Art of the Catch was being sold despite being reliant on another modder's work, Four's New Idols. It was perceived as outright theft, which is mildly inaccurate. This heightened the controversy in addition to the general opposition to fishing. Now that's not to say that everybody who thinks fishing is silly, is aware of the deep lore on the modding community. I personally had to look it up to even remember the details of what had happened. More so, I think fishing comes off as uninspired to people not in the community, but hearing about how Skyrim has been released for the 17th or 26th or 39th time, it's less about the content directly and more about the Creation Club, which is pretty funny because there is way worse stuff in the Anniversary Edition than fishing. After we get our property, we set out to pay it a visit. There's a drafting table and a chest with enough resources to get the basic shack built, but if we want to turn this place into a home, we'll need more resources. This is likely the origin of the Fallout 4 idea of finding materials out in the world to build up your settlements, although the primary resources are easy enough to source. We head out to a lumber mill to purchase some wood for the property, while we can mine stone and clay out in the world. You can also hire one of your followers to become the steward of your property, and they will drive to the hardware store to pick up a bunk of lumber or a pallet of stone for you instead. The stewards can also handle furnishing each section of your house, although that convenience takes away the ability to customize the interiors yourself by leaving out various options you don't want. 
After building the small house, we can add on a main hall, which then allows us to convert the house into an entryway, while also building a cellar, which allows us to create a smithing area as well as a coffin for sleeping as a vampire. There are then three wings, each of which has three options to choose from. You can mix and match what you want, or you can have each of the three new properties have a theme. However, you cannot change wing locations, have redundant wings, or do anything terribly creative. The east wing allows us to build either an armory, a kitchen, or a library. The armory adds various weapons displays and smithing stations. The kitchen adds the oven needed for baking and butter churning. The library provides storage options for books, should you be collecting them. I hate the fact that you can't build other wings in the east wing slot, since I don't really care for any of these options in my main house. In the west wing, you're given a choice between extra bedrooms, a greenhouse, and an enchanting tower. I wish I could put the greenhouse in the east wing and the enchanting tower in the west wing. I don't like that players have to choose here, especially given how useful the greenhouse was, at least until the farming creation. This one I actually like because it's only $4 but actually adds something both useful and seamlessly integrated. You do just kind of steal this property from a family that was murdered whose deaths you have to solve. However, afterwards you can recruit a steward and some farmhands, although unfortunately I had my steward handle that. See, it turns out you can actually hire the homeless people in Skyrim to work on your farm, which is more hilarious than what I tried to do, which was appoint an Argonian as my steward. The crops planted on the farm are automatically harvested and stored, and you can expand operations to include cows, chickens, and bees. I found the farm to be extremely useful for breaking the game alchemically, although you can accomplish the same thing with the basic farm plot and greenhouse that Hearthfire provides. Can you believe there was a world where players were expected to create fortified destruction potions using entirely what they purchased from alchemists or found in dungeons? And that was actually supposed to be the main way they made their spells do more damage? All because Todd thought that spellcrafting would make the game less fun? Anyways, the North Wing allows you to create a trophy room, a storage room, and an alchemy laboratory. So you can see the game sort of mixes the three main playstyles and rooms while providing options for a home built around keeping your new family. Which, when I played recently, Lucia finally stopped begging in Whiterun and moved into my house. Also fun note, between when I finished my playthrough and when I picked it up again, something caused the game to reinstall Hearthfire which undid literally everything I had done with the expansion on that character. Which I guess makes it lucky that most of my stuff was at Mirrorwatch instead. Now you could go through the process of building this house and spending lots of money, or you could spend some real money and get yourself a pre-made house for free. Most of the house mods were created by the mod author Eleonora, who I called a diva because I've used a number of her house mods prior to the Creation Club even being a thing, and they're actually pretty solid works. She's actually based because she responds to comments on her mods the same way I respond to comments on my videos, which is to typically type out that the person should kill themselves before deleting it and writing an actual response. My classic complaint about her house mods, though, was that they, like most house mods, never really integrate into the world. To give you a quote from her own mod page, Tirishan is a bubble world space, your very own small pocket realm of oblivion. Don't ask for background story, I'm an environment artist, not a narrative designer. Yeah, Bethesda should hire her, since she's got the right attitude for the job. Tundra Homestead is just a lame Skyrimified version of Hala. Mirrorwatch is just the Archmage's quarters that the player can unlock if they cast a flame spell, which, I will remind the viewer, every character starts with. Shadowfoot Sanctum is a house haphazardly chucked into the Ratway which is not only inconvenient to reach, but also super uninspired. Hindraheim is a house given to the player if they can best an NPC in a duel, which is just a redux of Yorvaskar into a player home. It's funny that the stuff you can download for free from the Nexus is better than the houses they originally charged money for and, when not enough people were buying, rolled into the Anniversary Edition. There are two more house mods to mention. Gallows Hall is a necromancer-themed home not created by Eleonora. You can tell because to unlock the house for ownership, you have to actually do a quest, which explains briefly the history of this place. It was owned by a necromancer interested in artifacts of Mana Marco, who was killed by his latest apprentice who wanted to steal those artifacts. In turn, the necromancer made a puzzle to ensnare his apprentice. This is not the sort of puzzle anybody would ever die of dehydration trying to solve. There are a bunch of torches on the wall representing various towns, and the first clue is a puzzle telling us the order of towns to pull torches off the wall of. Easy, but not easy enough for the apprentice. I did get stuck on the second clue though, because I didn't realize that the coffers it was referring to was not the safe and chest next to the clue, but in fact the coffins on the wall that you have to enter a dream via the Shrine of Vermina. The part I got stuck on was not realizing I was supposed to pray to the shrine and then sleep. I just figured if I did it right, the shrine would put me to sleep by itself, and that the puzzle had bugged out. 
The third clue is to just put the soul gems we found from the second clue on the altar and activate it. Extremely simple, so much so I'm surprised the trap even worked. Anyways, the hall is just a generic fort ruin in the middle of nowhere. It does add in a few items. There is an altar you can use to create black soul gems in case the black star isn't enough. There is the Bloodworm Helm, which was created in Morrowind and later appeared in the Oblivion Mages Guild quest. Apparently, it is Mana Marco's crown that he just misplaced. Funny thing is that, like the Necromage perk, the effect it has of fortifying damage against the undead also works on the player if they're a vampire, including healing and fortification magic. There's also the Helm of Orion Bearclaw, and the reason given is the joke referring to the similar appearance of the two helms in Oblivion. This helm used to fortify agility and endurance by 40 points, but was downgraded to just 10 points in Oblivion and offhandedly given to the player for completing the Fighter's Guild questline. It has been downgraded again to just fortify stamina and stamina regeneration. There is also the Staff of Worms, which in Oblivion could reanimate the dead. Since that's just a spell now, the Staff of Worms was actually upgraded into creating Dead Thralls, which is an extremely powerful ability to just give the player as easily as this creation does. I actually wish I had found this staff sooner during my initial playthrough. There is also Nuchian Thumes, a dwarven themed home that apparently not even the UESP bothered to fill out the article for. I watched a short video about the house and it just looked like a pain in the ass. It reminded me of the Stronghold quest where you advance a stage and then wait a multiple days for the Stronghold to progress. Plus, who wants to live in a Skyrim style dwarven ruin? Now, it probably doesn't seem important, but player homes are actually very important in Bethesda's style of RPG, which is probably a big part of the reason why Fallout 4 worked on increasing the player's ability to customize their living space. In a game where you're expected to spend dozens of hours doing quests and looting dungeons, you need a place to store stuff. We're a long way past the days of throwing stuff on the bed in the Mage's Guild, or in the chest in the waterfront shack. Mirwatch serves as a museum of player accomplishments, with dedicated holders for many unique items the player can find. Even from... exclusive questlines. Ironically though, the Creation Club adds so much more to the game that you need to display. Houses can also serve as a crucial money sink, something to work towards and maintain beyond just your ability to left-click on things, which is why the notion of a free house is baffling to me. I mean, it's not free, you paid real money for it, but I also paid real money for Skyrim, and Skyrim still charges me a gold value to buy Free's home. And that's a good thing. More than anything, a house is a good, singular representation of you. What you decide to do with that house is a reflection of how you live. I really hope that we see free prop placement in Elder Scrolls 6 and that homes are embraced as the end-game progression they deserve to be. Did you know that after a decade they finally fixed the mannequins? I've never seen it personally, but occasionally the mannequins in people's homes would come to life because they're just NPCs that are frozen in place. To some people, this bug is such an encapsulation of Skyrim that they actually modded the game to undo that part of the patch. It is weird because they only fixed five issues with the base game, but perhaps it's a sign that Bethesda is actually taking my advice and having an employee comb through the game's bugs. I just wish that I got this video out sooner so I could take credit for that. It's crazy to think that December 4th of 2012 would be the last time Bethesda would make anything actually new for a mainline Elder Scrolls game. All of the DLC would eventually be boxed into the Legendary Edition and then released to the 8th console generation via the Special Edition and the 9th console generation via the Anniversary Edition. There would be an MMO in Elder Scrolls Online and a mobile game in Elder Scrolls Blades and an online card game in Legends and a tabletop war game. Elder Scrolls 6 would be announced at E3 2018. 2018. It was just a marketing ploy to make sure people were aware that Bethesda hadn't abandoned the property. As silly as that sounds. Given people said only three months after both the Morrowind and Oblivion video that I must have given up on covering the next game due to taking too long, I understand that particular pain. Patch 1.9 would be the last major patch Skyrim would receive. Once Bethesda was no longer making content, they did a whole host of bug fixing before dropping the patch in March of 2013. 
That's not to say the patches released as part of the special or anniversary editions did nothing, but future patches would not as extensively repair many of the issues that Skyrim's initial patches did, leaving the game in the current state it's in. Bethesda would throw in legendary skills and difficulty months after Dragonborn, but it's clear that it was time the whole studio moved on to Fallout 4. Dragonborn's main idea as an expansion bothered a few people, who saw the expansion as overly pandering to Morrowind fans. I mean, why are we revisiting an area already explored in Blood Moon less than a decade prior? But heavily changed to further include more references to the original Morrowind. Personally, I sentence anyone who thinks this way to 20 hours of playing the Morrowind expansion for ESO to learn what pandering truly means. Dragonborn handles the premise of revisiting Solstheim as tastefully as it can without coming off as overly nostalgic nor tonally disengaged. Remember that Morrowind was more recent to Skyrim than Skyrim is to us today. The window of nostalgia also tends to trail around 15 years in the past, as that is the amount of time between someone doing something in their youth and becoming an adult with expendable income. Dragonborn begins with the player making the trip out to Solstheim, although your decision to do this will either be the result of one of two things. Either a radiant quest has pointed at a location on the island, which is always annoying, or you have completed the dungeon Ustengrav as part of the main quest and drawn the attention of a trio of cultists accusing you of being a deceiver. They are carrying orders with extremely specific instructions that we can reverse engineer to arrive on Solstheim, which in a smarter story would be used as a trap, but here it just seems to be outright incompetence, as per usual. I mean, let's compare this with the Dark Brotherhood assassin premise of Tribunal. After level 6, in versions of the game that are sane, you get attacked in your sleep by an assassin from the Dark Brotherhood. They don't have a note or orders on them, you can only report the assassination attempt to a regular guard, which points you towards a guard captain in Ebonheart that can further point you towards the Dark Brotherhood hideout in Mournhold. From there, you have to find the Brotherhood, which has a red herring clue to another gang in town, and even when you kill the Brotherhood's leader, you're only given a single letter of the name of the person responsible, H. And there are two powerful men in the city whose names start with that letter. Here, we know there is a cult leader on Solstheim named Mirak that is apparently a dragonborn and wants us dead. If this was Morrowind, it would almost certainly be a trap designed to lure us here, but in Skyrim it just comes off as people being stupid again as per usual. The ship captain that handles transport between Windhelm and Ravenrock says that he did transport the cultists, but that he doesn't actually remember the trip. After an easy persuasion check, he can be convinced to take us to the island and then forever act as a fairy. We're greeted at the docks by Second Counselor Adril Arano. Already I'm having issues with this. Raven Rock is sovereign territory of House Redoran. This is Morrowind, not Skyrim. That is such a weird thing to state right out the gate, as though Arano is aware that we are playing a game called Skyrim and locked within Skyrim's borders and weren't actually mainlanders who had simply traveled to Windhelm to charter what is apparently the only ship to consistently go to Ravenrock. It is also weird that Arano is the second counselor. He works under Councilman Morvane, a member of the Redoran Council, which means that Arano should be a housefather. So, to catch up since the last time we were here, Ravenrock was a colony established over the course of the Blood Moon expansion, thanks in part to the player character. Since then, the Ebony Mine has dried up, and the island was ceded by the High King of Skyrim to Morrowind following the Red Year, to serve as a place of refuge. What Arano badly establishes is that we're actually in a different country. Morrowind is independent of the Empire, yet for some reason Great House Redoran has deemed the island to be of strategic insignificance. The only reason I can imagine that House Redoran would not look at an island close to a free and independent Skyrim as valuable is that they have the majority of their forces garrisoned near Black Marsh and are of the opinion that Skyrim currently poses no threat to their nation. My question is, why is everywhere we go in this game in the worst state it's ever been in? Vardenfell was considered a backwater, and it had its terrible areas to live in, but there were places you could live a fairly normal life if you wanted to. Cyrodiil, outside of the ongoing invasion from Hell, also was full of great places you might want to live. Skyrim is so bleak by comparison, the only good place to live is solitude, and that's if you have the money for it. Raven Rock is just as depressing a town, showcasing Bethesda's new fetish for the post-apocalypse. Everything so far is pointing us towards the Earth Stone being tied to these cultists. I know where that is. It's northwest of town. You pass it whenever you go looking for a ship that crashed on shore. 
only it's looking kind of different now. Like there's some serious elevation. Wait, it's not actually here. That's because the Earth Stone has somehow migrated down south to the peninsula forming the western shore of the bay. Now, it's honestly no secret that Dragonborn took some creative liberties with the island. I don't even think that's necessarily a bad thing. There's no need to artificially shackle the developers down with the restriction that the island has to match its Blood Moon appearance one to one. But Solstheim's standing stones were a fixture of its main quest. The Earth Stone grew legs and moved south in order to be closer to town because the people here in town are all chanting mantras and working on a project to build up a little shrine around it. It has to be scenic, and it's much more scenic here than its old spot. Obviously, something is up, and when we touch the stone, we black out to find ourselves having contributed to the project. I am usually alarmed when I black out working on something, and that's when a Morrowind original character shows up. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, alphas and omegas, sigmas and ligmas, give it up for... Neloth? Seriously? The cranky old guy at Sadrath Mora who had that lotion that drained personality? Why is he even here? Not only is this house redder in territory, but he has a standing stone closer to his house with exactly the same thing going on. Did he really need to visit in person to confirm that weird stuff is also happening here? We have to talk about his voice. Excellent. I'll just make a copy for myself. It's far too dangerous to carry the real book around. Of course you can handle yourself, of course you can. Of course. Now, take this for your efforts, and we'll call the matter closed. Oh, have you? Well, let me just extract those memories, and I'll see if you found anything useful. I promise that any unrelated memories I run across will be kept in the strictest of confidences. Here. You deserve a bit of a reward for your efforts. That was a lengthy trip for you, I'm sure. There are too many coincidences. There must be someone behind all of my recent troubles. Yeah, not a fan. I am generally not a fan of the direction they took the Dunmer voices, but Neloth stands out. Likely because they instructed Dwight Schultz to speak slightly differently to other Dunmer accents to sell that he was a member of House Telvanni. Now believe me, I fully understand why they wouldn't want their voice actors to do the gravelly ash voice from Morrowind. But this is the second time Bethesda has showcased a grittier voice, only to pull back and have it end up being something goofy instead. Brave news indeed. Perhaps my axe can be of use. His mother's been holding him back, protecting him. You'll go to Nonwil Cavern with him. It's coming loose. I can feel it. You fool. Why should I share the treasure with anyone? You did it. You killed it. Now cut me down before anything else shows up. Yes, the claw. I know how it works. The claw, the markings, the door in the hall of stories. I know how they all fit together. A book? I'd hardly call a 26-volume epic simply a book. Surely you've heard of the rise and fall of St. Jim the Eradicator, hero of Morrowind and savior of the Dunmer. You are too young to remember the Nerevarim. He defeated Dagoth Ur and saved us all from the Blight. And when it's the, the homeland of the Dunmer. Save... The lesser races call us Dark Elves. The world... Moreover, if the logic is that Dunmer outside Vardenfell don't have the voice because they don't experience Ashfall, what's the excuse on Solstheim? In case you haven't noticed, the lower half of the island has been covered in so much ash that literal ash creatures are starting to rise and attack the settlement. Plus, even Dunmer that lived outside of the Ashlands had the voice, a constraint of time perhaps, but I'm tired of hearing this lazy excuse. Although that said, we never actually see the ash replenish, just like we don't see rainstorms in Skyrim. Plus, it doesn't really answer the question of why. Remember, these people are cultural Daedra worshippers. Their good gods include Boethia and Mephala. They are literally called Dark Elves, and they used to keep slaves. So yeah, I guess giving them British accents makes sense. I just hope Bethesda gets a dedicated language guy to come in and establish consistent accents for the characters because some of the Dunmer voice actors I cannot stand. I eventually switched the voice acting to the Japanese dub just so I didn't have to listen to them anymore. When we tell Neloth that we're looking for a guy named Mirak, who the cultists named when they attacked us, 
Neleth quickly recalls that Mirak has... Mirak's been dead for thousands of years. Yeah, starting to think we might need to have a meeting about the definition of words like dead and thousands of years. Not only is Neloth an old elf familiar with the various forms of immortality, he knew Divith Fear, who was over 4,000 years old. I just think in this setting, people would play by the rule that if you cannot find a corpse, they are not dead. He also says there is... But there are ruins of an ancient temple of Mirax toward the center of the island. There's... what? Yeah, when I said Dragonborn was taking creative liberties, I was not kidding. Now in Blood Moon, the best way to get around was to follow the river that ran south from Lake Fjaldin. If you went upriver, you'd get to many different locations. But everything has changed. Thirsk Mead Hall has migrated to the south of the lake instead of to its east. The Beast Stone, which lay between Thirsk and the Skull Village, is now west of the Mead Hall, completely changing which side of the lake it was on. And now there's a big temple here. In Blood Moon, this was the forest where we and the other Skull Hunters went searching for a spirit bear before getting ambushed by werewolves. Apparently, there was actually a giant temple here all along, and we were just too stupid to notice it. Now, there were two main events on the island that could change it geographically. The Mortreg Glacier, which collapsed at the end of the Blood Moon, and the eruption of Red Mountain. The glacier was localized entirely on the island's northwestern shore, and there are mountains between it and the temple. The eruption of Red Mountain, if anything, should have buried more in Ashfall than it uncovered during the eruption. You would think if the temple was all new construction, Neloth would have mentioned how it recently started getting rebuilt. He said it was ancient. But no, not only is there a temple, but it's even undergoing new construction from yet more people enthralled in service. All except for Freya, a member of the Skull Village, who attributes her immunity to an amulet that was fashioned by her father, the village shaman. Sure. At first, Freya potentially comes off as another serana style follower for the expansion, but she's not. It's weird that they didn't take a second stab at that idea, but would in Fallout 4. It would not have even been hard, spoilers, but the main quest of Dragonborn is really short. The strangest part of the temple are the dragon corpses on display, for reasons that have to do with Mirak. These dragons have to be ones he slew thousands of years ago, but left scattered around his temple. It has to be that way, because Mirek is the only other Dragonborn, and he hasn't been here in thousands of years. I mean, that raises a question about how his cultists are able to share his power to bend wills, but, you know, we're not there in the plot yet. I don't really remember much about the temple's interior other than it was a really, really long Draugr crypt. Blood Moon had Draugr crypts. In fact, Blood Moon was where Draugr entered the series. We even met a friendly Draugr lord named Aeslip who turned himself into this form so he could eternally protect the Skull from some Frost Atronax. I don't think it's true, but it's hard not to make a joke that part of the reason Dragonborn revisits Solstheim is just so that they can milk every drop out of those Draugr Crypt assets. It is a missed opportunity not doing the Blood Moon style Draugr and dungeons. Hell, even the Dwemer ruins on the island are done in the style of Skyrim's Dwemer rather than Morrowind's. There is only one new dungeon style in this expansion. I mean, you know, Bethesda was like an indie team at the time. Skyrim hadn't really taken off as a game yet in terms of popularity or sales. It wouldn't become popular until, you know, PewDiePie played it. It's unfair to compare Dragonborn to the Shivering Isles, which created an entirely alien world complete with two new dungeon types and dozens of new enemies, or to Blood Moon that had to create entirely new assets for Solstheim in addition to the new dungeon types. Alright, let's see this new dungeon type. Actually, I broke the sequence a bit because I had ended up running into one before the main quest the expansion brings you here. The premise is that at the end of some dungeons in Dragonborn are black books, which themselves transport you into dungeons within Apocrypha, the realm of Hermaeus Mora. The books are unique because you can read them anywhere, as long as you're on Solstheim, and when you die, instead of suffering a game over, you're just spit back out into the world. I'm actually surprised Fallout 4 didn't try something like this with the comic books, playing out a prefabricated story with the end reward being the perk. Well, maybe they did, but I never saw it. That's probably because the idea turned out really poorly here. Thing is, I think doing this thing where you play out the events of a written story has a lot of potential. These books could be micro dungeons with preset enemies and equipment to use, or a little story being told out. However, I think Bethesda was apprehensive about an idea like that due to the fact that black books are some of the worst dungeons they have ever created. 
Apocrypha is not popularly hated, probably because aesthetically they stand out compared to the tedium that is running remixes of the same Draugr crypts, caves, and Dwemer ruins we got tired of before even starting the expansion. It is a creepy plane of oblivion full of free literature and monsters. Problem 1. There are exactly two types of enemies in Apocrypha, Seekers and Lurkers. Lurkers are reskinned giants that can spew tentacles from their mouth. Seekers, on the other hand, they are floating magic enemies that can absorb health, are immune to paralysis and resistant to shock, randomly turn invisible, and summon weaker clones of themselves. I mean, I guess they're unique. I want you to bear in mind that a standard banded dungeon would have enemies that use one and two-handed weapons as well as bows and magic. That is, four enemy types, in what is widely considered to be a generic dungeon style. The lack of enemy variety, combined with how annoying these enemies are to fight in general, meant that by the end I was usually just running past Seekers and rushing through the dungeons. I find it crazy that people dog on Oblivion Gates but are fine with Apocrypha. The only real difference is that there are less black books, but frankly nobody forced you to run all of those Oblivion Gates either. Like the Deadlands, the end result of the tedium is just running past the enemies and rushing to the end so that you can leave. Except the Deadlands actually had enemy variety? In lieu of that, the Black Books instead try to be more creative with their level designs, but a lot of this just left me confused as to why they even bothered. For example, in one room, you pull a lever, which opens a door, inside of which is another lever that opens another door across the room, inside of which is a lever that opens another door in the center of the room, inside of which is a lever that finally unfurls a staircase and allows you to leave. It's not even like a new enemy is added to the mix every time a lever is pulled. It really is just busy work to run around the room pulling these levers. The only reason to endure Apocrypha, once the luster of its unique aesthetic expires in the middle of the first book, are some marginal perks and powers provided for completing the realms. Each book offers three to choose from, although for the most part every book has one power that is superior to the other two. One book, for instance, doubles the number of skill points you get from reading skill books, meaning that you can jump from skill level 90 to 100 just from reading those skill books that I spent the entire game having companions pick up for me. Another book gives you the power to summon a Dramora merchant if you want to sell a couple thousand gold worth of loot out in the field. Another book makes every spell in the game cost 10% less and makes enchantments 10% stronger. You can also make it so spells cost zero magicka for 30 seconds. The general idea is that if you pursue the knowledge within the Black Books that you are gradually giving yourself over to Hermaeus Mora. However, it is weird that there are seven of these things on Solstheim, yet the player could not find any of them during Blood Moon. Apparently, our adventures there led to island-wide excavation efforts to unveil just enough of ruins to make it nice and easy for the Dragonborn to stumble over these things. Speaking of though, one of the Black Books is contained in Kolbjorn Barrow, which is notable as the premise of this dungeon is that the player invests into an excavation project. It is sad that it took him this long to do a dungeon like this, given that in terms of scripting it's basically just the stronghold quest from Morrowind. You give the guy money, he manages the project off screen to advance the excavation, and then you check in to see that all the miners got killed by Draugr. As you descend, you uncover artifacts of a dragon priest named Azadal, including water walking boots, a ring that turns your reanimations into walking bombs, gauntlets that cause your wards to absorb more magicka, a ring that unlocks two new spells when you wear it, armor that has a chance to paralyze attackers, a helmet that increases the range you can summon and cast runes, and his mask which increases fire spell damage by 25%. While not all terribly useful, it shows far more mechanical creativity than the average piece of gear Skyrim throws at the player. I just can't wait until Elder Scrolls 6 when they forget everything they learned with Dragonborn and give us boots that increase fire resistance by 10% again. Because I recall saying the same exact thing about loot in Blood Moon and the Shivering Isles being far more interesting than the loot in the actual mainline games they were attached to or would be followed by. I guess this is an example of where Bethesda's policy of just starting over with each Elder Scrolls game really starts to break down. We tend to, each time, start over and we want to find weapon types with this game that really yield gameplay it was i mean when we do an elder scrolls we we like to start over we have a brand new engine we've written for the game all new graphics all new gameplay however not everyone seems to agree with this idea of starting over almost like it's marketing speak like they're saying this new game isn't gonna be like the old ones 
Skyrim is sort of this culmination of over a decade's worth of making open world RPGs and we're trying to take everything that we've learned and focus it onto this one game. Uh, Radiant Story is a system that, or actually it's a name for a system of designing content that we use at Bethesda Softworks and created for uh, the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. And it's kind of an evolution of things that we've been working on over the last few projects and we hope to continue to develop it as time goes on. Apocrypha sucks regardless. It was funny going through the two-week process and multiple runs of the same Draugr Crypt just to play a lame Apocrypha dungeon. It's a cool idea and great aesthetic, but it's everything wrong with Bethesda dungeons in terms of mechanics. Which is probably why people remember it well, because you can mod the mechanics, but few people choose to mod aesthetics. There is another thing I want to talk about with Hermaeus Mora in this expansion, and it's the worst part of Wrath of the Lich King. See, it's kind of suspicious that Bethesda really got into wanting to make Nordic areas when during pre-production Blizzard was experiencing the absolute peak player count with World of Warcraft. This was during the Wrath expansion, taking place in Northrend with a heavy emphasis on northern cultures, ancient high-tech civilizations, and necromancy. <laughs> Skyrim loves all of those things. But part of Wrath was the influence of a Lovecraftian being that was secretly maybe behind it all. Well, lo and behold, Dragonborn adds exactly that to the game, down to the detail that spending too much time in the area allows these beings to influence you. Oblivion and Early WoW was certainly a coincidence, the timeline just doesn't add up on that one, but Wrath is definitely a lot more suspicious. So we turn up to Apocrypha at the bottom of Mirak's temple. Mirak's given a speech to uh, four seekers and a dragon. I mean, I guess that's a cult following. He drops us after a second of sparks, which I'm way stronger than that. I'm a literal vampire lord. I'm not dropping to my knees from that. You could have just had him use a paralysis spell given that he is a dragon priest. Well, he's actually the first dragonborn. Not sure how literal that is, but give it time. So maybe he could use the ice form shot instead. Although I guess I would then nitpick that his shouts went off cooldown too quickly. Dragonborn is the first DLC to mandate some level of main quest progression to start. So you can't roll up on Mirak as somebody who hasn't slain their first dragon back in Whiterun. Mirak will comment on your main quest progression at this point, although what he's actually commenting on is just the raw number of dragons you have slain and if you have slain Alduin. <sighs> You are Dragonborn. I can feel it. And yet... So you have slain Alduin. Well done. I could have slain him myself back when I walked the earth. But I chose a different path. Man, even in the DLC, Alduin cannot catch a break. Although I find myself skeptical. Dragonrind was essential to beating Alduin, the acquisition of which required us finding and reading a specific Elder Scroll atop the throat of the world, which itself required the Clear Skies Shout, although Mirak could just fly to the throat in more ways than one. Now, given most of the Skyrim main quest is just information acquisition, and we are literally sitting in Apocrypha, I guess there's a chance Mirak might have been able to learn enough. Or maybe Mirak is just trying to communicate the fact that he, like us, is Dragonborn. There's a story among the Skull which claims that Mirak dueled another dragon priest named the Guardian and was defeated, which might imply he's not as strong as he claims, although this story also says the duel was so destructive it literally tore Solstheim off of the mainland, Skyrim. I don't buy it. Plus, despite the claim that Valak the Guardian is waiting for Mirak to return in order to protect the Skull, Valak does nothing when the Skull people are mentally enslaved by Mirak. He lays out the basics. He's having his temple rebuilt so he can leave Apocrypha and continue ruling over Solstheim. Given that he left Tamriel in the First Era, well, you know what I'm gonna ask. I don't fully buy the he's a divine champion of Herman Mora bit because the plot of the story is how Hermaeus Mora wants Mirak killed. Or, well, replaced. I think Bethesda just has a different definition of what a year is. Mirak flies off and the Seekers kill us, kicking us out of the book. It is cool that we're sent back the same way it can happen mechanically, but that is basically a mercy point that I'm giving away. Freya insists we return to her father, who is the Shaman of the Skull. Storn is maintaining a barrier around the village to protect those still here from Mirak. 
or I would assume his cultists, the story never actually establishes how his cult even works. Like, Mirak should be the only one that has the mind control power. Storing concludes that we and Mirak must be connected since we're both dragonborn. Are you dragonborn? Ah, uh, yes, even here, at the edge of the world, we are still crushed under the yoke of prophecy. Although this is just one guy's interpretation, it would have been better if the entirety of the Dragonborn DLC was devoid of the idea that we're somehow meant to be here for a purpose. Here's an idea. We came to Solstheim solely because Mirak lured us here as a trap. The Skull actually have zero knowledge about the Dragonborn, having been geographically isolated from the rest of the Nords. Or perhaps they've lost the knowledge due to oral tradition, which would fit in well with the themes of Apocrypha. Mirak's interest in us is solely because we are a dragonborn and thus have souls he needs to acquire more power. We are no different to him than any of the dragons he keeps around as health potions. Thereby, it draws that whole prophecy and song of the dragonborn into question. The prophecy of the dragonborn pitches us as the last dragonborn, when the world eater Alduin awakes because of all that prophesized shit that happened in the previous games. But the whole time there was another dragonborn that could have taken care of Alduin. So were we really necessary, or was that song on the main menu wrong about us? Instead, this is just another box to check off on the list of being the LDB. It's implied that Mirak became a dragon priest after learning that he was dragonborn. This is generally contrary to the story that the dragonborn were created to be rebels under the dragon cult, although it makes sense given his character. Mirak is a mage who is stuck in the constant pursuit of power. While we were morons doing boring dungeons, Mirak was studying shouts straight at the source. But then he learned a shout at Saren's watch that changed his course. Storn somehow correctly guesses that we need to use this mystery shout on the windstone to break Mirak's hold over his people. Saren's watch is a dragon lair which, flat out, did not exist in Blood Moon. In fact, the northern part of the island has actually seen the most straight up geographical changes. Solstheim has been converted stylistically into Skyrim, making more use out of verticality and blocky rock and ice pieces rather than the mostly simple plains of the Blood Moon era. Honestly, Morrowind's main constraint was water. The lake and rivers of Solstheim had to be at sea level, so maybe the idea was to revisit the island now that Skyrim figured out how to do vertical water flows. The problem is that, well, the island has been converted stylistically into Skyrim, including the warts. Solstheim was meant to be an island of weirdos. Nobody living here was congruent with their cultures on the mainland. Thankfully, they didn't take a chainsaw to the Skull culture, but they have standardized everything else. Now there are dragon priests, dragon layers, Nordic crypts, and everyone on the island dresses like they do in Skyrim. They ported over this stall room in Nordic mail, but what about the wolf and bear armor? I actually noticed there aren't very many wolves or bears on Solstheim anymore. That was the main novelty of the DLC back in Morrowind. Morrowind had so many exotic things that an expansion with a forest and some wolves was actually the weird part of that game. Well, they turned the southern half of the island into a Morrowind theme park, and they converted a lot of the open space in the north into rocky mountains. Damn, we forgot to make space for all the animals! This, as always, is that problem with scale. The more space that has to be dedicated to building blocks and dungeon entrances is less world space overall. You can pretty quickly see what I mean if you tried to recreate Dragonborn in the Morrowind construction set. Blood Moon was not a big expansion compared to Morrowind, which itself, even as only part of the province, was not very big. Yet we have increased the verticality of the game world without increasing the surface area. So now Solstheim feels like everybody is jam-packed onto the peak of an underwater mountain sticking out from the ocean instead of what is actually supposed to be a fairly sizable island. Now when I say world scale, I'm referring to the fact that if you overlap each game's world space onto a map, that they all generally line up to be the correct size and dimensions to each other. In other words, if you could force Morrowind's world space to load into Skyrim, it should neatly replace the dummy area you can see off the coast of Solstheim. I mention that as in the post-Skyrim but pre-Dragonborn days, people noticed that Bethesda had spaced out the area for Morrowind, despite the fact that you can't really see it from the border. The theory was that this was Bethesda making their games compatible as possible with renewal and expansion projects. These being mods like Skywind or Skyblivion, adding the worlds of the previous games into Skyrim. The other explanation could just as easily be that since it's the same engine, they've simply been using the same technique of translating the drawn map into playable space, which would naturally result in the same scale. However, and I stand by this, Elder Scrolls 6 needs to increase the world scale, and Elder Scrolls fans need to not complain if and when it bothers them. 
These new techniques of creating interesting geographical spaces are having the knock-on effect of reducing the actual player space. It really is Skyrimified. It looks cooler, but it's vacuous. Hmm. Well, it's nice to look at, but it feels like it has no substance, you know? I've tinkered with this in the construction set before. It's not so much difficult as it is simply a greater quantity of work to take the existing map and increase the scale. Well, I know one company that has had over a decade of growth and was recently purchased. All it takes is a decision in pre-production to double the scale. The level designers will grumble, but as long as their department has expanded, they can take on the challenge. Back at the dragon lair that never existed, we slay a dragon and learn the word that changed Mirak's course. You would think that Mirak would have had this word wall destroyed. Technically, Mirak has a chance of showing up to any soul absorption during the quest line and stealing a dragon soul from the player. That's a fun little bit of antagonism, but he doesn't actually show up to this one if you don't have any spare souls, because the player needs a dragon soul to unlock the first word of the shout, Bend Will. The first word translates to Earth, apparently allowing us to bend stones to our will. That's the power that made Mirak rebel against the dragons? Well, we use it on the Windstone, which wakes the villagers up and releases a lurker that has to be put down to restore the peace. Storm can tell the Skull people are freed and tasks us on our next step to cleanse all of the stones. This is a recreation of the Skull Test of Loyalty quest, where in Blood Moon we had to complete a Skull Rite of Passage to ingratiate ourselves into their society. At each stone, we would complete a ritual based on a Skull story of Avar Stonesinger, learning more about their culture while also getting an opportunity to explore the island of Solstheim. So, I should love its recreation, right? Follow the quest markers, shout at the stone, kill the lurker that comes out, and move on. Literally all you had to do was adapt and modernize the quest. What a great opportunity to prove us Moro boomers wrong by showcasing how much better questing in Skyrim is compared to Morrowind. And instead you replaced it with this. Busy work. In Blood Moon, the Ritual of Trees had us find a stolen seed that had been claimed by our Reekling, using the seed to acquire a harem of Spriggans. Interestingly, if you target the Reekling first and take the seed, the Spriggans will stop trying to kill you. Then we head to a circle of stones and plant the seeds, which over time will grow into a tree. Oh, and there's a story of how Avar accomplished that very same task, although the story refers to the Reekling as a Falmer. Meanwhile, in Dragonborn, we run up to the stone, shout at it, kill the lurker, and move on. Some nerd is going to point out that you can't cleanse the tree stone because that's what's in the middle of the Temple of Mirak, but that's the trick. You can't tell, because the special element of each stone having its own ritual is replaced with a standardized routine. This might as well be the tree stone, it's the same process as all the others. They have thrown in a consolation prize, that being that each stone has a power you can use once. Yeah, our reward is Oblivion's sloppy seconds. The beast stone even allows you to summon a werebear, which... You guys do remember how the Skull felt about lycanthropes, right? Even in human form, they would refuse to associate with the player if we were suffering from the disease. But I guess they've become more progressive about the idea, just like how the Dunmer stopped practicing slavery. It's not like the last major threat they faced 200 years ago was an invasion of werewolves, a pack of witches still living on the island to this day. You can cleanse the stones while going about your business, as our other lead is to investigate the Black Book we found, which Storm figures Master Neloth living at Talmithrin would be the most knowledgeable about the subject. Now, the player is likely to have already met Neloth, although I guess you could have immediately beelined for the Skull Village on the other side of the island and have Storm send you to the temple. It's a possibility, I guess. Master Neloth is a rogue Telvanni who has somehow gotten away with founding a settlement on the island despite it being the sovereign territory of Great House Redoran. He moved here prior to the Red Year, at some point in the 11 years between the end of Morrowind and the eruption. That's quite the coincidence. He just left Sadrath Mora apropos of nothing, decided to grow a mushroom tower on Skyrim owned Solstheim, which had recently gained empire interest due to the establishment of a successful ebony mine on the island, and nobody had an issue with that. And then when the Red Year happened and Solstheim was ceded to Morrowind by Skyrim, I guess Neloth was technically grandfathered in, even though he was undoubtedly illegally there before, and it wasn't even his great house that took control of the island. What, did he have inside knowledge that those mages in Vivek were about to lose control of the Ministry of Truth? When I was in high school, someone called a bomb threat, so they ushered us all into the gym. They didn't take our bags, by the way, so if there was actually a bomb instead of a couple classrooms, it would have just killed everybody. 
Anyways, one of our friends didn't go to school that day, so of course in addition to joking about the fact that the school's incompetence may well get us all killed, we also joked about him being the one to call in the bomb threat. That's kind of my way of saying that Neloth is suspicious without mentioning 9-11. Neloth says that he's never even been to mainland Morrowind, which I don't believe. He decided to move to Solstheim, a place even the people of Vardenfell consider to be a backwater. House Telvani has its properties on Vardenfell. I've never been to the mainland myself. That is nonsense. In the original pre-production map for Morrowind, there was to be an island about the size of Solstheim with a city labeled as Port Telvanis that was meant to be the seat of Grey House Telvanni. The Telvanni we meet in Vardenfell are actually the weirdos of the faction because of the fact that they could have lived anywhere and decided to live in a volcanic wasteland. In fact, this is when the game was going to be a mix of procedural generation and handcrafting. There was originally going to be more handcrafted content at Port Telvani than the entire city of Vivek. However, the near death of Bethesda in the 90s meant that this full provincial map never came to be, but the lore generally still stands. It's so weird how much thought Bethesda both has and hasn't put into mainland Morrowind. You would think Neloth, being an enterprising wizard, would have set up shop on the mainland after the Red Year. Guess which of the original game's artifacts he has a line to acknowledge. Have you? The actual Arkema Infinium, that's it. I've searched for it myself for many years without success. Well then, you should know better than anyone that Hermaeus Mora is not to be trifled with. Did you know he once wielded Merun's razor? In fact, the razor was a significant advantage he had held and he had even gone to war with Archmagister Gothrin using it, because he, you know, had an army. Master Neloth is a member of the Telvanni Council, after all. He holds the same station in Dunmer society as Councilman Morvain in Ravenrock. Yet Telmithrin is a settlement of five people, with zero guards. In fact, Neloth is having difficulty with ash spawn, creatures that are rising out of the ash and attacking his settlement. Yet never once does he consider acquiring some retainers or commissioning guards for his settlement. It's obvious what they are trying to capture with Neloth is a tone. He is a whimsical wizard that isn't taking anything that happens particularly seriously. He has been looking into this whole Mirak business, but the worst case scenario is that he ends up having to move again. We can fix all of this in one swoop. Master Neloth is now Master Arion. Arion was our sponsor in House Telvanni, working as our boss while using us to manipulate the pieces of the board to reform Telvanni. He tried to bring Divithfir back into the fold, he successfully returned Master Demnavani to the council, and he installed us on the council as well. Arion was a progressive who saw the changing face of Morrowind and was adapting. He was also fascinated by Imperial culture, which is a great justification to send him to Solstheim. It's a growing hub of Imperial business, land is cheap, he has connections with somebody at the East Empire Company, he's willing to expand Telvani territory, he can hire Imperial veterans of the Great War, and he probably foresaw the Red Year due to being involved with the Nereverim. Neloth was just some old guy at Sagerith Mora that liked kidnapping veteran daughters and employing criminals. It's not like you have to change much either. Neloth's past is not important to the story or even really addressed in detail. I understand and appreciate not roping Divith Fear into the role. Drotha and Therana both had good reasons not to appear and Gothrin died? I mean, technically they all died. So I guess the Mage's Guild quest to kill all the Telvanni counselors is officially not canon. Not that I'm particularly teary-eyed about that. Neloth tells us that he also has a black book in his possession, which he has been apparently using to find more. I think that's awkwardly trying to suggest that Neloth will give you quests to locate all the books, because otherwise the implication is that black books are relatively common, for Neloth to have already found two. It would make it weird that this would be the first we've ever heard of them, although I appreciate that Bethesda is introducing new artifacts instead of retconning old ones like with Ariel's bow, we need a particular book to find what we need to beat Mirak, and Neloth knows that his is not it. But he thinks he knows where the book Mirak had is, in... Chardak, the city of a hundred towers. In its day, it was the largest of the great Dwemer archives, and perhaps the most advanced. Really? In the old stories, when the Nords came to conquer it, it said the Dwemer submerged the entire city beneath the sea until the invaders gave up. So, bitch. I have my that. doubts. But the city was a marvel of Dwemer engineering. Now reduced to this. Amazing to think they built this so long ago. Still, it survives. 
Okay, interesting. I wonder where that is. Well, hell, you think I might have remembered that one. All right, so what the hell? Well, once we're inside the city, it's revealed to be an elaborate water puzzle. I think what happened is that a designer created this dungeon, which meant that the ruin had to be off the coast, so then there had to be an explanation for why it straight up didn't exist in Blood Moon. Now, the excuse they give is adequate for where the ruin went, but not why the ruin re-emerged from the ocean. Neloth hypothesizes that one of the potential explanations has to do with Red Mountain, that the city sank during the sun's death and that the city re-emerged after the Red Year. I think this is one of the very valid reasons why Solstheim was a bad idea. Revisiting areas is creatively limiting, and there's still so much of Tamriel that has yet to be truly represented in an Elder Scrolls game. Going back to an area we've already seen means you have to account for the differences, and while the Red Year is acceptable for explaining why there's so much ash on the island and the critters that live in the ash, it does not mean that you can just have new ruins appear out in the middle of nowhere. Why not, for instance, have the ruin be located in the ocean, south of Telmethrin? Neloth can explain that the Dwemer there were masters of alteration magic and built a great citadel in the ocean where the Nords and Chimer had difficulty reaching them. The city could also sink and the Dwemer used water breathing to live under the surface of the ocean. Then Neloth applies water walking to us and has us head out to the ruin with him across the water's surface. When we arrive, there are pirates living in the ruin, and when the dragon attacks after we leave, it could be one of those serpentine dragons using the water diving animations from Dawnguard. It's just weird to claim that a ruin was there all along, we just didn't look hard enough, and also that it's one of the greatest cities of the Dwemer, and one of the main places where they built automatons used in the Dwemer army. The char deck itself is... fine. The book is located in the first room, but we have to restore the power to unlock the case it's in. The problem is that most of the ruins are flooded, and to activate them, we need to use these Dwemer cubes. Neloth has only one, and we need to find more, so we have to keep juggling with the water level. The last cube is somewhere in here. I hope it won't require more swimming around in this filth. <laughs> you should leave slogging around in the muck to us youngsters. Freya has lines, but only for this dungeon. Granted, I hate to break this to you, but we're already at five out of the seven quests in this chain. Dragonborn is a surprisingly short expansion, which really makes you wonder. The Shivering Isles had 17 parts to its main quest. Blood Moon had 12 parts to its main quest. But its third act had two alternate sides depending on if you sided with the Skull or became a werewolf. And that is not counting the 15-part East Empire Company questline, which also had two alternate sides depending on if you sided with Falco or Carnius. Even Dawnguard was longer, with 12 quests in its main questline and, you guessed it, two opposing sides. You would think that maybe the explanation is that more focus was spent on side quest content and there are a lot more side quests than the average expansion, but a lot of these are just your normal Skyrim filler material. Now I won't say that every Dragonborn quest is boring, but I will say that enough are to really sour the expansion. But why is Dragonborn so mediocre? Well have you heard about Fallout 4? Between Oblivion and Fallout 4, Bethesda was considered an untouchable golden child. There were absolutely people out there talking about the issues Bethesda games have, but it's really hard to communicate in the modern era of bug-infamous Bethesda just how difficult a veil this was to pierce. It wasn't until after Fallout 4 came out that people started to wake up to this stuff. It wasn't that it was retroactively bad, it's that enough people began to discuss its problems. Dragonborn's mediocre nature is a reflection of complacency. They can get away with reusing assets and phoning in quests if just enough content is new and interesting to keep the hardcore fans engaged. Apocrypha looks cool. Remember Morrowind? Plus, the DLC came in at only $20 while the Shivering Isles was $30. It's harder to justify assigning designers to a project that's going to make less money. Better to get your obligatory second expansion done with and move the entire team on to Fallout 4. If you consider Dragonborn to be a more experimental phase where the designers are testing ideas for Fallout 4, it starts to make more sense. Dragonborn's question appears to be, what does it take to make your usual boring Skyrim dungeon seem more interesting? Is it context? Is it a unique premise? Is it in the rewards? The answer, and indeed the winner, appears to be in the mechanics. Oh good, be sure to say hello to Hermes Mora for me if you see I will admit that I do enjoy Nelos' blasé attitude. It makes him one of the series' only authentic wizards, as opposed to all those mages running around at the college taking everything so seriously. 
Neloth is old enough to be genre savvy. He knows Daedric adventures as well as what to look out for to stay sane. Even if he does sound like a dweeb. I'm running low on heartstones. If you have any with you, I'll buy one. Yeah, it turns out you can effortlessly switch the voice acting while keeping the interface in English. I really wish I had known that prior to playing. I might have honestly played the entire game in a foreign language. Anyways, Quest 6 of 7 starts with us reading the black book we found, named Epistolary Acumen. Literary Keenness. Awareness of Letters? I think it's just trying to relay the abstraction that the book has something to do with the dragon language. If you are rushing the Dragonborn main quest, then this will be your first run-in with a genuine Apocrypha dungeon and potentially Hermaeus Mora. Now you might recall Mora's Daedric quest as being the one you have to do as part of the main quest. This is actually a common misconception. As long as you don't return to Septimus after finding the Elder Scroll, you don't ever have to meet Hermaeus Mora in Skyrim's main quest. Which leads to another one of those annoying arguments people like to have about the protagonists, similar to the Cock and Sheogorath. Look, do not be surprised when Hermaeus Mora's quest in Skyrim 2 has a playful reference to him keeping a pet dragon around or something like that. That doesn't mean the last dragonborn is busy getting stuffed full of tentacles. We have a conversation with Hermaeus Mora where your options can range from service to your new master to necessary deal making. I think what trips people up is that Herma Mora pitches it as a spiritual glue trap. No matter what we do only ends with us getting deeper into his service since the allure of power is just so tantalizing to us. However, his actual terms are straightforward. He teaches us the second word of bend will, but we'll need to find a third if we ever want to stop Mirak. In exchange for the third word, Herma Mora wants us to acquire the secrets of the skull from Storm Cragstrider. Even at the end of the questline, it is not obvious that we've replaced Mirak as Herma Mora's pet dragonborn, only that that can potentially happen if we continue trying to accrue power from him. That power is said to be irresistible, but that implies one thing about the dragonborn, that they're actually capable of reading. I guess given the creation club, if fucking anything can be said about us is that we can read. The second word of Ben Will allows us to command creatures and NPCs for 30 seconds. Wow, how powerful. Hey, remember when I, as a vampire, forced a moth priest to pledge eternal loyalty to us? There's a reason that I chose the word command. It's because it used to be a normal spell that players could use. And since the third word is dragon, this implies that this is the secret power Mirak had that made him so powerful. Obviously, there are some gameplay concession elements at work here. Remember that Sheogorath made it rain burning dogs, but we couldn't do that and all. It's a pretty big letdown though, because Dragonborn itself shows off this power like it's something we can obtain, but then doesn't even really try to approximate it. There is so much fun you could have with this idea. This should be like quest 6 of an 18 part questline, where we're increasingly put in situations where we're tempted to use Bend Will to resolve conflicts on the island. For instance, maybe Storn refuses to give the knowledge to us because the Skull have decided enough is enough and these Dunmer Outlanders have to go. Ever since people started showing up on the island, things have only gotten worse for the Skull, starting with the Blood Moon and then the Red Year converting the lower half of the island into Ashlands. Now that the dragons and Mirak have returned, Herman Mora's offer should be the final straw for the Skull wanting to go to war. They actually hinted that this was happening during Oblivion if you listen to the rumors. There are only two ways to get the knowledge. Either we help the Skull and Storn gives it to us, or we help the Dunmer and take it from Storn. And now that we've had the chance to meet the residents of the island, we have to make it a choice. Add on all the stuff we already thought we knew about the Nords and Dunmer from mainland Skyrim, and you have the recipe for a pretty juicy conflict that can take ample advantage of our ability to literally influence people's minds. Maybe if we over-rely on Bend Will to accomplish our goals, someone will comment that we didn't really stop Mirak, we just replaced him. As we leave, there is a dragon encounter, with the dragon saying that Mirak has commanded our death. That's actually a clever hint at what Word 3 does, given that everything we've seen about dragons up to this point would imply that they just can't be ordered to go do something. At this point, we need to cleanse all the stones to continue since we're about to start the final quest of the chain, and there wouldn't be a reason for them to still be corrupted afterwards. Hermes Mora. Old Hermamora himself. So he is the source of Mirak's power. Of course. We have many tales of Herma Mora trying to trick us into giving up our secrets to him. 
And now he comes again for what we have long kept from him. Ancient lore, handed down from shaman to shaman since the All-Maker first gave source time to the Skull. How to talk to the wind, how to listen to the earth. These are our secrets. Nothing of power or mastery. We know him as Hermamora, the demon of knowledge. It is in his nature to hoard secrets to himself. Their value to him is of no consequence. The very fact that the Skal have kept knowledge from him has merely increased his desire to have it. What is up with the Skull? Why are they so strange? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. Back in Blood Moon, someone had the idea to make them monotheists. It's obviously clever because it's the inverse of the real world. The village at the edge of civilization are the monotheists, while civilization is full of polytheists. They don't view the individual gods as such, but rather as aspects of either the Allmaker or the Greedy Man. Storn is hesitant, but apparently they have an oral tradition that one day the shaman will have to sacrifice himself to give the secrets of the Skull to Hermamora. There is no point to that story, which means that really he's just making it up. Yeah, despite his commitment, he has immediate regrets. The skull yield up their secrets to me. Father, no, stop! I, uh... I, I won't. I won't. Not for you. We've unlocked the final word of Ben Will and read the original Black Book, Waking Dreams, to return to the area where we first encountered Mirak. You can actually return here sooner as you have the book the entire time and complete this Apocrypha dungeon. It is fairly lengthy, but at the end teaches you a word of the dragon aspect shout, which Mirak showed off when we met him instead of the actual shout that made him powerful, you know, bend will. Two of the words you learn over the course of the main quest, the third is in Blood Skull Barrow at the bottom of the Raven Rock Mine. A black book, one of Mirak's dragon priests, and a unique sword are down there. The Blood Skull Blade shoots an arc of energy, making it fairly unique. It also took me far too long to realize that using the energy is necessary for opening this door puzzle. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to implementing mechanics for puzzles. The puzzle here is to do the correct power attack so your swing goes in the right direction, hitting the line with the arc. Anyways, Dragon Aspect is more of a daily power than an actual shout, but it heavily augments our ability as a Dragonborn. More armor rating, more damage from power attacks, summons an ancient Dragonborn if her health hits 50%, 25% fire and frost resistance for fighting dragons, shorter shout cooldowns, 25% more powerful shouts, and 50% longer shout durations. This shout is really cool and displays far more design competence with dragon shouts than something like, you know, Elemental Fury, which does nothing if the weapon you try to use it on has an enchantment. This is when a serpentine dragon arrives. Bain root Milan, what foul words are these? No Dova would stoop to such vile Taravin. <laughs> He's talking about Dragonrend, by the way. It is very much in line with dragons to take issue with mortal words like Dragonrend, but not with something like Bend Will. It makes you wonder if the dragons we've met up to this point actually knew about this shout. Bend Will doesn't work on Alduin or Parthenax for quest scripting reasons, as well as a handful of other dragons for world map reasons. With Sarotar under our command, he allows us to fly up to the tower where Mirak is posted. Yeah, that's the essential thing we needed the third word of Bend Will for. This is what Storn died for. As far as riding them, I would not expect that. Um, <laughs> I'm not, it, it's not something I, I, I see happening. Um, it's it's kind of not how we're, how we're approaching them, first of all. Well, you could yeah. do that with the uh, DLC, the How to Train yeah, Your maybe, Dragon. Yeah. They're, they're not, a, from everything you've told me about these guys, they're not exactly the friendliest sort. No. So, no. Uh, jumping up on one's back might not get the best results. No. <laughs> um... You asked, and Bethesda answered. You would think, given they got the generic dragon voice actors back, that they would have revisited that whole Odaving thing in the context of now having the power to control and ride any dragon. I let it slide with Dernavir because it seems like riding a dragon that's gradually dissolving back into the soul cairn might be a bad idea. 
I guess we could use Become Ethereal to survive the fall damage, but still. Dragon riding is terrible. It feels like a bad mod implementation. You basically get to ride while the dragon goes on its normal route, and you can give it instructions on which enemies to target and to land. You can also use magic and shouts from dragon back, but not bows. Okay, so funny thing. Remember Reign of Fire, that movie that inspired the design of dragons? It had a video game tie-in, which actually came complete with a campaign for the dragons, with controls for the dragon that would make Skyrim weep. While I'm sure the idea crossed their minds during development of the main game, it's pretty obvious Bethesda was never in a position to implement any kind of dragon writing that was actually, you know, good. Even the modding community hasn't really risen to the occasion to fix it. So Rota, are you so easily swayed? No, not yet. We should greet our guests oh. first. And so the first Dragonborn meets And so the first Dragonborn meets the last Dragonborn at the summit of Apocrypha. Well, I am glad that my last Dragonborn press packet has gotten around. Nobody actually thought we were the last Dragonborn until you said it. Sure, it was in the Book of the Dragonborn conveniently present at several key Skyrim main quest locations, but that's one big commitment to say that we're the last. Ever. Plus, how bad could Hermaeus Mora have been if he was providing you literature written thousands of years after you were forced into captivity? You obviously didn't hear the prophecy of the Dragonborn firsthand, on account of you rejecting Feldir's plan to defeat Alduin. It is a stupid thing to say, and Mirak only said it to give this encounter more importance than it actually has. Making this a meeting at the Alpha and Omega is just to cover up the fact that Mirak as a character has like three dozen lines at most and this expansion only had seven quests. Mirak says he needs our soul to escape Apocrypha. Mirak, as a boss encounter, is unique in the sense that he has four health bars. Every time he approaches death he becomes invulnerable and sacrifices another dragon to replenish his health. This encounter was still just kind of a joke. My character is so supremely overpowered, and honestly, I don't know what to tone down to make it difficult enough to be interesting. Even just being able to summon a Dramora Lord seemed to put Mirak at a heavy disadvantage. They gave him a roster of unique versions of Dragon Shouts with shorter cooldowns, and he's a magic user. I guess it's supposed to be this way. He's a living Dragon Priest with Shouts, and that's literally all he is. His mask just fortifies Magicka, his sword absorbs fatigue. His staff is the most unique. It's a wall spell, but it creates writhing tentacles. That's cool. Hey, why not give Mirak some new spells the player can learn after the fight is over, like an ability that shoots tentacles, or a tentacle rune that reduces movement speed, or a, a tentacle cloak effect? How about adding more poison damage spells? You already added poison room to the game in this DLC. Or maybe make it so that Mirak knows how to cast Levitate. All the other dragon priests can levitate a few feet off the ground, so why can't Mirak do that? And more. His fight is also prone to breaking. Look, me and Mirak managed to peacefully resolve our differences and are just hanging out. I did the fight over and thought it broke again when there was this long pause at the end before this happened. These reads are awful. I know that's obviously heresy because Wes Johnson's the voice, but with this kind of thing you really should get multiple takes. It's a fine line between a demonic librarian and a guy annoyed that he can't reach the remote. I found a new dragon born to serve me. And that's it. 
Our rewards are Mirax gear, which scales up to level 60 instead of level 46 like most things, and the ability to spend our Dragon Souls to have our perks in a skill tree reset. That's better than anything we got for becoming Shea Gorath, but I don't know. I imagine most people playing do content in the release order. I mean, you have to start the Skyrim main quest to unlock this quest line, and it seems strange to drop that whole Alduin plotline to go adventure on Solstheim. My point is, this is basically the end of playthroughs. Given how reviewers tend to leave this feature out of discussions but mention legendary skills which were added in a patch after Dragonborn, I'd say it's a fair bet this mechanic is too little, too late. It is useful, because you can reclaim your perk points while keeping your skill level the same. This allows you to free up perk points that were wasted or to reallocate points for crafting. This can, in theory, solve several problems with base Skyrim progression. However, that's really the extent of it. If you spend half a playthrough running two-handed weapons, stacking health and stamina, while you'd be able to reclaim perk points for a transition to magic, you won't have the magicka or skill levels necessary to smoothly transition. Plus, I don't know if this is the kind of thing I want to encourage. I enjoy the commitment involved in a Morrowind playthrough. Skyrim's problem was never a lack of commitment, rather it was that the progression was stilted and somewhat boring, as a consequence of a lack of a clear mechanical design philosophy. You can butcher a character in Skyrim and still play thanks to the difficulty slider, which itself is just symptomatic of the real problem. It was Mirak who threatened Solstein. With him gone, her memora has been foiled once again. Tell me though, my father's death, was it necessary? One more thing, Skull friend, if you will. I know it is not my place, but may I offer a word of advice, of warning? As Shaman of the Skull, I am charged with the spiritual well-being of my people. While you are not of the Skull, you are Skull friend, and so I give you this warning. Hermamora forced you to serve him in order to defeat Mirak. Do not let him lure you further down that path. The Allmaker made you Dragonborn for a higher purpose. Do not forget that. Well, yeah, I still have a continent to go conquer. The only real thing left to do is Nelos' quest, which forms a side quest line. As if things weren't bad enough, Nelos' house has a little levitation pad. See, the Empire made levitation illegal and Neloth was forced to comply. Wait, no, he doesn't live in the Empire anymore. Neloth's levitation pad is a way to skirt around the fact that Telvanni houses required the ability to fly in Morrowind. It was a form of elitism that Telvanni practiced to keep plebs out of their hair. Well, not anymore. Strangers can invade his home consequence free. Neloth gives quests to track down all of the Black Books. He also has a handful of quests and some of them are even unradiant. But it is kind of boring and only really worth doing if you want to unlock some of the new spells like summoning ash guardians, surrounding yourself in a whirlwind of ash, or paralyzing people in a rune of ash. Wait, the creation club made it so I can already do that with paralyze rune. But yeah, that's basically it. It's a real anti-climax. Blood Moon ended with us dueling an aspect of Hearsene, or kicking our feet up in a home we earned through the building of Ravenrock. The Shivering Isles ended with us becoming a god and earning the ability to change the weather and have fully clothed lap dances. Dragonborn, meanwhile, just kind of ends. Even the final dialogue with Hermamora is just two lines and he's out. It's rushed. And I don't just mean in terms of production. It's like we're literally being rushed out the door. It's over. It's time to move on. Go play Fallout 4. But I still find myself wondering, both after the main quest and after a DLC sharing its name, what a Dragonborn is even supposed to be. At its most literal, we are a mortal with the soul of a dragon, granting us the ability to absorb dragon souls and master the dragon language. But why? Why us? Who chose us for this task? It is said that Kine was the one responsible for originally bestowing this power to the Nords, despite it supposedly being Akatosh's domain. The reality is that I have a hard time imagining Akatosh being down with the concept of Dragonborn. I think it's far more likely some outside party like Shore or Kine would create imitation dragons in mortal form or that it could be the work of the Daedra, like Hermamora. But the reality is that the Dragonborn were created by Bethesda. I usually wouldn't be so cynical, but I think the reality is that the designers saw explaining the Dragonborn as secondary to what they could accomplish with the idea. We want dragons, and we want the player to be special. The result of that unholy union is the Dragonborn. I guess then we should be thankful that we are the last Dragonborn.
I have gone back and forth on whether or not Dragonborn is nostalgia-based. Aspects of it certainly are, but as a whole, I think it does a good job of creating its own identity. If you've played Dragonborn, then you'll know more about Morrowind and Blood Moon than if you hadn't, but that alone is not enough to justify calling it nostalgia bait. Ghosts of the Tribunal is tacitly Morrowind nostalgia bait, the same way the cause was tacitly Oblivion nostalgia bait. It's even priced similarly, at $9. It's a Creation Club piece that wasn't just content with adding in old content, but trying to tell a story as well. The premise is that a group of rebel priests are still worshipping the False Tribunal. Through that, the game implements a lot of Morrowind items into Skyrim. Not just artifacts, but for instance, you can get your hands on robes from Morrowind, Ordinator armor, and the Rhetoran Watchman helm. It all starts at the temple in Ravenrock. Is you taking notes on a criminal fucking conspiracy? What the fuck is you thinking, man? With us getting pointed towards a Dwemer ruin where a heretic was trying to enchant a Dwemer weapon, which turns out to be the blade of Endoral Nerevar. Why was he doing that? Hell, let's back up and ask why the hell he has the blade. Is my character jumping to the Imperial City Prison now confirmed to just be canon? I guess the Nerevering took off all of his gear before his trip to Akavir. I mean, a lot of it wasn't Daedric, so the usual excuse does not work. Or, you know, Helseth finally managed to have him assassinated and what followed was Tamriel's largest auction, followed by a PR campaign about the Nerevering's trip to Akavir. The enchantment process is reminiscent of the quest to do the same thing in the Tribunal expansion, although there we did that because the sword was literally shattered and had to be reforged. So yeah, that's the level of grace this creation has with introducing items. The heretic had a note pointing us towards a hideout that the heretics are using and we're given a branching option to either wear the heretic's gear and earn the cult's trust or to wipe out the cult. I joined just out of curiosity and honestly it felt like a waste of time and that I should have just wiped it out from the start. Pretending to be in the cult gives us a handful of quests to complete to find other items. You should bear in mind that everything communicated to the player during this quest is done so through notes and existing generic dialogue. How is this showcasing the hard work of modders when you don't even have the signature style of quest mods? Bad voice acting. On my way back from my walk, I passed mine entrance again. I heard all sorts of horrific noises. I guess it is authentic to Morrowind, though, having us read 99% of the dialogue. If only they skipped the notes and journals and just had a text box where they could actually write dialogue. It does feel good to be proven right. That element of textual dialogue being a benefit for designers goes doubly so for modders who don't have as consistent access to voice talent. Over the course of the quest, we're given the unenchanted masks of Vivek, Amalexia, Sotha Sil, and Dagothur. They are unenchanted. Sadly, they don't let you stack circlets or dragon priest masks under them, so the Falmer helmet remains king. One of my favorite aspects of this creation are these ash zombies. What a coincidence that somebody started creating these things again after somehow finding the mask of Dagothur. How does this thing even still exist? In the launch version of Anniversary, these guys would attack the player every hour or so, and while they aren't dangerous, they have an annoying amount of health. Other artifacts in no particular order, the Cleaver of St. Felms looking a little corroded, plus who even remembers this thing? Like, yeah, it was unique, it was also kind of trash. Amalexia's sword hopes fire. Makes sense, we just got true flame. Guess they look good on my wall together. Light of day. Seriously? Light of day? It's unique, but not unique enough for me to have even bothered mentioning it in an 8 hour video on Morrowind. It was an iron mace that was notable for being scripted to kill vampires who tried to wield it. It has a sun motif now. Magebane, which looks to me to actually be a ripped model from Blades of the Weapon Breathtaker. Magebane was a generic glass claymore in the Urshalaku Burial Cavern. I mean, it's really nice to see the good-looking glass weapons get ported to Skyrim, but honestly, I might have preferred it if you actually just did that instead of scratching the bottom of the barrel looking for artifacts. Plus, you know, so I can enchant my own Morrowind-style glass weapons. Skullcrusher. That's not even a tribunal artifact. It was made by Nords during their occupation of Morrowind. Oh man, I forgot that the hideout's defense against intruders was a spinning block puzzle. Not just that, but the solution is literally Almsavi, you know, the gods that these guys worship. Ten years of derision, and people are still making these. They also added ordinator armor, and I guess it looks better than most mod implementations. I think the issue is that it went through the Oblivion era to get here, so everything's too wide. The ordinator gear was pointy, but slim. The clothing elements of the armor are also way too smooth. There's just no attempt at preserving or converting the original rough and low poly aesthetic. The story of this creation did not go anywhere. Or if it does, it broke and it just ended for me. And I don't think that's the case though, and even months later the UESP still hasn't really written up articles about the creation. Not that I need them, I glanced through my footage of playing the creation and it's all just really sterile. What happened? 
Well, this mod is the creation of Chris Takahashi, who for some reason has an IMDb page crediting his work on a 15 episode YouTube series where he interviews voice actors, most of whom seem to work on his other IMDb credit, the Skyrim mod, Interesting NPCs. The traveler came to this land not as a visitor or a pilgrim, but a prisoner bonded by fate. The thing is, this free mod is far more ambitious than anything his name is attached to in the entire creation club. I cannot speak for its quality or execution since I've never used it, but it implements a lot of quests with, you know, voice acting. So why is the Creation Club almost universally garbage compared to what modders can make for free? Now, there are some theories floating around as to why this is. One of them is monetary. I have heard ballpark figures that these modders get paid a flat sum of around $1,000 per creation. Sounds good, right? Wrong. That much money is less than a week of low-end developer pay. Apparently, despite the fact that creations were intended to be sold individually rather than in a bundle as is what happened with the Anniversary Edition, they were not offered any kind of percentage of sales. This means that rather than justifying extra effort to create standout creations that sell moderately well, most of these creators are just making fire and forget content. Especially since a number of them were created to be released as part of the Anniversary Edition. Basically, the developers weren't paid enough to make anything good. Takahashi has his name on a lot of the creations, yet most of them are just, I heard a rumor, clear this cave, search this body, and then you find some model that's been ported over from Blades or something. The kind of quests you make when you can only justify working on something for a couple days. Like the creation, The Contest. This adds the Ice Blade of the Monarch and the Fists of Randigulf from Morrowind to Skyrim. It starts with reading a journal that's hidden at Candlehearth Hall. Seriously, I knew it was there and still took more than a minute to actually find it. Then you go clear a spider cave, kill a unique spider with the help of a couple ghosts, and you just have the artifacts. There's even a bug with the fists. Because the temper recipe points to the ice blade instead of the fists, so you can't improve them. That's the level of ceremony that's given to some of the more unique items from Morrowind. Hey, remember when Mace got the sword out of sequence? Given that this person has a track record of being able to create real quests with voice acting, as well as a list of people he's worked with before, let alone even more people who would likely be excited to have their voices in the Anniversary Edition of Skyrim, we can conclude a few things. Either Bethesda stylistically decided that new voice acting would clash with the old voice acting, Bethesda refused to pay for these new voice actors, or the modders didn't want to split their already meager pay with voice talent. Example given, The Grey Cow Returns. This creation adds the Grey Cowl of Nocturnal from Oblivion. For some reason, they changed the lettering on the cowl, like, literally, all you had to do was... As this was one of the creations shown when Bethesda first started showing off the Creation Club at E3 2017. Yeah, the Bethesda Land E3. Apparently, however, the creation was pushed back two years to 2019 due to, quote, the community being very vocal about desiring more in-depth quests, end quote. You go to the Riften Graveyard where a thief randomly attacks you. A note on his body indicates that he's looking for the burial place of the Grey Fox to steal his cowl. Obviously, this is what thieves do and not a contrived scenario to justify the player getting the note. The note includes a clue to say the phrase Shadow Hide you to the local beggars upon which they will tell us to break into Bully's house and steal instructions. <laughs> Just kidding. They give you a note detailing all this. Our written instructions tell us to swap a deed and land title from Erica with a fake, then we're instructed to steal a sword from a dungeon. There is a hinted story going on that Geesley, also known as Eric, her sister, was using a child from the Iceblade family to steal land in Northern Daggerfall. The Iceblade thing is a coincidence. It's thus revealed that the Grey Fox is a member of the Iceblade family, having rescued his nephew, and thus you're handed the Grey Cowl. Now, with voice acting, this quest would be at about the tier of the Thieves Guild special jobs, and that's probably only due to it being delayed. The Grey Cowl itself is... interesting? Mind you, once I got this thing in Oblivion, I leaned on it a lot because its effect was very powerful. It's a very good reward for doing the Thieves Guild questline. In Skyrim, I tried to use it to loot an alchemy shop during the day instead of my usual routine of breaking in at night, and this caused a lot of issues. It is a lot less consistent about whether or not it will actually function. The idea is that while wearing the cowl, everyone perceives you to be the Grey Fox, rather than your true identity. You can use the cowl to then commit crimes as the bounty will be added to him rather than to you. It's meant to be very powerful, as it's the Daedric artifact of Nocturnal. In Skyrim, the bounty function is a bit janky, and the effect just makes guards hostile, which doesn't always go away when you take it off. Hey, does anybody remember paid mods? Creation Club is so much worse than Workshop paid mods. I mean, maybe. At least modders got a 25% revenue split, so as the workshop market stabilized and the content thieves eliminated, 
The miters that actually put effort in would be compensated, while the trash tier content that just drops a god item into the world would go unpurchased. We got the bad ending, although honestly the workshop ending is still pretty terrible. The good ending is modders abandoning Bethesda to go make indie games instead. Oh wait, Chris Takahashi did that, in 2020, and nobody played out of shapes. Oh god, we're living in the bad ending. Sunder and Wraithguard is a creation from 2018 featuring Kagranax tools, or at least the two that weren't already in Skyrim. There's a quest to the College of Winterhold that ends with us getting our hands on Keening, although I never actually gave it to Arniel because he dies if you do. After tracking down several caravans, which were transporting the artifacts through Skyrim for some reason, we end up heading to an existing dungeon, which has had an additional area stapled on to place these items. Apparently the dwarves had a system in place for automatically reclaiming Kagradak's tools, which killed the original smugglers. No idea why this system's only in Skyrim and not in Morrowind. Keening and Sunder no longer kill the player upon wielding them. Skyrim made that mistake when they added Keening in without Wraithguard for no real good reason. I never understood why the Keening quest was in the game, other than a way of trying to allude to the disappearance of the dwarves. Instead, Wraithguard empowers the enchantments on Keening and Sunder. Keening has no enchantment charge, meaning its enchantment just doesn't work. It also cannot be tempered, but that's probably intentional. Unofficial patch obviously disagrees, and makes it so you can somehow temper this ancient blade. Wraithguard makes it so you have additional red, green, and blue juice while wielding Keening, and fortified one-handed damage and green juice recovery while wielding Sunder. But you can dual wield it, so the protection effect... <laughs> Never mind. Like anything else, it's pretty much purely in the game just to pander to people like me. There are still over a dozen creations I haven't mentioned and honestly don't have the spirit to. The Anniversary Edition finally broke me in one. It's one thing to watch Skyrim fumble, to lament about what could have been had things only been slightly different. It's a whole other thing to watch Skyrim itself go through its own desecration, its own self-harm. Bethesda's so obsessed with necromancy they did it to their own games, repeatedly, to the point that even people who are just casual fans of the series have a problem with it. I can easily say that Anniversary Edition is paying to make your game worse. Let's finally talk about the namesake of Dragonborn. It refers to both us and Mirak. If you break down the main quest of Skyrim and Dragonborn, you find that they're structurally similar. There's an imminent threat. To defeat this threat, we need to seek out a dragon shout, which leads us to a Dwemer ruin and eventually another realm where we slay this foe. Being able to draw parallels never necessarily makes something good. The thing is, Dragonborn was an opportunity to recontextualize the story of Skyrim, and it does that, in tiny increments. For a long time I didn't know if I wanted to discuss this during the main quest or here because neither place really seemed appropriate. This is because Dragonborn, while squandering the opportunity, is still just a slightly more appropriate place. We have to ask the question of what exactly a Dragonborn even is. Dovahkin are mortals with the soul of a dragon. Dragons, or Dova, are immortal children of Agatosh. To get into this, I first want to say that many people overstate the complexity of Elder Scrolls. Elder Scrolls lore is more like an ornate chair. There's a lot of details, but it's still rather straightforward what function it serves. Imagine there's a guy named Steve, hanging out with his friends. One day, Steve says he has a plan where he can buy a nice plot of land for him and his friends to live on, but he needs donations from everyone to make his plan work. Some people immediately leave the room with the notion, deciding to go home. Some people reject this plan, saying they can go buy their own land. And some people accept it. Only it turns out that Steve defrauded everybody and is the sole owner of the new land, so Alan, the group leader of the people who said yes, kills Steve. That is effectively the creation of Nern, which is the planet the game takes place on. Both Steve and Alan have two names in the setting, depending on the people you ask about the story. Steve is known as both Lorcan and Shore, while Alan is known as both Ariel and Akatosh. Shore has two names because men see him as a god of heroes, while elves see him as a sort of devil figure. Akitosh has two names because both men and elves worshipped him, but Ariel seemed to fall out of favor with the elves, literally merging into just Akitosh worship due to the dominion of men and Cyrodiil, the part of the Eight Divines religion. Akitosh and Shor are reflections of a broader conflict in Elder Scrolls mythology between order and chaos. Akitosh, after killing Lorcan and shooting his heart across the world, has basically taken over as the god of time, keeping things generally moving forward. The dragons are meant to be agents of this order. They have a society and language, and using the dragon cult, we're able to keep men under control. The Nords have a story that neatly lines up with this, where Shore disappeared from them after his heart was taken by the elves at Red Mountain. In essence, 
The conflict between men and elves in the setting isn't just a disagreement about religion from people who took slightly different paths, it is literally baked into their entire culture. Just as the Dragon War was a revolution of men escaping the tyranny of Akatosh, the Great War was a revolution of elves attempting to restore Akatosh to prominence in their religion. But you have to wonder, is the Dragonborn really the chosen of Akatosh? Parthenax says that he is as his father Akatosh made him, as are we, only that might be poorly worded. It would be reasonable to assume one of two meanings from that statement. The first is that he's saying that Akatosh made him the way he is and that Akatosh made us the way we are. The other interpretation is that Akatosh made him the way he is, just like our creator did with us. Since this is a response to our stated surprise at him being a dragon, it's reasonable to assume he is talking about how he was born a dragon just as we are a dragon born. In reality, I do not think this is the case. It just doesn't taste right. The Nords have a belief about Kind that she taught the men how to use the Thum, but usage of the Thum alone is not creating a Dragonborn. That's why the Way of the Voice is the way it is. Kind's whole thing is about peaceful coexistence with nature. Her name is a word of power and the dragons shout to calm animals. It's also said that Kind performed this action through Parthenax. It's likely a combination of these stories. Kine wanted men to have the Thum, so she went to Parthenax, Chief Lieutenant of Alduin, who proceeded to begin teaching men how to use the Thum the same way he teaches the Greybeards about the Way of the Voice. It was just a reward for loyal service to the Dragon Cult, hence why so many Draugr are wielders of the Voice. And then Mirak came along. Mirak was a dragon priest in the cult, but eventually fell into the service of Hermaeus Mora. This is alleged to be because he learned a word of Bend Will and eventually sought to learn the entire shout. The word wall at Therene's Watch, which tells of someone named Bar the Stubborn who meditated there awaiting enlightenment only to become old instead of wise. If you're wondering, the first word for bend will is earth, which is supposed to bend stones to the will of the user. Apparently, however, if you learn the word for mind, then you can use the thum to control the minds of mortals. And if you learn the word for dragon, then you can control dragons. Are you... actually... serious? The final word needed to unlock the ability to control dragons is the word dragon something they can't go two minutes without saying You speak true, Dovahkiin, at the first meeting of two of the Dove. If you are Dovahkiin, a gift, Dovahkiin, Dova source, dragon blood, with an old Dova against the Dove, the dragons. The Dove are children of Akatosh, but all Dove to the immortal Dove. Dova King. Dova King. Dova, a captive Dova. Dova King. Dova King. Dova speech. Dova King. Me dove navarantil. Dova. You wound me, Dova King. Aha. Here's another of those dragon language inscriptions. I wonder what it says. Just let me study these runes for a moment. Hmm. Here's another mention of the Guardian. I can only assume that this is the Guardian's tomb we're standing in now. It's literally in our fucking name! That's the weird thing about the Thum. The word walls are literally stories written on the walls, which our brain just picks out a random word to learn as a shout. In theory, every word is a shout, but either that means the dragon language has an incredibly limited vocabulary, or that there's some mechanism preventing us from learning a number of words of power every word wall or conversation. In fact, during one quest, there's a character that transcribes the dragon language from a book. We're shown that we can learn a word of power just by hearing it. Even when Esbern, a non-dragonborn, says the name Odaving, we learn all three words of power. You would think that we would be learning dozens of words of power just from our first encounter with Alduin. What does the word of power Thuri mean when used in a shout? Why does the expression Earth Mind Dragon combine into a compound dragon shout? Is that a gameplay thing, or are these words inexorably linked together? Moreover, the question of where Mirak came from is never answered, because just like the secret knowledge of Hermaeus Mora just being the dragon word for dragon, Bethesda really wasn't putting in the effort. 
He just appeared one day. Apparently, the slightly less ancient Dragonborn asked him for help during the Dragon War and he declined their offer. How did he figure out he was a Dragonborn? How did he get his first Dragon Souls? Did Hermaeus Mora initiate the relationship that led to him learning to bend wills or did he seek that out? That is ultimately the failure of Skyrim. What the Dragonborn is and what purpose we are serving is nebulous and we are often shut down when trying to seek answers. We might be a creation of Akatosh existing to put Alduin into his place. We might be a perversion created by Shore existing to kill servants of Akatosh and protect men. Maybe we're products of Hermaeus Mora weaponizing the dragon's own knowledge against them while using the ambitions of mortals to create his own powerful servants. Hermaeus Mora is yet another failure of the story. You can't earn loyalty by demonstrating how you betray your servants in every incarnation. He wasn't like that in Oblivion, but in Skyrim for some reason, he's an exceptionally treacherous god. And the entire stakes of the story rests on the player believing Hermaeus Mora's own hype about the threat of Mirak. We need Bend Will, not to defeat Mirak, but simply to get a ride up to his tower. Which is narratively worse than Dragonrend, because at least that served a purpose in defeating Alduin. There is no reason to believe the last Dragonborn couldn't have defeated Mirak upon his return to Tamriel. Mirak's power is to control dragons, which we can already easily slay, and to sacrifice dragon souls to replenish his health, which just turns into a logistical issue. I don't have a grand elaborate theory about the truth behind the Dragonborn. I mean, I do, but there's no point in sharing it. There's no point because of the way the story presents its ideas. It's lazy. And remember that all of this is told through the medium of a mediocre action-adventure game. Could I agree with the notion that there's more going on with Skyrim than makes it into a typical Skyrim video? Sure, I can certainly believe there is a broader theme to the game, but that belief was strained when they had the opportunity to elaborate upon it and decided that this is what they wanted to do. But this doesn't really care about the Dragonborn, and they don't want us to care either. They are a dungeon master tired of answering their players' questions. We are the Dragonborn, because we can use Dragon Shouts, because that is the new gameplay mechanic tied to fighting dragons, because dragons are cool. Dragonborn is like, that's something where it gets really kind of metaphysical, kind of. We don't want to define it too much. That's what we do want it to be. Well, how does that work? You show up and you start exhibiting the powers and people are like, oh my god, is it, could it be true? Is this the Dragonborn? Does this person have the voice, the thum, this power of old? And if so, what does that mean? And it, what it really comes down to mean is, anointed by the gods with the soul of a dragon. This is something that, you know, once every few generations you have someone who's born with this ability. So you as the dragonborn, you must resolve the problem with the dragons. You must find out what it is they're back here for, and you have to take this head on. Skyrim is part of my origin story as a content creator. I've wanted to talk about this game in this format since 2015, but never really had the platform or experience to do so in a way that satisfied me. That makes it crazy to come to the end of this odyssey that started when I was writing in my spare time I had after work, making a video about Morrowind just because. But the question is, once the security of my next step is gone, what happens then? Who knows? It's not our problem right now. Instead, we have to look at Skyrim, stripped down before us. We have ripped it raw, and to be honest, I had a hard time trying to find ways to be positive about the game that were genuine. I mean, even if your perception of Skyrim ended in 2014, and you hadn't heard anything about the game since then, it's still hard to be positive towards Skyrim. The game presents three archetypes, the warrior, the thief, and the mage. The companions, the thieves' guild, the college of Winterhold. At its core, it's then supposed to provide an avenue upon which you can branch out, try a hybrid playstyle while you play other quest lines, or work through the less archetypal Civil War, Dark Brotherhood, and main quest lines eventually try out the Dawn Guard or Dragonborn expansions. You level as you play. You unlock perks as you level. You do dungeons which have enemies and rewards determined by your level. You do that again and again. It's all so... convenient. I could forgive one or the other, but not both. If you want to have a simplistic story, but have the same complexity of gameplay, 
Well, fine, we'll mark it as a weak entry. If you want to have a great story, but boring gameplay, that's also fine. We'll mark it as an odd entry, maybe a cult classic. But when you have a simplistic story and the boring gameplay, then we have to mark it as a bad entry. That doesn't make Skyrim a bad game on its own, it just makes The Elder Scrolls a once amazing series that it doesn't live up to. What went wrong in design? A few things. Bethesda has no dedicated writers, planting that responsibility on the shoulders of its quest designers. They could survive that when character definition was in the game part of the RPG, but with Skyrim it is in the RP part, relying on storytelling that just wasn't there. Moreover, there is not a clear lead design vision to Skyrim like there was with Morrowind and Oblivion, which can likely be owed to the departure of Ken Rolston. There are no writers, nor did there seem to be much of a perception at Bethesda that writing was something their fans actually valued. Hell, when you watch the QuakeCon demo and you hear the crowd chanting water as Todd Howard walks by a river, yeah, they probably felt justified not having worried about whether or not their stories made sense. As to the gameplay design philosophy, it seemed that there was little room to question Todd. It looks good, and looking good is the key to attracting an audience. Attracting an audience helps sales much more than retention, so focus on the effects and visceral nature of the gameplay more than long-term progression. It takes real effort to make an experience that is good throughout a playthrough, and this isn't to say that Bethesda doesn't want that, just that they couldn't justify worrying about, let's say, 10% of people being happy with the full experience, when what they needed was people to enjoy the game long enough for word of mouth to spread. So why do people like it so much? Well, a few reasons. Outside of raw graphical fidelity, the game really is kind of beautiful in its open world. The game's soundtrack is quite literally next level compared to the previous games, using new and more advanced techniques to integrate gameplay and music. If all you wanted was a game to walk around in to take your mind off of things, this is up there. But the more you actually engage with the world, the more its issues begin to stand out. Even when you subtract The Elder Scrolls from the title, it remains that Skyrim is not a particularly strong game on its lonesome, which is why it's more apt to say that Skyrim is a platform upon which mod packs are built. People don't like Skyrim the way I like Morrowind, almost entirely vanilla. It literally took 20 years for me to finally install a higher resolution texture pack for Morrowind. Skyrim is an engine that starts stock, but as time passes, you eventually replace every component. Even the parts people like have a chance of being modified. If that's the case, then everyone already knows that Skyrim is a mediocre game. If it's good, you wouldn't have to fix it. But I don't know, it's more complicated than that. Get this many videos with something explainable with a single number. There has to be something special here. What Skyrim actually represents is a breakdown of nostalgia. Skyrim is the coolest game ever, for a while, but in the process of trying to relive that part of your life when you played it, you keep noticing flaws and trying to fix them until you eventually realize that Skyrim hasn't changed that much. It was us that changed. But that's a pretty boring observation and generally true of most things. Rather, I think it comes back to that accessibility question. They made Skyrim accessible to everyone. So many who had been hearing about this Bethesda company played it as their first RPG and got into the genre, but years later look back at Skyrim with better developed taste and realize its flaws. In other words, it is a kid's game, you remember being tough, that you stomp in a couple hours years later when you replay it. In the quest to make the game easy to access, they made it popular, but both ease of access and popularity make it a desirable target of criticism. And let's be honest, it has gotten easier to criticize Bethesda with time. I maintain that I have been doing it for years. I literally participated in the Boston Salt Party back when Fallout 4 came out. But most people were scared to do it until Bethesda was fully on the backpedal. Even Fallout 4 for most wasn't low enough and it took Fallout 76 for some to be finally brave enough to admit that we might be right on a thing or two. It is so 
popular. To make fun of Bethesda, the contrarians have started going the other way with it, trying to defend Bethesda from the horde of people criticizing them. Which is actually pretty wild. I don't know about all that. The important thing to remember is that quality doesn't change retroactively. Skyrim isn't bad because of Fallout 76, it's simply that many people who had been blinded by the optimism of how happy games made them feel began to think critically about the things they spent the most time doing. Skyrim is a comfortable blanket. It has a habit of showing up at a low point in people's lives, giving them an out from the world for a while. Later in the future, when they need that blanket again, they reach for it, but it doesn't work as well twice. It never does. But the same could be true of anything. The reason why there are weirdo fans of bad games is just because it was at the right place at the right time for them. There are people I'm now friends with because they saw one of my videos at a low point in their lives. That's not a marker of quality on my part. It's like saying a game is fun with friends. Is it the game that's fun? or the opportunity to hang out with your friends. But that does raise a question. Is Skyrim only bad because it's not as emotionally significant to me? No, I think I've been very objective and logical with my conclusions. If you look at this video, I think you find it largely has no central thesis, which I think is a good reflection of Skyrim. The least I can say with Oblivion is that it was obvious they had a point to the stories they were telling and to the gameplay that the game has. It gave me something to focus on and thus focus the analysis down into. Skyrim has no concrete points to either its story or its gameplay. Thus, I have to build points myself just to give myself an anchor to base anything on. Whenever I try to ascribe a point to a Skyrim story, I find myself having to stop because it isn't quite right. The Companions is a story about the difficulty of dealing with a divine curse. Well, no, that's not quite right. Any attempt at succinctly explaining what the story is gives it more credence than it deserves. Is that what happens? Yes, but that doesn't quite relay the actual experience of playing through that story. The Oblivion Fighters Guild is a story about the downward slide of the guild in the face of a morally dishonorable opponent. It has a lot of literal troll quests, but you can at least tell that the story does want to be about that topic. You can't say the same for the Companions or anything in Skyrim. That is why analyzing it took me so long. Morrowind was entering a poorly lit room. Oblivion was entering a dark room and feeling around for the light switch. Skyrim is entering a dark room and having to wire up your own lighting without being able to see what you're doing. When it does have an ounce of something, it's also almost universally nonsense. It is genuinely a Herculean effort to be charitable to these stories as being anything other than the necessary filler to get the job done. Now, of course, a better man would have just said that, but I'm not above being thorough for fun. There are a lot of ways to improve here. One is to embrace dialogue. These stories would have been immensely better if role-playing through dialogue had been truly utilized. You could do branching narratives, or look into emergent stories like what Bannerlord offers. Or you could actually sit down and write out a plot a story filled with tension, or perhaps a piece that actually has something to say about the human condition. You know, Morrowind didn't have that many dialogue options either, yet it had a compelling narrative because it showcased us a world that was truly different than our own, how differently people had to live in response to that world, yet ultimately how similar it could be. Skyrim should be a harsh and unfriendly world, until you earn the respect of Nords who give you a big bear hug and then they start singing stories about elf hewers. The second that the Nords became an analog for humans is the second that the story failed, thoroughly and fundamentally. Because every plotline derives from Skyrim and the Nords, the story becomes a vehicle for the gameplay, and, well... Skyrim's gameplay is horrifically boring. In cutting out the complexity of previous games, they also cut out everything that could have made the system engaging. It is functionally the same, just clicking the left mouse button, but completely different because there's no distinction between doing it for the very first and the very last time. It's the same paddle-spamming combat all the way through. The numbers get bigger, but the experience stays the same. When you hear the developers talk about Oblivion, they talk about it like it's a dungeon crawler. I don't think they look at these games as something to be picked up and savored for a long time, and to be missed when it's over. 
They see the game as getting a quest, running a dungeon, looting a box, and selling stuff until you get bored. The bulk of the content just exists on the off chance that you stick around long enough to need it. It is cynical, but that is what Skyrim ended up being. Which is why, when you scrutinize the stories, they just fall apart. They aren't something to be written for long-term analysis, they're meant to be just a framework around which the game is strung up. And that's the major fault of Skyrim. There's too much preparation, too much foreplay, too much foundation, and not enough actual building. Lore is an accessory to quests. Quests are an accessory to dungeons. Dungeons are an accessory to the experience. They made a world without realizing that it's not just the geometry and planes of Black Mesa that make it special. It is everything combined with those aspects. I think the critical question that Bethesda has to answer is what exactly it is they want from their games. The novelty of being just an open world to explore is no longer there. Even Dark Souls has done it at this point. Should Elder Scrolls be about the lore, the writing, the mechanics? You can keep the focus on exploration, but there has to be something more for Elder Scrolls 6 to actually engage me. I'm years past done with these games, and I'm settling the books on this one. I'll play Elder Scrolls 6 out of curiosity, and if I get strapped for cash, I'll probably analyze it. But the magic is over. This isn't bargaining. This is acceptance. Goodbye. Skyrim. Don't dip out yet, though. I know when I say the words, we're finally done, that signals that it's over, and sure, it is. But I want to thank everyone who supported me through the process of creating both this video as well as my Oblivion video and minorly the Morrowind video. It was insane to see the Morrowind video get the viewership that it did and completely changed my life. Not just financially in that I'm now a content creator, but it renewed my belief in there being some small measure of meritocracy in life. When it was happening, I knew that I couldn't let the opportunity slip through my fingers, so I crunched out a Oblivion video. I didn't compromise quality or time, but, but that minute had quite the interesting production. Really learned a lot about myself that summer. Skyrim was much the same, but I knew once I had committed to Oblivion that eventually we would make it here. But I never knew when working on the Morrowind video that this was how things were going to turn out. I had no faith that that was going to be the case. At the end of the day, I have to thank Bethesda. I have to say this is probably it for the long form stuff on Bethesda for the time being. As natural an idea as doing this for Fallout sounds, it just does not sound appealing to me. That includes New Vegas before you say it technically isn't a Bethesda game. That's because the only way I want to do New Vegas is to do Fallout 3 in the same video and well, I'm not excited to do Fallout 3. Big shout out goes out to the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages. I cannot understate how impressive or useful their website is compared to the alternative over at Fandom. Pretty much every aspect of this production, from playing the game, to writing about it, to being able to quickly demonstrate something visually, was made significantly easier by the UESP. I am legitimately sad at the notion that in completing this video, I am also leaving behind this valuable resource. Would it have been possible without them? Well, yeah, but I'm still going to miss seeing that icon in my browser tabs, in seeing the familiar colors of their website, in being amused at seeing just how many purple links on a page there already are when I get there. I also have to show appreciation for the Elder Scrolls community, the art, the music, the memes, the videos, the streams, no matter how the games turned out. They always unlocked creativity in people. I'm not an Elder Scrolls channel, but I'll freely admit to being a part of the community. I'm sure Elder Scrolls 6 is going to absolutely destroy the community though, so let's just enjoy the years that we have. My patrons also deserve a mention for supporting me throughout this project. Everyone who's donated since I began this is currently going by on screen. Being able to financially support the content creators you enjoy makes projects like this possible. If I had tried to pitch this to some producer, I would have been laughed out of the room, 
Despite us now having repeatedly proven the viability and popularity of this style of content, the only way to prevent this type of thing from becoming overly corporatized is to continue to support independent creators and to give them the safety net that they need to take these kinds of risks on their projects. Ending these things really is the most emotional part because of just how much effort is poured into writing this, let alone at the editing by the time I get around to this part. These videos have been very impactful on my life. I didn't think that I would get 2,000 views per, let alone 2 million. With that, it's time to wake up. We're here. Why are you shaking? Are you okay? Wake up. Glover Mallory is a wonder with a hammer and anvil. He mended my armor like an old pro. I don't know what you're playing at, Glover, but something about you just doesn't add up. Understandable.